Little Theater of the Air. Now, the hermit. What's all the racket about? Well, stop crying and tell me what it is. There was someone in my room. Oh, you've been dreaming. No, no. I woke up and heard, heard my door creaking open. I could feel it. There was someone standing in my room. And then I heard them run down the stairs after I called out. Hubert, you've got to go downstairs and look. Well, of course I'll look, but you don't think there's going to be anyone in the house after all you're screaming, do you? Oh, Hubert, wait a minute. I'm going with you. You better stay right in bed, Cora. No, I'm afraid. Well, you said you heard someone go downstairs. I know, but I won't stay here alone. All right, come on. I think you just had a nightmare. Oh, no. That's a nice way to wake a guy up out of a sound sleep. All the screaming. Oh, you'd have screamed, too. Oh, not much. I tried to nab whoever it was. Look, careful, Hubert. The burglar may have a gun. I can't find the light switch here in the living room. I'll get it. What? Look. The rug is kicked up. Someone was in here. And look. The things on the table have all been disturbed. Yeah. Hubert, where are you going? Well, to look through the house. Oh, wait for me. Dining room window. I see it. Well, by George. It came in through the dining room window. Well, it should have been locked. I thought it was. I haven't had these windows open for ages, not since I've been home. Well, I'll be... Where are you going? Why, to phone the police. There sure has been someone in this house. <laughs> Looks like they used this window for entrance and escape, all right. Uh, Hal, find any footprints outside the window? No, not a darn one. Hmm. Well, maybe they didn't use the window. Well, there's a cement drive outside this window. It's possible they could have stepped on the cement both entering and leaving. We'll take fingerprints of the window. Now, let's see, uh, a few questions. You were the only one who heard the noise, Mrs. Armour? Yes. I heard the door to my bedroom open slowly. Then close, and then someone running downstairs. And the first thing you heard? My wife screaming. How far is your room from hers? Just across the hall. Are you a sound sleeper, Mr. Armour? Well, I guess so. I rarely wake up during the night. And you, Mrs. Armour? I don't sleep so well. You see, I've been ill and in the hospital. I, I'm not well at all. I... Oh. <laughs> there now, Cora, everything's all right. My wife had a nervous breakdown recently, officer. Oh, I see. Well, just a few more questions, and then we'll let you go back to bed. Uh, any valuables in the house? 
no valuables exactly. I usually have quite a bit of money on me. Why is that? I don't bank anymore. Cash my salary checks, and what I don't put into bonds, I use to pay bills. How about tonight? All the money's safe in my room. How do you know, Hubert? Well, silly, I looked when you yelled burglar. Who knows that you carry a good sum of money around with you, Armour? Oh, I don't know. Some of the boys around the office, I guess. I may have mentioned it in the bar. Hmm. They got those fingerprints, Hal? All set. No, we won't disturb you any more tonight. Obviously, there's no one here now. They didn't get anything this time, and they may not disturb you again. Oh, I hope not. It was awful. My nerves can't stand it. Go back and get a good night's rest. That is, what's left of it. You won't have any visitors again tonight. Good morning, Mrs. Armour. Remember me? Oh, yes. You're one of the policemen who was here last night. Mind if I come in? I'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, no, come in. I was just out in the kitchen finishing up the breakfast dishes. Well, then we'll go out there. I can talk to you while you work. Uh, did you sleep after we left? Well, yes, sir, I did. And you know, this morning I can't remember much of what happened last night. That's so? But I don't remember things well at all. Not since I've been sick. Lots of times things are foggy with me. How long were you in the hospital, Mrs. Armour? Let's see. It was... Well, it was a long time, over a month, I guess. What brought on your illness, Mrs. Armour? Well, sir, I don't know exactly. Were you unhappy? Yes, sir, I was. What about? Well, Hubert got so he didn't pay any attention to me. That's so? Stayed out a lot nights? Yes, he did. He was never home. But since I've been in the hospital, he's been wonderful to me. Kind and good and home every night. Oh, came to his senses, didn't he? Yes, sir. There's been a great change in Hubert. That's good. Yes. I feel like I can get well now. Of course, the burglar coming has upset me. Coming into my room like that and standing there in the darkness. Hubert says if it wasn't for that window being open in the dining room, we might just think of it as a bad dream I had. Well, Mrs. Armour, we're going to keep an eye on the house. And we want you to help us. All right. What do you want me to do? If you see any strange persons hanging around here in the daytime or night, you call the 4th Street Station and report it. Now, uh, here's the telephone number. Or anything strange that happens, you remember and tell us. Sure, I will. The best I can. You know, it might be a good thing, Mrs. Armour, if you wrote things down in a notebook. As long as you can't recall things very well. Oh, what should I write down? Oh, anything odd that happens. And uh, what's more, Mrs. Armour, you keep this notebook a secret, just between you and me. Think you could do this? Why, sure, I guess so. Not even tell your husband? I could keep it from him. Good. Now, let's see. Suppose you keep these notes under the mattress of your bed. Only you and I will know that they're there. Write down anything you want to and keep it for me. There was a peddler at the door this afternoon. He had funny eyes. I thought he might be the burglar come back again. Didn't let him in. He went to Mrs. Joyce's next door. She didn't let him in either. Hubert read to me tonight about a burglary on the south side of town. This burglar got in through a window, too, the basement window. He took money and silverware. We haven't got any good silverware. It's 
15 minutes to 12 midnight. I just woke up, and I'm scared. Awful scared. I'm writing in this notebook because I've sort of got accustomed to doing it. And it steadies my nerves a little. I've been writing in it for a couple of weeks now. But the policeman called Hal hasn't been around to see it. Maybe it's because I haven't called or had anything to tell him. But I'm scared tonight. It was at supper that Hubert said... You aren't frightened of burglars anymore, are you, Cora? Sometimes I'm afraid of him coming back again. Oh, fiddlesticks. There won't be any more disturbance after all this time has passed. Oh, I hope you're right. Of course I am. Well, anyhow, I have to go out tonight. You... Oh, Hubert. Now, don't cloud up and cry, baby. No one's going to hurt you. What's more, we'll see that all the windows are locked and the doors. Why do you have to go out, Hubert? A buyer. His boss asked me to see him tonight. I'm afraid. Terribly afraid. Now, listen. There's nothing to be afraid of. Before I go, I'll see that you're safely tucked in your bed. Well, you were complaining before supper about being tired. So you can take a little sleeping pill and go to bed early. Then I'll lock all the doors and you'll be as safe as a bug in a rug. What's more, I'm going to be home early. I told the boss I couldn't leave my wife for too long a time. So Hubert got me all fixed up. And after taking the pill, I did fall asleep. But a little while ago, something must have woke me up. It's exactly 12, and Hubert isn't home yet. I know because I just called out and he didn't answer me. It must have been about 10 or 15 minutes ago that I woke up and heard something outside my room. Footsteps. There would be one step. And then a long pause. And then another. For a minute, I was so scared I couldn't even breathe. Somehow, I just seemed to know that whoever was coming down the hall was coming to my room. And for me. For a few seconds, I couldn't move. Just sort of paralyzed with fear. And then I got brave enough to reach out and turn on my bed lamp. The person must have been real close to my room when the light went on. There was one more step. And then they stopped. Officer Hal, as true as I'm writing, they stopped right outside my door. I heard a board creak. Then all was very, very still. For almost years, it seemed. And then I heard, very quietly, as if someone was tiptoeing, footsteps leaving my room. The light. The light has frightened them away. Oh, I'm so certain that it was someone coming for me, but what am I going to do? I'm too truly afraid to go downstairs and phone for the police. I'm going to call out to Hubert again. Hubert? Hubert? No. Hubert isn't home yet. Or perhaps... Perhaps whoever has come into this house has done something to Hubert. Hubert! my door. I know it. Someone just moved outside my door. I'm going to hide this notebook under the mattress like you told me to do, and then I shall scream out the window for help. Just after Cora 
Mama puts the notebook under the mattress. She goes to the window, opens it, and is ready to scream for help. The door to her bedroom opens, and she calls out in terror. She sees a man standing there with a gun in his hand. One pleading cry, and then... No! <laughs> Cora Arbor has been shot, murdered. Will the police be able to find her assassin? Eh? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> hear a key turn in the door. The door unlocks. Swings open. And closes. Then the light switch is clicked on. Hubert Armour stands in the hallway of his home. He steps over to the mirror hanging on the wall. He looks himself over carefully. Brushes his hair with his hand. Now he looks at the stairs leading up to Cora's room. He pauses for a few seconds. Then he walks into the living room, turns on the lamp beside his chair, sits down. From his pocket, takes the early morning edition of the paper. He scans it, hmm. dropping the paper all around his chair. Now he rises, turns off the lamp, walks into the hall. He calls Cora's knee. Cora! Cora, are you awake? Naturally, there's no answer. For Cora lies murdered in her bedroom. A large red stain soaking the carpet on the floor. The blood is dripping slowly. Slowly, a crimson pool is collecting there. Hubert calls again. Cora! Cora, I'm home. And now he looks about him into the darkened room leading off from the hallway. Now there's a startled look of apprehension, fear on his face as he begins to mount the stairs. Hmm. Cora, are you away? Hubert pauses outside the door, just as the murderer did only a little time before. He listens. And now his hand reaches out for the doorknob. Cora! Cora! She's dead. Blood! She's dead! Dead! Operator, get me police headquarters, please. Hello, police headquarters. This is Hubert Armour. 97864 Crawford Street. Cup at once. Hurry, it's my wife. She'd been murdered. All right, Arma. Suppose you tell your story over again, just as you told it before. And you left the house when? At 7.30, officer. And where did you go then? I went directly to the office where I was to meet Mrs. Davis. Was she there when you arrived? Oh, yes, sir. She was waiting in her car outside the office building. And this was uh, approximately at what time? Well, I think it must have been about 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. Mrs. Davis would be able to verify this? Oh, yes, of course, officer. Well, why are you grilling me so carefully? That isn't going to help us find out who killed my wife. Go on with your story. Well, I suggested to Mrs. Davis that we drop into the Greenbrier Club to discuss her insurance policy, and she agreed. Yes? Go on. So we left her car standing near the office, and she got into mine, and we drove to the Greenbrier Club. The doorman took care of your car? Oh, yes, sir, and he'll remember that. Well, you can check all of this that I'm telling you. We will. Go on. Well, there isn't any more to tell. We sat there and talked, had a bite to eat. What time did you leave the club? Well, a little after ten, I think. Then what did you do? Well, I took Mrs. Davis over to her car. Then? I drove straight home, put the car in the garage. What time did you get home, Mr. Armour? I didn't look at my watch, but it must have been a little after 11. But you didn't call us about the murder of your wife until 20 minutes after midnight. Why was that? I didn't know my wife was murdered, officer. I called out to her when I came home, but she seemed to be sleeping. She'd taken a sleeping pill before I left tonight, so naturally I thought she was still asleep. So what did you do then? I went into the living room with a paper, sat there and read a while. 
And all the while, until I, I went upstairs and discovered my wife's murder. I don't, I don't know what time it was I called you. We know. And we know other things, Hubert Armour. We know at what time your wife was murdered. She told us. But what do you mean, she told you? She told us just as much as if she were alive now. But I don't understand what you're driving at. No? And when your wife told us at what time she was murdered... She also told us who murdered her. Who? Who did it? You were very clever, Hubert Armour, from the very start, when you planned this crime. When you called us here to hunt for a burglar who was no one but yourself. That's a lie. You built this thing up slowly. Tonight you carefully accounted for your time up till 11 o'clock. The remainder of your alibi was weak. It might have been strong enough if Cora Armour had not left us a notebook on crime. Uh, uh, What? I asked her to keep a notebook. To tell me all the strange things that happened in this house. She did. She kept it faithfully. Midnight tonight, you, according to her own writing, were not home. She called out to you, but you didn't answer. But you were here. You came in. You crept to the door of her room. You lost your nerve. You came back at midnight. Shot her. Left the house to dispose of the gun. Returned. Sat down on your chair and looked at the paper. Then went upstairs to look in her room. And to report her murder. Yes, Armour, you had it all planned very carefully. But you didn't reckon with Cora Armour's notebook. There's someone outside my door. I know it. Someone just moved outside my door. I'm going to hide this notebook under the mattress like you told me to do. And then I shall scream out the window for help. You heard the scream, didn't you, Hubert Armour? You heard it? No, no, I didn't. You heard the scream, all right. She made it when you opened the door, when you lifted the gun to fire on her. She didn't scream. She just called out, don't, please. I admit it, I killed her. She was a stone around my neck, nagging, never well. I hated her. I wanted freedom. She wasn't well because she feared you, Hubert. She feared you all the while. It was fear that sent her down to a sanitarium. In her heart, Cora Armour feared death at your hands. And yet, without her notebook, you might have gone free of the crime of murdering her. Did a notebook kept by a woman right up until the second of her death bring a murderer to justice? A notebook which spoke as strongly as if Cora had returned from the spirit world to point her finger at the guilty one. Yes, turn on your lights. Turn them on. I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, and occurrences is purely accidental. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's Monday night and time for the pleasantest of all doctor's appointments. Our weekly visit with that splendid host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Ah, there you are, Mr. Beryl. Punctual to the minute, as usual. Draw up a chair and sit down. Thank you. Ah, that's it. All ready for tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, Dr. Watson? Yes, my boy. I was just going over my notes on the case before you arrived. It was an adventure that started off on a note of gaiety and ended in one of the most bizarre tragedies that we ever encountered. I call it Murder in the Locked Room. This I've got to hear. But first, men, the good old summertime is here again. And after a day spent at the ballpark, on the golf links or just loafing under the sun... Does your hair look as stiff as a straw, dry, matted, and tangled? 
then don't make the mistake of plastering your hair down with greasy, sticky goo. Instead, put Kremel hair tonic on the job. Kremel is that famous modern hair tonic, such a wonderful natural-looking hairdressing. Kremel has just enough light oils to keep dry, stringy hair neatly groomed throughout the hottest, most humid summer day. Yet Kremel never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy. It never leaves any unpleasant odor. Kremel always feels so clean on both hair and scalp. Kremel is able to give you all these advantages because it contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. So men, make Kremel a daily must this summer for that handsome, clean-cut look from morn till night. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the new Sherlock Holmes story, Murder in the Locked Room? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure took place many, many years ago. It began on a gray and murky afternoon in Baker Street. We just finished tea, I remember, and Holmes was busying himself with some chemical experiments. For some time, he sat there in silence with his long, thin back curved over a, a retort in which he was brewing a particularly malodorous product. As I glanced across at him, seated there under the gaslight, his head was sunk upon his breast, and he looked like a strange, lank bird with dull gray plumage and a black top knot. Suddenly, he turned to me and spoke. So, Watson, you've decided not to invest in South African securities? Huh? How nice to know that, Holmes. It isn't really difficult. I observe a groove between your left forefinger and thumb. It is enough to tell me that you do not intend to invest your small capital in the gold fields. I see no connection. And yet the train of thought is elementary. Hmm? One, you had chalk between your thumb and finger when you returned from your club. Two, you put chalk there when you played billiards. Three, you never played billiards except with Marston. Four, you told me about a month ago that Marston had an option on some South African property which would expire in four weeks and which he desired you to share with him. Five, your checkbook is locked in my drawer and you have not asked for the key. Number six is the logical conclusion. You've decided not to invest your money in this oh, manner. Absurdly simple. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> I wonder who that is. Were you expecting a client? No, Watson, but I hope it is one. My practice has been decidedly slack lately. Go and see who it is, will you? Yes, of course. It's all right, Mrs. Hudson. I'll show the gentleman in. Uh, this way, sir. Good, good evening. I'm, I'm Dr. Watson. How do you do? My name is Chudley Stoner. Oh, come along in, Mr. Stoner. Thank you. And this must be the great Sherlock Holmes. My name is Holmes. The adjective is your own, Mr. Stoner. Sit down, won't you? Thanks. I don't imagine you know anything about me, Mr. Holmes. Nothing beyond the fact that you went to Eton and Oxford, that you have a beautiful and socially prominent wife, and that you contribute to the Strand magazine with some regularity. <laughs> I'm disappointed in not receiving one of your famous deductive analyses, Mr. Holmes, but I'm glad that my name is familiar to you. You contribute to the Strand magazine, sir, too? Uh, that's the interest of you, Stella. Uh, perhaps you read some of my, uh, my uh, humble efforts. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, Doctor. Uh, Very colorful stories they are. Oh, thanks. Well, thank if you uh, don't mind my saying so, Mr. Oh, Stoner, your uh, own stories, which uh, also deal with the world of crime, seem to me to be even more sensational than Watson's. Probably because he has the facts to work with, whereas I have to depend on my gift of imagination. But the reason I've come to you tonight, Mr. Holmes, has nothing to do with imagination. I find myself mixed up in a real-life murder that is as puzzling as any problem I've dealt with in fiction. A murder, Mr. Stoner? I say, really, you oh, do The facts, please. Oh. Well, Mr. Holmes, I'll give them to you as briefly and concisely as possible. I just got back from Paris yesterday. My secretary went with me. He did not return. The French police say he committed suicide. I know that he didn't. Oh, how do you know that, Mr. Stoner? The boy had everything in the world to live for. No financial worries and a very promising future ahead of him. Hmm. Please describe the circumstances under which his body was found. Well, uh, I'd left him alone in his room. When I came to fetch him, there was no answer to my knock. I tried to look through the keyhole, but the key was in the lock from the inside, and I could see nothing. After some time it elapsed, I got worried. A friend of mine, an inspector of the police, was dining with me that night, and he suggested we should investigate. We broke down the door. My secretary was dead, a bullet in his heart. Inside a room, locked from the inside. Huh? Obviously, the police were right in thinking that it was suicide, Mr. Sonner. Of course, you examined the room thoroughly for traces of some other method of ingress? Meticulously. The windows were locked tight. No uh, sliding panels? None. Where was the revolver? 
Beside his right hand, one bullet gone. And you say the key was in the inside of the door? Yes, and that's why the police wrote it off as suicide. Mr. Holmes, how would you explain such a situation? I'd like a few more facts before giving an opinion. You say you examined the room meticulously. Was there no uh, oddity? Nothing out of place? Nothing uh, peculiar in that room? Nothing that I noticed. Perhaps uh, a small pellet of wax, say? Eh? Yes, by Jove. I did find a wax pellet. It was lying on the carpet near the door, and I couldn't imagine what he was doing there. Well, there's your answer. Uh, one more question. This French inspector who entered the room with you, what was his personal relationship with your secretary? Odd that you should ask that. They'd quarreled the night before about some girl at the Folie Bergère. Then there you have it, Mr. Stoner. The murderer left the room, locked the door from the outside, removed the key and plugged the keyhole with wax. When the room was broken into, he simply slipped the key into the inside of the lock, thereby dislodging the wax pellet. Obviously, from what you've told me, only the inspector had that opportunity. Great Scott, a French police inspector, a murderer? Holmes, what are you going to do about this? Nothing, old chap. What? Huh? Beyond uh, Nothing, chap? wishing Mr. Stoner good luck with the editor of the Strand magazine. I don't think I follow you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, come now, Mr. Stoner. It's an intellectual game and, uh, in its way, quite stimulating. But don't think you can hoodwink me so easily. Holmes, what are you talking about? My dear Watson, I read the papers carefully. And what do the papers have to do with this? I've noticed the presence of you and your lovely wife at so many social functions here in London in the past few days that I'm afraid I can't possibly accept your Paris story. The obvious answer remains, you've come to me with an imaginary problem in order to solve a difficulty in one of your stories. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, you're even smarter than I gave you credit for. But this is disgraceful, sir, wasting my friend's time like this. I suppose I should apologize, Mr. Holmes, but here's the way it happened. I came home late last night, a little uh, under the weather. I had the most wonderful idea on earth for a story. I was going to call it The Locked Room. I'm convinced I made some notes on the story last night, but when I wakened this morning, I couldn't find them. All I could remember was the problem, but I had no idea how to solve it, and so I came to you. I see it's an excellent idea for a story. Though I have known similar locked room problems, in fact, I don't recall that fiction has exploited their possibilities as Holmes, yet. Holmes, why are you so calm? I think it's outrageous to come here and pick your brains for a story. My dear Watson, how else do you get the material for your own masterpieces? Oh, it's not very funny. Should you grudge it to him? Hmm? Well, it's not the same thing at all. I must say, you're um... being very sporting about it, Mr. Holmes. Oh, no, Mr. Stoner. I'm being businesslike. May I ask how much you are in the habit of receiving for a story of yours in the Strand magazine? About 20 guineas. Why? I am a consulting detective, and I think I've given you a valuable opinion. My fee, if you sell your story, will be 10 guineas. Good night to you, Mr. Stoner. There you are, Monsieur Stoner. A remarkable deduction, André. Yes, here I am. I've spent all afternoon searching for those notes on the story. I could not find any trace of them. And yet I could swear I did some work when I came in last night. You are sure I didn't give you some dictation? Oh, quite sure, Monsieur Stoner. If you will pardon my saying so, you were a little... Yes, uh, yes, go on, André, say it. The secretary has some rights. I was drunk. That's what you mean, isn't it? Oh, I meant no offense. It'd be rather a relief if you did. You're always so infernally polite. Where's my wife? She's in the library with your brother-in-law, Monsieur Seal. Very well. I'll need you after dinner, André. I'm going to work on the story tonight. Yes, Monsieur Stoner. Hello, Chad. I was beginning to worry about you not being back for dinner. I stopped at the club. Good evening, Chad. Hello, Henry. And how is our master of the violin this evening? Chad, don't make fun of my brother like that. Yes, Chad, go easy. I can't learn the violin in two easy lessons, you know. Violet accompanied me on the piano just now. She says I'm improving. I don't doubt that you're improving. You couldn't become worse. Chad, you're intolerable. Henry's our guest. An unwanted guest as far as I'm concerned. He's been here two months. Why doesn't he try and get himself a job instead of mooning around here all day scraping away at his fiddle? That's the last time you've insulted me, Chad. I'm leaving here in the morning. I hope I can count on it. How dare you, Chad? How dare you? If Henry goes in the morning, I shall go with him. Now, Violet, take it easy. You've been drinking again, and you're disgusting when you drink. You made an absolute fool of yourself in front of Andre last night. You're very protective about him. Are you sure those calf eyes he keeps making at you are entirely unreciprocated? I hate you, Chad. I'm not waiting until the morning. I'm leaving tonight. Now, wait a minute, Violet. I'm sorry. I don't know what makes me do it. I get a few drinks and I just feel that I've got to hurt you. Well, you certainly succeed. 
I used to think it was the so-called artistic temperament that made you this way. Now I realize it's drink. I'm sorry, Violet, but it's not been too easy for me. Having Henry around all day gets pretty trying, particularly when I'm attempting to work. But he's planning to move soon anyway. Surely you can tolerate it a little longer for our sake, Chad, can't you? Of course I can, Violet. I'm sorry, dear. I'll try and be a little less boorish, and uh, I'll watch the drinking. That sounds more like the man I married. And I'll help, too. I'll try and keep Henry out of your way as much as possible, dear. We can make a go of it, Violet. I know we can. Well, I'm going into the study. I want to jot down some notes on the new story while they're still fresh in my mind. All right, dear. Dinner will be in about half an hour. I'll call you. Fine. The Locked Room. Yes, that'll be a good title. Hmm. It'll be worth giving Sherlock Holmes ten guineas for the help he gave me. Who is it? Is that you? <coughs> I'm flattered that you dropped by to see me, Inspector Lestrade. Not a business visit, I gather. Bless you, no, Mr. Dams. You'll have a whiskey and soda, won't you, Lestrade? Thank you kindly, Dr. Watson. Uh, not too much soda, if you don't mind. The uh, London criminal is becoming a dull dog these days, Lestrade. My own practice has been remarkably slow in the past few weeks. Uh, same thing with us at Scotland Yard, Mr. Holmes. But, of course, we don't grumble at that. Now, take me. I've had an easy day today. Just come from investigating a suicide in Church Street, Kensington. Indeed, another poor devil who couldn't stand the pace of our modern living, I suppose. I suppose so, Doctor. They would have thought this bloke had everything he wanted. He was quite a successful writer, they tell me. A writer? What was his name? He wrote for the Strand magazine. Name was Chudley Stoner. <laughs> Dr. Watson, you dropped that glass. You say Chudley Stoner committed suicide tonight? That's right, Mr. Holmes. You know him? Under what circumstances was he found? It was a routine case, sir. Locked the door on his study from the inside and then blew his brains out. The windows were locked and there were no secret panels and that kind of stuff. It was suicide, all right. Hmm, the arm of coincidence is long indeed, but not as long as that. Has the body been moved? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I told him to touch nothing until the police photographers got there. Just to be on the safe side, you understand, sir. Splendid. Grab your coat and hat, Watson. Right, your home. But what's all the excitement, Mr. Holmes? It's just a suicide. Nonsense, Inspector. I'll stake my whole reputation that Chudley Stoner has been the victim of a murder plot as cunning and diabolical as any that I've ever encountered. In just a moment, we'll find out if Sherlock Holmes is correct in deducing that this is murder. Are you one of the many men who find it difficult to keep your hair neatly groomed in summer? Does the burning sun bake and scorch your hair, making it look messy and not the least attractive? Then try Cremel Hair Tonic. Just notice the amazing change in the appearance of your hair. You see, Cremel does lots more than just keep your hair looking handsome. This highly specialized hair tonic gives you your money's worth. It contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Cremel is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if the sun dries your hair so that it breaks off and falls, Cremel helps condition the hair in that it leaves it feeling so much softer, more pliable when you comb it. At the same time, Cremel removes itchy, loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so cool, refreshed, and alive. Be smart, men. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kreml daily for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, this is really one for the book. A mystery writer comes to Sherlock Holmes with a fictitious murder plot. Holmes solves it for him, then the man goes away and gets murdered in exactly the way he described. Precisely, Mr. Bell. As provocative a problem as ever we encountered. I bet you hurried off to the dead man's house at once, didn't you? As fast as a handsome cab could take us there. As soon as we arrived, we cross-examined the three members of the household. The dead man's wife, Violet, her brother, Henry Seal, and Andre LaRue, the secretary. All of them told the same story. They, that they'd heard the shot and hastened to the room from different parts of the house. They said that they looked through the keyhole, found it was blocked, and then the two men broke down the door. 
Just the same story as in the dead man's fictional problem, wasn't it? What happened next, Dr. Watson? Well, before we talk to the three suspects any further, Holmes, Inspector Lestrade, and I walked into the dead man's study to examine the body. I can almost hear Holmes now, as he said. Hmm. It's not hard to find a motive. A beautiful wife, a worthless brother who'd been told to get out, an attractive and attentive young French secretary who hated the dead man's cruelty. Blimey. And I called it just a routine suicide. You'll notice that no wax pellet is in evidence this time. I'd say that the answer is obvious. The dead man did write some notes on his story last night. The killer found them and realized that he'd been presented with a perfect murder method, never expecting that the dead man would divulge his method to me. Mr. Holmes, why are you examining the keyhole of the door? I was looking for a pellet of wax, Inspector. It's missing. Obviously, the murderer had read about that in the dead man's notes and was clever enough to remove it. But uh, let's examine the corpse. Hmm. Interesting. Most interesting. Why, Holmes? Well, surely you can see for yourself, Watson. The bloodstains clearly indicate that the man fell here, some five or six feet from the desk. And yet, with a dying burst of energy, he crawled towards the desk and clutched it. Undoubtedly, he was trying to give us a dying message. But how can holding on to a desk give a message, Mr. Holmes? And why should a dying man try to do that anyway? Remember that the dead man was a writer and a student of, a student of criminology. In his last few moments of consciousness, he probably realized I'd be on the track of his murderer. He gave us more than one clue, Holmes. Look at his body. As he fell for the last time, he upset that bowl of violets. And his wife's name is Violet. Coincidence, I think, Watson. The flowers were knocked over inadvertently as he fell. But the move to the desk was a deliberate and desperate effort. Well, uh, if you talk about that, look here, gentlemen. Lying by his right arm. Look. That was knocked off the desk, too. It's a seal with a monogram on it. Right, Doctor. And Seal is the name of the dead man's brother-in-law. Henry Seal. Interesting, but I refuse to believe that a dying man could deliberately knock over such a comprehensive number of incriminating objects as he died. Then who do you suppose did do it, Holmes? At this stage of the case, I shall suppose nothing, Watson. We have uh, three obvious suspects waiting for us. Let's question them. They want us here. I know nothing Quiet, about it. Quiet, please. Mr. Elms wants to ask you some questions. I... No, Inspector. I only wish to ask them one question. You, Mrs. Stoner, how did you occupy your time while you were waiting for the police to arrive? I was so nervous that to try to calm myself, I did some knitting. I do quite a lot of knitting for the Coast Guard men, you know. I see. And you, Mr. Seal, what were your movements before the police arrived? I sat in the library, Mr. Holmes, playing solitaire. And you, André? I, I went to my room and worked on my account books. I realized that my job here was finished and I thought I would get my books in order. I see. That's all for now, thank you. Come along, Henry. Uh, Lestrade. Yes, Mr. Down. I'd like you to get me those three objects spoken of. The knitting, the cards, and the account books. Right you are, Mr. Down. I don't see that you found out much there, Holmes. Don't you, Watson? I'd have thought my line of reasoning was obvious. What are you doing? Kneeling at that keyhole. You said that this time the pellet of wax had been removed. True, Watson. But even though the pellet's been removed, I'm quite sure there'll be traces of wax inside the keyhole. And there are. Splendid. I shall remove this lock and take it back to Baker Street. The murderer undoubtedly still had some traces of wax on his fingers. A closer examination of the fragments of wax inside this keyhole and uh, an equally close examination of the knitting, of the cards, and the account books should be able to give us the solution to this case. Well, Holmes, you've been poring over the microscope for nearly an hour. Have you got the answer? Nearly, but not quite. But you've examined all three of the objects. Surely it's just a question of finding which one of them shows traces of wax. Oh, no, old chap. Huh? It's not as easy as that. Oddly enough, the knitting, the pack of cards, and the account books all show traces of wax. Great, Scott. But that means that 
All those people were involved in the murder. It was a concerted plan between the three of them. I think not, Watson. What? And in five more minutes, I'm sure I can prove to you who the murderer is. Are you sitting alone here in the library? Oh, hello, Andre. I'm so upset. They think that Chad was murdered. The inspector's still questioning Henry. I believe they think he did it. Oh, it's awful. Oh. oh now, don't worry, darling. Everything is going to be all right. Please, Andre. With Chad's body hardly cold. But surely, now that he is dead, uh, you always made me believe that if he were dead, we could be together, darling. I was insane. I thought he was neglecting me. That perhaps there was some other woman. But just before he died, we had a talk. I knew it was going to be all right again. But me? You mean you were making a fool of me? I was making a fool of myself, Andre. Please forget it. Forget it? No, my cold-blooded English woman. I am not some stupid boy you can play with. You cannot throw me aside. I have risked my life for your happiness. Risked your... Andre! You murdered Chad. Of course I did. I hated him. And I hated the way he made you unhappy. And the fool gave me the perfect way to do it by telling me about his filthy story. And then forgetting that he had done so. You devil, get away from me. I'm turning you over to the police. No, you are not. You are going to join Chad since you love him so much. Andre, put away that oh, revolver. <coughs> nice shooting, Watson. You got him in the wrist. Oh, sorry. Mrs. Turner, are you all right? Yes, but... Thank heaven you were both behind those curtains. I'm sorry that we had to wait until the last minute to disclose our presence. But it's just as well to have witnesses to a murder confession. What do you have to say for yourself, Monsieur Leroux? Nothing. Send for your policeman and have me taken to prison. With pleasure. Watson, ask Inspector Lestrade to step in here, will you? Tell him we have a customer for him. A customer for the gallows. <laughs> Midnight. It'll be good to get back to Baker Street. It's, it's been an exhausting evening's work. Yes, Watson. A sordid case. A shabby patchwork of discontent and hatred. Oh, well, we've been instrumental in sending yet another felon to his rightful destiny. You know, Holmes, there are still one or two points I don't quite understand. I can't believe it, Watson. What are they? Well, you said that all three objects you examined contained traces of wax. They did, and at well, first that confused me. But there are various qualities of wax. For instance, Mrs. Stoner was knitting with a certain waxed wool that is used specifically in knitting for seafaring men. It uh, gives the garments a weatherproof finish. Never heard of it. Possibly not, but it's a fact. And, uh, as you know, I specialize in such odd pieces of information. Uh, what about the traces of wax on the cards that Henry Seal used when he was playing solitaire? Again, I was misled. Until I remembered that Mrs. Stoner told us that her brother had been playing the violin a short while before her husband's death. Oh, he'd been using rosin. Precisely. Oh, yes. Logically, it uh, had to be the secretary. But the proof came when I made the final analysis of the three specimens of wax. Uh, that, uh, on the account books, was the only one that exactly matched the traces of wax I found in the keyhole. Oh, I suppose I'm very stupid, Holmes. Hmm. Uh, anything else bothering you? Yeah, just one point. You said that the dying man tried to indicate his murderer by clasping the desk as he died. Yes, I'm sure he was trying to give us a dying message. Well, I was fooled by the violets and the seal. Well, that was a freakish coincidence. But the effort in crawling to the desk was not. That was the true message. I still don't see it. Oh, come now, Watson. The secretary was a Frenchman. The French word for desk and for secretary is the same. Secretaire. Oh, I see it now. Oh, really, Watson? You know, Holmes, you'll never get your fee for this case. Indeed. And why? Stone is dead. He'll never sell that story to the Strand magazine now. True, Watson. But uh, I've no doubt that you will. Though perhaps it'll be a slightly different version of it. And you'll probably call it something very melodramatic. Um, perhaps uh, murder in the locked room. <laughs>
Ladies, when you want to look your radiant best, you naturally want your hair to appear just as beautiful and lustrous as it can be. So here's a tip from some of the world's most divinely beautiful girls, Powers Models. Girls who are famous for their enchantingly lovely silken sheen hair. We glamour bathe our hair with cremel shampoo. And I want to state right here and now that no other shampoo leaves the hair more sparkling clean. Really, girls, you'll be amazed how cremel shampoo reveals all your hair's natural gleaming luster. It leaves hair shimmering with brilliant highlights that last for days. Cremel shampoo is not a cream shampoo, not a soapless shampoo, not a harsh soap, not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. After a cremel shampoo, the hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights. And cremel shampoo never dries or breaks the hair. In fact, it even has a built-in oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. How right you are, Mr. Bell. Cremel shampoo leaves the hair so much softer, silkier, with a lovely satin smoothness. The hair holds the wave better, too. So, ladies, buy a bottle of cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to have naturally lustrous hair, a vision of shining beauty. K-R-E-M-L, cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, I'll never think next week. Next week, I, I think I shall tell you how Holmes and I returned to Baker Street one afternoon... Find our rooms occupied by a beautiful young woman on the verge of hysteria. Well, that sounds promising. And who was the beautiful young woman? No, 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 <laughs> Mr. Bell, Mr. Bell, I've told you more about this. You'll have to wait till next week to find that out. <laughs> I will say, however, that her story was horrifying enough to make our hair stand on end. I call this adventure Death. In the North Sea. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Dancing Men. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about Death in the North Sea. <laughs> Save for the future the easy, automatic way. Buy U.S. saving bonds through your payroll savings plan or at your bank. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. <laughs> The people who make the new road-rated 76 gasoline and the new Triton Motor Oil Union Oil Company presents The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. As the great clouds of fog roll in, the tall buildings of the San Francisco skyline gradually become giant bulwarks in the mist. Most businessmen are at dinner now in the world-famous restaurants of the city. But the light shining in a window of the Rust Building shows that private detective Michael Shane is an exception. As he struggles with the necktie he's going to wear this evening, he munches a sandwich brought to him by lovely Phyllis Knight. Hey, uh... Hey, Phil. Yes? Here, uh... Help me with this tie, Angel, will you? I can't do a thing with it. Why do I have to work for a detective? If you were anybody else in San Francisco, your tie would be tied, and we'd be at dinner at Jack's or Vanessa's or Lupo's or... Oh, let me at that tie. <laughs> now, Angel, you know very well I said I'd take you to dinner, but you want to make the first stack at the Geary, and... Uh, just a minute, honey, just a minute. Make the knot a little tighter, will you, please? Glad to. 
This, my uncultured employer, is the fashionable way to tie a tie. It's known as the Windsor Knot. Oh, yeah? Well, make mine smaller anyhow. Hmm? Oh. I'm not a member of your artist colony yet. All right, all right. How's that? Better? Oh, that's perfect, Angel. Like you. Oh. <laughs> Do you know how long it is since you said something nice like that? Hmm? Well, not to change the subject, but uh, that letter on your desk. Who's it from? Which one? Oh, the one written with the very fancy hand. Oh, oh, that. It's from some poet who wants my opinion of his work. I've never heard of him before. Uh-huh. So you're still the uncrowned queen of the artist, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, how is his poetry? Well, confidentially, it... No, oh, don't answer it, Mike, please. It might be important, Angel. Well, that's just it. We'll miss the play, Mike, and you promise I'm me. I'm sorry, oh. Angel. Hello. That's you, Mike? Oh, yeah, yeah. What's new, Inspector? Oh, no, the Inspector. What do you know about a guy named Van Allen Haven? Oh, nothing. Why? I'm out in a case. He's a murder suspect. I see. So you just naturally assumed that uh, I knew him. No, not quite. There's a note on his desk. It says Phyllis Knight, Russ Building, San Francisco. Oh? What did you say his name was? Van Allen Haven. Oh, that's quite a name. Just a minute. Say, honey... Did you ever hear of a guy called Van Allen Haven? Yeah, certainly. He's the poet that wrote that letter. Oh, that accounts for it. <laughs> Inspector, yeah. we don't know him, but he wrote to Phil for a criticism of his poems. Say, maybe we'd better drop over. Oh, my. You're sure you don't know more than you're telling me, Mike? Well, sure, I'm sure. We never met the guy, but he wrote to Phil. You know, she's got a rep in those poetry circles. Okay. Come on over. It's that apartment house at Leavenworth and Jewel. It's on Russian Hill. I'll be right there. Well, come on, Angel. Let's go see how the other half kill. Well, here we are, right on top of Russian Hill. Yeah, the view is almost as good as from your apartment, Mike. Mm -hmm. But different, Angel. Well, come on, come on. Let's see what the fuss is all about. Uh-oh. Three guesses which building it is. Yeah. Gee, looks like the whole police force is out. Mm -hmm. Hi there, Mike. Oh, hello, Sarge. Hi. Go right in. Oh, thanks, Sergeant. The inspector inside? Yes, sir. He's expecting you and Miss Knight. Hello, Sergeant. Okay, Doc, you can have the body removed anytime. I'm through with it now. Oh, there you are, kids. What kept you? Well, Mike had trouble with his necktie, Inspector. You know, as far as ties are concerned, he's still living in the Middle Ages. Oh, oh don't mind her. She's prejudiced. Well, come on, kids. we got a lot to do. Okay, Inspector, okay. Give us a quick rundown. Look over there at the foot of the stairs. The corpse you see all huddled up is what's left of Robert Freeman. Know him? Nope. I didn't think you would. Uh, what happened to him, Inspector? Coroner says he was shot in the back while coming down these stairs. He died instantly and fell to the bottom. Hmm. Any suspects? It's an apartment house, Mike. Theoretically, everybody in the building is a suspect. We've sent them all back to their own apartments, and we'll question them there. How about the gun? So far, we haven't found a thing. Well, anyone here report the incident? Yeah. Yeah, one of the tenants, a Miss Rambo, phoned us. I got right over. Well, what's your opinion, Inspector? Well, Phil... From the angle at which the bullet entered the body, the killer must have been standing at the head of the stairs. I assume he or she then stepped back into an apartment after firing. Mm, probably into a front apartment. Now, uh, look at the top of the staircase now. You see those two doors? Uh-huh. Yeah. The occupants of both those apartments would have had a better chance to get out of sight after the killing. I see. Who lives in them, Inspector? Well, Phil, here's the list. The one on the right is listed to the deceased and his wife. The left one, let's see... Joseph Bauer, pianist. May I see that list, Inspector? Yeah, here, Mike. Where did the gal live who uh, reported the killing, Mike? It shows Elaine Rambo on the first floor. Mm -hmm. That's right. Jones, Schmidt, Haven. Oh, here's Van Allen Haven. Hmm. Lives on the main floor, too. Yeah, right across from the base of the stairs where we found the body. And it was in his apartment that you found the note with my name on it. Yeah, and he's really a poet, all right. Never stops reciting his stuff. Really? Is he any good? <laughs> you can't prove it by me, Phil. Oh. So. Well, come on. Let's have a look at these apartments upstairs. Inspector. Okay. Come on, fellas. Let's, uh, let's try the two at the head of the stairs first. Yeah, that's what I had in mind, Mike. 
Not much of an apartment house, is it? Yeah. What do you mean, Angel? Well, look at these dirty stairs. Dust, sawdust, everything. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, where's the piano music coming from? Seems to be the one on the left. Yeah, yeah, that's listed to a pianist, isn't it? Yeah, Joseph Bauer. And here it is. Pretty good, isn't it? Yes, yes, and pretty excited, too. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, Phil? Well, I'm no expert, but even I can play Rachmaninoff's spread in C-sharp minor without missing that G-sharp note every time, you know. You must be a callous sort of guy. Anybody who played piano right after a murder. For I a guess he didn't hear us, Mike. Mike, look at the crack under the door. There's no light. Well, he must have cat's eyes to play in the dark. Then well, he's apparently going to ignore us. Let's try the door, Mike. Behind, it's pitch black. Can't seem to find the light switch. You won't find it over there. Who are you? Do not reach for your gun. I've taken the precaution of having my own cover the three of you. You can't get away with this. I appear to be at present, do I not? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Bauer, Joseph Bauer. And you are... Inspector of Homicide. Your credentials, please? Look, you. Aren't you a little silly playing games in the dark? You couldn't see my badge if I showed it to you. Try it and see, Inspector. Here, here it is, our eyes. Yes, I can see it plainly. Thank you. I'll turn on the lights. All right, let me have that gun. I have no gun, my friend. But I must take every precaution, especially when I hold such information as I do about the Freeman murder. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventure. The body of Robert Freeman was discovered at the foot of a staircase in his apartment house. He was shot in the back, apparently from the second floor landing. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have started interviewing the tenants on the second floor. And we find them now with an eccentric pianist called Joseph Bauer. All right. Out with it, Bauer. What information do you have about the killing? I will tell you, but you must promise to protect me from any revenge on the part of the murderer. No harm will come to you. You can trust the inspector, Mr. Bauer. You understand that a man in my position has to be careful. There are many who are envious of my great talent. Yes, yes, Bauer, the information. When I saw Robert Freeman lying dead, I knew he had been killed by Mrs. Freeman. By Mrs. Freeman? Why? The deceased and his widow had been arguing. Is that all? Is this not a revelation to you? Oh, for How do you know, Bauer? I was practicing this afternoon, and I heard them talking. You know, I sometimes practice for many hours in one day. I... You uh, were saying? Oh, yes. Well, I was playing the piano, and I heard their voices, quietly at first, and then they became louder and more violent. Could you make out what they were saying? Not at first, but as they grew louder, I heard Mrs. Freeman say, If you don't stop, I'll kill you both. Kill you both? Do you know who she meant by both? I'm sorry, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Bauer, where were you when Freeman was killed? I was a block or so away. I'd gone out to buy some cigarettes. When I entered the building, I saw everyone gathered around the body. Anyone see you come in the building? There was quite a crowd when I arrived. I don't know if I was noticed or not. All right, Bauer. I want you to remain in your apartment. We may want to question you again later. Say, Phil, what are you doing? Huh? Oh, I'm just looking at Mr. Bauer's telephone pad. What, um... What do these represent, Mr. Bauer? Nothing. I often scribble when I'm on the telephone. Mm -hmm. hmm. Looks like the initials E.R. It is nothing of the kind. Uh, I'm what you call a, a doodler. Nothing more. Uh, okay, Inspector. You ready? Yeah, Mike. And now, if you do not object, I'll go on with my music. That's all right. Go right ahead. <laughs> Stop, my good friend. Play your music to the end. Ah, oh, Mr. Haven, I am delighted to see you. Uh, permit me to introduce one of the foremost poets in the country, Mr. Van Allen Haven, Inspector of Homicide, and I assume his assistant... Miss Knight and Mr. Shane. How do you do? Hello. Have I the honor of addressing Miss Phyllis Knight, who has assisted so many an artist in his plight? Oh, that's charming. I did receive a letter from you, Mr. Haven. What a happy happenstance meeting you this way. 
You read my poem? Uh, not yet, Mr. Haven. I'm sorry. Mr. Haven, you live on the first floor? Yes. Right over there, you will find my lair. The first apartment across the stair? Oh, quite, Inspector, quite. Where were you when the murder occurred? Composing verse in my abode. I always say, for every man some troubles lurk, unless he's busy in his work. Did you hear the shot? Ah, yes, I did. The fatal shot. You went into the hall at once? Sir, I write poetry. I do not have the heart of lions like my heroes. I but opened the door barely ajar and peeked out. When the crowd gathered, I walked boldly forward. Yes, uh, Mr. Haven, you knew the deceased? No. Some months ago, however, I permitted him to read some of my poetry. He didn't like it. <laughs> I see. I wonder if you'd let us use your apartment as a sort of headquarters while we're here. We have to conduct a little investigation, and your apartment would be handy, you see. My good inspector, say no more. My place is yours, however poor. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, here's the key. And since Mr. Bower's music brought me to this room, I think I'll stay for a while, if you will play. Certainly, Mr. Haven. Thank you, Mr. Bower. <laughs> Inspector, what do you think of our two geniuses? <laughs> if you ask me, they're crazy as loons. That Haven character. You know, I've never heard such poetry in my life. Well, I think we'd better see Mrs. Freeman now and get her story. Say, Inspector, why don't you have this Miss Rambo here at the same time? Not while we're questioning Mrs. Freeman, Mike. Well, I have a reason. Look, Inspector, since the deceased was shot in the back as he was going downstairs, the murderer must have been standing behind him on the stairs or at the head of the staircase. Well? I see. With Mrs. Freeman at the top and Miss Rambo at the bottom, one of them must have seen the murderer. Right. Unless one of them is lying. Well, that's why I think it would be interesting to have them both here to check each other's stories. All right, Mike. We'll try it. Oh, Sergeant. Yes, Inspector? Bring down Mrs. Freeman and Miss Rambo. Right. Hey, what are you two up to over there? Say, did you see these? What are they? Well, they're... they're miniatures, Inspector. Huh? Look at them, handmade carvings of all sorts of things. Mm, no end to Van Allen Haven's talents, huh? Mm -mm. What do you make them out of? Well, some of it's balsa. Some is heavier. Looks like uh, teak. Yeah. Here's one of Fisherman's Wharf, complete with boats, sidewalk vendors, and everything. And look at these tools. Everything from a brace and bit Say, to... wait a minute, Inspector. Huh? You notice anything unusual about this? No, except they're small tools, neatly arranged. Yeah, all but the brace and bit. That's just what I mean. Each tool is in its place in that wall bracket, except this one brazen bit. Yes, Haven is too neat and precise to leave a tool like that lying carelessly about. You know, it could fall and break the bit. Unless he'd used it and was in a rush. Oh, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Not necessarily, no, but I just... Come in. Miss Rambo and Mrs. Freeman, inspectors. All right, Sergeant. Please sit down, ladies. This is Mr. Shane and Miss Knight. Mrs. Freeman, Miss Rambo, how do you do? Hi. How do you do? Now, Mrs. Freeman, we'll start with you. Will you please tell us just what happened? Well, I'll, I'll try. It's been a terrible shock. I understand. Well, Bob came home late, as usual. I was reading in bed. He sat on the bed, and we talked for a while. Then the doorbell rang, and Bob went down to answer it. Mrs. Freeman, you mean your husband left the apartment? Yes. At this time of night, the door downstairs is locked, and you have to go right down to admit anyone. I see. And uh, then? Then I heard the shot. I ran out to the head of the stairs and saw Bob lying at the bottom. He was all in a heap. And uh, then what happened? Then the others started coming out of their apartments. Whom do you mean by the others, Mrs. Freeman? Just exactly who did you see first? What? Miss... Miss Rambo appeared at the bottom first, I believe. That's right. I saw you at the top right after the shot was fired. Then who came out? Well, I, I think Mr. Haven came out of his apartment next. How about the pianist, Mr. Bauer? Did you see him? Yes. Yes, he was there too, I believe. Did he enter the building? Well, he may have. I didn't notice. Now, look, Mrs. Freeman. This is important. You saw all these people on the first floor? Yes. None of them came from the second floor and passed you? No. It was several minutes later before anyone came out of their apartments upstairs. Now, Miss Rambo, 
I believe you were the one who called the police. Yeah, I see nobody else was going to do nothing, so I took over. I just dialed O and said, give me the cops. When did you do this? As soon as you heard the shot? No, when I heard the shot, I hot footed out of my joint as fast as I could. Then I seen Freeman lying there and Mrs. Freeman standing upstairs. Did you see anyone else? Anyone at all? No. You sure? Sure, I'm sure. Well, the next guy to show was Haven, who come running out of his, his apartment and... And then? Well, then a lot of people started showing up from all the apartments. Did you see anyone upstairs except Mrs. Freeman? No, not at first. Was there anyone else on the staircase or in sight at all when you first ran out? No. Mrs. Freeman, we have testimony that you and your husband had been arguing. The fact that you threatened to kill him. Is that true? Well, I, I may have said something like that, Inspector. But I didn't mean it. I loved Bob. Then will you tell us why you were arguing? Bob had, had been staying away from home often. Uh-huh. He said he was working, but I knew it wasn't true. Do you know whom he was seeing, Mrs. Freeman? Yes. It'll be better if you tell us. No, I can't. I can't. She's um, a showgirl, Mrs. Freeman, isn't she? But I, I... She lives in this building. As a matter of fact, she's in this room right now. It's Elaine Rambo, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Kids, it's just too simple. What do you mean, Inspector? Well, if the bullet was fired from upstairs and all the suspects except Mrs. Freeman were downstairs, it leaves only her, doesn't it? Yeah. And her husband being in love with Elaine Rambo supplies the motive. But you don't believe she did it, Inspector, do you? No, Mike. I don't think she did. Neither do I. Oh, now, wait a minute, you two. You know, we aren't getting any place. If everybody but Mrs. Freeman is in the clear and you don't believe she did it... Well, we're up against a stone wall. That's yeah, what it looks like. Oh, maybe not. Now, look. Here are two women. One at the head of the staircase and one at the bottom. Between them, a man is shot as he comes down the stairs. Now, if Mrs. Freeman had done it, Miss Rambo would have seen the gun. And Rambo couldn't have done it or the bullet would have entered the body from the front. So? So the bullet must have been fired from some other point. Mike, you're right. Come on, kids. This calls for an examination of the staircase. We'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures in a few moments. Robert Freeman has been murdered on the interior stairway of his apartment house. As we rejoin Mike, Phil, and the inspector... They're examining the staircase with Mike and Phil on one end and the inspector on the other. You uh, find anything up at your end, inspector? Not yet, Mike. You? Uh, no. You two certainly look cute bending over and tapping those stairs. Well, you look kind of cute yourself, Angel. Mike, Phil, I'll come up here. What? What'd you find? What is it? Would you find anything? Look. Look at this step. Huh? Right there. Two holes. Both plugged up. Yeah. Here, wait a minute. I've got long fingernails. Let me try to get them out. Go ahead, Phyllis. Yeah. Uh-uh. uh-uh. It's, it's no use. They're in too solid. Well, here. Let me try to push them in. Here's my penknife. Use it, Mike. Okay. There. Well, I guess we know where they landed. In the closet under the staircase. Come on. Here. That's, uh, that's where all the sawdust you noticed came from, Phil. Yeah? Be careful. Be careful. Here, I'll open it. There are the plugs. And two shafts of light made by those two holes. Yeah. They were bored in the riser of the step. About halfway between the two floors. Yeah, but why two holes? One to see through and one to shoot through when the victim was in range. So the murderer rang Freeman's doorbell from downstairs, as Mrs. Freeman said. Then waited in the closet for him to come down. When he got about halfway down the stairs, he was in range of this hole, and he got it in the back. Then the killer plugged the holes and waited for a crowd to gather. When he did, he slipped quietly out of the closet. And joined the crowd. Well, that's the way it happened, all right. Okay, Mike. Now we know how it was done, but we're not sure who did it. No. No, and our pictures changed completely, too. 
before, we thought that everyone on the main floor was innocent, and, and now... Now, now, they're the ones who could have done it, and Mrs. Freeman is the only one who couldn't possibly have done it. Right. All right. Now, who have we got? Joseph Bauer, Van Allen Haven, and Elaine Rambo. No, no, I think we can eliminate Elaine Rambo, Inspector. If she and Freeman were seeing each other, she'd have no reason to kill him. Besides, I... I can't see any woman boring holes in the staircase to kill a man. No, but you could see a man doing it, couldn't you? Yeah, a man handy with tools. And that would account for his leaving the brace and bit around. Yes, but you'd never get a conviction on that little evidence. No, you're right, Mike. It's not enough. We're stymied. Sounds like Mr. Bauer is stymied, too. And by Mr. Rachmaninoff. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean, Angel? Well, he can't be deliberately trying to miss that G-sharp note. No, it doesn't make sense. He plays too well. Huh? Say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Look, Inspector. What? Let's try this, huh? We'll switch off all the lights. Have Mrs. Freeman stand where she did at the top of the stairs. Have Elaine Rambeau stand at the bottom. Have Bauer at his piano. And have Haven bring his brace and bit. I've got a hunch we'll get ourselves a nice little confession. <laughs> That's beautiful, Mr. Bowers. Beautiful. But uh, right now, I would like to hear you play the C-sharp minor. C. Irachmaninoff? Mm hmm That's right. Oh, but I... Play I... it, Mr. Bauer, or Miss Knight will. Very well. play the piano in the dark, don't you, Mr. Bauer? Like you were when we first interrupted you. I need no light to see music. That's right. But you do need light to see sawdust. Switch on the lights, Inspector. You see, Mr. Bauer? After killing Freeman and leaving the crowd that gathered around his body, you returned here and began playing in the dark. But, but you didn't notice the sawdust fall from your sleeve into the keyboard. Most of it right under this G sharp, which doesn't play, as uh, Phil pointed out. That's not true. When Phyllis found the scribbling on your phone pad, your hand had been tipped already, Mr. Bauer. This just clinches it. It's not true, I tell you. It's not true. Bauer, you're a dead duck. Would you like to go down to headquarters and have the sawdust under your fingernails analyzed? We both know they'd match the sawdust on Haven's brace and bit over there. Why don't you give up? All right. All right, I did it. I did it. Well, Inspector... I guess there won't be any problem about satisfying the D.A., will there? Michael. Hmm? You think we could still catch the last act of the Geary? Oh, could be. But it would take a couple of detectives to figure out what we've missed. What's the matter with us? <laughs> Seriously, Mike, there are just two things I can't figure out. First, hmm? why didn't Bauer fix that key on the piano? Well, he didn't have time, Angel. You get sawdust underneath a key, and you've got to practically tear the keyboard apart to get at it. Well, that's right. Secondly, why did Bauer kill Freeman? Well, Angel, <clears throat> Bauer was in love with Elaine Rambeau. Mm -hmm. He knew she was seeing Freeman, so in his uh, distorted imagination, he figured that getting rid of Freeman would give him a better chance. Oh, so when I found the initials E.R. on his telephone pad, you realized that they stood for Elaine Rambo. Yep. You see, darling, he just couldn't get her off his mind. Uh -huh. Just like you can't get me off your mind. Huh? <laughs> yes, Angel. Just like... For a solid hour of 
exciting mystery dramas. Listen every Monday on these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by the case book of Gregory Hood. Michael Shane, private detective, stars Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis with Joe Forte as the inspector. The sergeant was played by Charlie Lund. Tonight's story was written by Robert Webster Light and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. And this is Ben Alexander saying good night for the people who make the new road-rated 76 gasoline and the new Triton Motor Oil Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Out, dead tired. But I kept on walking through the mist. And suddenly I started hearing footsteps behind me. I turned around, and then I saw him. He was walking along slow, dragging his feet, walking as if he couldn't see. His face was all covered with blood. But I know who it was. It was Miller, the guy I killed. Midnight, the witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fear is the strongest, and our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute, then. The dead come back. Midnight, Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by William Morewood will threaten your sanity. Its title, The Dead Come Back. About one o'clock in the morning, on a dark, deserted street, standing in the doorway of a gloomy brownstone house, a man with a wild expression on his face rings the bell desperately. There is no answer. And he rings again. Then... Hey, Doc Padgett. Why, yes. The brain doc knows what goes on inside a guy's head. Well, yes, I'm a psychiatrist. I've got to talk to you. It's very late. If you come back tomorrow during office hours... Now, Doc. Something's been happening to me. Something that's driving me nuts. I'm that... sorry, but... Get inside. Well, be careful with that. He won't go off until I pull a trigger. <laughs> Sit down, Doc. Very well. well. Just to make sure we understand each other, I put this gun here on the desk and my watch. We got just half an hour to get everything cleared up. And then? And then I got a guy to kill. Suppose we start at the beginning. Your name? Lefty O'Connor. O'Connor? So you heard of me, huh? I'm not sure, but the Tilson murder case. That's right. But as I remember That's it... That's right. He decided I was nuts, put me away. But get this straight, Doc. Yes? I was never out of my head, and I ain't now. I see. Insanity was something that I cooked up to keep from burning. I played it up all right. Good enough to make monkeys out of the doctors and the jury. But when I got to the nut house, it was different. I didn't have to pretend no more. You know, Doc, some of them wax act just as sane as you and me. Yeah. I was getting along fine. Till two nights ago. And I was called in to see the superintendent. He was a white-haired old guy. Name of Miller. Ah, oh, sit down, Lefty. Cigarette? Thanks, Mr. Miller. Here you are. What's that? This? Just a music box. It plays when you open the lid. That ain't just a... What are you trying to do to me? Oh, what do you mean, Lefty? I just offered you a... That's the box they kept talking about at the trial. The one old Mrs. Tilson kept her jewels in. I'm afraid you're mistaken, Lefty. In a pig's eye. I know what you're trying to do. But I don't remember nothing. Nothing, you hear? Then why does this tune seem to disturb you, sir? Never mind why. Turn it off. Yes, of course. Take it easy, Lefty. I called you in here because I want to help you. You're trying to trick me into admitting I knew what I was doing when I hit old lady. 
Nothing of the kind. Next, you'll be asking me where I hid the jewels. Don't you think I know that routine? There's no routine here, Lefty. You're a liar, Mr. Miller. You got me in here to give me the third degree to try to break me down all over again. Well, you won't do it. Not again. I've had enough. Lefty, I'll put down that paperweight. Uh, so I... <laughs> I didn't have no idea of escaping when I hit him, Doc. I was just scared. I was scared of what would happen if he kept after me. When I found a gun in his desk drawer, I began making plans fast. I brought him around. I told him exactly what he had to do. We went out, got into his car, started for the gate. Okay, Miller, it's up to you now. I understand. Now remember, I'll be lying back here with this gun against your spine. Evening, Mr. Miller. Uh, hello, George. Going out kind of late, aren't you, sir? Uh, yes. Something unexpected came up. Uh, you wouldn't be smuggling out anyone under that rug and back, sir, huh? I might. <laughs> <laughs> yep, looks suspicious. Just the right shape for a man. But I'll take a chance on you, sir. Okay, Charlie. Open up for the super. Good night, Mr. Miller. Turn the left fork here. Ah, the Ganville Road. I was afraid of this, Lefty. The Tilson Estate's up this way, isn't it? You're too smart for your own good, Mr. Miller. You can turn off here. But there's no road. In under the trees. All right. What happens now? Do we walk the rest of the way? One of us does. Get out. You're no use to me anymore. Let you know. Put that gun away. You can't. You fool. You won't get rid of me this way. You are. I left him there beside his car and started walking. I don't know how long I was at it. Maybe an hour when I hit the outskirts of town. The light was kind of funny. It was different from anything I'd ever seen. It was kind of yellow. Kind of yellow mixed with a mist that was curling up. Maybe I was tired, I don't know. But suddenly I began to hear footsteps behind me. I looked around, and then I saw him. He was walking on the other side of the road, blind. As if he couldn't see where he was going. And his feet were kind of dragging along. His face was covered with blood. Through the blood, I could see that it was him. Miller. I don't know what happened then, Doc. I must have passed out. Because the next thing I knew, somebody... People, faces bending over me. He's coming too, Tom. Yeah. How are you feeling, chum? Hey... He's as, as white as if he'd seen a ghost. Who, who are you? I'm Ruth Mason. This is my brother, Tom. We live right by. We heard you yell and came running out. Uh, did, did, did you see anyone else? I know. No road? No. You were lying <laughs> right in the middle of the road till we pulled you off. What happened? Did the car hit you? Yeah, I don't remember. Well, take his arm. Help him up, Tom. Okay, sure. Here we go, Mo. The name is uh, Sims. Johnny Sims. Uh, I'm all right. <laughs> you look kind of bushed to me. I, 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 I've been walking all night. Out of a job, so you and broke. Well, our house is right over there. You come on in and we'll... Oh, fix thanks. It. I got to keep moving. What's the rush if you're just looking for a job? Well, I... Uh, hey. Cops coming this way. Probably looking for that man that escaped from the state hospital. That's right. They said that. But, Johnny, what's the matter? You look as if you're going to faint again. I guess I must be worse than I thought. Look, does that invite still hold? Well, of course. Right this way. Something more, Johnny? No, thanks, Ruth. Couldn't manage another thing. Pull up. Oh, well, then you lie right down on that sofa. 
That is, if Tom will get off with his paper. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. I was just reading some more about that guy, Lefty O'Connor, that broke out of the asylum. Seems he forced the superintendent to drive him out in a car. Please, Tom. Let's not talk about it. Gives me the creeps to think of anyone like that being loose. Maybe he ain't so bad. He's a murderer, Johnny. A homicidal maniac. How do you know? Maybe the super deserved killing. The super? Yeah. But the paper doesn't say anything about the super being killed. Well, Ruth said... I meant the old lady, Mrs. Tilson. Oh. Yeah, I, I guess I must have heard. Uh, maybe I just thought... I'll try the radio. Maybe there's some late news on it. Well, you're probably right, Johnny. The super wouldn't stand a chance. Sure. The way I figured... What's the matter, Johnny? Turn that off. What? I said turn it off! Why? Johnny. Hey, what gives? Well, I'm sorry. I... I don't like radios. Well, it's all right, Johnny. We understand. Now, suppose we show you to your room and you take a good long sleep. I must have slept like a dead man, Doc. It was dark when I woke up. There was nobody in the house. I switched on the lamp and looked at my watch a few minutes before midnight. I didn't have much time if I wanted to get the jewels and blow town before morning. So I started for the door, but before I reached it, it opened. And standing there, smiling, kind of sad-like, was Miller. Hello, Lefty. Did you get the jewels? You! It can't be you. You're, you're dead. I told you you wouldn't get rid of me so easily. What do you want with me? Nothing, Lefty. Just what I wanted before, to help you. You're lying. You still think you can break me, get me to confess, but I'll show you. I must have hit the lights, Doc, or maybe they were never on, because suddenly the room was all dark. I struck a match. I bent down to look at Miller, make sure that he was really dead this time. And... I ain't crazy, Doc. You gotta believe me. But the man lying face up on the floor was Tom Mason. A dead man who came back. And now, a second victim, as the hands of the clock move inexorably to the witching hour. And yet another. Murder at midnight. <laughs> Back to Murder at Midnight. To Lefty O'Connor, sitting in a psychiatrist's office with a gun in front of him, trying to convince the doctor and himself that he is sane. My hand was shaking so much that the match went out. It was Tom, all right. Tom Mason, dead. But it was better that way than what I'd thought, because it meant that Miller hadn't come back from the grave. I'd probably just imagined I heard him talking to me. I frisked Mason, I got the keys to his car, and went out. It was a little coupe parked in the driveway. I opened the door. I was just getting in when... Hello, Johnny. Huh? Ruth. <laughs> you look a little better than you did before. How do you feel? Oh, I, uh, fine, fine. Oh, that's good. You were sleeping so soundly when I left it. Are you going somewhere? Well, yeah, yeah. There was something I had to do, and, uh, Tom told me I could borrow his car. Oh, all right. I'll go inside. No, and... you can't go in there. Well, what do you mean? Why not? Well, I mean, uh, such a swell night. Uh, how about a little drive, Ruth? <laughs> but what about your errand? Well, that'll just take a minute. It'll be swell having you along. Well, I don't know. I I don't suppose Tom will mind. But... I'm sure he won't. <laughs> well, then, all right. <laughs> <sighs> I guess that's one of the wonderful things about life. You just never know when something completely unexpected will happen. <laughs> that's right, baby. You just never know. Why so quiet, Johnny? Huh? <laughs> you asked me to come driving with you, and I do. You don't say a thing to me. What should I be saying? Well, you might start by telling me something about yourself. 
Like I said, I'm just a guy looking for work. What kind of a job did you have before? Chauffeur. Well, that sounds interesting. Did you work around here? Why? I just wondered. You seem to know the road so well. Listen, baby, let's not talk about me. I'd rather hear about you. Well, there's not much to tell. I'm 21, fancy free, and I work for a living. I'm a nurse in a psychiatrist's office. A what? Psychiatrist. A doctor who, well, helps people who are disturbed mentally. Like people who uh, see things that ain't there? Oh, yes. He gets a lot of those kind of cases. What does he do? Mm, talks to the patients, explains away the hallucination. His name is Dr. Paget, and he's really wonderful. Johnny? Yeah? Where are we going? Why, baby? We've turned off the main road. This leads past the old Tilson mansion. What's that? The house where that terrible murder took place about a year ago. It's all boarded up now, of course. Yeah, yeah, that's the job Lefty O'Connor pulled, yes. huh? Yeah, he was old Mrs. Tilson's chauffeur. What? Chauffeur. Quite a coincidence, ain't it? Johnny, you're turning in the driveway. Yeah. See, a couple of nights ago, I broke into this place to sleep. It was just an empty house to me. I didn't know anything about no murder. I left the parcel behind. I want to make it up. Oh, oh I, I see. You think I had any other reason for coming here? No, Johnny. Sit tight, baby. I'll be back in a minute. All right. All right, Johnny. I... Well, why are you taking the keys? Just to make sure the car stays here and you with it. But of course I'll stay. You better, baby. Or it'll be just too bad. Loose from one of the windows. Climbed into the old house. It was black as pitch inside. That musty, shut in smell. Felt my way along the wall of the stairs. Climbed to the second floor. The old lady's room was at the head of the stairs. It wasn't so dark in there. The windows hadn't been boarded and the moonlight was coming in. And I saw that marble fireplace with a gargoyle in the middle grinning at me. So I picked up the poker and smashed into it. And there, behind where I pushed it past a loose brick, was a paper bag containing the jewels. I looked inside to make sure that everything was safe. Moonlight sparkled on them shiners. And then, then Doc, suddenly, suddenly out of nowhere it started. That music started. <gasps> Stop it! Stop it! Johnny, where are you? What? Oh! Ruth! Ruth, get her to stop! Get her to stop! Oh, get her to stop! Mrs. Tilton, that tone! What tune? You mean you don't hear nothing? Well, no, Johnny. But you must. It's gone now. Johnny, you're shaking all over you. Johnny, what's that? What's what? Well, they're all over the floor. They look like diamonds, jewels. Didn't I tell you to stay in the car? What are you doing up here? I, I heard noises and you You were yelled. spying on me. No, I wasn't, Lefty. I... What did you call me? Nothing. I... So you guessed it, huh? Okay. I am Lefty O'Connor. And I came back for the jewels. But that information ain't traveling far. Mm-hmm. Not with you, anyway. What do you mean? I... No! <laughs> I was rattled, Doc. The music did it. That and everything else. I left the lion there and I picked up the jewels and beat it. It started to come fast. I just about hit the main highway when the wheels started acting funny. I stopped and got out to look. It was a flat. My luck had played out. If I took the time to change it, someone might come along. And just then I did hear a car coming. I froze, waiting for it to pass. Instead, it stopped and... Hi, Johnny. Tom. Tom, mate. I got out as soon as I could. Which is the flat? What? How did you know? How did I know why you just called me? You told me you couldn't find the tools. And... I called you? Why, yeah. Don't you remember? No, no, I don't. I couldn't have. I, 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 I... Of course, it's none of my business, Johnny, but... Look, you've been acting awful funny. 
I'm beginning to think maybe you ought to go see a doctor. Someone like Doc Patchett that Ruth works for. There's nothing wrong with me. Nothing. Okay. Okay. Get started with this, Jack. The rest of the tools are under the front seat. I'll get them. No, no, wait. What's this paper bag? Give me that! You're calling in for pebble collecting, huh? Pebbles? Yeah, look at them. Well, they are pebbles. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What's happening to me? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> but I told you, you don't look well. <laughs> hey, where are you going? Hey, wh- wait a minute. I told you that was a borrowed car. Get off that man, boy. Yeah. I said get off. You're nuts, Johnny. You're nuts. You're crazy. <laughs> Doc. Yeah, huh? It's his story. I kept hearing what he said. Tom. Over and over again. I'm nuts. I'm crazy. I couldn't stand it anymore. So I looked you up in the phone book and I come over. Oh, what do you expect me to do, Lefty? Do? You're a brain doc. I'm not nuts. I know I'm not. Why am I seeing these things? What's happening to me? Well, it's rather difficult to make a diagnosis this quickly, but uh, I'd say that you were suffering from hallucinations because of a sense of guilt. Guilt? About what? Well, it probably started with that first murder, Mrs. Tilson, and it's been weighing, preying on your mind ever since. Now, if you could extrovert that, get it out of your system. But I, I did. Uh, that's true, but not as a confession, with all the details. That's the only way you can achieve a complete catharsis. Well, that's crazy. All right. You wanted my advice, but you don't have to take it. And you think... Okay. Okay, I did kill her. I knew all the time what I was doing. I waited for a night when there was only the two of us in the house, and then I beat her brains out with a tire iron. There. There, I said it, I told you. Yes, Lefty. And I think that now I can promise you you'll never be troubled by hallucinations again. You sure, Doc? Quite sure. That's good. Because... Remember I said that in half an hour I was going to kill someone? Yes. Well, a half hour is up. And you're the man. Am I, Lefty? Yeah. I'm sorry, Doc, but you know too much now. You're the only one who does... So I wouldn't, Lefty. Why? Why are you sitting there like that? I shot you. Yes, Lefty, with blanks in your gun. All right, boy. Take it easy, Lefty. We got you covered. No. And Mason. Did you get it? Uh huh. Every word. The... You're cops. No kidding. Then the whole thing. Letting me escape and everything that happened afterwards was just a trick. That's right. You wanted to show I wasn't nuts, get me to confess. Smart boy. You made just one mistake, Lefty. Or rather, Ruth did. Following you into the Tilson mansion. She paid for that with her life. But now, now you're going to pay. No, no. Shut up. Yes, Lefty, for that and for the Tilson murder. And my only regret is that rats like you can only burn once. Faced men take hold of Lefty O'Connor, and Lefty knows that he has come to the end of the road. The road began when he first heard the clock in the old Tilson mansion strike twelve for murder at midnight. Remember to be
be with us again when death's face peers out of the darkened windows of deserted houses and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. <laughs> The part of Lefty O'Connor was played by Joseph Julian. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris and known to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime now comes transcribed to radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as... The Saint. Just step a little closer, if you will, my friend. You might be the start of a mighty and surging throne. You mean me? You and none other. Slumming the night, friend? Oh, I just happen to like carnivals. The gentleman says he likes carnivals, eh? And now let us all step up a little closer here while we talk about the greatest attraction on the mighty Midway. A test of strength, courage, and endurance attracting attention all over the civilized world and further, Texas. <laughs> it's a joke, friend. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. sorry. Indeed. Well, I am talking about that little lady inside the tent here that all your friends have told you positively not to miss. The courageous girl who lies buried alive 20 feet below the surface of the earth. Are you going in, friend, or am I wasting my time? I'm still on the fence. Hmm. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Huh? Well, you have heard her name, you have read about her in the papers, and now you are going to see Mona the Buried Alive Girl, who has lain in her grave on these premises for 222 hours, 36 minutes, and 21 seconds, and is now attempting to break the world record of 244 hours. Ooh, how strenuous. Inside the tent, you will see her... Talk to her. Ask her any questions that happen to be on your mind. Tell me more. My friend, I don't request that you buy a ticket for this great attraction. I just ask that you put this question to yourself. Yes? Would I have the courage to change places with Mona, the buried alive girl? No. I thank you for your kind attention, and the box office is now open. Oh. Uh, one, please. One, he says. Oh, the... Hmm. Some days it don't pay to get buried alive. Hey, yeah, uh, son, the entrance is right in front of you. My change? You ch oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the change. That's right. It's a <laughs> mere oversight, sir, I assure you. <laughs> hey, you are right straight ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hmm. 
to communicate with Mona, talk down too. Well, all right, I talk. Mona! Frankie, you gotta get me out of here. I'm going crazy down here. I'm scared. Mona, this is. I've isn't... been thinking, Frankie. I've been thinking all day what Angie said just before she. I don't want to end up like Angie, Frank. I don't. And I will if you don't get me out of here. I know I will. I don't want to die, Frankie. Get me up. Mona, this isn't Frankie. This is Simon Templer. Can I help you? Oh, you're not. You're not Frankie? No, but I'll help you if you'll tell me what you're afraid of. Mona. I am in very good health and am enjoying no physical discomfort whatsoever. I am looking forward eagerly toward breaking the world's record for being buried alive. 244 hours. Pictures of me are available at the box office at nominal cost. Mona, what are you afraid of? I am in very good health and am enjoying no physical discomfort whatsoever. I am looking forward eagerly to... I know, I know, I heard. Hey. What are you doing here? Who are you? I'm Simon Templer, a customer. Who are you? Customer? Oh, I, excuse me. I, I thought... Uh, excuse me. Oh, say, aren't you the strong man? I saw your act a few minutes ago. Segundo, huh? That's pretty good. Uh, yeah, pretty good. Uh, Tell me, Segundo, what about Mona? Who was Angie? Angie? Excuse me, I gotta go. Excuse hey, me. Hey, wait a minute. Excuse me. I think you got two for the price of one, eh, friend? Mona and the strong man Segundo. I caught his act before. Quite a large hunk of muscle. I wouldn't like him to step down on my foot. Yeah, the guy is built like a Hudson. <laughs> <laughs> Only trouble is uh, his motor don't run so good. Oh, a few <laughs> chips light in the head. Huh? A whole stack. <laughs> well, did you enjoy your chat with Mona? Tell me, who was Angie? Angie, oh, yeah, that... Angie, that's a real sweetheart. That was Mona's sister. Angie used to do the buried alive act before she died. Oh, a real down. Was it an accident? Accident? No, no. It was a weak heart. That Angie, oh, she was all heart. Oh, we miss her. How'd you know about her? Tell me about Mona. Why? I might like to help her, that's all. Hey, look, my friend, nobody in this county needs no help from you. We take care of each other. We always have and we always will. Nobody on the outside cares nothing about us, and we don't care nothing about them. Now, beat it. Who's the owner of this carnival? B. St. Clair, and a trail is right down the midway, and she'll tell you the same thing I did. I'm hard to discourage. Friend, there's nobody here needs no help. Friend, you forget that I've heard your jokes. See you later. Miss St. Clair? Right. Who are you? I'm a customer of your carnival. Well, come in, customer. Sit down. Oh. Thank you, thank you. I wanted to ask a few questions, if you don't mind. <laughs> Where's your question license? My name is Simon Templer, also known as the Saint. These are for my own opinion. <laughs> what do you want to know? I'm interested in Angie. Oh, Angie? Mm hmm. They never come any better. Every hundred years or so, you meet somebody nice in this louse trap circuit. And Angie was one of them. Now she's gone and the crumbs remain. Anything peculiar about the way she died? Sudden, that's all. Heart. Why? And her sister Mona took her place. Yep. Mona's a good kid, but a kid. Any chance of her being brought up from the living grave soon? Why? I got the impression she didn't like it down there. No, you did. You know something? I don't like running this flea circus of a carnival either. Some mornings I don't even like living. But I don't come running to you about it, Mr. Templer. You won't bring her up then, huh? No. I got nothing to say about it anyway. It's up to her husband, Frankie Fowler. You catch his act? Frankie the tattooed boy? <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not an art lover. <laughs> well, he's no Mona Lisa, Jack. Any more questions? Would I get any more answers? No. But when a woman says no, that's not always what she means. Jack, that's an entirely different type of question. <laughs> Hello. Anybody here? Yeah? Frankie, I'd uh, like to talk to you. Who are you? My name is Simon Templer, Frankie. What do you want? Well, I've always been interested in tattoos. I, I think they're fascinating. Oh? Huh? Mm, almost as fascinating as the people who do them. Oh, a fan. Come in, come in. Thank you, thank you. 
You know, the, uh, the Connie's closed for the night, but I'm always glad to oblige a customer. Well, I'm not exactly a customer. I'm a friend of Mona's. Mona's got no friend, Simon Templer. Well, let's say a speaking acquaintance. Did you know Angie, Frankie? Know her. Angie was my wife. Wonderful girl. Almost killed me when she passed away. Omaha. She's buried there? I couldn't leave her behind. Not with strangers. Call me sentimental if you want to, but that's the way I felt. You see that urn over there on the table? Now Angie's with me always. I, uh, I see. They say us carny people got no heart. Hey, you like to see some real artistic work in tattoo, Mr. Temple? Oh, maybe some other time, Frank. Look at that. Look at that. Here. Monitor and a Merrimack. Civil War. Authentic, 100%. Mm. Eh, they don't do work like that anymore. Frankie, I, uh... Everything I got on me is art. Art! I seen a guy the other day ask him what he had on. He said, surrealism. Surrealism. I told him right out. I said, the guy that tattooed that on you ain't American. That's what I told him, and I'll stand by it. <laughs> surrealism. Frankie... I've been talking to Mona. What about? She's buried too far under the earth, Frankie. She wants to come up. Well, she does, does she? She say anything else, did she? I just got the impression she was frightened down there. Well, all. let her be. Let her stay there. She's getting just like Angie. Oh? Angie was frightened? Well, no, no, that's not what I meant. Angie, Angie was the greatest. It's just that they're sisters, see? It... What's this to you? Nothing, except I think it might be better if you brought Mona up. Oh, you do. You do. Segundo! Uh, Frankie. Come in here. Now you see what happens to guys who get nosy. Afraid to do your own strong arm work, eh, Frankie? Why, you... Here I am. Look, Segundo. This guy came in here saying bad things about Angie. About Angie? Yeah. You shouldn't have said that, mister. Not about Angie. I don't like nobody to say bad things about Angie. I'm trying to help her, Segundo. And Mona. Don't listen to him, Segundo. Get him. I don't trust... Hit him again, Segundo. Throw him out. Yeah. You shouldn't have said bad things about Angie. <laughs> Mister, wake up! You hurt? Uh, hey, carnival's closed for the night, friend. Uh, Why don't you go home and sleep? Oh, wait till I find my head. What happened? Well, uh, let's say too much cotton candy and circus peanuts, huh? Drink help you out? Ooh, immeasurably. Lead the way. <laughs> yeah, don't mind drinking with a dwarf, do you? Uh-huh. Why should I? Well, some people do. <laughs> Oh, mm, my name's Carlos. Oh, hello. Uh, I'm Simon Temper. Yeah. Oh, right in here. Oh. My home. Uh, one of the wagons. Oh, don't, don't bump your head. Oh, I'll watch it. <laughs> here. Pour this down. Oh, thank you, my friend. Why, I needed that. <laughs> uh, have to go, or can you stay and talk a while? Oh, I'd like to stay if I may, Carlos. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I very seldom get the chance to talk, Mr. Templer. Why is that? Eh, yeah, a dwarf's rather a lonely occupation. Not freak enough to make much money in the carnival, and too much of a freak to be accepted out of it. Oh, I... <laughs> Sorry to burden you with my troubles. Everyone's troubles are everyone else's, Carla. Well, thank you. <laughs> Want to tell me about yours? Well, I had a, a call for help tonight from 20 feet under the ground. And I, I just don't know what to do about it. Mona? Yeah. She said she was afraid she would end up like Angie. She wanted to come up. Did you uh, tell anyone else about this? Not directly, no. Frankie refused to let her come up. I have another drink. Yeah. Mona never talked like this before. She was never scared, not like Angie. Mona's got guts. It worries me. Go oh, here. Oh, thanks. Uh, uh, what about the man who was married to both of them, huh? Frankie. Simon. 
If you were born a freak like I was, you had no choice and you can be philosophical. But if you make yourself a freak like Frankie did, you got to hate yourself and everybody else as long as you live. And yet two women married. Don't rub it in. I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have jumped you. I'm not always as philosophical as I try to be. I can't help thinking of Mona, buried alive, afraid. Afraid of what? And she mentioned that Angie said something to her just before she died. What? She didn't say. Tell me, uh, how far are we from where Mona is? Just across the midway. You want to go over there? I'd feel better. And so would I. Let's go. Hmm. What about B. St. Clair, Carlos? Uh, can you figure her out? Well, not quite, because I don't think B. can figure herself out. She hasn't had much fun either. I hope she gets some. Uh, this is Mona's tent, isn't it? Anybody around? Mm, mm, not a soul. Let's go in. <whistles> Mona! Mona! Huh. She must be asleep. Now, let me try. Mona! Can you hear me? Mona! She's not asleep. There's something wrong. Mona! Mona, it's Carlos! Mona! What was it she said? She might wind up like Angie. Mona! Carlos, go get every man you can and every shovel and then get a doctor and an ambulance. Yeah. He wanted you to break the record. Well, maybe she will. Maybe she will, like Angie. That's it. Keep going. Stop. Get out of the way. Move, move. Go, go, go. Too much. Okay, okay. Oh. Are they almost down to her, B? Well, I think so. It's only about eight feet. We advertised 20, but eight is enough. What do you think happened, Carlos? I don't know. What happened to Angie? A heart attack, you know that. Do I? She's just fainted, maybe. Maybe this is all about nothing. I doubt it, Frankie. And so do you. What do you have to come nosing in for, Templar? B and I don't need you. We can get along. B for... and you? All of us, that's what I mean. You mean you'd rather have left her down there? I'm not taking this from you. I... Frankie! Frankie! I got the box! Oh, come on. Come on, you guys. Grab it. Grab it. Grab it. Come on. Come on. Uh, oh, boy. Uh, oh, there, there. Now, give me a hand with the lid. You better come over here, doctor. Right, Mr. Templer. Yeah. There. What is it, Doc? Is she... Is she... Well, she's still breathing, but that's about all. Any symptoms? Well, if I had to make a guess, symptoms of poisoning. Get her over to the ambulance. All right, come on. Mr. Templer. Mr. Templer, I'm sorry I didn't get her up sooner. I should have made it plainer, but I didn't know who to trust. Well, do you now? Just who not to trust. And who's that? Everyone. How is she this morning, Doctor? Oh, she's a sick girl, but she'll live. We got her in time. Oh, I'm glad. What caused it? Poison of some kind, definitely. I'm waiting for a lab report. Uh, may I see her? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Templer. She's rational now. Kept asking Angie to forgive her before... Forgive her for what? Well, she didn't say. They usually don't. Don't stay too long. Oh, all right, Doc. Good morning, Mona. Who are you? Simon Templer, I... Spoke to you down the tube yesterday. You thought at first I was Frankie. I don't remember. Don't you? You said you were afraid you might end up like Angie. She said something to you before she died, Mona. What was it? I don't remember. She didn't say anything. You uh, know what happened to you last night, Mona? No. There was poison in your food that was lowered through the tube. Got any idea who did it? Poison? I don't believe it. Well... Police will find I out. I don't want the police. I, I, I did it. I, I took it myself. What kind? Well, I, I don't remember, but I took it. Why did you want Angie to forgive you, Mona? Who told you that? I mean, you're making that up. I'm trying to help you, Mona. I don't need help. I want Frankie. I want him back. I, right, I want Mona. him back. All right, all right. I'll find him for you. <laughs> Come in. Ah! 
Simon, come in. How are you, B? How's Mona, Simon? Better, Carlos. I was at the hospital all day. Had to wait for the lab reports on the poison. Who did it? Oh, it could have been put there by anyone. To the police now? Not yet. Mona claims she took it herself. She's obviously protecting someone, or is afraid of someone. But who? B, you don't have to answer unless you want to. What, Simon? Has there been anything between you and Frankie? Well, everybody gets lonely. Are you still lonely? Jack, I got no ambition to travel around the country in an urn. Does that answer it? That's good enough. If I can wind this thing up tonight, will the two of you help me? You especially, Carlos. Anything I can, Simon. All right. You're not closing the carnival down tonight, B. We'll stay open if you say so. Well, it might make it easier. Carlos, you go to Frankie's trailer while he's doing his show and take the urn. Would you mind doing that? I'll do it. Good. Put it in a safe place, doesn't matter where, and come back to the trailer. All three of us will wait for Frankie to come back after his show. What happens then? I don't know for sure, but I have a theory. I hope it's right. It's a question. What happens if it's not right? B, that's an entirely different type of question. Simon, why do we have to wait in the dark for Frankie? It's creepy in here. He might not come in if he saw the lights, B. Do you mind, Carlos? Not a bit. The dark is a friend of mine. Oh, I'm getting jumpy. You can leave if you want to. I might be able to handle what I have to do alone. Oh, I'll stick. But give me a chance to gripe, will you? <laughs> How about you, Carlos? Oh, I'm enjoying it, Mr. Templer. Gives me a chance to feel important. I don't get many chances like that. See, Frankie's late. He should have been here by now. Well, maybe business was good tonight. Well, it usually is. Oh? Uh-huh. Say, B, I uh, don't want to be personal, but running a carnival, is it uh, lucrative? Jack, I don't want to brag, but I am loaded. Oh, how nice for you. Why, last year alone, I... Someone coming. Good evening, Frankie. Templar. What is this, B? I couldn't keep away, Frankie, but I brought my chaperone. Well, get him out of here. Some chaperones. A saint and a dwarf. I didn't choose to be a freak, Frankie. That's the difference. What's going on? Look around, Frankie. Anything missing? What do you mean? The urn. Where is it? What'd you do with it? We took it. You took it? Segundo, come in here. I don't think you'll need Segundo this time. No? Sit down, Frankie. If you don't like that seat, I can get you a hotter one. You think you know something? I'm nosy, Frankie. Very nosy, as you pointed out. This guy Templer again, Segundo. He's been saying bad things and doing bad things. He took Angie's urn. Easy, Segundo. You'll want to hear this, too. Hear what? Don't wait, Segundo. He's just stalling. Go get him. You took the urn. Segundo, sit down. No. Segundo, wait in here. Wait in here. Okay, Carlos, I trust you. Good. It's about Angie, Segundo. This morning and last night, Mona was calling out for Angie to forgive her. For what? Because she'd been going around with you, Frankie, while you were married to her older sister. I loved Angie. And how long after she died did you marry Mona? Six weeks. I couldn't help it if the kid was crazy about me. And you couldn't help it when you killed Angie with poison. Who says I did? Where's the evidence? You thought there wasn't any. It was almost a smart job, Frankie, but you couldn't pull anything all the way smart. It was only half smart. And that can be fatal. If you think I'm going to stand here and listen to this You'll stuff, stand you... and you'll listen. Murderers hardly ever change tactics, Frankie. The poison showed up in Mona's stomach. We couldn't prove that on you, but there are certain poisons that can be traced even after cremation. The kind you used is one. Now, do you begin to get the point? It's not true. You can't trace it, can you, Carlos? Yes, you can. I should have remembered I should have had that urn analyzed long ago. Now, wait a minute. You're guessing at this. Are we? Where's the urn? You're guessing at a motive. I didn't kill Angie. Then why would I want to kill Mona? Bigger stakes. You were after B. She was, uh, loaded. It's all a lie. I, I, I mean, B and I... Segundo, stay away from me. Put that gun away, Frankie. No. I'll use it if you don't stay back, Segundo. Frankie... You kill Angie? I tell you, nobody killed her. She, she had a weak heart. That was it, a weak heart. Segundo, listen to me. You kill Angie, Franco. Stay back. Stay back. He's going to shoot, Segundo. She, she never done no harm. She, she was so... Stay so... back, I'm warning you. 
Loved you and you gave her poison. Don't come no closer. I mean it. Stay back. She laughed some time and she did like a little girl. Keep away from me, you big creep. Well, you couldn't let her live. You crazy creep. Why don't you drop? You ain't human. Keep your hands off of me. Let go of him. Let go of him. Let go. It's me. Carlos, let him go. Let him go. Shut up, Carlos. Shut up. Secundo, are you hurt? Bad? No. No. Uh, I think one was a clean miss. The other two got him in the shoulder. And he'll live. Here, let me help you up, Secundo. Come on now. Sit down. Sit down. B, get a doctor. All right. Quite a man, this Secundo. Not so strong upstairs. But in the heart, plenty. Yeah, he almost killed Frankie. I'm almost sorry he didn't. Frankie doesn't deserve to live. Someone else will decide that, Carlos. What Segundo did? I wish I could have done it, Saint. In my hands. I wish I could have done it. Carlos. I never told anybody, Saint. I never told her. She never guessed. But I loved Angie, too. Heaven help me. I loved her, too. Just step a little closer, if you will, my friend. You mean me? I mean you. Uh, hey, do you care to see the fat lady, friend? Wait, 9,324 uh, ounces. <laughs> well, that's better. <laughs> How are you, Mr. Pepper? <laughs> I'm fine. Tell me, uh, how's Mona? Oh, she's all right. It's a funny thing, Mr. Templer. I, I think Angie must have told her when she was dying that she suspected Frankie. But Mona could never bring herself to believe it. She still can't. But I guess she will. See, uh... Going in to see the fat lady, Mr. Templer? You talked me right into it. Here's a five. Thank you, and the interest is straight ahead, friend. Uh, my change? <laughs> yeah, change. <laughs> Here's your five back. For Simon Templer, everything is always on the house. On the house? Yeah. Well, thanks. Say, you'd make a wonderful bartender. Oh, now, Mr. Templer, that wouldn't be refined. Oh, well, just a lovely dream. A wild, lovely dream. <laughs> been listening to another transcribed adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. And now here is our star, Vincent Price. Ladies and gentlemen, your life is your own. It's yours to guard when danger is near. And danger is never absent from the highways of America, where some 30,000 persons are killed every year. Only you can take the responsibility for averting the most tragic of all traffic accidents, the accident that happens to you. You can take that responsibility by recognizing the dangers of the road and by obeying the laws that have been made to protect your life. In almost every single motor accident reported by the National Safety Council, there was at least one violation of traffic regulations. The most common violation was speed. Speed too great for safety. Speed to save a few seconds. Speed that spelled out death and tragedy on the road. And, as always, the National Safety Council warns about driving after drinking. It's not an empty warning because fully one quarter of all fatal accidents involve drivers or pedestrians who have been drinking. This is a fact. So when you drive, remember that an accident can happen to you. Learn and obey the traffic laws and don't take the little chances that so frequently result in a smash-up. The care you take may save a life. And that life may be your own. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure of the saint. Good night. This adventure of the saint was written by Dick Powell 
In our cast, you heard Mary Schiff as Mona and Sheldon Leonard as the Barker. Bob Jellison was Carlos, Ed Max Segundo. Henny Bacchus played B, Harry Bartell was Frankie, Harry Brown was the Doctor. The Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, is a James L. Safier production and is directed by Helen Mack. Vincent Price is soon to be seen co-starring in RKO's production of His Kind of Woman. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that the Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Today, Theater Guild on the Air presents the dramatic story, Come Back, Little Sheba, starring Gary Cooper and Shirley Booth. Sunday also means another 90 wonderful minutes with the big show. And among this Sunday's stars are Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Judy Holliday, and many, many more. And, of course, Tallulah will be the MC. And for a sparkling article about the glamorous Tallulah, see the latest issue of Look Magazine, now on sale. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Listen to the wave. Listen to the bell. Listen to the weird circle. murder. That's the title of tonight's Weird Circle story, brought to you by Ogden's. From the pen of the noted author, Charles Dickens, The Trial for Murder provides excellent story material for a smooth radio adaptation. Speaking of smoothness and adaptability, you'll find Ogden's fine cut, a smooth echo. And if you look for a product that's completely adaptable to the smoker's taste, well, it's simple to make smoking satisfaction come true with Ogden's. Yes, on all counts, Ogden's provides genuine smoking enjoyment. You'll find Ogden's easy to roll, delightful to smoke. Yes, easy to roll, delightful to smoke. And now the Ogden's Playhouse presents The Trial for Murder by Charles Dickens. the past, phantoms of a world gone by speak again the immortal tale, the trial for murder. Here we are, Mr. Trelawney. Newtown Jail. Ah, gloomy old place it is, sir. Watch your step getting out. Oh, thank you, Derek. I can find you a place up at one of those garret windows if you like. Then you can see the hanging. No, no, Derek. I didn't come down here to watch the hanging of Peter Cook. Then begging your pardon, sir, I don't understand. Well, it's hard to explain. It's as though some strange force has urged me to come here today. I've felt it ever since the trial ended. Well, sir, I, for one, never did believe all that rubbish they were whispering about you during the trial. Supernatural powers, Mr. Trelawney can read the witnesses' minds. Why, there never was a more practical man than you, sir. As foreman of the jury, I tried my best to be fair, Derek. But I can't think back on the trial without a shudder. It was a nightmare, an ugly dream. Oh, look, sir. Yeah? The flag is up. Your Peter Cook is dead. Yes. Oh. And suddenly a great weight seems lifted from my soul. Strange. Why, I, I feel happy for the first time since it all began. Robert Blackwell has just come out to the prison gate, sir. I think he's coming over here. 
Even a great lawyer like Blackwell couldn't stop you from hanging Peter Cook. Oh, this is a fortunate meeting. I've long wanted to talk to you. It's Mr. Trelawney, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Blackwell, I'm at your service. Even though you'll never persuade me Peter Cook wasn't guilty of murder. He was, sir. He was. Confessed at the last minute. Oh. I was completely taken in by a scoundrel. Disagreeable business, the whole thing. Well, would you care to join me for a stroll? I'd be delighted, Mr. Blackwell. Uh, that will be all, Derek. I'll be home for dinner. Yes, sir. I suppose there are many questions in your mind. Mr. Trelawney, from the moment you appeared in the jury box and my client leaped to his feet, screaming that you must be challenged, I felt you were the key to the whole mysterious business. I was, through no fault of my own. In a way, I was a puppet moved about by forces that can't be explained in any logical way. I've long wanted to tell the whole story. Just what I was hoping for, my friend. I've long wanted to hear it. Well, I warn you, Mr. Blackwell, you won't believe me. You'll laugh at me, call me crazy. Not at all, Mr. Trelawney. Now, here's a quiet little park. Uh, let's rest on this bench while we chat. All right, sir. As I was saying, Mr. Trelawney, I have every reason to believe you implicitly. Well, then you have more faith in me than I had in myself. Do you know that after the trial, I went to a specialist? And it was with relief that I heard him say that I was sound in body and mind. Excellent. And now a confession from the counsel for the defense. I had you checked on, sir. After several incidents that seemed unbelievable, you understand. And you found... That you are a well-known bank director, respected and admired. A man of character and integrity. Not given to imagination and fancy. Oh, I'm flattered. But was that sufficient proof? Perhaps not. However, on four different occasions during the trial, I was startled by a sense of someone standing at my elbow. A weird sensation. A sort of a chilly presence that made the hair stiffen at the back of my neck. You may recall that during my summation, I lost my place and glanced quickly in back of me. You certainly looked startled. There was no one there, of course. Ah, but there was. It was John Talbot. John Talbot? The dead man? The man murdered by Peter Cook. I saw him frequently during the trial. But, my good man, such things don't happen. I told you you'd call me crazy. But it was as much a fact as two and two make four. And at least, Mr. Blackwell, you've given me a motive for telling my strange story. First, let me tell you that I don't follow crime stories in the daily papers. And it wasn't until much later that I discovered that this first incident took place before Peter Cook was even suspected or arrested. I was standing by the window in my apartment overlooking the park. Derek, my servant, was in the room at the time. Shall I lay out your evening clothes, Mr. Trelawney? If you will, Derek. But first, take a look out this window. Something strange going on. What is it, sir? Well, do you see that man approaching from Berkeley Street? The one with his collar turned up? Yes, yes, sir. He seems to be in a bit of a hurry. Well, what's the way he keeps glancing in back of him? That man thinks he's being followed. I'd say he acts a bit frightened, sir. Now, you're right, Derek. Oh, and now I see the reason. Good heavens! What a peculiar-looking chap following him. Huh. No wonder he wants to get away from him. Where, sir? Uh, uh, stand over here. You can see him now, Derek. No hat, his hair blowing in the wind. He has the whitest, most unhealthy-looking face I think I ever saw. I don't see him, sir. Well, you must be blind, Derek. He's practically in front of the window now. Look, look. Oh, he sees us. And he's pointing at the chap with his collar turned up. I don't like the look in his eyes, Derek. He must be a madman. Doesn't he look mad to you? I'm sorry, sir, but I don't see a soul. What's that? I don't see anyone there, sir. Well, you must be crazy, Derek. Oh, he's moving away now, but looking back over his shoulder and still pointing. Are you quite sure you're feeling well, Mr. Trelawney? If you're trying to be annoying, Derek, you're succeeding admirably. Is this your idea of a joke? No, sir. I'm, I'm very sorry, sir. May I draw the blinds? Please do. Let's have no more of this nonsense. Serves me right for not minding my own business. Yes, sir. What's that? I mean, no, sir. That is, <clears throat> shall I lay out your evening clothes? Yes. Yes, I'll change in the dressing room. It's warm there. Derek. Did you leave the dressing room door ajar? No, sir. I closed it tight to keep the heat in. Well, it's ajar now. Wait a minute. I have a feeling there's someone in there. That's impossible, sir. You'd have to go through this room to get there. And we'd have seen anybody who did so. Yes. Yes, you're right. Of course. Look. Look and remember. Derek. Did you hear something? No, sir. What is it? There's someone in that room. Open the door wide. Yes, sir. 
There. You see, Mr. Trelawney, there's nobody there. If I may say so, sir, your imagine... What's the matter, Derek? I... I don't know, sir. All of a sudden, I felt cold. Sort of a chill came over me. You... You didn't see anyone in there when I opened the door, did you, sir? I... I thought I did. Just for a flash. It was the white-faced man I saw on the street a moment ago. And that's the truth, as you recall it, looking back? I'm certain of it. Moreover, Derek came to believe me. That chill of death that he felt convinced him. It's odd that neither one of us connected the incident in any way with the summons for jury duty that he brought to me at breakfast the next morning. As a busy man, I was merely annoyed with what I thought would be some dull civil case. But several days later, I arrived at the courthouse. I remembered so clearly the dim, gaslit passageways to the court. I remember that black, heavy fog hanging like murky curtains outside the great windows. I think I moved as one in a dream until you and the prosecutors started examining the jurors. As I stepped into the box, I remember your client, Peter Cook, leaping to his feet. I demand that you challenge that man, Mr. Black Cook. He'll hang me, sure. I want a fair trial. I demand that you challenge him. Uh, please, sir, please, Mr. Cook. Uh, your Honor, I ask your forgiveness for this outburst. My client is unstrung. Uh, with your permission, however, I will examine the juror. Uh, your name, sir? Hugh Trelawney. Do you know the defendant, Peter Cook? No, sir. Never saw him before? I believe I saw him in front of my home several days ago. He was being followed at the time. At least he looks like the man I have in mind. I'm sure I don't need to remind you that you're under oath, sir. Now, my client seems to believe that you are prejudiced against him in some way. Is that true? I know absolutely nothing about him. So far as I know, I've never spoken to him or read anything about the case. I have no personal interest in the matter whatsoever. Uh, Your Honor, my client, Peter Cook, seems to have been a bit hasty in his remarks. I, I feel he's made a mistake. I withdraw my challenge. And this incident, which you'll recall, Mr. Blackwell, was the first inkling I had of any connection between the scene in front of my home and the trial. Naturally, at that point, I felt attention had been centered on me unfairly. It wasn't until the prosecution had started its case that I discovered the further link. The prosecutor was speaking at the time, I recall. The state submits this locket as Exhibit A. I shall ask each juror to examine it carefully. There are several interesting points about it. First, it contains a picture of the deceased John Talbot, who the prosecution will seek to prove was foully murdered by the defendant Peter Cook. Now, secondly, I'll ask you to notice that the case is bent, as though it was stepped on and crushed during a struggle. Now, later, we will bring witnesses to prove that this locket was found in the effects of Peter Cook, carefully hidden from the sight of man. Now, Mr. Foreman... Will you take a moment to look at this locket and then pass it on to the next juror? Yes, sir. Thank you. The picture has been identified as that of John Talbot. Naturally, he was younger when the... I say, is there anything the matter, sir? Why, this this picture gave me quite a start. It looks very much like the man I saw following the defendant on the street in front of my house the other day. May I request that the juror confine himself to the examination of the prosecution's evidence? His remarks are irrelevant. The more so since John Talbot died some three weeks ago. I beg the court's pardon. I was younger then, and my face was not then drained of blood. But quick, a glass of water somewhere uh, in the form of his face. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm all right now. Oh. It was just for a moment. Uh, let me have the locket again. Take the picture out. Remove my picture from the locket. Just a moment, Mr. Foreman. What are you doing? Uh, stop that at once. You're destroying the evidence. I'm sorry, sir. But there's something on the back of this that I must see. There. Do you see what it is? No, Mr. Foreman, I do not. It's blood, sir. Dried human blood. In Charles Dickens, we meet a writer of many facets and strange parallels. An author with a faculty of applying his genius to all fields of plot, from a tender romantic turn to such a story as we hear tonight. The story of a juryman invested with incredible and supernatural powers of judgment. Friends, 
The judgment of the Canadian roll-your-own-smokers jury regarding the excellence of Ogden's fine-cut tobacco has been unanimous. Yes, ask the person who likes to roll his own cigarettes to name his choice of tobacco, and it's almost certain that his verdict will be Ogden's. You see, Ogden's has been pleasing the majority of roll-your-own-smokers and making new friends right down through the years. Try Ogden's. Taste the rich, mellow goodness of tobaccos that are sun-ripened for absolute smoking satisfaction. You'll find Ogden's easy to roll, delightful to smoke. Yes, easy to roll, delightful to smoke. Back now to Hugh Trelawney and the trial for murder. Trelawney has found that of all those concerned in the trial, he alone can see and hear the ghost of the murdered man, John Talbot. As foreman of the jury, his questions have revealed important evidence against the defendant, Peter Cook. Right now, he's explaining to the prosecutor how this mysterious voice guided the course of the trial. And so you see, Mr. Blackwell, how the rumors of my so-called supernatural power started. How I was drawn into the horrible affair almost against my will. Even you looked startled when I pried out the picture of poor dead John Talbot. Naturally, Mr. Trelawney, naturally. You seemed to do it without any apparent reason. Of course, the fact that the locket had been found among Peter Cook's things meant nothing. Everyone knew they had been friends. But finding dried blood on the back of the picture tied Peter Cook to the scene of the killing in the mind of all your fellow jurors. Miss, I see that now. At the time, I was only doing what the voice told me to do. Now, this uh, voice... At any time during the trial, did any of your fellow jurors see or hear the uh, murdered man? There was no doubt that the murdered man, uh, this ghost of mine, made his presence known to others than myself. Other jurors told me afterwards that they had awful dreams in which the figure appeared and told them that Peter Cook must die. It was this fact that kept me sane. As long as others felt some disturbance, I knew it was not my imagination leading me astray. For instance... Nearly every night of the trial, I saw his ghastly figure at the tavern. But each night that I saw him, some juror would awake, screaming with fear, to tell of dreaming of John Talbot. But as long as I was the only one who actually saw or heard him, I could not risk my reputation by speaking up. It must have been a horrible week, sir. Then you do believe my story, Mr. Blackwell? I do, sir. And I'll tell you why when you finish it. Well, it was after you started the defense of Peter Cook that I began to hear the voice more frequently. You, of course, recall your star witness, the young woman who lived in the same building as Peter Cook and John Talbot. Indeed, I do. Her name was Alice Hawkins. She started out as an excellent character witness for my client, but you soon put a stop to that. I remember the afternoon when you first started questioning her. I heard the voice several times as the testimony went on. It seemed impossible that others could not hear it, too. But I know now that no one did. Since she was your witness... I recall you were using a gentle, friendly method of questioning. Tell us again, my dear, how long you have known the defendant, Peter Cook. Over two years, sir. And you say that in all that time, you never knew him to do an unkind act. Was he on good terms with that unfortunate man, John Talbot? Well, they were very friendly, sir. Of course, they had little arguments, but it was all very friendly. But you never saw an open act of hostility, is that correct? He tried to kill me on Easter Sunday. What was that? Did someone... Now, may I ask the jury to pay more strict attention, please? It suddenly seems very cold in here, Your Honor. Oh, quiet, please. Now, in short, Miss Hawkins, you never saw signs of anything except friendship between the two men? Mr. Cook is a good, fine man, sir. She loves him. She would lie for him. Uh, your witness, Mr. Prosecutor. Uh, may, uh, may I ask another question, Your Honor? I object, Your Honor. The foreman of the jury has constantly interrupted this. Your, your question seems to have had an important bearing on this case so far, Mr. Trelawney. You may speak. Uh, just two things I'm impelled to ask. First, isn't this young lady in love with the defendant? And second... Didn't the defendant make an attempt on the life of John Talbot on Easter Sunday last? I object, Your Honor. This man has no right. Miss Hawkins, please answer these questions. And remember, you're under oath. Are you in love with Peter Cook? Well, what if I am? Is there anything wrong with that? Well, it makes you a rather doubtful character witness, I should say. And more important, what about this other attempt on John Talbot's life? That's a lie. What's a lie? Nobody tried to kill him. Well, what did happen then on Easter Sunday? He... He almost met with a bad accident. How did it happen? All three of us had gone to church. Afterwards, we decided to climb the cathedral tower for the view. Mm -hmm. On the way down, John Talbot slipped and fell. 
If he hadn't caught hold of the railing almost immediately, he would have... He would have... He would have plunged to his death. Is that correct? Yes, sir. But it was only an accident. I'm sure it was. And did the friendly relations you've mentioned continue after this... this accident? Well, not exactly. And why not? Tell us the reason. No, I won't. I won't tell you anything well, more. my dear girl, a man has died. Another man is on trial for his life. You must tell us everything you know, or you'll find yourself in a very unhappy position. Now, you've already hinted that friendly relations were strained between the two men after this time. Why? He accused Peter Cook of pushing him down the stairs. But he didn't do it. I'm sure he didn't do it. You, Trelawney, you have set him on the path of truth. It was at this point, Mr. Trelawney, that I had my agents look into your background. Two simple questions from the foreman of the jury, and the prosecution starts to upset my whole defense. Naturally, I didn't suspect the murdered man was working at your elbow. Did he actually call you by name? That was the first time, Mr. Blackwell. And though I was familiar with that ghostly voice by then, it gave me a start, I can tell you. Nevertheless, I believe Peter Cook would be a free man today instead of dangling at the end of a rope in Newton Jail if it hadn't been for the next day, Mr. Trelawney. Yes, I'm inclined to agree, Mr. Blackwell. Your suicide theory was built up ingeniously with the doctor's testimony. I know you believed it to have been a fact at the time because there was a ring of sincerity in your voice. You will note, gentlemen of the jury, that everything Dr. Croydon has said points to suicide. John Talbot, the deceased, was an unhappy man. He had come mistakenly to believe that his friend, his best friend, had made an attempt on his life. He knew that he had lost the woman he loved to that friend. The good doctor has shown how the wound could have been self-inflicted by a man holding the razor in his left hand. We know John Talbot was left-handed. And in that case, it makes it possible that he did commit suicide. Your Honor... I beg of you to let me speak. Again? Your Honor, if the foreman of the jury has deeper knowledge of this case, I ask that he Mr. be Mr. Blackwell, to... I have no knowledge of the case other than what I've heard here in this room. But I am impelled to ask that young woman, Alice Hawkins, that she be recalled and questioned further. She can tell us whether or not it would have been possible for John Talbot to meet his death by his own hand. The clerk will recall the witness. This is most irregular, Your Honor. Well, Your Honor, if it will further justice, I'm sure my learned colleague, Mr. Blackwell, will have no objection. I'll cross-examine after you finish with your witness, Mr. Blackwell. I have no questions, Mr. Prosecutor. I am confident she can throw no further light on the case. Very well, Mr. Blackwell. Now, Miss Hawkins, is it true that the deceased was left-handed? Yes, sir, he was. He wrote letters and performed all the regular little routines of life with his left hand. Yes, sir, he did. Well, then I fail to see what the foreman of the jury... In other words, Miss Hawkins, he could have easily cut his own throat with his left hand, couldn't he? Well, speak up, my girl. No, sir. It would have been impossible. You have done well, you Trelawney. You have done well. You see, sir, it was this way. I don't think anyone knew about it but me. John Talbot was very sensitive about it. Although he was left-handed, there were many things he did only with his right hand. One day he told me. He had an accident while a boy. And though he could still write and use his left hand, he could never lift it above his shoulder. And so, Mr. Blackwell, as you recall, the trial came to an end. The jury withdrew to the great room in the tavern to reach their verdict. I remember the strange feeling that came over me as the discussion went on as though I was becoming less and less Hugh Trelawney and more and more the voice of the murdered man. The little vestryman, Mr. Jones, was the only one who was still voting not guilty. I agree, Mr. Trelawney, it couldn't have been suicide, but would Peter Cook have killed him just to keep him silent? Peter Cook has been proven a man of violent hate. Yes, I know all that. I know that he was about to marry Alice Hawkins and that he had another wife in existence. I know that the dead man had threatened to expose him, but is that enough? Always keep in mind that John Talbot loved Alice Hawkins, too. Mm -hmm. When he found out that Cook was leading her on, his reaction would have been violent. Mm -hmm. His threat to expose Peter Cook would have caused strong hate between them. I still don't see the picture. <laughs> Why, who blew out the candle? Light it quickly. Oh, I wish I were out of this business. You, Trelawney, talk to this man. There, there that's better. Why couldn't they give us more than one candle? Why, why it frightened you too, Mr. Trelawney. Why, you're white as a ghost. Listen carefully, Mr. Jones. I'll try to set the picture for you. Morning. It might have been the morning of the murder. Peter Cook came to my room. Peter Cook comes to John Talbot's room. He threatened me. He threatens Talbot's life. 
unless he changes his mind about exposing him to Alice Hawkins. I loved her. Deeply. He loves her deeply. To hear Peter Cook speak of her lightly infuriated him. He, he tells, tells Peter, Peter Cook, Cook that, that he intends, intends to reveal him, him as, as he is. A man already married who intends to wreck her life by this despicable trick. A man petty, mean, selfish, with murder in his heart. The room is tense with hate. The fury of frustration burns in the eyes of Peter Cook. He sees the razor near at hand. It takes but a moment. With the strength and quickness born of hate, he moves. The morning sun looks in. Looks, looks in, in on the, the lifeless body, body of John, John Talbot. Why, it's uncanny. You might have been there yourself. Why, your whole story, even even your voice sounded different. Yes, I can see it now. So clearly that it it frightens me. Look, I'm shivering. The very coldness of death is in the air. Let us give the verdict quickly. Peter Cook is guilty. We filed back across the street into the old courthouse. Across the street in the rain, with a growl of thunder in our ears. The dim, gaslit courtroom was deserted except for the officials and the judge. I stood in the jury box, my heart pounding, my mind reeling. Your verdict, gentlemen. Guilty, Your Honor. Peter Cook will die. You are free, you Trelawney. You are free. And my life has been perfectly natural and normal since I heard the words, You are free, you Trelawney. You are free. Strange. Strange. And although Peter Cook never saw or heard this presence, he knew he was doomed from the day you stepped into the jury box. He knew he would be found guilty. He did, Mr. Trelawney. He did. In the confusion that followed the verdict, the judge and I were the only ones to hear what he had to say when sentence was pronounced. Did it have to do with, with my strange part in the trial? It convinced me that a supernatural force had been at work since the beginning. When the death sentence was passed upon him, Peter Cook said to the judge, Your Honor, I knew I was a doomed man when the foreman of my jury came into the box. I knew he would never let me off because before I was arrested, he somehow got to my bedside in a dream one night, woke me, and put a rope around my neck. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought you the story, The Trial for Murder. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. As we come to the end of another Weird Circle story, brought to you by Ogden's, here's a reminder till we meet again at the Ogden's Playhouse one week hence. There's a full week ahead during which smoking enjoyment will make your working and leisure hours brighter. If you roll your own cigarettes, make sure of getting the most out of your smoking by turning to Ogden's. Yes, follow the rule of the smoker who knows a good thing. Make your choice, Ogden's Fine Cut Tobacco. You'll find Ogden's easy to roll, delightful to smoke. Yes, easy to roll, delightful to smoke. Next week at this time, another Weird Circle story, The Werewolf by Frederick Marriott. Be sure to join us. If you smoke a pipe, why not try Ogden's Cut Plug? It's a delightful, smooth pipeful every time. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents...
welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Have you any idea of the meaning of paramnesia? Neither did I until I heard the strange story, later confirmed by an arrest, of Mr. Terence Pierce. The word paramnesia means the illusion of remembering scenes and events experienced for the first time. You find yourself somewhere, or you meet someone, and you know you've been there before, or that you've once met that person. It's an odd experience. For Terence Pierce, it once was fatal. Remember that once. More coffee, darling? Uh, pardon? What is so absorbing about the front page of the paper? Sybil Harrison's been murdered. Oh, no. Oh, she was such a fine actress. So was Lady Millbrook. And she was murdered, too. Who? Lord Millbrook's wife. England. 1810. Oh. Well, how interesting. Uh, it's terrifying. Why? Because Sybil Harrison and Lady Millbrook are one and the same woman. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Insight into Murder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Gordon Gould and Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Normal psychology is the study of mental processes that deviate from the imagined norm. The key to understanding it is the concept of the unconscious, which we owe essentially to Freud. One aspect of this complex subject is fantasy life. Investigation into such phenomena as déjà vu, the sense of familiarity in a new situation, and that, it seems, is what has suddenly possessed Terence Pierce. Call it paramnesia or déjà vu. He's seen something he's seen before. Let me see the newspaper, Terry. Yeah, it's on the lower right-hand side. Sybil Harrison strangled. Maintenance man arrested and charged with murder. Body discovered by husband Rodney Harrison and his close friend Seward Black, a film producer. Oh, how awful. What's the name of the man accused of the strangling? Uh, Philip Donato. <sighs> he didn't do it. Terry, I don't understand you. Uh, I don't understand myself, Meg. You said Sybil Harrison and some English lady. What did you say? Lady Sybil Millbrook and Sybil Harrison are the same woman. <laughs> Now, don't look at me that way. I know it sounds bizarre. Terry, that makes no sense. No, I suppose it doesn't. Let me see that picture again. What would you know about some Lady Millbrook? Didn't you say she was murdered in 1810? And how do you know that? Who was Lady Millbrook, anyway, and how could you have seen a picture of her? It was a portrait. Where did you see it? In Lord Millbrook's home. In 1810? Oh, Terry. Listen, I'm glad we're leaving on vacation at the end of the week. The Arizona air will clear your mind. <laughs> I suppose so. Yeah, you've been working terribly hard defending my brother. And what a marvelous job you've done. Thank you, darling. Ben will be grateful for the rest of his life. He was innocent, Meg. Yes, but to be accused of taking dirty money from a mob leader still makes me furious. Well, the department stood behind him. They knew he was an outstanding detective. And still, it could have broken him. As a police officer, but not as a man. Your brother Ben is a real man. Well, it's behind us now, thank goodness. Terry, you're still bothered by that picture in the newspaper, aren't you? Hmm? Oh, not really. Now, forget it. It's, it's just a coincidence. That's not what you really think, though, is it? Come on now, I'm your wife. I won't send for the man in the white coat. <laughs> I hope not. Just take me out of town. I look forward to our trip. 
You know, I miss the parishes, George and Kim. Oh, no. For heaven's sake, now what? They... They lived in England near Enfield School. One of the boys from the school was Charles Cowden Clark. And he... He had a young friend named John Keats. I met them at the parishes. Keats. Keats the poet. You remember John Keats? Yeah. Terry, you've got me scared half to death. You know that. Oh, well, it scares me, too. Look, should I, should I telephone Dr. Fisher? No, no, no. I'm, I'm all right. I wonder. No, really, darling. What is the matter with me? That picture in the paper... And Lady Millbrook and Sybil Harrison being lookalikes? Even the names are vaguely familiar. I seem to be experiencing something I experienced before. That's déjà vu. Yeah. Your imagination is playing tricks. Well, could be, but it's also vivid. I've never had an experience like it before. Did I exist in this fantasy land of yours? Yes. Yes, you did. That's that that's that's vague now. Like something seen through a mist. Mist. Mist from the Thames. Oh, no. Darling. The parish has warned me. For my sake, they feared Lord Millbrook. And then I was swallowed up in the mist. I wandered into it. And I was drowned in the River Thames. <laughs> you, Terry, for saving my life and my career. <laughs> you thanked me in court, then. Yeah, and I'll go on thank you as long as I live. <laughs> I hope you like this joint. I do. I like its old-fashioned flavor. The dark paneling and the red and white checked tablecloths. Hmm? Now, the food's plain, but uh, very good. Oh, I got that table over there, the one for two. Ben. Hmm? Isn't that... Isn't that a man named Seward Black? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, it looks like him. The uh, friend of Rod Harrison. Whose wife was strangled a few nights ago? Yeah, the actress. Hey, what a dirty shame, huh? She really was a beautiful woman. A pretty good performer. Well, I wouldn't know. She could light up the screen, though. I've seen him before. Sure, why not? His picture's been in the paper before. He's a producer. It's a nasty case. No, that's not right. It's no case at all. Donato was found in the bedroom with a picture wire in his hands and lipstick on his face smeared all over. Drunk as the Lord. Hey, he'll go up the river for life. <laughs> Should. Donato didn't commit that murder, Ben. Huh? Uh, of course he did. Harrison and this guy, Seward Black, walked in and found the wife strangled and Donato sprawled on the floor with the evidence in his hands. It's an open and shut case. What are you talking about, Terry? Excuse me for just a minute. Oh, well, I'll meet you back at our table. Mr. Black? Yes? You are Seward Black. Is there something I can do for you, uh, Mr... Terrence Pierce. I'm an attorney. Don't you remember me? I've never seen you before in my life. Now, if you don't mind... Not in this life, no, Mr. Black. <laughs> uh, you've had one too many, Miss Pierce. I don't want to be rude. You don't remember 1810? And the murder of Lady Rodney Milbrook? Or the Lord's close friend, Sir Seward Humphrey? <laughs> You're uh, drunk or insane, Mr. Pierce. Or a little bit of both. Uh, please leave me alone. 1810, that's 165 years ago. Wow, what was that all about, Terry? I wish I knew. Hmm? Well, uh, why did you want to speak to Seward Black? <laughs> I'd prefer not to risk it. You lock me up. <laughs> That'll be the day. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, you've worked up my curiosity. Well, Seward Black's the man who murdered Sybil Harrison. Are you serious? Dead serious. <laughs> to explain it? No, you'll think I'm crazy. Well, I... What I think isn't important. 
Well, now, we've locked up Phil Donato for the murder of Mrs. Harrison. Now, you're saying that Black committed the murder, huh? What's your evidence for making such a charge? I haven't got any. <sighs> well, you're talking like you really are balmy, Terry. Tell you what, Ben. You are coming over for dinner. Sure. Makes fixing corned beef and cabbage to celebrate my being cleared, and <laughs> you know how a Kelly likes corned beef and cabbage. Right. Well, let me hold my story until then. <laughs> okay. Does uh, Meg know anything about this? Yes. I told her over breakfast. It was the picture in the morning paper that started it. Started it? Started what? A journey into the unconscious. Ah, oh, holy Saint Simon. And I traveled all the way back to the year 1810. And what's that year got to do with how you're acting now, going up to a stranger and getting his back up, huh? Now, I could tell you were annoying him. He was annoyed. Now, don't tell me you accused him of murdering Sybil Harrison, huh? No. But he knew I knew. I could see it in his eyes. Oh, Terry, Terry, my friend, forget it. Talk to Meg and me all you want to about the murdered woman and whatever it was you bumped into on your journey backwards in time. But you're a lawyer. Cases are decided on evidence. Now, if you made an accusation against Seward Black, Mr. Harrison's best friend, what do you think would happen? I know, Ben, I know. Yeah, sure, you'd be laughed out of court. Nevertheless, I have just spoken with the man who murdered Sybil Harrison. <laughs> Don't you look lovely, Meg. What's that color? Primrose. You like? That's a beautiful blouse. And you become it. Well, thank you. My goodness, after 20 years, how nice. Many men take their wives for granted. Not this man. I hear we're having corned beef and cabbage for dinner. How did you... Oh, of course, you were having lunch with Ben. Well, he ought to be along soon. So, come on, sit down and tell me about your day. Oh, there isn't much to tell. My partners were very happy. I proved that Ben was not guilty. I got dizzy from their pats on the head. Well, you deserved them, and I expect you got a really big one from my brother. Hmm? Better than that. I got lunch at Chris's chop house. Yeah. It was a rewarding day. No daydreaming? I'm sorry about this morning. I must have sounded a little wild. Now, that was an odd story you told me. I had a funny experience at lunch. Ben and I were having a drink at the bar when I saw him. You saw? Seward Black. That wasn't his name 165 years ago. Oh, no. It was Sir Seward something. And? He committed a murder for which a vagrant was arrested and hanged. Terry. Yeah, I know. Look, did you mention this to Ben? I told him I'd tell him the story tonight. Seward Black. He's that producer friend of Rodney Harrison. That's right. I spoke to him. Not a... Not about... No, no. I, I, I just asked him if he remembered me. He denied it, of course. He intimated that I was drunk or crazy or a little bit of each. I'd deny it, too. Meg, I've got to resolve this, this puzzle. Will you help me? Of course, Terry. Then, then try to get to the library tomorrow and look at back issues of London newspapers or periodicals for 1810. Find out if there was a Lord Millbrook and a Lady Sybil. Did he have a friend named Seward? Was a man, a vagrant, convicted for the woman's murder? Will you do that for me? Certainly, darling. I mean, really research it, Meg. As Ben pointed out, cases at law are decided by evidence. I don't have any. All I've got is a picture in my mind of a murder and of an innocent man being hanged for the crime. It's a very long time ago. But the same crime has been repeated. I just know that. If there's any substance to what I've seen in my mind's eye, I'm going to defend the man now being accused of murder. A long journey back into time. Paramnesia or deja vu give it either name or call it nonsense, but I've experienced it, and so I imagine have you. You find yourself in a place you've never been before, and it's familiar to you. Or you meet someone you know you've known before. Is it nonsense, 
daydreaming? If it wasn't for Terrence Pierce, as we'll find out when I return shortly with Act Two. anyone have an insight into murder? Terence Pierce sees a photograph in a newspaper and declares that a murdered woman, an actress named Sybil Harrison, is the same woman who, as Lady Sybil Millbrook, was murdered in England in the year 1810. Offhand, that seems to be absurd. But so are many of our dreams. Can you deny it? I can't. Hey, hi, Meg. Come in, Dan. Well, corned beef and cabbage last night and cocktails tonight. <laughs> what a sister you are. You're always welcome. How was your day? Well, I'm back in the routine. It's been a bad time, Ben. Yeah, yeah. I never expected to be accused of taking payoffs from that gang and, and then have to prove my innocence. Well, you did. Oh, huh? Terry did. Ah, uh, he's something else as a lawyer. Is he home from work? Any minute now. Would you like a drink? Uh, no, 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 thanks. I'll, I'll wait. You're really worried about Terry, aren't you? Well, not worried. Concerned. Mm. It's all been very funny. Yeah. Yeah, I thought so, too, when we had lunch. You know, he left me at the bar and he walked over to a stranger. Yes, he told me, Seward Black. Mm? Terry has convinced himself that Seward Black murdered... Sybil Harrison. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's just not so. Now, we got the guy who committed the murder, Philip Donato. But that way you know all that. It's been all over the papers. Now, what's gotten into Terry, huh? What was all that last night after dinner about some murder that took place in England in, uh, 1810? Well, that's what I wanted to see you about, Ben. Huh? Terry asked me to do some research on the subject. He wanted to convince himself that he wasn't just a little crazy, so... I went to the public library and looked over old copies of newspapers from that period. Well, they had newspapers well, then? Of a sort, yes, and periodicals. And uh, is Terry just a little crazy? No. You mean there was a murder back then when, when, when he said there was? Oh, there's Terry now. Why would he ring the doorbell? Before you ask me why I rang the doorbell... I rang it to get into my castle. I left my keys on the dresser this morning. What? Tidy Terry. Hi, Ben. Oh, hi. He forgot his keys. Well, he's had a lot on his mind, Megan. And my guess is that <laughs> you are not going to relieve the situation. Did you turn up anything, Meg? I was just about to tell Ben. All right, researcher. Let's hear. Now, you're certain you haven't been cheating, reading up on some old murder case? I know you still read Walter Scott. Scott never recorded what jumped off that newspaper page and into my head. What I saw in my mind's eye, I saw. I still see it, in fact. And you found something? Yes, I did. It's rather terrifying, Terry. There really was a Lord Millbrook? There was. And a Lady Sybil Millbrook. Was she an actress? Oh, she had been. Rodney Millbrook was what was then called a womanizer. Before he ascended to his title of Lord, he seems to have been a very gay blade around London. He ran with a wild crowd, and they drank, fought, generally were a nuisance to the police. He bought himself out of scrapes many times. Oh, well, it was going on even then, huh? It's always been going on then. Well, Millbrook's buddy was a baronet. Hey, what's a baronet, Meg? Uh, a commoner, a person of common birth who's somehow distinguished himself. Oh. The crown then might bestow a sir on him. Seward Humphrey became Sir Seward because of some service. I'm not clear on this, which he performed for the king. A spy mission, I think. Sir Seward. And in 1800, um, 1808, Lord Rodney Millbrook married Sybil Harrison, who was then appearing in Johanna Bailey's plays on the passions, whatever that was. Not good, I gather, but Sybil lit up the stage. Millbrook was wild about her, and he married her. And then she was murdered? It was in November... 1810, that Lord and Lady Millbrook were paying a visit to friends near Winchester. Millbrook and his host had gone riding. A maid discovered Lady Millbrook's body in her bedroom, strangled to death. Good Lord. Just like Sybil Harrison. 
Officer Seward, who had gone with the Millbrooks on the visit, scoured the countryside and found a tramp. His name was Pip Donat. Philip Donato. Pip's a nickname for Philip. And Donat is another version of Donato. Uh, it's, I, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, and you know all this? Almost all of it. Go on, Meg. Terry, I don't like the rest of it. Let's hear it. There was a solicitor. Me? Uh, could be. Anyway, there was a solicitor, a lawyer in London. He was suspicious of Lady Millbrook's death, so he began to investigate. He learned that Millbrook had grown very tired of his wife, Sybil, and wanted in every way to get rid of her. The solicitor... What was his name, darling? Edgerton. Rob Edgerton. Edgerton? Why, isn't that your middle name, Terry? Yeah. Well, what happened, Meg? Did Edgerton learn the truth? No. The vagrant was drunk when the confession was wrung out of him. He was hanged. Which is just what might happen to Philip Donato. Pip Donat was hanged, but Rob Edgerton cast so much suspicion on Sir Seward that he was forced to leave England for the United States. Well, good for lawyer Edgerton. Uh, not too good for him. One night, his body was found floating in the Thames. I see. So... May I suggest, darling, now that you've taken your trip backward in time, please come home. I can't do that. Sir Seward framed a vagrant for the murder of Lady Millbrook, and Pip Donat was hanged. Today, Seward Black, Rodney Harrison's furtive confidant and hanger-on, frames a maintenance man, Philip Donato, for the murder of the actress, Sybil Harrison. It's Phil Donato I'm worried about. Ben, hmm? you've got him cold to rights, haven't you? I'm afraid so. Well, let me ask you this. Huh? Who's defending Philip Donato? A uh, friend of the court. Donato's a poor man. I'd like to talk with him, Ben. Maybe I'll offer him my services. Oh, no, you won't. Do you want to end up dead in the East River? No, Terry. Then you do think there's something to what you've told us. Well, I, I can arrange for you to see Donato, Terry, but... See, I'm with Meg. Don't get mixed up in this. You both think there is something to what jumped into my head when I saw Sybil Harrison's picture, am I right? No. Ben, make it possible for me to visit Philip Donato. Well, Meg? All right. But let me give you a piece of advice, my darling husband. Stay away from the East River. Good morning, Mr. Donato. Uh, hello. I'd like to talk with you for a few minutes. Oh, okay. I uh, haven't got any money. Uh... This won't cost you anything. Okay. What do you want to talk about? Mrs. Harrison. Oh, what's there to talk about? Who killed her? <laughs> I killed her. You see in the newspapers. Did you kill her? They say so. Maybe I did. I don't remember much about it. It's it's all in the papers. Were you drunk at the time? Nah. No, I, I don't drink. Oh, I have a beer when I'm watching a ball game, but I don't touch the hard stuff. Then how does it happen that when the police found you with the picture wire in your hands, you were drunk? Uh, yeah, I was drunk, all right. But you don't drink? Mm. Do you remember drinking on the morning of the murder? No. Tell me what you did that morning. Uh, from when? Well, from the time you reported for work. What for? Because I don't think you murdered her. Well, are you some kind of nut? No. I really have no doubts about who killed Mrs. Harrison. I know who killed her. Yeah? Who? Tell me the story. You, you think maybe I didn't kill her? Yes. Now... You reported for work? Yeah, I, I relieved the night man at uh, six in the morning. Someone's on duty all the time. You know, people want service all kinds of times. Well, why did you go to the Harrison's rooms? Oh, it was about 11 o'clock in the morning. The maids had already cleaned the rooms. One of them, uh, Gertrude, she said the kitchen sink was stopped up and I should fix it. Was anyone in the rooms when you went up, Mr. Donato? Uh, uh, just Mr. Harrison. He was leaving to go out. What about Mrs. Harrison? As far as I know, she wasn't there. I, 
I didn't look around. You know, you got a job like mine, you stick to business. They gotta trust you. So, Mr. Harrison was going out. And as far as you know, Mrs. Harrison wasn't there either. No, no I didn't see her. Mm-hmm. The uh, newspaper said she had a date at, at the beauty parlor for 11. But she didn't show up. No. What did Mr. Harrison say to you when you rang the bell and he let you in? He said good morning very nice and said he was sorry to trouble me. I said that's all right. Uh, I had it fixed up real quick. Anything else? Uh, yeah, he said there was coffee in the kitchen if I wanted a cup. Uh-huh. Did you have a cup after you fixed the sink? Yeah. Then what? Uh, after that, I don't remember. It all went blank-like. <gasps> It's so simple, it's ridiculous. Huh? You were drugged, Mr. Donato. What? The drug in the coffee knocked you out. Someone had strangled Mrs. Harrison. She was probably dead in the bedroom and framed the murder on you. I was? Someone drugged me? Yes. It happened before. A long time ago. You you mean I was drugged with booze? No. Yeah, but I smell all over from booze when they found me. Of course. The murderer poured whiskey down your throat and over your clothes. Who was it? I know, but I can't prove it. Mr. Harrison admitted that he told you to have a cup of coffee, didn't he? Uh, Yeah, yeah, at the door when he was leaving. That's when he told me. And no one else was in the rooms? Like I told you, I didn't look around. Hey, you really don't think I killed her? That's right. But how to prove it? That's the question. Terry, have you seen the evening paper? Have I ever? Well, who talked? I did. You? They make you have to be some kind of nut. Look here. I know, darling. Prominent attorney theory about Harrison killing, and then it goes on about the journey you took backward into time, and Harrison and Sword are going to sue for libel. Why did you do it? Because I'm right. Some alert reporter wondered about my visit to Donato. So I told him my theory. But why? I want Harrison and Black to realize I know that Donato didn't murder Sybil Harrison. But why? I still want to know why. This will reopen the case. I've spoken to Ben, though he's not optimistic. But he didn't laugh at Donato's story. What's he got to work on? The only evidence the drugged coffee is long since gone. We'll see, darling. We'll check on Seward Black's movements on the morning of the murder. And I want to talk to the maid who serves the Harrison. Oh, Terry... There goes our trip to Arizona. No, it doesn't. That's still on. But... Uh, ben and the police can handle what has to be done, and I'll be perfectly safe. Well, I hope so. I'm worried silly, Terry. Don't be. There's no Thames or East River in carefree Arizona. Are you enjoying your visit? I hope so. Even science cannot scoff at dreams. And from a dream experience, as Thomas Jefferson remarked in a letter to Thomas Monroe in 1823, we sometimes pick up some hint worth improving by reflection. But can a man's life be saved by an experience in paramnesia? We'll find out when I return after these messages. into murder, a strange and rather chilling story. A lurid murder in England in 1810, its duplicate in 1975. Even the names of the victims and the perpetrators are quite similar. And Terence Pierce, otherwise an attractive, successful lawyer, is possessed with the conviction that the man arrested for the murder is an innocent man. All set for the airport, Terry? Yep. Packed and ready to go. How you feeling, huh? Well, a little nervous, to be honest. <laughs> the newspapers have had a lot of fun with you. <laughs> I know it. Uh, the papers think you uh, ought to be at the funny farm. But how about Professor Gruber? He didn't think it's all nonsense. Yeah, yeah, I read the interview with him. Well, that's everything. Kitchen, heat, draperies pulled, everything. Hi. Oh, it's nice of you to drive us to Kennedy, Ben. Glad to do it. Uh, Terry's feeling a little nervous. Yes, I am too. Those newspaper stories. They're not what I'm nervous about. It's Seward Black. Ah, he and Harrison are going back to Hollywood. Didn't you know that? 
No, I didn't. For the funeral, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, it was yesterday. Harrison said he'd go away for a while. Yeah, he's badly broken up by his wife's death. Well, with them on the coast, I've got nothing to be afraid of. No. We'll make sure of that. Now, just what does that mean, Ben? Nothing, nothing, Meg, nothing. We're, we're doing some further investigating. Now, Terry's created a doubt about Phil Donato's guilt. Harrison and Black are angry about it, so I wouldn't want anything to happen to Terry, you know. What? What could happen? I didn't mean to alarm you. Nothing. Relax. How can I relax when you're suggesting that Harrison and Black might try to do something to Terry? <laughs> Not a chance. Why should they? Because they know they're guilty of the murder. Oh, that's your theory, Terry, but it hasn't got a leg to stand on. But you said you're doing some further investigating. We are. Now, look, now let's not talk about it, huh? Okay? You're staying with the parish, is that right? Yes, in mm. carefree Arizona. Kim and George Parish, you remember that? Sure, sure. Same address, phone number? Yes. Why? Well, nothing, just in case anything develops. You know, I'll telephone Terry. I'd appreciate it. And now can we put this fantasy out of our minds and leave... I'm on vacation. There they are. Kim! Meg! Welcome to the theater. <laughs> Hello, George. Hi. Oh, Good flight. George, yeah. you were just perfect. And yeah. the land and all this sunshine is just marvelous. I'll get the bag and meet you in front. Oh, George. <laughs> no, no, no. I can manage. I'll see you in a few minutes. Oh, it's so good to see you, Meg. <laughs> I worried that you might not come. Why? Oh, well, yes, that worried me, too. A remarkable story. <laughs> it's been in the local papers. It, uh, it won't embarrass you, will it? Good heavens, no. Terry might be right. Oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that, George. Everybody thinks we're crazy. <laughs> you, uh, include yourself, I see. Well, of course. I must say that at first I thought Terry was suffering from something, nervous exhaustion or whatever, but I did the research, and it's amazing that Terry remembers what happened all those years ago as if he had been there. 1810. I mean, it boggles my mind to think the murder of Lady Milbrook could have any connection with the murder of Sybil Harrison. It's been driving us both batty. That's why it was so good to get away. And now, sunshine in your wonderful Arizona. Uh -huh. I'll get the car, Kim. We'll be right along. I've read, Meg, that your brother Ben has persuaded the police to reinvestigate the charge against Philip Donato. Well, he's doing it for Terry. The trouble is there's no solid evidence to be found against Seward Black. The historic Sir Seward Humphrey. Hey, you have read about it, haven't you? Of course. I wouldn't care to see history repeat itself. This is wonderful, darling. Clean, dry air. And look at the view over the desert and up to the mountains. Mm, tomorrow I'm going to swim and lie by the pool and burn myself to a crisp. Pool? Sure. Look out the other window, the one facing the back patio. You see? Doesn't that look inviting? Tomorrow I'm going to wear it out. Yes. Very nice. You say that kind of funny. Uh, I didn't mean to. Water. Terry, you don't think... Oh, no. That couldn't be. Anyway, it was the Thames, not a pool at a friend's house in the Arizona desert. What is the matter with us? Oh, my fault. That got us both worked up about that miserable murder case over a hundred years ago. I'm sorry. Ready to go downstairs? It's getting late. The sun is almost set. Uh, not quite. You go ahead. I'll be down as soon as I, I comb out my hair. I won't be long. You look beautiful. Run along. I'll be down in a few minutes. We meet again, Mr. Edgerton. What? Mr. Edgerton? Oh, good Lord. You're Sir... Sir Seward Humphrey. Well, then it's true. I was right. It's a long time ago, and I've... Never forgiven you for your persecution. But you were guilty as sin. So I was. And you caused Pip Donato to be hung for a murder he didn't commit. What, what are you doing here? Harrison wanted to get away from Hollywood after his wife's tragic death. Just as Lord Millbrook left London after the death of his wife, Sybil. I remember. 
He and his faithful hanger-on, Sir Seward Humphrey, went abroad. <laughs> History repeats itself, Edgerton. I knew that when I spoke to you in Chris's bar. You handled that very well, Sir Seward. But your eyes gave you away. Oh. I knew that as Seward Black, you had killed Sybil Harrison and placed the blame on the maintenance man, Philip Donato. All those years ago, he was Pip Donat, a vagrant. He was hanged for your crime. He was a worthless tramp. Donato is an ignorant cipher. Now, the innkeeper... Oh, my good Lord. I think the wife's name was Mrs. Kimberly. That's it? She reported that some gentleman had brought the vagrant glass after glass of brandy. You'd gotten Pip drunk, and then you framed him for the murder of Lady Millbrook. You made it very unpleasant for me in London, and that's why I emigrated to the United States. Not before you'd committed another murder. It was quite painless. Your body was found in the Thames. So it was. And now... History is repeating itself. You murdered Sybil Harrison, doped the coffee that Phil Donato drank, and framed him. Yes, it was quite simple. Why did you do it? Harrison was tired of her two-timing him. Do you think you're going to get away with the murder? Of course. I made certain that a maid went up to the Harrison's rooms and cleaned up soon after I'd deposited Mr. Donato next to Sybil's outsized bed. Who called for the maid? Well, that's unimportant. And where were you supposed to be the morning of the murder? More details. Harrison and I can give each other alibis. No one has a chance of placing a charge of murder against me. We'll see about that. You freely confess that you did murder Sybil Harrison? Well, certainly. It was a pleasure. Why? Because you couldn't have her? I wouldn't have touched that. No good. Just about the same thing you said about Lady Milbrook when everyone in London wondered if you were a frustrated lover. That's a lie. I don't think so. What you think is unimportant. And we haven't completed our little drama. Harrison and I are going abroad... I'm producing a film in the south of France, but before I go, before my second emigration, shall I say, there's one more thing that I have to do. I suppose there is. It was the Thames back in 1810. And in 1976, it's a pool of Harrison's friends, the parishes. Intimate friends, I might say. Kim is Harrison's cousin, she invited us to spend a few days here until the publicity dies down. And just how do you propose to have me drown, Mr. Black? Oh, it would be quite simple. I don't intend to try to overpower you physically. I rather doubt I could. You intend to mesmerize me? <sighs> would you settle for tranquilize? What? What's that in your hand? Fall down, Johnny! <coughs> My arm! You dirty... I'll take that, Mr. Black. Don't move or I'll break your head. Ben, what the devil? I'll be back in a minute, Terry. The police are outside. Let me turn this bum over to them. Let's go, Black. We've been after you for 165 years. Are you all right, Meg, dear? You're still white as snow. Drink your bandy. Well, I'm still trembling, and I still don't know what went on. Well, you were redoing your golden locks, and I strolled downstairs and outside to the pool. Seward Black was waiting for Terry. But how come he was here? I don't understand. Well, ben arranged it with Kim. Kim's a cousin of Rod Harrison. She invited them to stay here for a few days. Ben, you used Terry as bait? Well, there was no real danger, Meg. I had Seward covered all the time. What I wanted was to hear what they would have to say to each other. But that's horrible. Not as it turned out. Kim Terry could have been killed. It was a weird experience. It's a nightmare. No, it isn't, Meg. Ben telephoned me a few days ago. He knew that you and Terry were coming to visit us for a week or ten days. and He told me what had been going on in New York. It sounded pretty wild, but George thought there was something to it. Terry's whatever you call it. Deja vu, yeah. To him, it was very vivid. I was intrigued. I did some research, too. Well, it struck us that Terry really had a vivid deja vu experience. 
He knew the murdered woman, Lady Millbrook. And the names fascinated us. Many are so similar, especially the first names. Well, except for Terry's 19th century name, Rob Edgerton. Edgerton's my middle name, Kim. Well, then it all fits. Right down to me is Kimberly, the innkeeper's wife. Isn't it amazing? But why would he want to murder Terry? I know that nonsense about history repeating itself, but without Black's confession, he'd have gone free. Oh, I don't think so, Mag. Remember the maid who received a call late in the morning to clean up the Harrison kitchen? Could she identify Black's voice? Eh, probably. Even more important than that, she thought that the coffee pot had a very peculiar smell, as if it had been burned. Now, she carried it back to her closet, was going to give it a good scouring or tell Mrs. Harrison to buy another one. Well, with all the excitement, she forgot all about it. But we didn't, based on your suspicions and what Donato told you. The contents in the bottom of the pot were analyzed. Heroin. Well, I'll be. So that's how Donato was doped. Yeah, yeah, the rest was easy. Thanks to you, Terry... We caught the real murderer of Sybil Harrison. And my journey back into time really was an insight into murder. It began when a man saw a picture on the front page of a newspaper which jogged his memory and sent him spinning in his imagination back to a time long forgotten. Paramnesia, deja vu... Whatever we call it, it was a phenomenon. More remarkable still, what Mr. Pierce saw in his subconscious was a pattern of murder about to be repeated. And it almost was. I'll return shortly with further observations. dream is the occurrence during sleep of ideas, emotions, and sensations. Upon awakening, we may or may not recall them. Often the dreamer will tell in detail about what happened in the mysterious world of the subconscious. When you are lying in bed on the dark, quiet night, and you slip into sleep and then into a dream, perhaps you'll go back in time to an event that occurred long ago. If so, I hope it will be a less frightening experience than that of Mr. Terrence Pierce. Our cast included Gordon Gould, Terry Keene, Court Benson, Earl Hammond, and Joan Arliss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You left me everything in your will. But I'm not dead. To all the world except me, you are. And you're going to stay that way. If you come one step closer, I'll scream. No one will hear you. Not in this big old house. Westerly's thick walls have no ears. What are you going to do to me? You'll see, Mother. You'll see. Look, you... you, You're going to... Put me back in that coffin and... and bury me alive. Yes. I haven't any choice now. Oh, please, please, please. Don't worry. You'll be quite comfortable. I'm going to bury you alive. But not in the coffin. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Incredible. Unbelievable. Yes, truth is often incredible. But you must believe. Listen to the weird circle. I didn't ask you to come to my humble apartment tonight to endeavor to stun you with my superior knowledge of crime and criminals. I've asked you here only to prove to you that the murders in the Rue Morgue present no great insoluble mystery. Monsieur Dupin, if you think the case is so obvious, tell me, who is the murderer? He will be here shortly, Monsieur le Prefect of Police. Here? Yeah. Who is it? The murderer here. In this place? Gentlemen, I give you my word as a man of honor... But he will be here in my apartment at precisely 10 o'clock this evening. How can you be so sure? I have asked him to come. Oh. It is exactly 9 o'clock now, gentlemen. And in the hour remaining to us before we meet the murderer, I shall explain to you as simply as I can how I managed to arrive at my conclusion. Yes, do, Monsieur Dupin. I'm always interested in guesswork. Guesswork, my dear fellow? This is not guesswork. No. Now, gentlemen, let us retrace the case. The story begins, if I'm not mistaken, with Madame L'Espanay and her daughter Camille on the afternoon of December 16th, 1841. Uh, well, of course, you're correct so far. Anyway, Dupin, I bow, Monsieur le Prefect. Madame L'Espanay and her daughter Camille entered the Bank of France at precisely 2.45 in the afternoon to transact important business. Ah, oh, Madame L'Espanay, I've been waiting for you. So good of you, Monsieur Le Bon. Have you met my daughter, Camille? I don't think I've had the pleasure. How do you do, mademoiselle? How do you do, Monsieur Le Bon? Are you quite sure, Madame L'Espinay, that you wish to withdraw all this money at this time? Quite positive. But 4,000 francs is a great deal to keep about one's household, madame. I'm quite aware of the danger involved, Monsieur Le Bon. But if the bank keeps this withdrawal quiet, nobody else need know that I have a sum of money in the house. Well, things do get about, madame. There's no use inviting unnecessary danger. The danger is my problem, Monsieur Le Bon. I think we'd better let the matter drop at that. Have you, uh, any protection against possible thievery at home, madame? Ah, uh, no, monsieur, but Mama and I have protection enough. We bolt and lock our doors. It's absolutely impossible for anybody to enter the house unless he should break the door down. But does any male protector live in the house? My husband died many years ago. Madame misunderstands me. I'm only asking these questions for your own good. Two unprotected women living alone in a large house can invite trouble. Don't that you... is our problem. If Madame insists. And I do insist. Very well, Madame. I have the money here. I myself will see you both home to ensure safe delivery. But let me warn you now. The minute you arrive in your home on the Rue Morgue, the Bank of France resigns all future responsibility. We understand, Monsieur Le Bon. We understand perfectly. So, gentlemen, the first step in this little tragedy was completed. Madame Espanay and her daughter insisted on taking the money home from the bank. Monsieur Le Bon drove them in his carriage to their house, the large, bleak house, number 12, Rue Mort. When they arrived there, Monsieur Le Bon looked about for the gendarme who was in charge of that particular block. I help you out, Mademoiselle Camille? Oh, thank you, Monsieur Le Bon. Madame? Thank you. Thank you. Is that the gendarme on the corner, the gendarme usually on this block? Not having had any reason to talk to the gendarme, Monsieur Le Bon, I wouldn't know. Yes, I think it is, Monsieur. Gendarme! Gendarme! All this fuss over a little money. Really, you'd think we were incapable of taking care of ourselves. Well, I think Monsieur Le Bon is very thoughtful, Maman. Gendarme! Coming, Monsieur, coming. Do you live on the first floor, Madame Lespinay? On the fourth floor, in the back of the house. I own this house, and I've shut up all the other rooms. You mean this entire house is unoccupied you except You called for... me, monsieur. Yes, I did. I want you to keep a special watch on this house for the next week or so. 
Madame L'Espinay and her daughter will have a considerable amount of money in the house. I will watch the house like a watchdog. You would be better off if you did it like a man. Then you'd use your head instead of your feet. Monsieur! What is your name, gendarme? Gendarme Isidore Musée. Very well. Gendarme Isidore Musée. I leave these ladies in your care. You needn't worry about a thing, mademoiselle. And madame. I'm sure we won't. That is, as long as you don't spread the news around the neighborhood that we've got 4,000 francs hidden here in the house. Who, me, madame? I am the law. And your secret is safe with me. <laughs> Come along, Mama. I'm getting hungry. Yes, dear. Thank you so much for all you've done, Monsieur Le Bon. It is nothing, mademoiselle. Nothing at all. Just a courtesy extended by the Bank of France. I'll keep good watch. Be assured of that. I'll keep very good watch. Gentlemen, gentlemen, let us proceed to the next event. Mm. Gendarme Isidore Musée kept a very good watch on number 12 Rue Morgue. At 11 o'clock the evening of the tragedy, he strolled into the shop two doors away from number 12 to buy a pouch of tobacco and to chat with his very good friend Pierre Moreau, a tiny man known as the neighborhood gossip. Uh, good evening, uh, good evening, good evening, friend Isidore, good evening. Uh, evening. I've been waiting for you, yes, I've been waiting for you. You usually drop in at nine o'clock. And I said to myself, as I sat here waiting for you, I said, uh, where's my good friend Isidore? It's been a busy evening this evening. That's what I said to myself. If Isidore doesn't drop in to buy his usual box of tobacco, he's busy. There must be big news abroad, but then <laughs> how could there be big news abroad on this block? That's what I said. You were wrong, Pierre. Very wrong. Wrong, eh? Uh, there is big news. Thievery? No. Uh, uh, murder? No. Well, then, <laughs> I give up. It's a secret. Secret? What could be a secret? Somebody got married. That's no secret. Somebody died. That's no secret either. A child is ill, a contagious disease, an epidemic, or Paris will be infected? No. But I can't guess. If you promise not to tell a soul... No, oh, not a soul. Well, Madame Lespinier... Yes? ...and her daughter Camille... Yeah. ...have withdrawn 4,000 francs from the bank today... ...and have it hidden in the house somewhere. No. And I must stand on guard. Oh, uh, naturally, naturally. But don't tell a soul. No, not a soul. On my honor, not a single soul, is it? Not my word of honor, I swear it now. And so, by midnight, gentlemen, the entire neighborhood in the Rue Morgue was buzzing. 4,000 francs in the Lespinade household. I hear it was 10,000. Two women all alone. Imagine it. 20,000 francs. I wonder where... And I... all that jewelry must be a veritable fortune hidden away. Do you know what they say? She's got money hidden in every corner of the house. Imagine almost a million francs in that house. I always knew there was something strange about those two women living all alone in a house like that. And in the rear, fourth floor... Yes, sitting in the bedroom of the fourth floor rear. But while the neighborhood was busy gossiping and chattering, Mademoiselle Camille and her mother were completely unaware of the commotion they had caused. It was almost three in the morning. Camille had just finished undressing, and her mother was sitting in front of the mirror, brushing her hair so that they didn't notice the window opening in back of them. I'm so tired, Mama. Poor Camille. It's been a very busy day. You know, I thought that Monsieur Le Bon was very nice. He seems fairly affable. Oh, Mama, fairly affable. I thought he was perfectly charming. So concerned over us. <laughs> no man ever gets that concerned over me. Must have been you, darling. <laughs> All men see. Oh, <laughs> Be calm, Camille. Don't Mama, move. he's got a razor in his hand. Don't move, Camille. Mama, quick. Let's hide. He's coming closer. Where, Camille? Where shall we go? Into the closet, Mama. Quickly, Mama, into the closet. Close the door. Mama, he'll break the door down. He'll break the door down, Mama. What now? Mama, he's breaking it down.
How terrible. How terrible. How awful. Quite right, gentlemen. Simply ghastly. We fully realize that this is a horrible atrocity, but we must remain factual. While all this was going on on the fourth floor of number 12, Rue Morgue, the gendarme Isidore Musée, the little tobacconist Pierre Moreau, Monsieur Lebon, who, strangely enough, was in the neighborhood at that very moment, and a passerby, a sailor, all four were attracted by the screams of the two women and immediately tried to break into number 12, Rue Morgue. Now stand back, everybody, while I break the door down. Stand back. This is the gendarme's job. Break it down, Isidore. Break it down. <laughs> Stop. Follow me, everybody. Up these stairs to the fourth floor. Stand right behind you, Isidore. Right, right behind right. you. Go on to the next floor. Keep going. Wait a minute. Wait. Wait. Listen. Listen to that. 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 Listen to he, he, he stopped speaking, hadn't he? Yes. Probably escaped. Yes, probably. I wonder. Try the door. Uh, can you open this door? No. It's locked. I, I think we're too late. I'm sure of it, sailor. I warned you about this gendarme. Well, let's, let's break the door down. One. Two. Oh. Oh, three. Look. Look. What? Oh, the entire room is wrecked. Just exactly as if a maniac had torn up the place. The bed's torn apart. Yes. It's... I sailed the seven seas, but I've never seen a place look like this in my entire life. Monsieur Le Bon, where are Mademoiselle Camille and, and her mother? I don't know. They're not in here. Look. Where? They're in the fireplace. Oh. It's Mademoiselle Camille. Dead. Yes. Dead. Dead. Poor girl. Here, help me, somebody. Mm-hmm. Help me lift her up. Look. Look out this window. Huh? The old woman is lying in the courtyard below. The sailor's right. Absolutely right. She's lying in the courtyard below, dead as a dead fish. Oh, probably twice as dead. Somebody is guilty of this. Somebody. And as a member of the Paris police, I mean to find out who that guilty person is. Yes, gentlemen. Isidore Musée Gendarme swore up and down that he would find the murderer. Well, at four o'clock that morning, I was awakened from a sound sleep and called to number 12 Rue Morgue to examine the evidence. Monsieur Le Gendarme Musée was running around the room destroying the evidence, or at least what little evidence there was, as fast as he unearthed it. The three gentlemen who had been there with him were still waiting round out of a combined feeling of horror and curiosity. The sailor, whose name escaped me, was sitting on what was left of a bed, staring blankly around the room. Monsieur Pierre Moreau, the tobacconist, was watching Isidore Musée, the gendarme, play detective. He played it badly. And Monsieur Le Bon was the picture of dejection. I entered the room and gazed about while Isidore well, supplied me with all the facts well, in the case, the only... at least from I'm his point of view. And, and that is exactly what happened, Monsieur Duvin. Very interesting, Monsieur Isidore Musée. And uh, now, gentlemen, I wish to ask just a few questions. Uh, no, on, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, now, all of you seem to think you heard the voice of the murderer. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, we did definitely. No doubt about it. And uh, you, Monsieur Isidore Musée, you are... Positive that the murderer is an Italian? Positive, Monsieur Dupin. Absolutely positive. I could tell by his uh, his intonation. Mm-hmm. Do you speak Italian? Oh, no. Definitely not. Have you ever heard Italian spoken? No, Monsieur, never. But I imagine... Yes? You imagine what? Oh, I imagine it would sound like that. I see. And uh, you, Monsieur Le Bon... You said it was Polish. Definitely Polish, without a doubt. I judge you have lived in Poland a long time, yet? No, no, but I heard Polish spoken once. Once? Yes. That makes you an excellent judge of the Polish language. 
Uh, how about you, Monsieur Pierre Moreau? What language did you say it was? Uh, Russian, I thought, uh, but that's only a guess, since I admit, and I admit it very freely, I'm not a man to hedge. Uh, I've never heard a word of Russian in my life. Mm, uh, I thought so. And how about you, sir? I, I thought it was Dutch. I don't speak the Dutch language, but I've heard a considerable amount of Dutch spoken when I was in Holland eight years ago. Eight years ago. Hmm? I, uh, I don't mean to make a suggestion, Monsieur Dupin, but Monsieur Lavant was the only man beside myself who knew about the money being kept in this house. What are you insinuating, Monsieur Musée? Insinuating? <laughs> I'm an officer of the law, and I think it was very peculiar that you should just happen to be in this neighborhood at three o'clock in the morning. Don't you live in this neighborhood, Monsieur Lebon? No, but I've good reason to be here. Oh, so? Suppose you tell us. Well, I was worried about Mademoiselle Camille. I was rather attracted to the young lady. And, well, I had a feeling that there would be trouble over the money. And, well, I was in the corner cafe having some tea until about ten minutes before the murder occurred. And then you strolled by the house on your way home. Correct? Quite correct. Now, my tobacco store is open all night. All tobacco stores are open all night, Monsieur Pierre Moreau. I was just walking by. I didn't steal the money. But naturally. Nobody stole the money. It's in the safe behind this wall. Huh? Are you positive, Monsieur Dupin? Perfectly obvious that the money hasn't been touched. These murders were far too cruel to be instigated by man's greedy desire for financial reward. Here, let me open the safe and show you. I, uh... Happen to know an interesting combination that will open any safe. <laughs> I should have been a thief. So, there. That ought to open it. Oh, it did. Naturally. Now, look. There's the 4,000 francs, safe and snug as a 4,000 franc group of notes should be. Well, for us, Monsieur LeBlanc was interrupted in the midst of his thievery. Perhaps he, he, he didn't have time to finish. Well, nonsense. Monsieur Lebon was with you when you walked up the stairs. Well, an accomplice, perhaps. No, 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 Monsieur Isidore Musée. Let me show you something. Look at the fingerprints on this girl's neck. Very strong, heavy prints. And very large, too. Why, yes. The murderer must have been a giant. His hand must have been twice as large as mine, and I have a large hand as hands. Can. Yes, yes. The murderer was a giant. A giant with extraordinary strength. Gentlemen, I think now I have sufficient clues. Uh, look at this window. It's, it's just a window. Yes, just a window with a cord on it. A broken piece of cord. Clue number one. Clue number two. Look. Look at the dead girl's hand. Huh? Huh. She has some hair clutched in her hand. Quite correct. And with this cord and this hair... I can find the murderer. Gentlemen, go home. Go home, get a good night's sleep, and I'll hand the murderer over to the prefect of police very soon. Monsieur Dupin, <clears throat> uh, don't forget to mention that I helped you. I'm, I'm due for promotion soon. Well, that's uh, very strong. Well, I don't care. And so, messieurs, that is the story. And you have the fact. A piece of cord and some hair. The condition of the room, the strength of the murderer, the passion of the deed, the lack of motivation, should all suggest to you the very same thing it suggested to me. Monsieur Dupin, you are talking in circles. Circles? So? You mean to say you still don't know who the murderer is? No, of course I don't know. And frankly, Monsieur Dupin, I don't think you know either. <laughs> really, gentlemen. R really, gentlemen, you, you amaze me. Here... Here, Monsieur le Prefect. Examine this piece of cord, if you will. What do you make out of it? A uh, piece of cord, yes. Uh, well, let me see. Well, it's a piece of... Well, nothing, except that... Uh, well, it's it's been torn. Yes, it's been torn. Now, yes. try to tear it yourself. Well, try to... Well, I couldn't. It, it, it's a very, very strong cord. Ah. Notice anything else? Yes, now that I look at it, it's got a very unusual knot in it. Uh, but what does an unusual knot prove? You will see what I mean presently. It's the first stroke of ten o'clock. Any minute now, gentlemen, the murderer will enter this room. Uh, may I please ask you to extinguish all the candles in the room, all except one. Oh, uh, 
Why, if Monsieur Dupin, we'll all be murdered. Which would be no great tragedy, but I, I wouldn't worry if I were you. Well, as you say, Monsieur Dupin. Uh, extinguish the candles, gentlemen. Yes. Now we are in semi-darkness. That is fine. Listen, gentlemen, the downstairs door to my pension has opened and closed. The murderer is now downstairs. He is walking up the stairs. Now listen. Yes, listen. For the love of heaven. Quiet, quiet. He is coming closer. Gentlemen, are you ready to grab him when he enters? Yes, monsieur. That is good, good. He is standing outside my door now, Monsieur le Prefect. Ready, gentlemen? Yes. yes. Come in. <laughs> Grab him. Oh, let me go. Let me go. There you are. So it is you, sailor. Uh, help the sailor to sit down. Uh, it was a trap, huh? Yeah, but this sailor doesn't look strong enough to commit these murders. Let me go. Let me go. Don't let me go, I say. Please, please, please don't struggle. <laughs> You see, sailor, Uh, Monsieur le Prefect cannot arrest you for the murder because, although you are responsible for the crimes, you are not guilty. I am not guilty. I am not. I I, I couldn't help. Of course you couldn't. Gentlemen, it must be obvious to you now that no man murdered these two women. The only creature able to do it would be a Bornese orangutan. Orangutan? Uh, I matched these hairs I found in the dead woman's hand, and of course they belong to just such a creature. An orangutan. Yes. Yes, Monsieur Dupin is right. But tell me, how is uh, this sailor involved? I own the animal. Dupin put an ad in the paper saying my orangutan was captured. Oh, that's why I'm here, to claim it. But didn't you realize that Monsieur Dupin knew that the murder was an orangutan? No. No, I, I didn't think anyone could solve the murders. But I did know that whoever put the ad in the paper knew that I was the owner of the animal and that he was keeping what he thought was a perfectly innocent animal. You see, I addressed my ad personally to this sailor. This piece of cord told me a sailor owned it. There was a sailor's knot in the cord, and the knot was peculiar to those tied on Maltese vessels. Therefore, when I put the ad in the paper, I asked the sailor from the Maltese vessel, uh, I checked on the name of the vessel from the sailing data in the paper, to come and get the beast. Well, naturally, I I came to pick him up. Ah, now I see. Uh, one question I must ask, sailor. How did the orangutan get hold of a razor, and uh, how did he manage to escape? I... I had the animal locked in my quarters. I... I captured him in Malta and brought him to this country to sell to the zoo. They're, they're very smart, you know. Well, last night when I entered my room, he was trying to shave with my razor. When I tried to chain him up, he escaped. He ran out into the streets, saw the light in number 12, Rue Log, climbed up the lightning rod to the ladies' apartments. Well, you know the rest. Indeed we do. Well, gentlemen, if you have any other problems you wish settled, call on me. Just call on Monsieur Auguste Dupin. Incidentally, if you'd like to see the orangutan... You'll find it safely locked up in the zoo. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have brought you the immortal tale, Murders in the Rue Mall. There the people, the Adventures of the Saint, starring Vincent Price. The 
Saint, based on characters created by Leslie Charteris, unknown to millions from books, magazines, and motion pictures. The Robin Hood of modern crime is now transcribed for radio, starring Hollywood's brilliant and talented actor Vincent Price as... The Saint. Hey, what's what going on doing? here? This is my car here. Uh, whoa, whoa. No, no, no. Stop hey. it. Hey, cut it out. Stop it. What's the idea? Now let that man alone. Look, you keep out of this, buddy, or I'll... Well, it ain't the same. <laughs> it's euphonic, but slightly ungrammatical, Mac. Now, what's the disturbance? Uh, they drew up alongside of my car. Him and the other fella, they said, get out. We're taking your car. Why, Mac wouldn't do a thing like that, now would you, Mac? No. Nah. Of course not. The old man's nuts. What Mac would do if he coveted his neighbor's jalopy is slug him with a piece of lead pipe and drive off. Yeah, so good night. I get business. Now, wait, Mac. You could satisfy my curiosity a little. Why should you want to steal this gentleman's old automobile when you've got nicer, newer ones to choose from? Yes, sir. Uh, ask him, mister. Ask him. Yeah, ask me, son. Go ahead. And I'm going to satisfy a little curiosity of my own. I didn't think you had any, Mac. <laughs> what shape does it take? I always wondered how you'd look dead. Good night, all. Good night, man. Be seeing you. You, you let him go. Yes, he convinced me that I should for now. There's nothing like a thirty-two in the pocket of a known thug for winning an argument. Did you uh, say there was another fellow with him? Uh, yes. Uh, run off when he heard you coming. It was the same fellow tried to buy my car yesterday. Someone tried to buy this <laughs> this car? Oh, sure. This fellow tried to buy it. And there was a woman made an offer, too. Did you mean you actually refused? I ain't selling until I find out why they want to buy it so bad. This fellow who tried to buy the car, do you know his name? No, he he looked like a gentleman until... Until you found him consorting with felonous intent with our just-departed friend, eh? <laughs> Tell me, was he uh, well-dressed, an annoying little mustache placed just over the sneer he wears for a mouth? Well, well yes. Say, how did you... <laughs> That's easy. Our friend Mac does piecework for him. Fancy Dan Turner is his current alias. And But I see you don't keep up with such things. You're going to tell the police? Later, perhaps, when there's something to tell them. Right now, I've got a great thirst that needs quenching. A thirst for knowledge. Huh? Yeah, what's your name and where do you live? Uh, Collins. Uh, 302 East 8th Street. Mm-hmm. Now, put your car in cold storage, old time, and take care of yourself. Something tells me this is Rat's Night Out. Hmm. Hello, Smitty. Back making book, I see. You got the wrong joint, Saint. Take a look around. I run a pool room. You interested in a horse? No, no, a man. Well, like I said, Saint, you got the wrong joint. His name's Mac. He hangs out here. Now, where is he? In the back room? I'm the three monkeys, Saint. Deep, dumb, and blind. The only Mac I know is a truck. Oh, then if you don't mind, I'd like to look in your back room and see if he's parked there. I mind. But you won't even know, Smitty. You're deep, dumb, and blind. Oh, have a heart, Saint. I ain't got no back room. And besides, last time you dropped in my place, a, a lot of my customers started patronizing elsewhere. Including you, Smitty, remember? I've only been back from the gray place a week, and I ain't forgetting it. Oh, come on, Saint. Be a good guy. Beat it, huh? No, no, Smitty. Let him stay a while. Hello, Mac. I was hoping you were smart enough to go home and get some sleep. How could I sleep with you out roaming the streets, Mac? You know how I worry. Yeah, yeah. Too much. What does he want, Smitty? You. Why, Saint? I want to talk with fancy Dan Turner. What about... Now, let's not be coy, Mac. It doesn't become you. I want to ask Turner why he's trying to steal a jalopy from an old man. Well, what do you know? I got a surprise for you, Saint. I'll take it to him. The boys say you're looking for me, Saint. Mm, The boys are right. So you found me. So? I understand you're interested in a certain old car. So what? Probably the smiling Irishman is, too. A broken-down 1929 sedan seems a little slow for a fast man like you, Fancy Dan. Well, maybe I like to go slow enough to read the billboards when I drive. What's it to you, Saint? It depends on what it is to you, Turner. What's on the fire? You are. 
There's a handle with care sign on this deal, and I don't want just anybody cutting in. You're a fowler upper. You've been stepping high and fancy free too long, Turner. You're beginning to irritate me. The feelings likewise, Saint. Only I got more than fingers in my fist and you haven't. Hmm, that's a nice gun you're so bravely wearing, Turner. It must be a pretty big part to change a small-time con artist like you into a fire-breathing gunman. Big potatoes, huh? Yeah, plenty big, Saint. So big I wouldn't hesitate to shoot at the slightest move. Am I clear? You couldn't be clearer if you were a day ordered by the Chamber of Commerce. Good. Now, it ain't a palace, Saint. It's just the back room of a pool parlor, but please stay and be my guest. Oh, very well, for a little while anyway. Where are the boys? Out. And they're wasting their time. Collins won't sell his old wreck. Some old men are stubborn. And Collins seems like a hard man to intimidate. Well, that all depends on who's doing the intimidating, Saint. Now, Max a chowderhead, and Smitty's even worse, but put the two boys together and you'll get a job of work done. Dan, I've adopted old man Collins as a friend. Ah, oh, how big are you? Yes. And you know how I feel about people who push other people around, Turner? Especially when the guy getting the shoving is a friend. You know, if I had a glass of beer, I'd cry into it. Sit back and relax, Saint. The boys will be back with what they want after soon enough, and maybe then I'll let you go home. You mean they're coming back with a car? Well, maybe not the whole car. Sit back and relax. Hey, relax. Hey, 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 what are you doing? Sitting back with my chair to the wall, Turner. You want me to relax, don't you? Yeah, I... Hey, let go of that cue stick. <laughs> as my old grandmother used to say, Turner, there's nothing as relaxing as a game of pool. <laughs> Particularly with a hoodlum's head as the cue ball. <laughs> Collins, Collins, open up. You, uh, you wouldn't be from the police now, would you? No, no, I'm no more a policeman than you are, old man Collins. <laughs> Come in and be welcome, Dad. Oh. Where's Collins? The old man, he's here. Where? Behind the sofa. But if you're of a mind to look at him, make us a quick look. Dead? Very. How? Every way. Beaten, stabbed, and tortured. Maybe even shot, for all I know. Yes, and for all I know, maybe you've got a gun with an empty chamber, for all I know. Bless me, no. Me business doesn't allow it. <laughs> Just what sort of business are you in, Irish? The name's O'Brien. Ah. When a job is pulled and the police go after the boys who pull it, I make an end run and go after the swag. Or at least part of it. Oh, I see. Uh, what's the swag here? Collins' wallet? Not unless there's 400 grand in it. 400? Oh, no, I'm afraid you'll find the old man a few cents short. Who killed him? Not I. How do I know? You don't. You're right. What brought you here? Why, I'm here about the old car, of course. You want to buy it? Certainly, don't you? Say, maybe you're not being cute. Maybe you really don't know about the... About what? Well, now, <laughs> I'm greatly relieved. When I first saw you come through that door, I said to myself, O'Brien, oh, here comes some more competition. But I see you're not. I'm relieved, laddie. <laughs> Greatly relieved. Turner is competition enough, eh? Yes, but Turner and his ugly ducklings are nothing compared to... Who? In time. I got here just a minute before you, laddie. The old man was dead when I arrived. Beyond that, I know nothing. Get down. O'Brien! Oh, O'Brien! Oh, Competition. Getting worse. All the time. Look, I'll call the doctor. No, no, no. Uh, thanks, laddie. Lay, lay off this frolic. He'll get you next. You're gonna die, mister. You're gonna... O'Brien. Oh, O'Brien, oh, the old man's car. What... Well, I guess I'll have to try another angle. This one's pretty dead. I 
awaken Mr. Ritchie as you requested, Mr. Templer. He'll be right down. Oh, thank you. I hope the fire isn't too serious, sir. Well, it's serious enough to awaken Mr. Ritchie. Oh, oh, here he is now, sir. Well, well, which plant is the fire in? Who's responsible? How big is the damage? Oh, the fire isn't in any plant, Mr. Ritchie. What's that? Then, then, then where... It's where, inside uh, of me. I'm burning up and I need your help. How dare you sneak your way in here at three o'clock in the morning by telling me there's a fire? Look here, who are you? Simon Templer. Oh, oh yes, the saint. Hmm. I've heard of you. If you have business with me, Mr. Templer, I suggest you phone my secretary for an appointment. Meanwhile, there's no subject on earth can keep me from going back to bed. Not even the subject of $400,000, Mr. Ritchie? What do you know about it? Nothing other than that it was stolen from you, Mr. Ritchie. That happened seven years ago. The criminal, John Quayley, was caught, tried, and convicted. Now, if you'll pardon but me... Quayley I... worked for you, I believe. He was my head accountant. And the money was never found? No. Quayley drew 20 years in the penitentiary. He never revealed where the money was hidden. Until the day he died. Died? Yes. Two weeks ago in prison. <laughs> and uh, now, Mr. Templer, if you don't mind, I need my rest. I won't detain you much longer, Mr. Ritchie. Just one or two more questions. Well? Uh, did Quayley have a wife? Yes, he did. If he knew he were dying in prison, it's quite possible he made an attempt to get word to her, to tell her where the money was hidden. He may have made the attempt, but he couldn't possibly have succeeded. He was too closely watched. Oh. After all, $400,000 is a lot of money. A lot of money. Yes, you could almost buy a second-hand car with it. If I hadn't been fully covered by insurance, my firm would have gone under in the face of a loss that large. And uh, now, Mr. Templer, if I might ask a question... Certainly. Why this sudden urgency, this three o'clock in the morning business? An old man was tortured to death. Then a fellow named O'Brien, who came calling on the old man, was shot to death. But, but, Before but, but... he was killed, O'Brien told me he was tracking down $400,000 that had been stolen. Oh, I see. Yeah, and some checking back over how many people have ever had that amount stolen from Led them. you to me? Yes. I wonder what I've led you to, Mr. Templer? I wonder, Mr. Ritchie. I wonder. <laughs> What is it? Mrs. Quayley? What do you want? Several things, Mrs. Quayley. Like what? A murderer. You've got the wrong apartment, mister. An old automobile. No sale. Anything else? Maybe you'll buy this, Mrs. Quayley. Collins was murdered a little while ago. Collins? Mm. Oh, the old man. Why? Someone wanted his car. Someone who evidently couldn't wait any longer for the newer models. So? So I saw Collins' car in your garage, Mrs. Quayley. Maybe you better come in after all, mister. But come in careful. Careful enough? Keep those hands high. Yeah. I don't like you, mister. You're nailing together a frame and you're trying to put my picture into it. Colin sold me that car. When? Tonight. I could have bought a Cadillac for cheaper, mister, but I wasn't in any position to haggle. Yes, I know. What do you know? That's what I want to find out. I know that Colin's car is a car is worth about $20, but if something else is worth in the neighborhood of $400,000. And you know that's an awfully nice neighborhood. Nice and exclusive. Chiselers aren't invited to move in. Mm, I've been gathering that impression all evening. Well, what if we're here? You name it. An acetylene torch, welder's mask, a few chisels, a hammer, steel wire. <laughs> Either you've gone to work for Henry Kaiser or the hand that customarily rocks the cradle is going in for rocking a safe. I had to go into a hardware store to make a phone call, and I just couldn't leave without buying a few things. How fortunate you didn't make your call in an establishment that sells steamrollers. Yeah, I see you have a set of license plates. You see too much. From Collins Jalopy, aren't they? These license plates. <laughs> so that's how Quayley smuggled out his message. You're getting awfully close to a bullet in your head, mister. Give me those plates. Shh, there's someone at the door. Stay where you are. I'll see what it is. Better not take the license plates with you. Yes? Oh! Mrs. Quayley! Oh! Mrs. The devil! The devil! He... He got the plane? Yes, yes, he got them. Don't let him. Oh, catch him there. Where? <coughs> Where? Where Johnny worked. Shaft. Top. Before six. Before... Ah. Mrs. Quayley. Uh, Collins, O'Brien, and now... Now I have three reasons for wanting to meet a certain party.
Taxi. Hey, hey, taxi, taxi. They uh, don't stop sometimes when it's so early in the morning, Saint, because they're on the way back to the garage. Well, what brings you out so early, Mac? Looking for a drunk to roll? Just looking for you, Saint, just looking for you. See here what I got in my hand? Oh, there goes that coy streak in you again, Mac. All right, so it's a gun. Well, what does it want me to do? Come, go, turn handsprings, quote Shelley, play the bassoon? You have to speak for it, Mac. Very funny. Look out, it shouldn't speak for itself, Saint. I and the gun, one you should get in that there car. Yeah, you have a most persuasive way of offering a fellow a lift, Mac. Yeah, yeah, a lift. Right now, it's a lift. Later on, it may grow into a ride. Hmm. Come on. Uh, where are we going, Mac? Back to our little gray home in the rear of the pool room, Saint. Fancy Dan Turner wants he should thank you for showing him a new trick. Oh, it really isn't necessary. He feels like it is, Saint. He feels like it is. He's got a couple of tricks he wants to show you. Sounds like fun. Oh, on into the car, Jim. Turner's waiting. He's got very little patience. Nice to have you back with us, Saint. I missed you. <laughs> From the looks of that bandage on your skull, Turner, I'll bet you wished I'd missed you. Not now, I don't, Saint. It's a nice feeling having you here, knowing that I owe you something. I pay my debts, Saint. I pay off. Yes, I know. O'Brien was paid off. So was Mrs. Qualey. Paid off with lead checks. They're dead? Oh, now save that innocent expression for the jury, Turner. You'll need everything you've got. Well... When were they killed, Saint? Okay, I'll stooge for you. They were killed an hour or two after I so abruptly left you before. Oh, well, I'll have to find another pigeon, Saint. My alibi's fat. How fat, Turner? City Hospital. Having remember the Saint embroidered where a cue stick hit me. And Smitty and Mac were there, too, to see me through it. Hospitals have records, Saint. We're clean. We're clean. Huh. Then you've got a competitor you don't know about, Turner. Yeah, looks that way. For a job that was supposed to be as simple as this one, I got too many competitors. I wonder how come. Who fingered the job for you, Turner? Who told you Quayley got word out to his wife about where the money was? I got nothing for you, Saint. Well, Smitty, wasn't it? Smitty just finished a stretch up the creek. My guess is he ran into Quayley, maybe shared a cell with him. No. It was in the jail hospital they met. Smitty worked there. Quayley was dying off his nut. Smitty made him talk. Yeah. And Smitty, not being mentally suited for solo work, spilled the pitch to you, Turner, for a price, of course, for money on the line. Yeah. Ten G's to buy in on a 400,000 job. But what are you driving at? What are you picking Smitty's bones for? I was just wondering, Turner, how much O'Brien paid Smitty for his slice of this exclusive information and how much your other competitors shelled out. The one who happily goes around killing people. What do you mean? If you ask me, Turner, your pal Smitty is the sort of rat that even rats on rats. He sold Quayley's secret three times that we know of. Hey, thanks for handicapping it for me, Saint. Well, if you're really grateful, Turner, you can return the favor by telling me, uh, what time is it? It's, uh, 5.15 in the morning, Saint, but you ain't going nowhere. I have a date to keep before six, Turner, with your competitor. Yeah, Saint, that's what you think. Maybe not, Turner. What do you say we play a little pool while we're waiting for the boys? Get away from that pool table. I ain't playing any games with you, Saint. Well, maybe pool was the wrong game. How about a game of pitch and catch? What? Yeah, I pitch like this. Ow! And you catch it like that. Hate to leave you all by yourself there in the side pocket, but like I said, I have a date to keep. Well, Mr. Ritchie, huh? get enough sleep despite my interruption? <laughs> I wasn't really asleep when you called on me, Mr. Templer. I know, Mr. Ritchie. Your hair was a little too carefully combed for a man who's been suddenly awakened and told he's having a fire. You're very clever, Mr. Templer. But not clever enough to catch you before you committed three murders. So you're Smitty's silent partner, huh? <laughs> see what low company's gotten you into, Ritchie? Yes, I see. $400,000 buried in the siding of this elevator shaft. And with the help of this acetylene torch, it'll be all mine. A very ingenious fellow, Quayley. And to think the money never left this building. Hmm. The place where Johnny worked. 
Yes, he was ingenious. It was very smart of him to use his prison job making automobile license plates as a means of smuggling out the information to his wife. How did he do it, Richie? Very simple, Templar. There's an extra piece of thin metal in this particular plate, forming a sort of pocket. And inside the pocket, a note on cigarette paper telling poor Mrs. Qualley how to get the money. Of course, once he managed to tell her the number of the license plate, well, the rest was easy, wasn't it? Yes. All poor Mrs. Qualey had to do was ask the motor vehicle bureau to whom the plate was assigned. Mr. Collins, in this instance. Poor old fellow. Uh, Mr. Templer, would you mind joining me here in the shaft, please? Hmm? Yes, right on top of the elevator. I'd like to keep an eye on you while I finish burning out this metal partition. You see, I've only until six o'clock when this elevator is switched on downstairs. Oh, well, I... I... Come, come, in the shaft, please. Well, really, I, I... I have a gun, Mr. Templer. Oh, well, that makes it official, then. There we are. Careful, Mr. Templer. I wouldn't want anything to happen to you. Anything accidental, that is. You know, it's funny. I've known you such a short time, and I have exactly the same sentiments towards you. I've never been astride the top of an elevator before, Richie. And we're right near the top of the shaft. Yes. (laughs) I don't mean to worry you, Templer. But when this elevator power turns on in a few minutes, it will rise to the top before it descends. How is your treasure hunt coming, Richie? Almost finished. One last strip of metal to cut away and the partition will come off. Then we'll decide your fate, Mr. Templar. Your future. Here goes. A last blow. Ah, it's there. It's there. I see it. $400,000 in currency, Templar. Think of it. Think of what it. You think of it, Richie, and also think of how much blood was spilled on it. Preaching, Templar? You? I never thought... The elevator, Richie. Maybe it came to work a little early today. My, my money! My money! Come on, Richie. Come on, get off. No, no, there's still some money left here. I want it. I want it all. All! Come on, we've got to get off. Jump, Richie, jump. No, no, my money! I must save the money! Richie, you fool! All right, I got it! I... Ah! Yes, Richie. You saved your money, and you saved the state some money, too. I'm sure you didn't plan on saving the cost of your execution. You have been listening to another adventure of The Saint, the Robin Hood of modern crime. And now, here is our star, Vincent Price. These immortal words of Ovid, translated from the Latin, express quite well indeed the justice of our Mr. Ritchie's fate. Nor is there any juster law than that the contrivers of death should perish by their own contrivances. This is Vincent Price inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another exciting adventure of The Saint. Good night. Tonight's script of The Saint was written by Michael Cramoy. Our cast included Laureen Tuttle, Barney Phillips, Tony Barrett, Fred Howard, and Dan O'Herlihy. The music was composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. The Saint is a James L. Safier production and was transcribed and directed by Thomas A. McAvity. All you Saint fans will be glad to know that The Saint comic books are on sale at all newsstands. Your announcer, Merrill Ross. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, murder will shout. I 
am the Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Murder is born in many places, most of them quite ordinary. Sometimes it's born in a smoke-filled hotel room, sometimes around a nightclub table, but more often it begins in a small secret place, because murder is a secret thing at first. Take, for example, a small unobserved telephone booth in the back of a chain drugstore, the one in which a small-time racketeer, Peanut Marola, is talking. Well, Peanut Marola speaking. Yeah, yeah, I got all the dope. It shouldn't be a tough proposition to swing. The garage is out in the suburbs, in the Oakdale district, where the houses are far apart and everybody minds his own business. Nice place to work. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, this guy who owns the place, George Kramer, is single and lives by himself out in a little house on 71st Street. Yesterday, I counted only three cars that stopped in. That ain't enough to buy him a good breakfast. What? Well, the place is plenty big, but empty. Hey, here's an interesting angle I got on it. Seems that some small fry businessman named Albion, if I got the jerk's name right, has got some kind of a mortgage on the place. It might give us some trouble. Huh? Yeah, I'll get busy on it. Now, I'll call you when I got something definite. Don't worry. It'll be easy picking. <laughs> Yes, that's the way murder is born. In an ordinary way. Nothing unusual about it. A small-time racketeer makes a phone call to talk over a business deal. And that's the beginning. Maybe if George Kramer had known, things might have been different. But he didn't. In his little garage in the Oakdale section, he was sound asleep, slumped in his office chair. Kramer! Uh, Kramer, wake up! Uh, what's that? Oh, oh, Mr. Albion. You were asleep. Asleep in the middle of the day. How do you expect to make any money like that? Well, Mr. Albion, I was up half the night last night doing a hurry-up ring job on an Oldsmobile. You never saw an Oldsmobile last night. And the last ring job you did was probably six months ago. Probably out carousing around last night. Ah, uh, you know I don't go out nights, Mr. Albion. Well, I'm... anyway, you haven't got a single car in your garage to work on, and you fall asleep in the middle of the day because you're tired. <laughs> Why don't you go out and stir up some business? Now, look here, Mr. Albion. You stick to your business, and I'll stick to mine. Right now, this things This happens are... to be my business. I'm trying to tell you that things are tough in the garage business these days. Look... You know I'm having a tough time of it. Why do you come in here every day and burn my ear? Can't you leave me alone? I'll leave you alone for the next week. But let me give it to you in black and white. I've loaned you in various amounts a total of $2,000, which is more than I've come to think this place is worth. You agreed to pay it back. With interest. Of course. One week from today, you owe me $2,000. But I thought you were going to carry it along until I got back on my feet. I've been waiting six months for you to get back on your feet, and you show no signs of ever making it. I'll, I'll, I'll pay the interest. I'll pay it faithfully. Haven't I always paid it? What good is the interest if I lose the principal? Oh, you you won't lose it. Honest, Mr. Albion, I promise you, you won't lose it. Well, I think I've already lost it, unless I can do something with this garage myself. Well, I have to be going along now. I have business to do. I'll see you in a week, Kramer. Wait a minute. You... You wouldn't take the garage away from me. Wouldn't I? Well, you, you've got a lot of money. You, you don't need it. That's beside the point. A debt is a debt. Yeah, but what, what would you do with the garage if you had it? I'd sell it to someone who could run it profitably. Oh, you wouldn't. I'll be back in a week. Have some money for me. Mr. Albion. Yes? I... I could kill you. With the prologue of tonight's story, Murder Will Shout, the Signal Oil Company brings you another of the strange tales of the Whistler. But first, I know you Whistler fans will be interested to hear of the growing popularity of this program. The Whistler is now tops on the coast. 
The latest program popularity survey of all radio programs shows no other single Pacific Coast program has more listeners than The Whistler. Yes, people do know a good thing when they see it and when they hear it, too. And that goes for gasoline and auto lubrication, too. For 14 years, so many drivers have been switching to Signal products that today, Signal dealers serve six western states from Canada to Mexico. But what's of most importance to you is the reason for this swing to Signal. What the Signal products and Signal dealers have that accounts for this growing popularity? Well, throughout 14 years, the name Signal has stood for the absolute top quality in gasoline and auto lubricants. Even now, with certain ingredients reserved for war, Signal's famous Go Farther gasoline is still the finest gasoline that can be made today with the emphasis still on mileage. And experienced Signal dealers, being in business for themselves, have a real reason for giving your car more thorough, more conscientious service that will keep you their satisfied customer. There you have it. Two genuine reasons why signal service cars do go farther. Two reasons why when today's cars must last out the duration, your neighborhood signal dealer is a man you should know, too. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, murder gets its start in simple and ordinary ways. For instance, there's murder in the heart of George Kramer, and once the thought occurs, the next step is easy, if the opportunity presents itself. And in this case, it does very soon, and in the person of Peanut Marola. You George Kramer? Yeah, that's right. Something wrong with your car I can fix? Not exactly. Got a couple of minutes? Time is all I've got. Good. Mind if I sit down? Well, what do you want? I want to talk over some business. Oh, well then, sit down. Sit down, by all means. Thanks. Things kind of tough in the garage business these days? Oh, they're not what they used to be. But I managed to get along. But not in the way you used to get along, eh? Uh, not exactly. Look, uh, what are you getting at? Can you use a little ready cash, no references, co-signers, very little collateral? <laughs> Who couldn't on those arrangements? My name is Marola, Peanut Marola. Oh, I'm glad to meet you. Now, where does this ready cash come in? You sound like a smart man, Kramer. Mind if I talk turkey? Oh, go ahead. I can't lose anything listening. Has Mr. Albion been bothering you lately? Uh How'd you know about him? Well, I kind of looked into things and found out that Albion holds some kind of a mortgage on this place. Is that right? That's right. How much? $2,000. That's a nice little sum. Keeps you awake nights, doesn't it? <laughs> awake at night and asleep in the daytime. Well, if you want to let me, I can fix it so you can sleep at night and spend your days buying expensive clothes. Hmm. What sort of a proposition is it? Ever hear the black market? You mean where you buy meat without giving any ration points? No, the black market in automobiles. Well, I didn't know there was one. Well, there is, and it's big time, and there's big money in it. Well, where do I fit in? Now, look, pal, you have a nice big garage in a quiet neighborhood where nobody bothers you. We get the cars any way we can, and then we sell them for anything we can get. And it's always a lot. We need some place to keep them until they're sold. You just want to store them here? Sure, it's a cinch. A guy drives into your garage with a car and asks you to fix it up, see? When it's ready, the same guy calls for it again. Looks like a legitimate business. Nobody knows that anything out of the ordinary is happening. Well, how much fixing up is there to do? Eh, not much. You change a few numbers, switch a couple of wheels, and maybe splash a little paint on now and then. What about the police? Nothing to worry about, pal. When they get suspicious, we just move to another garage. But while we work here, there's plenty in it for you. How much? A hundred on a car. Good enough? Sounds too good to be true. Well, is it a deal? It's a deal if you advance me $2,000 to pay off Albion with. This is strictly a cash and carry business, chum. We don't advance nobody nothing. Well, then it's no go. In a week, Albion will have this garage and you won't be able to use it. Yeah? Getting tough on you, eh? Hmm. Yeah, we wouldn't want our plans upset, now, would we, pal? 
There's a cheaper way of paying off the debt than by me giving you the money. Yeah? How? Simple. Maybe Mr. Albion just disappears someday. You mean... Yeah, sure. Oh, oh no, no. I, I, I couldn't do that. No? Maybe you won't have to. Maybe we'll do it for you. You'll... You'll do it for me? Sure. In my business, there's nothing to it. Then all your problems would be solved. Well, I, I don't know. But, well, if I said okay, what would we do first? Well, the first thing you do is, just so that we can sort of pass the buck back and forth in a nice way, you understand, in case somebody starts poking his nose into our business, we've got to have at least two partners in this garage. What do you mean? Well, what I mean is this. You gotta make me a 50-50 partner in this business establishment. You mean you want me to sign over half of this garage to you? That's the idea. Oh, now wait, wait a minute. I'm not getting into anything that's gonna end up with me losing this garage, no, sir. All I wanna do is make some money and in a hurry. Now, if that's what you're in... Slow down, Kramer. Don't get all excited. Nobody's trying to cut you out of your garage. In this business, the more partners you have, the better it is. I'm not gonna move in permanently. As soon as the racket wears thin, we... Dissolve the partnership and the garage goes back to you. Oh, oh, well, in that case, everything's all right. I'll, I'll make any sort of an arrangement you want. <laughs> I thought you would. Well, I'm going to skip downtown and get in touch with a mouthpiece who will draw up the papers. I'll bring them back this afternoon for you to sign. See you later. Marola. Just a minute. Yeah? Aren't you, uh, forgetting something? Forgetting what? Mr. Albion. <laughs> well, what do you know? I almost forgot about Mr. Albion. Well, don't you worry, pal. We'll take care of him in due time. Uh, look, I, I know you know your business, but I know Mr. Albion. I've uh, been doing some thinking. Uh, I've got an idea. Yeah? Okay, spill it. Well... This guy, Albion, has a lot of money, but just the same, he's too tight to buy a car of his own, so he always rides the bus everywhere he goes. Now, the end of the Oakdale line doesn't quite reach his house, and he has to walk a half mile along the highway from the end of the line in order to get home. You can't bump a guy in broad daylight on the highway. Oh, you, you don't have to. Every Saturday night, he always stays in town and takes the last bus home at 2 o'clock. At two o'clock in the morning, that halfway, half mile of highway he walks is, uh, deserted. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. Quite a setup. All we do is run over him and make it look like a hit and run case. The easiest thing in the world. But an automobile leaves a lot of clues behind. Who's worrying about clues? We just pick some car up off the street, use it, and then abandon it somewhere. Let some other sucker worry about taking the rap. Well, I, I, I don't want to know too much about it. You just go ahead and handle it in your own way. Wait a minute. Today's Saturday. Yeah. Mr. Albion takes the bus tonight. Okay. Don't worry about a thing, pal. I'll take care of all the little business details. It'll be a sin. You heard what the man said, Kramer. He said it's a sin. He ought to know because he's an old hand at this business of getting inconvenient people conveniently out of the way. It's an art the way Peanut Marola does it. The art of murder. Yes, and since it's going to mean so much to you, you should be here to see it. Those two cars parked at the side of the road, waiting for the bus to stop, drop its lone passenger, turn around and head back for town. And when it does, there's a quick flicker of light, and the first car, driven by a friend of Marola's, starts down the road. His headlights pick up Mr. Albion walking along the right side of the pavement. Then, Marola in the second car, the stolen car, starts. Walking along the highway, Albion hears the first one come up and pass him. The noise of the first one hasn't died down before Marola roars in. The rapid succession of sounds confuses Albion just enough. He doesn't step off the road quite fast enough. And except for a slight bump, there's nothing to it. I'm looking for 
George Kramer. I'm George Kramer. My identification, Lieutenant Clark, headquarters precinct. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. You hear about my car. Yes, yes, the car. That's right. You reported it stolen. Yes. Last night, I left it parked in front of my house like I always do. I don't have a garage on my property yet. And when I came out to drive to work this morning, it was gone. It was a green Chrysler sedan. License uh, 6G4537? Yes, that's right. I just finished putting on that paint job two days ago. Yeah, had it in the shop a week, fixing it up. I reported the theft as soon as I could hitch a ride over here and telephone. Yeah, I uh, came right out when we got the report. Funny, we were just checking up on the ownership of your car when you called. You you mean you found it already? Yeah, yeah, we found it even before you reported it. Uh, do you ever drive out around uh, Miller Highway, Mr. Kramer? Mill... Miller Highway? Why, no, no, I haven't been out that way for months. You uh, weren't driving out there last night around two. Why, oh, no, no, of course not. I, I was in bed and my, my, my car was stolen. Yeah, sure, sure, well. Well, you may be telling me the truth, Mr. Kramer, and maybe you're trying to be pretty smart. I don't know which, but uh, either way, I think you'd better come down to the station with me. Get your hat and lock up the place. Oh, but wait, wait a minute. You mean you're arresting me? Well, let's say we're going to hold you for questioning. But why? For what? For hit and run. Maybe you can explain to the boys down there how your car happened to be found parked 300 yards from where a guy was run over and killed. And the front of it was covered with bloodstains. <laughs> Well, George Kramer, that's what happens sometimes when you think about murder. It doesn't uh, come out just the way you expected it. You don't know what this is all about yet, but you do know that there's only one person who can explain it to you. So when you get to the police station and after they've booked you and taken you to your cell, you ask him to call Peanut Marola, and pretty soon he comes. Five minutes, Marola. Okay, I won't stay long. Hiya, Kramer. Marola, what is this? They've got me in here for manslaughter. My car was the one you used to run down Albion. Shut up, you fool. Well, I want somebody to hear you. Well, before I'll take the blame for this, I'll make sure somebody hears me. I'll tell them you were driving that car, not me. Listen, small fry. What do you want to go flying off the handle for? More than one way to beat the record. But you used my automobile. Why? It was an accident. One of those things that happens once in a century. It's doing just like I told you it was going to do. I came out to your end of town and stole the first car I found on that dark street. How was I to know you lived on that street and it was your car I was taking? Good Lord, you expect me to believe that? Look, all you gotta do is tell them that you weren't driving your car last night and get an alibi. Tell them you were someplace else. That's what I told them, told them that I was home. But they don't believe me and I got no proof. Okay, look, tell them you were mistaken about the time. Tell him you spent the night until 2 o'clock at the Lido nightclub down on Foster and Green Street. You get a dozen people to swear that both of us were there until 2. You tell him I drove you home in my car. Well, is, is that any good? They can't do a thing to you. They got to prove you were driving that car. They won't be able to break an alibi like that. Got it straight now? Yeah, I, I was at the Lido nightclub until 2 with you and some friends. You, you back me up now. Sure, I'll back you up. You got nothing to worry about, pal. That's right, Kramer. You don't have a thing to worry about. That is, unless spending the rest of your life in prison worries you. Amateurs like you shouldn't get mixed up in murder, George. But of course... Your friend Marola, your good friend Marola, has everything figured out. Marola's an old hand at this business, and he doesn't seem to be excited, so don't you worry about a thing. Hello? See that Marola speaking? Yeah, I'm at the Hall of Justice. We're just up to the jail talking with him. Listen to this. He believes that I took his car by mistake. <laughs> How can you lose when you work with characters like that? Huh? Let him talk all he wants to. What can he do to us? 
I got an alibi that he couldn't break if he talked a year. Besides, the cops have an open and shut case against him. I'll give him about two days to clear it up. Then we'll have the garage to ourselves and it'll be easy sailing. Huh? Yeah, he signed the papers all right yesterday. Yeah. Everything's great. <laughs> That's not all of tonight's story. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's tale. Meantime, a question. Have you forgotten anything lately? Just anything? Well, of course, we all forget occasionally. And suppose you had 32 different things to remember, like the service station operator who lubricates the average modern car. It'd be mighty easy to forget one of those parts, wouldn't it? And you know what that'd mean. Going without lubrication might wear out some vital part some part you can't replace today. That's why signal gasoline dealers don't trust to memory when they lubricate your car. Instead, they use the famous signal check chart on which the maker of your car lists each part and the exact lubricant it should have. And your dealer isn't satisfied with checking each part against the chart just once. No, sir. He checks each part twice. So not a single part can be overlooked and go without lubricant. And when I say lubricant... I mean the nine specialized lubricants that signal dealers use to assure all parts the long, trouble-free life the maker of your car built into them. It's just another example of signal gasoline dealers' more conscientious service to help your car go farther. Another reason why a good man for you to know today is your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the whistler. <laughs> Well, George Kramer, now you know what murder is like. How it starts as a fleeting, almost meaningless wish in your mind and builds into a noose around your neck. You're in jail charged with manslaughter. And Marola, the man who actually did the killing, who double-crossed you with a frame-up, is going scot-free. Or is he? Everything's great, he said a minute ago to someone on that telephone. But now, as he hangs up and steps out of the phone booth... Well, what do you know? Peanut Marola. Huh? Oh. oh, nice to see you once in a while when you're not in trouble, if that's possible. Yeah, Lieutenant Clark, you ought to quit the police force and go on the stage. You're so funny. So long. Uh, wait a minute, Marola. Yeah? Aren't you being a little unsociable? Step across the hall here to my office where we can talk. Come on. I got nothing to talk to you about. Sit down. I think you have. For instance, you know a guy named George Kramer? Sure, I know him. He's my partner in the garage business. Oh, that's sort of a new one for you, isn't it, Marola? Maybe, and maybe I like it. Yeah, maybe. You were just in talking to Kramer, weren't you? Sure, naturally. My partner gets in trouble. Naturally, I'm going to see him, see what I can do. You, uh, they get anything to do? Seems like there's not much I can do. He got out of line. You caught him. Looks like an open and shut case. What can I do? Uh, I was wondering if you'd say that. Yeah? What else would I say? Knowing you, nothing. I just wanted to be sure this was the way I figured it. What do you mean, the way you figured it? How else could you figure it? You got the guy red-handed. I think maybe we have. You say you went into partnership with Kramer in his garage? Yeah, sure. He needed some dough, so I bought in. I figured it might be a good investment. I'm sure you must have. Hmm. But didn't you know that Kramer already owed another investor some money? Sure, I heard about it. But that was Kramer's own personal affair. It had nothing to do with our deal. Uh Uh-huh. After you talked to Kramer, one of my boys went in to see him. He's changed his story about where he was last night. Says he was with you down at the Lido nightclub until two. Then you drove him home. He says that? He's nuts. You know the Lido's been closed for two weeks. Hold it up because of the curfew. And I didn't see Kramer last night. I can prove where I was. Sure, sure. I'm certain you can. You always were good at alibis. Hey, listen, Clark. Take it easy. Just a couple of questions more. One, did you ever drive Kramer's car? Why? Suppose I did. Oh, nothing. I just wanted to check. 
You see, we found some fingerprints on the steering wheel that weren't Kramer's. I just thought they might be yours. Oh, uh, I... Yeah, as a matter of fact, they might be. I, I did drive it once. When? Oh, about a week ago. Think again. Kramer's car was in the shop being fixed. Up until two days ago. Uh, yeah, I... I guess it must have been later, uh, a couple of days ago. Yeah, it must have been. Lieutenant Clark. Yeah? Okay, thanks. Well, it's nice you told me about driving the car, Marola. That was the file room. Those were your fingerprints. When I heard you talk to Kramer, I had him pull your prints and check. Okay, so they were my prints. I just... But you got nothing on me. I just said... Okay, so I'm getting sick of this. I told you what connection I got with Kramer. It's strictly business. My partner, see? But I got nothing to do with him going out and bumping off a guy he owes money to. So I'm through answering questions, you get me? Now, wait a minute. Just one more. Answer this one, Marola, if you can. How did you know Mr. Albion, the guy Kramer owed money to, was the one that was killed? I, uh, I read in the paper. The only paper that carried the story was the Morning Herald. Here, read what it says. The hit and run driver early this morning. Hit and killed. Go on, read it. Uh, an unidentified man. On... Yes, Marola. Until 20 minutes ago, even I didn't know who he was. So how could you have? Unless you had something to do with it. Listen, Clark. I, I tell you, I didn't. Kramer, Kramer told me who it was. Yes. Well, maybe Kramer will tell us a lot more when he hears how you've been trying to frame him. This is one time, Marola, when you depended too much on an alibi. You forgot too many other things, important things, like the fingerprints on the steering wheel. You forgot to find out that it would have been next to him too impossible for George Kramer to have driven that car last night. You see, he has a very advanced case of night blindness. Rare, but very real. And it prevents him from driving after dark. Now, with his help, our case against you won't be hard to prove. The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The curious story of Checkmate for Murder. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with story by John Hayes, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking and suggesting you let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, instead of joining the doctor at his home, we're all meeting here at Camp Roberts in California, where the doctor's going to tell his story before a large audience of G.I.s, and as usual, I'm going to tell my story right now. It's about Petri California Sherry. And I want you to know that Petri Sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. Before you sit down to dinner some evening soon... Just pour yourself a glass of Petri Sherry. Look at that rich, dark, amber color. Just smell the fragrance of those wonderful grapes. And then taste that Petri Sherry. Mm, is that ever good? And say, if you like your sherry on the dry side, you know, not sweet, 
Then just wait till you taste Petri Pale Dry Sherry. If some of the family like regular sherry and some like pale dry, don't buy one, buy two. You can't go wrong so long as you buy Petri. P-E-T-R-I. Petri Sherry. He seems a little bigger than usual this week. Yes, my boy. I felt that as tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was rather an exciting one, the men here at Camp Roberts might like me to, to tell it to them in first. I'm sure they will, Doctor. Which particular story have you selected? One that I call the strange case of the murder in wax. It concerns one of the most sinister mass murderers who ever threatened the peace of London. It's in the summer of 19... Nasty murders on Hampstead Heath. Hampstead Heath? Yes, Hampstead Heath. That's a large rambling park in the suburbs of London, Mr. Bartell, and noted as a rendezvous for young lovers. It was here that the elusive murderer, knife in hand, was wont to roam at night time, searching for his prey. All of his victims were young girls, and despite the frantic efforts of the police, each murder seemed to be as baffling as the one that preceded. Finally, of course, as usual, Scotland Yard came to Sherlock Holmes for help. It seems almost like yesterday, Mr. Bartell, and Inspector Lestrade stood in our Baker Street rooms, imploring Holmes to handle the case. Mr. Holmes, you've got to help us. I don't mind telling you the yard's at the end of its rope. I sympathize with you, Lestrade, but I don't see the rule. Only the police can handle the widespread detailed work necessary to this case. The private detective is helpless. Yes, perhaps if you'd come to Mr. Holmes in the first place, Lestrade, he might have helped you. But the murderer hasn't finished yet. There'll be more killings if we don't catch him, you mark my words. Mr. Holmes, please help us, won't you? Before I commit myself to start, give me the exact chronology of events, will you? All my information on the uh, murders has been derived from the London newspapers, notoriously inaccurate in matters of fact. I can give you all the particulars, sir. I've been on the case right from the beginning. All the murders have taken place on Hampstead Heath at night time, and all the victims have been young women. Who was the first one? A girl by the name of Oakley, a Bessie Oakley. She was a shop girl who worked at Derry and Tom's in Kensington High Street. Three weeks ago, the moonlight night that night, as they sat there out on the Come on, Bessie, give us a kiss. <laughs> oh, go on, Fred. Don't be so soppy. I ain't soppy. Come on, Bess. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello. Who's this coming towards us? Blooming prowler. Here, you, what you want? Can't you say something? Look how Bessie's got a knife. No, you don't. Uh, you devil, you, you, you hit my friend. Keep away from me. Keep away from me, you. And that's all I know, Rob. I never got a good look at him. He caught me on the head, and when I come to, there was... Ed. All right, Sergeant. You can book him on suspicion of murder. <laughs> We shouldn't be walking on the heath. Didn't you read about the murder here two days ago? It's a fine thing. I, I take you out in the moonlight and you talk of murders. Let's talk about our spilet, darling. It seems to me we should talk about your wife. My wife doesn't mean anything to me anymore. Violet, if I could get a divorce, I... There's someone behind that tree. He's coming towards us. Who are you, sir? And what do you... No, you don't. I... Oh. Don't come near me. Don't. <laughs> Inspector Lestrade, she's, she's dead, poor girl, I know, but a scandal can't bring her back. If there's any way to keep my name out of the papers, I... Yeah, I'm afraid you'll have to take your chances, Sir George. Oh, and Sergeant... Yes, Inspector? Yeah, you can turn that boy loose, Weave, Elle, for questioning. The man who did this is obviously the same killer. I'm afraid we're going to hear a lot more from him. Light edition, evening paper. Hempstead Heath murder is struck for fifth time. Nine girls murdered on Hempstead Heath. Light edition, evening paper here. Never walk in by yourself on the Heath. It ain't safe. Oh, thank you, Constable, but, but I'm not frightened. I want to be by myself. And I want to think. Well, I can't stop you by law, I suppose, but you shouldn't do it. Yeah. I don't know how to handle these modern young things, and that's a fact. Inspector Lestrade, he must have killed her the moment she got out of my sight. I searched the old ruddy heath, but I couldn't find the murderer. But I did startle him. He left his knife in the body. Good, Jackson. Uh, the body's uh, not been identified yet, eh? No, Inspector. Uh, 
Uh, we'll print her photograph in all the papers. We've got to find out who she is. Mr. Bishop, is the, this the uh, body of your missing daughter? Yes, it's Rousey. Lay my hands on that murdering fiend. I'll kill him. I'll kill him with my bare hand. Here's the story, Mr. Holmes. Rose Bishop was the tenth and last girl murdered. But she was the first girl murdered when she was alone, eh, Lestrade? Yes, sir. You found no clues? Well, none that proved anything when we checked on them. Let me ask you a question or two, Lestrade. Well, anything you like, sir. You've taken the obvious precautions, of course. Oh, how do you mean, You posted a heavy police guard on the heath? Well, yes, sir. We've had a hundred plain men walking there at night ever since the second murder. But he, he seems to slip through our fingers. I suppose you've also posted policemen dressed in women's clothes. Yes, Miss Rose. And we've hired girls to walk the heath in couples with our plain clothesmen. But the murderer it won't seem to rise to our bait. Oh, he's a cunning brute. Yes, yes, Watson. Obviously a morbid madman obsessed by a hatred of love. You'll be hard to catch. Mr. Stroud, you mentioned clues that amounted to nothing when you checked them. What were these clues? Well, uh, footprints, a couple of cigarette butts dropped at the scene of the crime. Nothing that helped us. The of Rose Bishop, uh, uh, the uh, last girl murdered. Because the experts at the yard examined it. Yes, sir. Didn't tell us a thing, though. You have the knife with you? <laughs> Here it is, Mr. Holmes. I knew you wouldn't trust us. <laughs> You'd want to look at it yourself. Thank you, Lestrade. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. What is it, Holmes? Huh? This knife is a collector's item. It's at least a hundred years old, I should say. May I keep this overnight, Lestrade? I should like to conduct a few experiments of my own. Why, of course you can, sir. Then you're going to take on the case, Holmes? Now, let us say that I'll take it under advisement. I'll do my best, Lestrade. I'll do my best. Well, thank you, sir. If any further developments occur at once, will you? Yes, sir. In the meanwhile, I'll smoke a few pipes on the problem. But I promise nothing, my dear fellow. I promise absolutely nothing. <laughs> Clock in the morning, Holmes. You're still peering through your microscope at that knife the straw. Yeah, that's you? true, old chap. That's quite true. I must be a very dull companion. Why don't you go to bed? Oh, because I'm afraid I, I may miss something. Confound it. Have you discovered anything? Yes, I think so. Oh, what? The handle of this knife is corrugated. On the underside, I observed a slight diffusion in the markings. Under the penetrating eye of the microscope, I found a minute deposit which had caused the diffusion. I have just analyzed that deposit. It's wax. Colored wax. Colored wax? Well, what does that signify? Oh, by itself, very little. But when you combine it with a knife that definitely belongs to another century, it does suggest a certain origin. I've got an idea. Perhaps it came from the theater. An 18th century dagger could belong in a period play. And the colored wax might easily be part of an act. Excellent deduction, Watson. Oh, thanks. <laughs> However, my own theory would be that this dagger came from a waxworks exhibition. Oh, wrong again. Putty is used in theatrical disguises, but I don't recall the use of colored wax. Whereas it is used in making wax and effigies, and of course the dagger would belong as part of the costume. Precisely, my dear fellow. It's a long chance, but uh, I think in the morning we'll have various London waxworks exhibitions. If my deduction is a false one, at least we'll have the pleasure of a busman's holiday. We can visit all our old friends who died on the gallows. <laughs> Exhibition that we've been to? The fourth and the last. We fail to find any clues here at the Vex Museum. We can return to Big Street. Oh, thank heaven. This is our last port of call. I'm so dizzy from looking at waxworks that they begin to look like human beings to me. <laughs> Did you notice that I asked directions from the wax? Well, I'm sure many people have been uh, deceived in the same way. Uh huh. Here we are. Oh, Monsieur Levesque doesn't believe in understatement, does he? Look, look at that sign oh, there. Good gracious me. The Chamber of Horrors, coming of history, reenacting their famous crimes. Well, <laughs> let's go in, Watson. We should feel thoroughly at home. Creepy in here, isn't it? I've heard that Monsieur Levesque will pay a hundred pounds to anyone who will spend all night alone in the Chamber of Horrors. Yes, I've heard of that challenge, too. I wouldn't spend a night here for a thousand. A very comprehensive collection of killers, aren't they? Let's see, Williams, Wainwright, ah... 
an arsonist de Brinvilliers. By George, yes. She was an attractive woman, wasn't she? As trim a pair of ankles as ever I've seen. Yes, but you wouldn't have liked her cooking, Watson. She used the most lethal condiments of almost any woman in history. Hello. What is it? Look over there. Uh, I was wondering when we'd come to one of your cases. Dr. Grimsby Rylett and the murder at Stoke Moran. Or the case of the speckled band. By Joe Holmes, the tableau's extraordinarily realistic, isn't it? Yes. One of my other old friends of mine are represented here. She'd rather like her a new acquaintance with Ricoletti of the Clubfoot and his abominable wife. Ricoletti? I don't remember him, Holmes. Oh, one of my earlier cases, old fellow. I must tell you that story sometime. I wish you would, Arbuff. Holmes, look, that veiled figure over there. Read the placard in front of it. The Hampstead Heath Murderer. Well, how very interesting. The face is covered with a black veil. Is this pure showmanship, I wonder, or does Monsieur Levesque... No. Uh, good day to you, gentlemen. Chris Scott, you, you startled me, sir. Are you admiring my collection of murderers? Monsieur Levesque? Yes, sir. And haven't I the distinction of addressing Mr. Sherlock Holmes? That is my name, and this is my friend Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do, Doctor? I am greatly honored to meet you both. What do you think of my chamber of horrors? Oh, oh, it's very impressive. We're particularly interested in this veiled figure of the Hampstead Heath murderer. Yes, indeed we are, sir. Is there a face behind, beneath that, that veil? <laughs> I'll let you in on a trade secret, gentlemen. There are no recognizable features behind that veil. This is purely for publicity purposes. The public always expects to see the latest horrors here. And I, I thought I'd titillate their morbid palates by, by having a mysterious figure representing the killer. Of course, if he is captured, I shall add his effigy to my collection. You think he will be captured, then? One can only speculate. He's a clever man, Mr. Holmes. By the way, Monsieur Levesque, does your offer of a hundred pounds to anyone who will spend a night in the Chamber of Horrors still hold good? Oh, yes. Are you thinking of accepting the bet, Mr. Holmes? Uh, no, but Dr. Watson would like to. Well, Holmes, I don't I recommend the experience, Doctor. It's an ordeal that calls for nerves of steel. However, I shall be glad to arrange for oh, I haven't the slightest intention of... Uh, backing down now? Of course you haven't, old fellow. What time shall my friend return, sir? Uh, about 11.30 tonight. I'll be waiting for him at the main... Splendid. Come on, Watson. Oh, Holmes, I told Good day, you... Monsieur Lebesque. Good day, gentlemen. I shall be waiting for you tonight, Doctor. Holmes, what the blazes do you think you're doing? I haven't the slightest intention of keeping that appointment tonight. Well, of course you haven't. I shall keep it. Disguised as you. You keep... For heaven's sake, tell me what you're up to, Holmes. You didn't even mention that missing dagger to Lebesque. No, because he knows something about the murderer. I'm convinced of it. Well, why do you say that? As we were standing there talking to him, a breath of air from the open window blew back a corner of the veil. I'll swear that there are clearly defined features beneath it. And so you're going back there tonight to find out. That's right, old fellow. The superstitious used to believe they could use a waxen image to kill a man. Tonight, Watson, we shall prove that a waxen image can be used to trap a killer. <laughs> Dr. Watson will continue his story in just a second, so I'm just going to remind you that there are lots of ways to make good food taste better. But the easiest way is to serve that food with a good wine, a Petri wine. If you like a white wine with chicken or with fish, you'll love that wonderful Petri California Sauterne. If you like a red wine, then rich, hearty Petri California Burgundy is your... Try them both, Petri Burgundy and Petri Sauterne. Red and white. Don't buy one, buy two. But always buy Petri. Well, Doctor, so Sherlock Holmes decided to night in the Chamber of Horrors, yes, huh? Yes, hotel after dinner that night, he began to apply the makeup. It's uncanny to sit there in Baker Street and watch Holmes slowly turning into a very convincing replica of myself. As he did so, we discussed last minute to rain. Thirty, Watson. If I'm not back here by two o'clock, you'd better come out to well, me. Oh, should let me come and wait outside, old fellow, just in case there's any trouble. No, 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 no. You'd attract attention. By the way, um... Yes, Bishop. Uh, Rose Bishop, wasn't exactly. it? Exactly. The only girl who was murdered when she was unescorted. The body... Was... Robert Holmes. Levesque is a French name, and yet the gentleman had a decidedly English accent. I should say that, uh, he adopted a foreign name as being more suited to his profession. I don't see what you're driving at. What's the connection between Levesque, the owner of the waxworks, and the father of Rose Bishop, the murdered girl? Levesque is the French word for bishop. Great Scott. You think that he knows who the murderer is? I may see who is beneath that black veil. Yeah. Now, how's my disguise? Huh. 
Wonderful. You look exactly like me, but how do you, you manage? Well, I don't think that'll be too difficult, old man. I'll call Rebecca and Louis will be well. I can't understand half what you're saying. In your own case, old chap, that's a handicap that I've suffered from for years. Rubbish. I'm perfectly intelligent. Now, let me see. The uh, bullseye lantern. Yes. Uh, Watson, I think I'll borrow your revolver, too. I probably won't need it, but uh, for once, I think it might be safer for me to go armed. Here, Holmes, now, do be careful. I will, old chap. Don't worry. Goodbye. And if I'm not back by two o'clock, you better come to the waxworks and see what's happened to me. Dr. Watson, you don't mind if I search you? Oh, good gracious, no. Right. No, of course not. Uh, and, uh, no, no lantern, please. The uh, moonlight will give you all the illumination that you need. Oh, dear me. A revolver in your pocket. Mm. I'm afraid I can't allow that. Oh, no. Once before, a young man who unwisely accepted my bet left bullet holes in some of my finest waxworks before he finally went raving mad. Oh, gracious me, raving mad, did he? Oh, oh, Mr. Holmes, here. Uh, don't be frightened, Dr. Watson. Many of the waxwork murderers here are all friends of yours. Uh, they'll be good company. I shall come and release you at eight in the morning. Yes, but no, no, no. How about how many know if I'm quite well, I've, uh, huh? I've, uh, I've sealed all the windows with string and wax. I shall seal the door behind me as I leave. Well, that's very unkind of you. Ah, midnight. Yes. The bet is on, Doctor. You still wish to go through with it? Well, I suppose so. Very well, then. I shall leave you now. Yes. Uh, good night, Dr. Watson. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams, all the Who's there? 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 Who's you're carrying a lantern. The vet took mine with him. Come on in. Uh, oh. Shh. Uh, there we are. Quiet, over quiet. I'm glad to see you, Watson. But uh, what made you decide to come here so early? After you left the start, came to Beck Street. He told me there was another murder on the heath at another 7 o'clock tonight. Another murder, eh? I started worrying about you, Holmes. Uh. I had a premonition of impending danger, and I decided to come over here. You're... You're not angry with me? Oh, of course not, my dear fellow. I'm glad of your company, and I appreciate your concern. Have you looked under the veil of the waxwork figure of the Hampstead Heath murderer yet? No, I was just about to. Your lantern will be most useful. Come on, Watson. Oh, what have you been doing? Just to, just doing nothing? Yes, yes I, I wanted to give Lefebvre an impression that I was here for the night, and I also wanted to do some serious thinking. I smoked two pipes on the problem, Watson, and I think I know the answer now. I'm willing to swear you'll know the face you see when I lift the veil from the waxen dummy... The figure. Now, hold your lantern a little higher, will you, old That's it. I lift the veil and... Oh, who do we see? Good Lord, it's the waxwork figure of Levesque himself. Precisely, Watson. An unparalleled example of the self-betrayal inherent in criminal egotism. Levesque couldn't resist the... Holmes, the waxwork is moving. It's got it. It's alive. Yes, gentlemen. Which is more than either of you will be in a few minutes. You re-entered this room by a secret door, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Holmes. And since you've displayed such a flattering interest in the Hampstead Heath murderer, I decided to remove the wax figure and appear in person. Look out, Holmes. You've got a revolver. Oh, no, 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 Doctor. This isn't a revolver in my pocket. What would the Hampstead Heath murderer want with a revolver? This is a knife. I feel unarmed. Which one of you meddlers wants to die first? Look out, Holmes. Watch it, watch it. Hold together. What a pity. Holmes, where are you? Over here by the effigy of Macbeth. How very thoughtful of you to provide him with a dagger, Levesque. A wooden one, my dear Holmes. <laughs> you can't escape me. I can feel my way in the dark here. I know every inch of this room. You're doomed, both of you. Don't suck a match, Holmes. You'll make a target of yourself. Step over that. I'm lighting this newspaper. It'll make an excellent torch to set light to the nearest waxwork. No, no! Don't burn my waxwork! Why not? Wax on a wooden frame should blaze brilliantly. There we are. Oh, oh you devil! You're destroying my life's work! Holmes, that burning wax is pouring all over the floor. The curtains are catching light. The whole place will burn down. Oh, my beautiful museum! Ah, 
I thought this would smoke you out. Quick, Watson, at him again. What's that knife, Holmes? Well, Mr. Holmes, you've done it again. You've solved the case in a blaze of glory. <laughs> Blaze of glory. Yes, Mr. Stroud, I get the point. Thank you very much. Pass that marmalade, will you, Watson? Uh, uh, Holmes, is that the morning paper you brought with you, Lestrade? Yes, Doctor. Uh, want me to uh, read you the headlines? Yes, yes, please, please do. Yeah. Amstead Heath murderer captured in fire that destroys waxwork exhibition. <laughs> you know, Mr. Holmes, you and the Doctor were lucky you went burned to death. Never mind the chance you ran of having your throat cut by that maniac. It was fortunate that the police and firemen were on the scene as quickly as they were. Levesque the had the strength of ten men. Yes, the strength of a madman. He'll never stand trial, of course. No, Doctor. He'll end up in an asylum where he belongs. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, what made you suspect Levesque? You first gave me the clue yourself, Lestrade. You uh, told me that all the murdered girls were accompanied by men when they were attacked. All of them, save one, Rose Bishop. Therefore, if the murderer was venting a hatred of love, he had, to, uh, he had to be someone very close to Rose Bishop to know that she was a suitable victim. That point alone, which I was shockingly slow in observing, should have told us to focus our attention on the father, Mr. Bishop, alias Love. Well, your theory was certainly right, Mr. Holmes. He swore his daughter had been ruined, and so he'd killed her too. Holmes, the, the waxwork figure of the killer, the one with a veil over its face, the features underneath were those of the... Of Levesque himself, weren't they? I'm certain of it, old fellow. You see, he had two great prides. The first, his natural pride as a fine craftsman in wax. The second, his perverted pride as a prominent and successful murderer. These two prides combined suggested to his crazed mind that he make a whack figure of himself and range it with the other great killers of history. Yes, but he was cunning enough to protect himself by placing a veil over the Precisely, face. Precisely, my dear fellow. And when he saw us yesterday and we accepted the wager, he undoubtedly became suspicious and removed the wax figure last night and made his personal appearance as the murderer with every intention of killing us both. Yes, we were very lucky, old chap. Yeah, if you ask me, Mr. Holmes, you've been very smart. No, I quite agree, Lestard. I think you solved the case brilliantly, no, Holmes. No, 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 no. I've been very sluggish. I... Solved by circumstance and melodrama what should have been a purely intellectual problem. I'm not pleased with myself. But, Trant, I hope that my name has not been used in that newspaper report. No, it hasn't, sir. Excellent. I want no credit in this case. Well, do you mean to say that you're going to let Scotland Yard get the praise for catching him, Holmes? Why not? Well, that's very generous of you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, it'll make things a lot easier for me. Yes, it certainly will. Holmes, uh, I can't see why you reproach yourself. Because, my dear Watson, like the Hampstead Heath murderer... I, too, have my pride as a craftsman. This case had a clearly defined pattern, and I was unable to recognize it. If you should have occasion to chronicle this story, Watson, and I should prefer that you didn't, I I would like you to entitle it The Education of an Idiot. Oh, come now, Holmes. The Education of an Idiot? <laughs> That's absurd. I know. <laughs> but um, if you do tell this story, it'll probably end up as... Um, the strange case of the murderer in wax. Well, Doctor, that was sure a swell story. You know, that's the kind of story I like. Lots of action. Well, that's the kind of story I like to tell. You know, Mr. Bartell, although our broadcasts were heard overseas every week through Armed Forces Radio... This is one of the few occasions that I've had the privilege of really telling my story directly to the boys. And it's been a great pleasure for me to be here at, at Camp Roberts. Well, that not, Doctor. And for the Petrie family. There, there are no words to describe how much our country owes our servicemen. And to all of you, the Petrie family wants to say, just as every American wants to say, thanks for a swell job. Well, Dr. Watson, what story are you planning to tell us next week? Next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you one of the strangest adventures that ever happened to Sherlock Holmes. It takes place in a, in a monastery high in the mountains of Tibet and concerns itself with an avalanche, an execution, and a murder. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, 
The Adventure of the Second Stain. Music is by Dean Fostler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Mummers in the Little Theater of the Air. Let me look at you. Ah, it's good to see you again. It's good to see you again, too. I've only seen you once since your marriage. Where do you and Lyman hide out? And how is that author husband of yours, anyway? Well, it's hmm? your fault you haven't seen us. Been invited three times, you know. And couldn't get away. Besides, why do you live way out in the wilderness? Hazel, you're not ill. Or are you? No, Dr. Russell. It isn't I. Bob, not... Dr. Russell to you, my dear. It's easier to call you Dr. Russell on a call like this. What can I do for you, Hazel? Here. Want to smoke? Have a cigarette. Thank you. There, now. I came to talk to you about Lyman. Yes? Is he ill, Hazel? It's worse than that. I, I don't know what it is, but it's something dreadful. Terrible, I know. You uh, tell me the best you can. Well... At first, when we moved out in the country, he seemed so happy. He was busy writing a new novel. And he had you there with him? Yes. I thought that should make him happy. He'd made me rush the marriage so. Married two months before you planned to be, weren't you? Yes. But then, several months after we'd been out in the country, Lyman began to act very strange. Very strange. What do you mean? Well, at first I thought it was fear of something. I, I don't know what... And then he began to sit in the library, all night long. Writing, you mean? Some, perhaps. But when he'd come upstairs early in the morning, he'd look like someone who had undergone a terrible struggle, an ordeal. His face would be white and chalky. His eyes would jerk and his lips tremble. How long has this been going on? For a month now. Oh, it's terrible. Something's driving him mad. Whatever it is, it'll kill him. Hazel, I don't know what to say. I can't say anything right offhand. But you know, my dear, writers... Well, anyway, Lyman has always been rather a peculiar chap. Normal, of course. Normal as any of us. He's not normal now. He's changed. He's, he's not the same. Oh, you've got to do something. Can you get him to come and see me? No. That's the trouble. I can't. He won't leave the house for a day. I've begged him to get out, but he won't. Tell him you were coming to see me? Oh, mercy, no. Just in town shopping. And you want me to come to him? Is that it? Exactly. Without his knowing, I'm making a professional call. Yes. I want you to come for the weekend and while there, see if you can do anything for him. I'm not a psychiatrist, honey. 
I may advise Pills when he needs a change of air. Oh, I know you. You'll do the right thing. When can you come? Well, want me this weekend? Tomorrow? Indeed, I do. I think I can get away this weekend. I will. I'll be there. Oh, fine. I feel better already. About Lyman, I mean. I know you can help him if anyone can. Now, don't put too much faith in a doddering old surgeon, my dear. Oh, you're the best physician in the world. Because I have faith in you. I'll be expecting you for dinner tomorrow. Hazel, this has been a splendid dinner. I've really eaten more than I ought. Oh, it's nice to see a man relish a meal. <laughs> Lyman rarely eats. He's going to tell you, Bob, that I have no appetite. But it isn't true. Lyman, you know it is. Why, night after night, he leaves the table scarcely touching his plate. It isn't true, I tell you. <laughs> well, perhaps Lyman is more sensible than I am. Now, I know too hearty a meal isn't good for me, particularly at night. I don't recommend it to my patients, but like all who preach, I don't practice my own teachings. <laughs> like the shoemaker's children who go without shoes? <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> well, if you finish your coffee, shall we go to the drawing room? Fine. Now, Lyman, how about telling me about your new novel? What's the theme? I haven't been writing lately. But he has to soon. He's promised his publishers it'd be ready in a month. Don't remind me what I have to do. I'll have it ready. I'm sure you will. With Hazel here for inspiration, it ought to go fast. Uh, shall we go to the drawing room, then? Yes. Yeah. This way, Bob. Oh, beautiful here. This <laughs> beautiful, then. Hazel, this is a lovely home you have out here in the country. I'm glad you like it. Quiet and peaceful, too. Ought to be a writer's paradise. Oh, here, Bob. Sit in this chair. I'm sure you'll find it comfortable. Oh, thank you. Uh, where are you going to sit, Lyman? If you'll excuse me, I think I'll go to the library. I have some work to do. Don't let me annoy you, Lyman, or keep you from work. But I thought you'd like to visit with Bob. I tell you, I have work to do. All right, of course we'll excuse you. Yes, I have work to do. Will you join us later? Perhaps. No, no, don't wait for me. It's getting late, I'm sure Bob will want to retire soon. Oh, but it's early yet, Lyman. All the same, don't wait for me. Well, what do you think? I don't know what to think. He does act strange, doesn't he? Yes. He isn't the same. No, he isn't. Changed. I'm so awfully worried. Notice how he glances everywhere and looks nowhere? I did. What can be the trouble? He seems to be listening for something. Waiting for something. Yes, that's it. Of course, Lyman's never been very loquacious. No, that's right. He dislikes small talk. There's something almost rude about his taciturnity this evening. Oh, I know. Oh, Bob, as a doctor, not as a friend, what would you say is the matter? My dear, I can't answer you yet. Is it I? Is he tired of me? No, no, I don't think so. But I must know. Notice how white and drawn his face is. He's under some strain, all right. What do you propose to do? As soon as you go upstairs to bed, I'm going to the library and sit with him. Oh, but he won't let you. I'm accustomed to giving orders, not taking them. I know, but you don't He'll know how... He'll let me stay. Did you notice how he kept looking towards the library and yet tried to hide it from us? Well, yes. Now that you mention it, I do. I have a feeling that whatever it is that's bothering Lyman, the library has something to do with it. I'll do my best tonight to find out what it is. It's I, Bob. What do you want? Let me in, won't you? Sorry, Bob. I'm busy. Why lock the door, Lyman? Never mind. Go away. Lyman, I'll call one of the servants to open it for me. I'll rouse the whole house. You can't come in. All right, all right. Well? Come on, let a fellow in. You came here to snoop. I know it. Hazel brought you here to watch me. Then you admit that there is something wrong, Lyman. I admit nothing. Uh, what time is it? Chimes just struck as I came down the hall. Let's see. 11.45. Then you must go. Get out of here. I don't understand. The door. I must lock the door. Come on, Lyman. Tell me what it is that's bothering you. Go. Leave me alone. No, I'm here to stay. I have a gun here, Dr. Russell. But you won't use it. Not on me. She'll be coming in a moment. 
She'll try to get out of this room, rattle the doorknob. Try to get out of this library to kill my wife. I confess I don't know what you're talking about. Who will come, Lyman? You'll hear her in a minute. Moving out of those bookshelves. Moving towards me. Towards the door. Who do you mean? At first, you'll smell the perfume she always wore. Lyman, who are you talking about? Shirley Gray. The ghost of Shirley Gray. Shirley Gray? The ghost of Shirley Gray. She lives in this room. At night, midnight, she tries to get out and kill Hazel. Oh, now, come, Lyman. You've been working too hard. Your mind is weary. Your imagination is working overtime. Better go up and get some sleep. I knew this would be the way. I knew what you'd say. You think I'm out of my mind. You think I'm crazy. Well, I'm not. You doctors are fools. Can't see. Only measles. Smallpox. You only can see something that bats you in the face. It's only because I can see that I'm asking you to go upstairs and get some rest. No one can go on sleepless for weeks and remain sane. I'm sane, all right. More than you are. Listen. The clock... It's midnight. She'll be here in a moment. Listen. Listen, do you hear? Listen, if you dare. Do you hear her? I hear nothing, Lyman. She's coming nearer. I can almost see her tonight. She's dressed in a soft, flowing gown. She's coming closer towards me. Nearer. Nearer. She's coming nearer. Shirley, I didn't kill you. I, I I didn't mean to kill you. Lyman, what on earth is the matter? Dr. Russell, don't grab my arm. Let me go. Let me go, I tell you. Let me go. Can't you see? She's moving towards the door. She wants to get out. No. No, you can't get out of here. I'll stop you. No. No. You can't get out that door. Get back. Back into the shelves. I didn't mean to kill you, Shirley. Get back into the shelves. Back. Back. I'm pushing her back. I'm winning, winning, back, back into the shelves, back, back, there, there. Simon, Simon, what is it? It's all over now. I won. She didn't get out. She's gone back. Now I can go upstairs and sleep. Sleep. I've won the battle for another night. Now I can sleep. <laughs> Who is Shirley who comes out of the bookcase at midnight? Is it someone Lyman killed? <laughs> the hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> There are people in most countries who would like to live in the Republic of the United States or the Dominion of Canada where that good Olga Coal is sold. The citizens of our free countries are the envy of many people elsewhere because of the personal freedom which we have enjoyed. Why then doesn't every country adopt a form of free government? One answer is that unfortunately there are people and parties in many nations who are so greedy for power that they will sacrifice the freedom of their fellow countrymen to obtain power for themselves. History, even recent history, is replete with such instances. That is why the citizens of the Republic of the United States and the Dominion of Canada must be careful to recognize at its very beginning any movement to steal or limit their freedom. That is not always easy. The man who would enslave a free people doesn't begin by saying, now I'm going to be your dictator. Instead, he probably will claim that he is a devoted supporter of personal freedom. But all the while, he will support policies that weaken and undermine personal freedom. Such a man will deny any totalitarian aims. But free citizens must not be deceived by such denials. Apparently, it is a cardinal principle of every sincere totalitarian that he is justified in lying, if such lies will advance his plans. In these times, no public figure and no party or organization supporting such a person can be accepted without careful consideration. Every public figure and organization must be carefully scrutinized. And if their real aims are to limit or to destroy our freedom as individuals, they must be opposed and defeated. Now the hermit again. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> the next morning, Dr. Russell talks to Lyman about the mysterious Shirley. Is the doctor talking to a murderer, eh? <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Lyman, I want to hear the story. In this clear, clean daylight, I want you to tell me your story. It's nothing I can tell you. I'm your friend, Hazel's friend. I can't see your lives ruined, see your whole future shattered by some strange thing that holds you that, if it were brought out into daylight, would vanish. You think it would? I'm sure it would. It's with me as much in the day as it is at night. I found out since last night that Shirley Gray was a character in your last novel. Now, certainly, Lyman... You aren't going to sit there and tell me that you believe a character out of a storybook can return to haunt you. Yes, yes, she does. It's absurd. Besides, from what I know of ghosts, doors wouldn't bother them. They'd walk right through them. Not surely. She isn't strong enough yet. She hasn't been dead long enough. And how should she kill Hazel? How do you know she wants to kill her? For revenge. I killed Shirley when she was still young, lovely. She didn't want to die. But how do you know she wants to kill Hazel? Because night after night, she's come to me. Guided my hand while I write. It's written, I'll take your wife from you, just as you snatched my lover. Lyman, listen to me. Characters from storybooks, I don't care how real they are to you, were never flesh and blood. They can't inhabit a spirit world. But Shirley Gray was flesh and blood. I took her out of life and put her in a book. You... You mean you used some real girl as a type for your story? Yes, I did. Tell me about it, Lyman. Perhaps I'll be able to aid you. It was several months before I was married. You remember I went up to that lake in the north to write? I remember. It was while I was there that I met Shirley Gray. She was the most strikingly beautiful girl that I'd ever seen. Max, this is Mr. Clinton. Mr. Lyman Clinton. How do you do, Mr. Clinton? Shirley tells me you're an author. She's frightfully keen on your stories. But I'm ashamed to say I don't believe I've ever read any of your work. No, don't apologize, please. I'm the one who should do that. I'm afraid I write for money, not fame. Oh, it isn't true. We've had a grand time talking books. From early French beginnings of the novel to modern. From Zola to John de Oh, well, It's nice of you to entertain, Shirley, Mr. Clinton. I can only come out weekends. Gets pretty lonely here at the lake with only her folks for company. The pleasure's been mine, I assure you. Come on. We're wasting a glorious day, men, for swimming. I'll race you to the second sandbar, Shirley. <laughs> right. One of them? <laughs> what are them say? Whatever you say. <laughs> and so I spent days at the lake with her. Walking through the woods. Talking. And falling in love with her. But this Max. Who was he? The boy she loved was engaged to. Yes, Go on, Lyman. In Shirley's company, I could feel myself groping for new thoughts, beginning to live more than I ever had before. She had a free and full imagination. Yes? She wasn't muddled by life as most people are. She possessed a spiritual insight, clear, alive. I understand. And one night, I told her how I felt about her. But Hazel, you were engaged to Hazel at the time. I'd forgotten about Hazel. She belonged in another world. She had no existence in this one. And so you told this Shirley? Yes. We'd climbed one of the high sand dunes that afternoon. Had returned. It was dusk. Shadows had begun to settle on the water. Stars were beginning to fill the sky. And we'd paused to watch their reflection. You will be returning home soon, Lyman. And so will I. I shall never leave this spot. Nor you. Not in mind, perhaps, but in actuality. This lake, the beauty of it all, will be something to remember on cold winter nights. It's no use to disguise things from you, Shirley. You know I'm in love with you. I know that, Lyman. I'll never let you leave me. Never. I think you will. You understand me. And yet you don't. Meaning? That you've read many things into me that don't exist at all. And have omitted one thing. The main thing. Which is? That I love Max. Love him very much. No place for me? Don't beg. I hate it. 
With Max, life is easy, unconfused. We're happy on a simple plane. We'll romp through life together and fight together. But not with too much effort. The easy way? Perhaps. But why take the difficult? I like life. It's fun. It may be drab and hard someday. But not now. I haven't misunderstood you, Shirley. Quite the contrary. And I love you. Please, Lyman. Let's not talk anymore. Look at the water. See the boat way off in the distance? Covered with a thousand lights. Going somewhere. Let's just sit here and watch. That night was the last time I saw Shirley Gray alive. Yes, what happened to her? She left the lake the next day. Two days after, I returned home. And asked Hazel to hasten your marriage? Yes, because I wanted to forget this girl as soon as I could. I understand. But I couldn't forget her. I couldn't. She was with me constantly. So I began to write a story about her. That drove me wild. Yet you finished the book? Published it, in fact? Yes, I finished it. But do you know what I did? I think I know. I couldn't bear to think of Shirley living without me. So I killed her in the story. Then the very day that I killed her in the book, she was killed in life. What? Yes, killed. In an automobile. Instantly. That had nothing to do with your story. You weren't to blame. I was. I was. I fought so hard. Wanted it so much. I brought it about. I killed her. She wasn't ready to die. She won't accept death. Now she comes back to haunt me for retribution. Tell me, Doctor, what am I going to do? Help me if you can. Help me, please. I will, Lyman. Tonight we shall go to the library together. And I will help you. I have a plan. I killed her. I killed her. How do you do, young man? You're Max Pierce, aren't you? Yes, sir, I am. I'm Dr. Russell. Oh, yes, Dr. Russell. I'm glad to meet you. But there's nothing you can do for me. I was in an automobile accident. Smashed up. Always have to walk with crutches. I know what I'm going to ask of you will seem very strange and personal. But I have a very good reason. Will you hear me? Oh, yes. What is it? You were engaged to Shirley Gray, weren't you? Yes, I was. And uh, loved her? We were to have been married. I don't understand you. You will in a moment. And Shirley Gray died... Yes. And I had to live on. I don't want to. If you're able, your doctor told me I might take you with me tonight to help save another man's sanity. We have to drive in the country. I'll tell you the story on the way. This is all strange to me. Now, don't be afraid. It's all right. Will you come? Yes, I'll come. To my car, then. I'll tell you the story as we drive to our destination. That's all there is to tell right now. It doesn't seem possible. I'm sane and considered to be a level-headed man. I've never believed in ghosts. Never. Nor I. But I'm compelled to believe this time. But why doesn't she come to me? Perhaps she will. Tonight. Here we are. It's 11.30. We'll find him in the library waiting. It's I. Yes? Come in. Who's this? Who have you brought with you? Max Pierce. Do you remember him? Why have you brought him here? Oh, please, Mr. Clinton. I want to help you. And I want to see Shirley. Perhaps he can talk to her. You've made a mess of things. Seeing Max will craze her. She'll kill all of us. No, I think it will give her peace. She wants revenge, not peace. But you need help. You can't go on this way. Sit down, both of you. Be quiet and listen. Listen. Do you hear that rustling sound? It's the wind in the water. She brings the sound with her. Listen. She's coming. Nearer. Nearer. I can see her tonight. Do you see her? Why? Why, yes. 
Yes, I do see her. Surely, my darling, surely speak to me. Max. Max, you've come to me. Oh, yes, Shirley, I'm here. My darling, I love you. Do you want to come with me now? Forever? I do, yes. Surely I do. But your revenge upon me... I shall have my revenge. You shall go on living, suffering for killing others. Surely. Don't be afraid to die. Death will be lovely when we are together. What have I done? I forgive you, Lyman Clinton. I leave you in peace. Come to me, Max. Follow me. Yes, Shirley. I'll follow you. I'll follow you. I'll follow you. Shirley Gray. <laughs> her spirit returned and took Max Pierce to her, leaving Lyman to ponder and suffer the rest of his life. <laughs> Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. I'm a criminal, and I didn't mean it. You know I didn't. Oh, stop whining, Gerald. Take your medicine like a man. What? All right, Harvey. I'll stop. You're responsible for the whole thing. You know you are. And since they can only hang me once, even for two murders... Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight, when the graves gave open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in Death's Goblets. <laughs> Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by Sigmund Miller is Death's Goblet. It all began at one of Arthur Cunningham's parties. He always gave a party when he came back from one of his trips abroad. I went there with Gerald, my partner, and his wife, Susan. Beautiful Susan. Did I care for her? <laughs> People used to say so. But she was too self-centered a woman for me. Now, I like to look at her just as I like to look at anything that's uh, lovely. That was all. As for Gerald, well, he was rich, which was the only reason he was my partner. But suppose I start at the beginning, at the moment we got to the party and Arthur came over. Well, 
Well, hello, Harvey. Glad you came. Wonderful to see you back, Arthur. You know Gerald and his lovely wife, Susan. Of course. Hello, lovely wife, Gerald. It's nice to see you again, Arthur. Good trip, I think. Marvelous. And you're just in time for a drink. Hey, let's get away from this mob. Come into the study. Oh, oh, nice. I just opened my last bottle of Chateau Albert. Oh, nice. Here we are. Oh, well, someone get the glasses out of the cabinet, will you? <laughs> Marge <laughs> parties make me very nervous. <laughs> you know, I'm much yeah. Here we are. Hi. Yes. What an odd goblet this one is. Oh, uh, put that one back, Susan. Why, what's wrong, Arthur? Uh, use any of the others, but not that one. Oh, I'll be careful of it, if that's what you're worried about. Oh, it's not that. I just don't want you to drink from it. What's all the mystery about, Arthur? Well, you'd all think I was mad if I told you... Uh, Take a look at it. It's a very strange-looking glass. Yes, looks uh, Venetian, possibly from Murano. It is. This red spot here on the side. Yes, it's supposed to be a drop of blood. Oh, that's very odd. How do you know that? Well, Gerald, this goblet has a legend, a terrible legend. And, of course, none of you will believe it, but the story is that anyone who drinks from this goblet will kill someone. Oh, that, that's wonderful. And you believe it? Why, yes, Gerald. You see, I've had proof. Good heavens. I, well, I once drank from this goblet. What? Arthur, you're joking. You mean that Yes, you... Susan, it was justifiable homicide, but after I drank from it, I did kill someone. What? He was a thief and he attacked me, but still I killed him. Well, you never told us about that. There's not anything that I care to remember particularly. Oh, how terrible for you, Arthur. Where did you get the goblet? From a murderer. A man who killed his wife. They were auctioning off his estate. Hmm. Extraordinary. May I look at the glass, Arthur? Yes, if you like. Everyone stared at the goblet in silence as I held it to the light. It had a delicate brown tint, reminding me of old blood. Except that it sparkled and glittered. The spot of red did look like a drop of blood about to roll down the side. It seemed ridiculous that this inanimate object could make men commit murder, and yet there was something about it that that fascinated me, and suddenly I wanted to drink out of it. You seem very interested in my goblet, Harvey. Yes, will you pour some wine in it for me? What? Oh, no, Harvey. This happens to be one superstition I believe. Everyone who has ever put his lips to this goblet has killed. I don't know why it's so, but... It is. Oh, it's silly, of course, but why tempt fate? Oh, nonsense, Gerald, nonsense. I'm going to drink out of it. You'll have to pour the wine yourself, Harvey. All right, I will. Well, here's, um, health and, uh, long life. No, Harvey, I won't oh. let you. Oh, why, Susan, you shouldn't have done that. You've spilled some of Arthur's best burgundy and ruined a good tablecloth. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm glad you did it, Susan. I won't let you or anyone else drink from that glass. It's strange to get so distressed about a ridiculous legend. I don't think murder is ridiculous. You know, I'd like to get rid of it. I was thinking of destroying it. Well, why don't you just fling it against the fireplace? No, I can't. Uh -huh. I've tried several times, but somehow I couldn't. Um, Arthur. Yes? How about uh, giving it to me? I'd rather not. Oh, come on. You want to get rid of it, and I have a fine glass collection. I, I'd, I'd like to add to it. I'll keep it locked up. You'll be sorry, but if you want it that badly, Harvey, it's yours. Arthur, please don't give it to him. Susan, what's the matter with you? You watch over Harvey as if... Well, as if... As if what, Gerald? Oh, the whole business is absurd. Of course it is. Yes, and if I should drink out of it and commit a murder, that would be the most absurd thing of all. <laughs> I kept the goblet on the mantelpiece in my library where the lamplight made it glitter. I discovered that the red drop was not paint. It was ingrained in the glass. Oh, very cleverly. One night, both Susan and Gerald were at my home. As we chatted, I got up, went to the mantelpiece, and idly toyed with the goblet. That goblet... It's the one Arthur gave... Yes, yes, you remember. He gave it to me. Why don't you smash it, Harvey? Get rid of it. Ooh, it gives us all the creeps. Mm. Well, Gerald, you aren't really afraid of a piece of glass, are you? You don't believe Arthur's story at all, do you, Harvey? On the contrary, Susan, I do believe it. But uh, not the way you think. What do you mean? Well, I mean to say murder is not in the goblet. It's in me, in you, 
Even in, in general. Oh, what a silly thing to say, Harvey. Oh, yes. You don't need a magic goblet to commit a murder. All you have to do is let yourself go. Let go of the civilized controls that tie you up. Why, oh. Gerald, if you had cause, you could murder me or even your lovely wife. Oh, I couldn't kill a fly. Oh, but you could if the fly gave you enough trouble. Now, supposing, uh, just as an example, supposing that you discovered that Susan was really in love with me and only married you for your money. <laughs> Wouldn't that make you want to murder her, Joe? Oh, you're crazy. That's not very funny, Harvey. Even you, Susan. What? Even though you have a lovely face and exquisite hands, even you could commit murder. Why, there must have been times when you hated Gerald, or only for a moment, of course. But in that moment, eh, in that moment, if you were not so civilized... Stop it, Harvey. Why, you could even put your lovely hands around my throat. Oh, stop it, Harvey. <laughs> You're not that important to her. And then just why are we on this gruesome subject? That's Harvey's idea of humor. Susan looked at me, a touch of red at the point where the cheekbones make the skin taut. She seemed angry, but she wasn't really. Oh, yes, she loved me. I could see it in her face. She looked at me for a moment and then dropped her eyes. May I look at the goblet, Harvey? No, I'm afraid not, Susan. You might accidentally drop it. It might be a good idea. Well, I have an even better one, Gerald. And that's to go home before we get really serious about this murder business. I sat there staring at the goblet after they left. It, it fascinated me, glittering in the lamplight. And as I looked at it... It almost seemed as if the red spot of blood was uh, uh, moving, rolling down its side. Why, why shouldn't I drink from it? Why? And before I knew it, I'd taken it down and put it on the table. I got a bottle of burgundy, opened it, and I poured slowly, filling the goblet just up to the red spot. And then I drank from it. It seemed to me that the wine had a, a different taste, although I had drunk this wine often and knew its taste well. It was delicious. I had another. It was heady. And it made me a little dizzy, although I felt fine and, and, and free. Yes, light and dizzy. But, but after a while... When the dizziness wouldn't go away, I decided to go for a drive, even though it was close to midnight. I drove fast. The speed and power of the car gave me a feeling of great exhilaration. I took the turns at full speed, enjoying the danger of the sharp curves. Then I came to a long, level stretch of road. I pressed down hard on the gas. The needle of the speedometer slowly moved upward. Sixty... Seventy, eighty, eighty-five. The road, like a black ribbon, rolled up in front of me. And then I suddenly saw him, but it was too late. I shot him with my right fender. He never made a sound. The car swerved a little from the impact. My heart in my throat. I stopped. Then I... I backed up. Backed up. Backed up. Backed up to where the body was lying sprawled grotesquely on the edge of the road. One look was enough. He was dead. But no one had seen the accident. I stepped on the gas and drove off. Death's Goblet and a man who drank from it, a corpse lying limp by the side of a lonely road, and a car speeding away as the clock strikes twelve for... Murder at midnight.
And now, back to Murder at Midnight. Harvey challenged the curse of the goblet and found it true. He had just killed a man after drinking from it. Let's listen to him as he continues the story of Death's Goblet. I knew now that the story of the goblet wasn't a myth, and I also knew what I was going to do about it. The next night, I got Gerald to come to my house to do some work. I can't make head or tail out of your cost estimates, Harvey. Oh, now, really, Gerald, it's very simple. Just concentrate. Oh, why can't you take care of it like a good fellow? I'm awfully tired. Well, all right, let's stop for a couple of minutes. Have a drink. What are you doing, Harvey, the goblet? Why, you don't really believe that story of Arthur's, do you? You're much too intelligent for that. Well, you only pretended in front of Susan, didn't you? Well, I... (laughs) Oh, yes. Had to pretend, you know, women. Well, of course. And even if you did believe it, I have a feeling that... Basically, you're pretty reckless, aren't you? Well, I used to be pretty wild when I was a young fellow. <laughs> on a motorcycle once. And... Yes, yes, I know, yes. Well, let's drink up. Find me a victim, will you, Gerald? Huh? Well, you know, according to the legend, I've got to murder someone. Uh, maybe even you. <laughs> Harvey the murderer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh. mm, very nice wine. How about another? Right. Well, here's to uh, your lovely wife. And um, how about switching glasses? Huh? Well, you might as well get a kick out of it, too. Um, well, uh, <laughs> okay. Here goes. I watched the fool swagger as he drank down the wine. In an hour, when he was alone, he'd be shivering with fright at what he'd done. (laughs) Well, I did it. You certainly did. By the way, Gerald... Yes? I checked Arthur's story about this goblet. Yeah? And it seems that he's right. Everyone who ever put his lips to this goblet has committed a murder. You mean... Well, of course, it's all coincidence, but... uh, Then again, who knows? All the next week, I kept reminding Gerald about his drinking from the goblet. I wasn't really trying to get him to kill, but it was amusing to see him get upset and uneasy. And I noticed he was getting a little bolder, particularly with Susan, and had developed a temper. And one night, just as I was about to retire... Hello, is that you, Harvey? Yes, Susan, how are you? I'm fine, I'm just a little worried about Gerald. He usually gets home at about six, and it's eleven o'clock now. Do you know where he might be? Why, he's having dinner with his sister. Sister? Yes, a tall, dark girl. She was in the office today, and... Harvey, Gerald has no sisters. Oh, he hasn't? Oh, uh, I, um, uh, I guess I got him mixed up with someone else. Yes, yes, it, it was Les Gordon who was meeting his sister. Yes, Gerald had some business to take care of over in Milford. You're and not that... very good at covering up, Harvey. I'm coming right over. Please wait up for me. <laughs> good. Things are beginning to happen. It was becoming very interesting. Now we'd see. Harvey, I want you to tell me everything. I must know. Who is this girl? Take it easy, Susan. Come, sit down, sit down. Oh, never mind that. What about Gerald? I don't know anything about Gerald's private life. And besides, you're not the one to talk. What on earth do you mean? You know perfectly well what I mean. You don't really care for Gerald. Actually, you're in love with me. Harvey. Well, you are, aren't you? Maybe. Sometimes I think I am. <laughs> oh, but you're too cold-blooded. I'd never be sure I could trust you. As a matter of fact, you'd like to get rid of Gerald. Why, why do you say that? Well, I'm just putting your thoughts into words. You never really loved him, did you? Oh, but Harvey... And he's finally become unbearable, hasn't he? Oh, Harvey, if you only knew... Do you know that the last time Gerald was here, he drank out of that goblet of Arthur's? It's possible that he wants to get rid of you, too. Stop it! Stop it, you hear? Well, I'm just telling you what I think you ought to know. 
Oh, you see, I left word at home that Gerald was to meet me here. And if he does come, well, we'll see. We sat and waited, not talking much. Susan's face was pale and agitated. It was most exciting. Susan, with all her charm and embellishments, was really a fierce animal underneath. I could almost hear her rage seething. Are you expecting anyone? Just Gerald. Well, let him in. Oh, hello, Harvey. Susan, what's up? Why did you leave word to meet you here? It's almost midnight. Where have you been all the evening? At Milford. With whom? What's going on, anyway? What are you so excited about, Susan? What were you doing in Milford? Why, I went there on business. Oh, really? You've been behaving very strangely lately, Gerald. If you don't love me, why don't you say so like a man? What? This is all your fault, Harvey. You've been filling her head with poison. I? I had nothing to do with this. I told her that you went to Milford. All he did was to make me see clearly something I've felt for a long while. And I think this is the time to do something about it. Oh, how are you out of your mind? Put that gun down. You remember it, don't you? You gave it to me. Said it might be useful in an emergency. Harvey, take that gun away from her. She's liable to shoot. She won't shoot. She's only trying to frighten you. Am I? Let's see. Oh, my shoulder. Give me that no. gun. Give me that gun. Harvey. She... She's dead. Yes, Gerald. And you killed her. But... But it was an accident. She shot at me, and I was only trying to get the gun away from her. You know that's what happened. I only know that you drank from that goblet and that you killed her. What? But... Oh, you... You dirty treacherous. You planned all this so that you could get rid of me. So that you could have Susan. So you could have the firm for yourself. You'll have to do better than that to beat the gallows, Gerald. The gallows? Please, Harvey... We've been friends for a long time. You can't let me down. You wouldn't have pressed the trigger if you hadn't had murder in your heart, Gerald. You shot her because you wanted to. That's what I saw. I believe in telling the truth. Harvey, I'll turn over the business to you. I'll do anything, anything, if you'll just... I don't accept bribes, Gerald. All right. But I'll fool you. I'll call the police myself. Well, there's the phone. I'll prove my case in court. They won't convict me. Operator. Operator. Give me the police. Hello? Police department? This is Gerald Hamilton. I I just accidentally shot my wife. And my friend's home. Yes, she's dead. The address is 411 Grove Street. That's right. I killed her. Accidentally. Yes. I'll be waiting here. Cigarette, Gerald? Treating me like a condemned man, huh? I'm not going to die. All I have to do is tell the truth about everything, including you. Oh, but you forget, Gerald, there must be fingerprints, your fingerprints on that gun. That won't look very accidental, will it? I... But... But Harvey... You did it, Gerald. I saw you. If you don't back me up, they'll hang me like a common criminal. Please, Harvey, don't let them do that to me, please. Oh, stop whining, Gerald. What? All right, Harvey, I'll stop. You're responsible for this whole thing. You know you are. And since they can only hang me once... He raised the gun, but I'd been expecting it. I grabbed his hand, pushed it against his chest. My finger pressed on his and on the trigger. And suddenly, he went limp. You won't get away. My alibi was perfect. All I had to do was wait for the police that he himself had called... The minutes ticked slowly away, and then... Hello, Harvey. Arthur. Glad I found you in. Say, you look as if you'd been in a fight. Arthur, you'd, uh, you'd better not come in. Why? What's the matter? No, no, you, you'd better not come in. Oh, but why? Well, uh, uh, Gerald and uh, Susan, they, they had a quarrel, and he killed her. What? And then he shot himself. What are you talking about, Harvey? Well, all right, come in. Look for yourself. Good. Good Lord. Well, tried to kill me, too. But but why? It doesn't sound like him or like either of them. I don't know why. Fit of insanity? Or maybe it was the... The goblet. Your goblet. He drank out of it, you know. The goblet? Why, that's ridiculous. As he spoke... 
He picked up the gun. It made me furious. All those fine fingerprints of Gerald's were now erased. Put that gun down, Arthur. There are fingerprints on it. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I tried to get hold of myself. The stupid fool, he was going to ruin everything. But I had to keep calm. What, uh, what were you saying about the goblet? Why, it has no curse or magic. I just made that story up. You, you, you made it, you mean... Of course, I bought the goblet in an antique shop. As a matter of fact, I have a whole set of them. The pulses hammered away in my head. A vast, uncontrollable anger seized me. Was it because of those precious fingerprints that he'd wiped out? Or because I had believed in the goblet myself? I don't know. I only know that I had to fight to keep from grabbing him by the throat. You know, I don't think you're telling me everything you know about this horrible business, Harvey. In fact... A red hot wave came over me. I don't remember exactly what happened. Let me go! Get your hands off me! Arthur's body is lying there, too, now, next to Susan's and Gerald's. But the police will be here any minute, so I have to hurry. First, the goblet. There. That's done. That... No. Some of the broken fragments still glitter in the lamplight. I've got to crush them, grind them to powder under my heel. All these other pieces that I can't find. They're, they're hiding from me. They're afraid of me. But I'll find every piece. I'll find them. I'll find them. I'll find them. <laughs> Three bodies lying huddled on the floor. The madman crushing the fragments of the broken goblet to powder as the police car drives up and the clock strikes 12 for murder at midnight. again when death appears at the door, wearing the face of a friend, and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of Harvey was played by Eric Dressler. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Last time, Walt. Please let me go. Nuts. Then it has to be this way. Hap, no. Drop that gun. Uh, I'm sorry, Walt. Very sorry. I've known all along you had to die tonight. But I didn't know. I killed you. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in... The Man Who Died Yesterday. <laughs>
And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of Mystery and Terror by Radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story by William Morwood is The Man Who Died Yesterday. traveled highway. A strange-looking man in threadbare clothes stands hopefully by the roadside. A car comes around a curve. Slows up. Stops. Looking for a lift? Are you headed for New York? That's me. Hop in. Thank you. It's very good of you. I... I'm in a hurry to reach New York. I haven't much time, you see. Yeah, sure. I picked you right off for a big executive on his way to a board meeting. Oh, nothing like that. <laughs> it's just that oh, there's something terribly important I've got to do. A mission. Oh, Salvation Army, huh? No, United Nations. I have to see the Secretary General before midnight tonight. That leaves me only eight hours. The United... Are you feeling all right, pal? Yes. I was sick, but... I'm feeling fine now. You don't look so good to me. Why does it go? Of course, you could do with a haircut, too. I suppose so. I'm afraid I've been out of touch with civilization a long while. By the way, my name is... Rather was... David Hepgood. I am. I'm Walt Griggs. Can't you drive any faster, Walt? We've still got a long way to go, and... Well, I'm worried about this part of the road. There's going to be a rock slide and... Rock slide? Oh, you mean those signs? Ah, uh, it's nothing to worry about. They put them up on... What the... It's all right. Keep going, Walt. We got through safely. Yeah, but... There was a rock slide, just like you said. Of course. But... How did you know? I can see ahead, Walt. See into the future. For 24 hours. <laughs> I was nuts, of course, but still, what are the odds against calling a long shot like that? A million to one? A billion? I gave up trying to figure it. We drove along for about an hour and then stopped for gas. There was this hamburger joint right by. Where are we going, Walt? Grab a bite. Oh, but there isn't time. I've less than seven hours now, and by midnight I... have got to gas up anyway, and I'm hungry. Come on, Hap. Hello, sugar. Sit down, Hap. What'll it be, boys? Hamburger for me, sweetheart, with onions. What's yours, Hap? I... I'm not hungry. Oh, busy with your speech for the United Nations, huh? Well, I'll just read this racing form while you're thinking. Racing form? Sure, I play the G's all the time. Got some important dough on today's meet. Fifty bucks on Alistair to win in the sixth. Alistair? Yep. I'm afraid you'll lose your money, Walt. What? Don't kid me. Alistair's the hot favorite. It's going to be a walk away. Marble the third won that race. Marble? What are you nuts? He's a rank outsider. A hundred... To... What do you mean, won the race? It hasn't been run yet. Hasn't it? I didn't know. Look, I... Wait a minute. Sweetheart. Yeah? You think you can get the races on the radio? Oh, sure. It's all tuned in. A lot of our customers like to listen. Well, we can't waste time like this. Who can think about a horse race? I like... can. Remember my 50 bucks. What? For the great race. The crowd is going wild with excitement. They're around the bend now, coming into the straight. Alistair is out in front by two lanes. Uh-huh. The rest of the horses bunched. Alistair is going strong. Atta boy, where's your marble, Hap? Wait. Entering the last stretch now. It's a walk away for Alistair. I see. Four lanes ahead and no challengers. Wait a minute. Alistair stumbles. Can't regain stride. He's down. What? The chockies don't clear, but Alistair is... The other horses have gone past. Number eight is out in front. Number eight. Marble the third. Marble the third. Marble the third. And Marble wins. We go. Ah, turn that thing and off. And run for the books, folks. The most extraordinary. I'll be. You knew it all the time, Hap. You knew Marble had to win. Of course. Thought we've got to go. Sure. Sure, Hap. Anything you say. You're the guy I've been waiting for all my life. I didn't need no more figuring to tell me Hap was a gold mine. 
And I had him first before anybody else could get their hooks into him. The only thing that worried me was the way he talked. All this about midnight, not having much time. I had to use him while I had him, even if it meant taking chances. So while we drove, I worked on a plan. Walt, we've left the New York road. The signs are pointing the other way. I know. I'm taking a shortcut through a town called Hassock. Hassock? Yeah. That name mean anything to you, Hap? Hassock? Think hard. Let me see. There's going to be a hold up there tonight at the factory. Two men involved. They steal the week's payroll, ten thousand dollars. Ten grand, huh? They get away with it? Well, there's a chase, but they take off the police. Great. Couldn't be better. Why? Where the two men have. You and me. What? No, Walt, no, I'm not a criminal. And I've something else to do with what little time I have left. You're coming with me, Hap. Maybe this will convince you. Her gun doesn't frighten me. Stop the car and let me out. I've got to get to New York. All right, look, I'll make a deal with you. You come with me on the stick-up and I'll drive you straight through to New York without stopping. Are you on? But, but I can't, Walt. My message concerns the whole world. That's the only way you'll get to deliver it. Well, if, if it is the only way. All right. Now, there's something more I've got to tell you, Walt. What's that? We leave a dead man behind. It was getting dark when we hit town. I drove down the main street and onto the factory building beyond. It was all dark except for a light in the cashier's office. Hap and I went in. There was a guy sitting at a desk. Who? Who are you? What do you want? The ten grand in that safe. This is a stick-up, brother. Y- you're crazy. There's no ten... Open up. I'll do the talking. I, I warn you, men. You'll be caught for... Shut the... up and start turning that dial. All right. Well, I guess you win. Come on, come on. Snap into it. I'm doing the best I can. That's it. Now hand out those greenbacks. Come on, get a move on. Watch out, Walt. He's turning in an alarm. Oh, you double cross and rat... The guy that had to be killed, Hap? Yes. Okay, then step on it. The cops will be swarming around like flies. They're gaining on us, Walt. I can't go any faster. I'm down to the floorboards already. He'll start shooting soon. You sure we get away? There's no slip-up? No. We get away all right. Good. Good. Where did they get you, Walt? My arm. What do we do, Hap? Keep driving till we hit that bend in the road. Yeah? There's a clump of willows around the corner. Pull in there. Okay. Here goes. Starts the lights. Off. We shook him, Hap. Just like you said. No hurry. Get back to the New York road. I've less than three hours left. Okay, but i got to stop and see a doctor. A doctor? Sure, my arm. Oh, what's the matter, Hap? I, I'm afraid of that doctor. Something happens there that I don't understand. What is it? I don't know. It's something I should have explained before. I can see into the future for you, Walt, and for everyone else. But not for myself. You the doctor? What can I do for you? Oh, my arm. I had a little accident. I was cleaning my gun and went off. Come into my office. Okay. And this man? He's oh, just a friend of mine. Nothing the matter with him. I don't agree. He looks much sicker than you do. No, doctor, really. Your face. It's the color of... No, and I'm all right. Believe me. Please hurry with my friend. It'll only take a second. Just get my status Look, open. let's quit kidding around, doc. I'm the one Quiet. that... Hmm. Good Lord. What's the matter, Doc? Why are you looking at him like that? Well, it's it's impossible, of course, but there's no heartbeat. No. But but that's impossible. If, if your heart wasn't beating, you'd be... Dead? Yes. I've been dead since yesterday at midnight. Staring at him. 
the living corpse of the man who died yesterday, Walt, and the doctor draw back in horror. Just who is David Hapgood? Perhaps we'll know when the clock strikes twelve for... Murder at midnight. and the man who died yesterday. The goose pimples were standing out on me. Here I found the guy. I'd been with him for hours through a hole up in a killing. And now I was hearing from his own lips that he was dead. He gave me the creeps. I wanted to take it in the land, but instead I was froze to the floor. I heard the doc saying... You've been dead since yesterday? Yes, doctor. But that's, that's impossible. There must be some explanation, some obscure heart condition. There is an explanation, but not that kind. You see, I was cheated out of 24 hours at the time of my birth. Eh? And I'm just speaking up for it now. How do you mean? This will sound fantastic to you, but nevertheless it's true. I was born on a ship crossing the international date line... I started coming into the world during the last moments of a Friday and finished up early on Sunday. So I skipped a whole day of my life. I've always been living 24 hours ahead of myself. But but that's sheer... gospel, Doc. He can call the turn on anything like he was reading tomorrow's paper. I told you it would sound fantastic, Doctor. But it is true. When I realized it, I... Well, I tried not to use it for selfish ends. I wanted to help people. But I never could. People would never listen to me, believe me. Finally, I realized that there was no place for me in the world. That man wasn't meant to know the future. So I went away. Up into the woods. Uh, how long ago? About ten years ago. Away from civilization, it was easier. I still knew what was going to happen, of course. But with no way to communicate my knowledge, my conscience was at rest. That is... Until last night. Last night? I had caught a cold. It developed into pneumonia. I was deathly sick. I couldn't breathe. And uh, lost consciousness. Then suddenly, at midnight, I was well. Quite well. Not a trace of my illness. I knew what had happened, of course. I was dead. Duh. But I still had my missing day to live. I knew I must use it for the benefit of mankind. How? There's something I know. Something that involves the fate of millions of people. Unless some action is taken within the next few hours. What action? What is it? I'm sorry, but I can't tell you, Doctor. I can't tell anyone except the Secretary General of the United Nations. And I must reach him before midnight, before I'm really dead. It's getting on to ten o'clock. Now do you understand why I'm in such a hurry? I'll say, let's get going, Hap. Never mind about my arm. That can wait. No, listen to me, Hap. You can't leave. What? As far as your being able to read the future is concerned, well, it doesn't matter whether I believe that or not, but that heart condition of yours, that's something unique in medical history. Now, you've got to let me take you to a hospital where it can be studied properly. Lay off that stuff, Doc. I'll phone for an ambulance. Stay away from that phone. He's mine. Yours. But do you realize what this can mean to science? To Don't you... give me that talk. You just want to grab him off for yourself. Uh, nonsense. Stop it. Stop it, both of you. I don't belong to anyone. I'm not a specimen to be examined. I've got a mission to perform for all of civilization. I've got to get to the United Nations before... Now, now, no matter how you've been deluding yourself, young man, you're terribly sick. I'm going to phone the hospital Okay, and... you asked for it. Do you? I must get away from here. Hap. Hap, come back here. Come back here. Okay, you did that. It won't hurt you if you're not. Oh. Holy smoke. That bullet went right through you and only knocked you down. Let go of me, Walt. Try to run away, huh? I've got to get to New York. Nothing can stop You're coming with me, Hap. i got plans for us as long as you last. You've got your 10,000. What more do you want? A chance to run it up to 100,000 and we can do it. I know the police and you can call the cars. But there's no time. I'm figuring on only a couple of hours. That's plenty. Listen, Walt. I'm asking you for the last time. Let go. Do a decent thing for once in your life. Nuts. What I'm trying to do, it's for you as much for millions of others. I never gave a cuss about the others and I'm not starting now. All right, Walt. 
Something has to be this way. Half, drop that gun. Oh! I'm sorry, Walt. Very sorry. I'd known all along that you had to die tonight. But I didn't know that I'd kill you. Type, ain't you? Sorry? Oh, that's all right. I don't like fellows a gad too much. You know, it, it was nice of you to pick me up back there on the road. I was lonely. Besides, I, uh, well, I needed reassurance. How's that? You see, I've been out of touch with civilization for some time, and the people I've met today weren't inspiring. <laughs> You're a strange guy, do you know it? Am I? Yeah, I mean, the way you talk and look. You don't look quite real. Oh, now, now, now don't get me wrong. I, I like you a lot. Oh, I'm glad. Well, for instance, we've been driving for nearly an hour now, and you haven't even made a pass at me once. I'm afraid that wouldn't do either of us much good. Yeah, but just the same, a girl appreciates a little thing like that. Incidental, what's your name? You can call me Hap. Hi, Hap. I'm Hazel. How do you do? Well, I guess I ought to tell you something about myself. Well, I know a little already. Huh? You're going to New York to find your fiancé, aren't you? Yeah, a guy called... Say, how'd you know that? You're going to look him up in the phone book and call. Then you're going to uh, find out that he's married. What? Oh, you're kidding me. Jim wouldn't do a thing like that. He'd wait for me forever. He said he would. And Hey, why are we stopping? Almost out of gas. Howdy, folks. Uh, fill her up as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, how far to New York from here? Well, you ought to be at George Washington Bridge in about ten minutes. Fine. You folks hear about all the excitement on the highway? No, what happened? Well, the cops are looking for a crazy killer. Murdered three people. One was a stick-up, the other two was a doctor and his own sidekick. Oh, what's he look like? Well, according to the radio, he's got, got a chalk white face, a... Mop of hair that looks like it hasn't been cut in weeks. No hat and, uh, and... What's the matter, bud? What are you staring at? Your, your friend, I... I, I gotta get something out of the office. I'll be back in a minute. He's going to phone the police. This is your chance to get out, Hazel. Oh, no, I'm staying with you, Hap. Now, you better get moving and keep moving. <laughs> We're being followed. We may make it yet. Are you frightened, Hazel? Being with me? I guess I should be, but I'm not. Thank you. Somehow I, I can't believe you're crazy. If you killed anyone, you knew what you were doing and you had a good reason. Thank you again. You don't know what that means to me. Have people always been scared of you, Hat? Most people. Till I met you. Why couldn't I have met you sooner, Hazel? Well, what's wrong with now? It's a little late. Not for me. You honestly mean that? Sure. Well, then perhaps it's going to be all right after all. Perhaps we'll meet again. What do you mean? I didn't mean to tell you this. Perhaps I shouldn't now. It may cause you pain. Go ahead. I can stand it. After you call Jim, your fiancé, and find that he's married... Start across the street in a daze. A taxi is driving too fast and... Uh... It's got my number on it, huh? Yes, I'm sorry. And yet, in a way... What did that sign say, Hazel? Uh, uh, George Washington Bridge, two miles. Oh, I'm going to make it. There's still time. The Secretary General is in his home. They'll let me in when they hear my message. I'll have most of an hour with him. It's not quite 11 yet. 11? Hey, your watch must have stopped. What? Look, look, there's a clock on the building. Where? Up to the right, there. Three minutes of 12. Oh. Well, what's the matter, Hap? Oh, I can't make it. Oh, I've lost. Unless... a hey, telephone. 
There's still time for that. Well, why are you stopping here? There's no phone. In that house, the family's all in bed upstairs. There's a telephone in the parlor. But the door is sure to be locked. They've forgotten to latch the parlor window. Hey, how do you know all these things? Never mind now. Goodbye, Hazel. But I'll be waiting here. No, you better start down the road. The police mustn't find you. But when you come back, I'll be here. I won't be back, Hazel. This is goodbye. For keeps. But you've got to come back. You've got to. Operator, get me the Secretary General of the United Nations at his home. Hurry, please, it's urgent. Hello? The Secretary General, please, it's terribly important. No, I've got to speak to him personally, I... Uh... Midnight. Hello? Will you get him for me? There's no time left and... Uh... Never mind. I'll tell you. It's... It's about... <gasps> Climbed in this window. We'd better go in and have a look. There was a girl with him when he left my gas station. She ought to be around. Where's the light? Here. There he is. On the floor. And he looks... He's dead, all right. No wonder. Look at that hole in his chest. Wait a minute. There's something funny here. That wound never bled. Huh? The only way that could happen is if he was dead before the bullet hit him. Two men staring at a corpse that is finally still. And still forever. The corpse of the man who died yesterday. While outside, somewhere in the night, the restless spirit keeps a rendezvous that none can avoid. And the distant clocks chime the last notes in epilogue for... Murder! At midnight! Time to a full stop, and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The part of David Hapgood was played by Stuart Brody. Vandell Kramer was Walt. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another excited his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. 
And I'd like to talk about an adventure myself. An adventure in good eating. It ends with a good wine. Petri California Sauterne. You just serve that Petri Sauterne the next time you have fried chicken. You like fried chicken? Cooked so it's crispy and a beautiful reddish gold color on the outside and just oh, just as tender as all get out on the inside. Ah, that's chicken. But wait till you try it with Petri Sauterne. That's a wine. That Petri Sauterne is a pale, delicate, golden color. You can just look at it and you know it's going to be one of the most, if not the most delicious. Petri Sauterne is not only wonderful with chicken, it's it's great with fish or any kind of seafood, too. Get a bottle of Petri Sauterne. When it's a Petri wine, it's a good wine. And now I'm sure Dr. Watson's expecting us, so let's go in and join him. Ah, oh, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening. Drop your chair by the fire. That's it. The tobacco's in the jar beside you over there. Thanks. Well, Doctor, all ready for tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Yes, Mr. Bartell. Though on this occasion I'm going to tell a story. You see, I didn't take part in it myself, so I shall act as a narrator and recount the adventure as it was told me some years after it actually took place. Told you by Sherlock Holmes, I suppose. Yes. At the time the story happened, the whole world, including myself, believed that my old friend had been dead for three years. What did he do with himself during those three years, Doctor? Wandered about the world, Persia, Egypt, the south of France, and two years of his time was spent in Tibet, where he disguised himself as a Norwegian explorer by the name of Sergusson, his object being to visit the forbidden city of Lhasa. The story began as Holmes stood on the outskirts of a tiny encampment, high in the Tibetan snows, disguised as a Norwegian Sergusson. Surrounding him was an excited group of, of native guides, their fur-capped faces and shaggy sheepskin coats, making them appear like strange, wild animals, uh, gesticulating wildly. The freezing wind whirled great clouds of snow away from the mountaintop that loomed above them. And Holmes told me that he felt a premonition of impending disaster. My men will go no further. They say the goddess of the mountain is angry. If we climb further, she will swallow us up. She will bury us. But we cannot go back now. We have come so far, a thousand feet, eight hundred feet higher. We shall reach the pass. We shall be safe. I will not go. We can stay back there in the tents until the goddess of the mountain tells us we may go further. He is right. We can't go. We don't want to go anymore. It's too... Fools! If you stay here in the wilderness, in the village, and the avalanche comes, you will all be buried. You will be swept away. The only road lies upward. Back to the tent! The wind is rising! Then I shall go on alone! 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 Holmes was the only one who survived. He struggled up the pass that led to safety, the icy gale whipping round him in a, in a frenzy. A few moments after he reached the top, the avalanche occurred. The tents, the guides, and all their equipment were buried beneath hundreds of feet of hurtling, thundering snow. The way behind him was closed. He could only forge ahead. Alone, unaided, he descended the path that led to the plateau beyond. But the goddess of the mountain was still angry. Through the knifing wind and snow, he battled on, without food and without, as he told me later, much hope. Even Holmes was helpless in that battle of man against the elements. What happened in that 36 hours, he never really knew, except that the wind howled and the driving snow slashed at him without mercy. Finally, his mind began to wander, and he became delirious. Watson, dear boy, hand me my violin, will you? Moriarty, I want to introduce to you the goddess of the mountain. I think you will have a lot in common. 221 B Baker Street, Clavier, for heaven's sake, get me as fast as you can. I think I've caught a chill. Though his mind, great strength combined with instinctive urge for self preservation, must have kept on his feet. But finally he returned to normal consciousness to find himself jogging along a rough road 
in a primitive cart, the sun shining on him, and a white girl feeding him warm broth from a cup. For a moment, the girl looked at him with a comforting smile, and then she spoke. No wonder you look puzzled, poor man. You can't make up your mind whether you're in this world or the next. Who are you? And how did I get here, please? My name is Eileen Farley. I'm a medical missionary. I found you wandering out of your mind two days ago. And I've taken you under my wing. We're going to the monastery of Pancha Pushka. I'm most grateful to you, Miss Farley. You have saved my life. Permit me to introduce myself. My name is Sigerson, Olaf Sigerson, a Norwegian explorer. <laughs> Oh, no. No, your name is Sherlock Holmes, and you're a famous English detective. Please, I don't understand you. Mr. Holmes, you've been delirious for the last two days. In your ravings, I was delighted to learn you did not die two years ago at the Reichenbach Falls. Our simulation is useless, my dear young lady. However, I must implore you to keep my secret. It's essential that for a while longer, the world continues to think me dead. You don't need to worry, Mr. Holmes. I'm a great admirer of yours, and I promise that no one will ever learn your secret from my lips. Try drinking a little more broth. You're uh, dreadfully weak. Thank you so much. Help me, please. Please, to give me help. Another white man travels the road to Pancha Pushpa. Stop the cart. You need help? Ah! Ah, my own cart has broken the wheel. We're going, perhaps, to the monastery of Pancha Pushpa. We are. Ah, good. Pyotr Dmitrievich Borodin, Imperial Russian Envoy, will travel with you. Uh, please to make room. Uh, as possible. Uh, remember my secret. Uh, the cart may proceed. Pani uh, Your name, please, young lady. Eileen Farley. I'm an American medical missionary. Well, I do not approve of missionaries, but uh, you are very beautiful. So Borodin will forgive you. Uh, who is this magic lying on the floor? He looks half dead. I am half dead, Grosbody and Borodin. My name is Sigerson. I am Norwegian. What is a Norwegian doing in Tibet? I have been exploring the mountains. And what, may I ask, is a Russian doing in Tibet, Grosbody and Borodin? What is a Russian doing? <laughs> you shall see, my friend. To Holy Mother Russia shall belong Tibet. But now let us be gay. We have some hours ahead of us. You uh, like vodka, Miss Farley? I'm afraid I don't drink. <laughs> Borodin will teach you to drink. Then he will sing you songs of his native Russia. Uh, we shall be happy. <laughs> Singing. Holmes told me that every note jarred his aching, weary head. After a few hours, the strangely assorted trio arrived at the gates of the monastery. An edifice, as Holmes told me, of great antiquity and of breathtaking beauty, and built in the shadow of a giant mountain. He was fed and bathed, and shortly afterwards he found himself together with his two companions in the presence of the head abbot himself, a man of great age and infinite wisdom. The faint chanting of religious music could be heard coming from another part of the monastery. As the old man... <laughs> My dear Miss Farley, my dear gentlemen, I have welcomed you to the monastery, and yet each one of you has come to me separately and asked that he be given permission to go to the sacred city of Lhasa. I cannot give that permission, my children. Borodjin has traveled a long way. Russia will be most unhappy if he does not get the permission. I am an explorer, Reverend Sir. Will not that fact entitle me to some consideration? I, too, have traveled a great way, sir. My children, I realize your claims, but the permission is not in my power to grant. Tibet is ruled by our Chinese overlords. In any case, I will ask you to turn your heads. The gentleman approaching us has preceded you in residence here. He also wishes to tread the road to Lhasa. You have new visitors, I see. Yes, my son. Permit me to introduce you. Sir Harvey Forrester, and this is Miss Eileen Farley. How do you do? How do you do, Sir Harvey? Gospodine Borodin from Russia. How do you do? One cannot travel the world without meeting an Englishman. God we push it, what's it? And Mr. Olaf Sigerson from Norway. God dark, Sir Harvey. How do you do? Please be seated. My children, 
The Chinese ruler in this province has heard of your presence here. He has announced his intention of visiting you. Before he arrives, I should like to ask you each a question. Four of you, all from different countries, have traveled here to the mountains of Tibet. At this monastery, I can <coughs> offer you refreshment, the opportunity of acquiring wisdom and peace. What more do you seek in life? I shall ask you each that question in turn. You, Miss Farley, what do you seek? I seek the opportunity to bring both God and health to your Tibetan people. And you, Mr. Seegerson? I seek to chart the true course of your mountains, and so to bring knowledge to the world. And you, Gospodin Borodin? I seek to bring about complete understanding between the great peoples of Tibet and Russia. If I succeed, Tsar and his family may consider turning to Buddhism. Indeed. And you, Sir Harvey, as representative of the British government, what do you seek? I shall not join in this country. I merely remind you, sir, that your government has signed a treaty with mine. And was not that treaty forced upon us by our Chinese overlords? No. You have advanced brave reasons, but I cannot help remembering that the streams of Tibet bear gold nuggets the size of hazelnuts. You foreigners, in your pitiful ignorance, esteem gold. <laughs> That signals the arrival of Hua Tsun, the Chinese emissary. Your problems will soon be settled, my children. I will acquaint him with your request. Mm. Why are you smiling, Mr. Holmes? At the name of the Chinese overlord, Hua Tsun. Must avoid falling into old habits and saying, Elementary, my dear, Hua Tsun. Shh, shh, he's going to speak. Silence! Silence! The abbot has told me your wishes. I will hold conference. American lady and Norwegian will not be allowed. Only Great Britain and Russia have treaties with my country. I insist that I have prior right over the Russian representative. George Vosme, I represent the Tsar, and Russia is your neighbor. I demand my diplomatic privilege. Follow me. I will decide these things, not you. I shall inform the British consul in Peking if proceedings... This is an insult to the Tsar. Only Mother Russia will never... Well, Mr. Holmes, it looks as if you and I, at any rate, don't get to Lhasa. No. You look worried. Does the journey to Lhasa mean so much to you? It isn't that. I'm worried about the potential danger that hangs over this monastery. Violent forces are at work. What do you mean, Mr. Holmes? As you know, Miss Farley, I have some specialized acquaintance with these matters, and I tell you that I have rarely seen more clearly exemplified that emotional tension which leads to one thing, murder. That is what I'm afraid of, young lady. Murder. That was what Holmes was afraid of. Later that day, as the sun was setting over the mountaintop, the old abbot walked slowly in the monastery gardens as he talked to the man who he thought would be Seagerson. Oh, Mr. Seagerson, what can I do to help you? Our conversation has pleased me. You are a man of rare perception and knowledge. I grant you one worthy to enter, Lhasa, but I can offer no hope. Mr. Wa has already rejected the applications of both the Englishman and the Russian. He did that. He did, my son. He told me they were both very angry and threatened him. If anything were to, uh, to happen to the Chinese emissary, would you have the right to grant permission for the journey to Lhasa? Yes, until the new envoy arrived from Peking. But what are you suggesting, my son? This monastery is a haven of peace, a backwater far from the troubled stream of life. No violence has ever occurred here. I hope it never will. And yet, the Chinese envoy was threatened, you say, Reverend Sir? Yes, my son. He has left the monastery, of course. No, those who come here even for a short visit must break bread with us and sleep at least one night. Mr. Wa is quartered in the cell you see before us. Then do you mind if we call on him, Reverend Sir? Of course not, my son, though you will waste your breath in talking to him. He will not give you permission to take the road to Lhasa. He sleeps, son. Let us not disturb him. If you don't mind, Reverend Sir, I must waken him, if he can be wakened. What can be wrong? I think I know. I'm going in. There, 
is your answer, Reverend Sir? He is dead. Yes, sir. Strangled with his own cue. Oh, the poor misguided man has taken his own life, my son. No, sir. Look at those marks on his shoulder. He has been murdered. But what are we to do? As it happens, Reverend Sir, I have had a certain amount of experience with these matters in my in my own country. If I were to produce the murderer for you with certain proof of his guilt, would you authorize my going to Lhasa? Yes, since for a few days that mission is mine to give, I will grant it. You fill me with a strange confidence, but how will you find this taker of life? I can't tell you now, sir, but I shall find him. All that I require is a little assistance from you, sir. Of course. What is it? Let us both leave the cell, post a guard here, and give him strict orders that no one is to enter unless accompanied by me. Very well. But, my son, where are you going? Before very long, sir, I hope to be on my way to Lhasa. <laughs> Dr. Watson will tell us the rest of his story immediately, so I'll just take a second to remind you that hamburgers, yep, hamburgers, are practically an all-American food. We all love a good hamburger, but wait till you taste a juicy hamburger together with a glass of Petri California Burgundy. Boy, that Petri Burgundy is a hearty red wine that's just the best friend a hamburger or, or steak or any kind of meat dish ever had. So remember, if you want a red wine for dinner, you want Petri Burgundy. If you prefer a white wine... You want Petri so turn. And if you can't make up your mind which you want, it's simple. Don't buy one, buy two. But always buy Petri. P E T R I. Petri. Well, Dr. Watson, it seems to me that Sherlock Holmes was in a tough spot. There he was, thousands of miles from England. A murderer was running loose. Holmes was in disguise. And he hadn't got you to help him on the case. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bartell. I must say, I think that I always was useful to my old friend. But I, I wasn't there. So this time he enlisted the services of Eileen Fowler, the American girl. Immediately after he'd left the cell of the murdered man, he'd gone to Miss Farley and told her of the tragedy. As they returned to the scene of the crime, he found that his instructions had been carried out and that a guard was barring the entrance to the dead man's cell. There's a guard in front of the cell. My instructions. The abbot gave you your orders. Yes, you may go in. Please close the door behind us. I'm sure your nerves are up to this, Miss Farley. It's not a pretty sight. I've seen sudden death before, Mr. Holmes. In any case, I would dare appear frightened. I'm so flattered that you asked me to help you. You were the only one who knew my true identity. That's why I suggest that you take my old friend's place. I need, what shall I say? I needed uh, a sounding, sounding board for my deductions. Wait a minute, here. I'll light a match. There we are. Now, here's a candle. <gasps> oh! I warned you it wasn't a pretty sight. Hold the candle, will you please, Miss Farley? Thank you. <gasps> this isn't hard to reconstruct. The killer stood behind his victim, held him by the left shoulder. So, wound his cue around his neck and pulled back. Yes, yes. The marks are self-evident. Hello. What's this on the floor? His feet. A cigarette. Dropped as it was burning, I should think. And now it's nothing but ash. Exactly, ash. Now, which of the visitors at the monastery smoke cigarettes? Uh, yourself? The Russian and the Englishman. I think we may justifiably omit myself from the list of suspects, so that narrows us down to two. Look, Miss Farley. What is it? There are clear traces here to the naked eye, not only of tobacco, ash, and paper, but of, of cardboard. But what does that signify, Mr. Holmes? Well, the case is nearly solved. Come on, young lady. We must pay a visit to Borodin's cell at once. <laughs> Always, Sir Harvey Forrester, you give me the argument. But, my dear Borodin... I am not your dear Borodin. Ambassador of Holy Mother Russia, I am no friend of yours. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, oh, huh. the missionary girl and the sick Norwegian. Come in. We will drink vodka, and I will sing Russian songs for you. We haven't come here to listen to songs. The Chinese envoy was murdered tonight. Oh, so we have been told, my dear. Sir Harvey and I are very happy because of his death, are we not? Well, I won't pretend I'm heartbroken. Rasputin Borodin. What is it, Norwegian? You were in the cell tonight at the time of the murder. Huh? That's a lie. I can prove it. In that cell, I just found ashes, a totally burned cigarette, ashes that included fragments of cardboard. 
Only a Russian cigarette has a cardboard mouthpiece. What you can or cannot prove is of no interest to me, Sigerson. He's very obstinate tonight, Sigerson. We've just been having a political argument. No point, except on the danger of the common man. He was telling me of the most extraordinary revolution in his estates. Off one of his hands. Oh, dreadful. Your hand borrowed in. Which, which one? Uh, as God was merciful, uh, my left hand. And the one beneath your glove? Is made of wax, my Norwegian. Is made of wax. Mercy for yourself. Extraordinary. It's more than that. It is conclusive proof. What do you mean, Mr. Seekers? I cannot tell you now. I must leave you here. Let me warn you, the three of you will be well advised to keep an eye on each other. Meanwhile, I must see the abbot. Why, Mr. Seekers? Because now I know who murdered Bart Sun. <laughs> of dawn are stealing across the mountain top, my son. Soon you will be on your way to Lhasa. Yes, Reverend Sir. You have kept your promise. You kept yours, Mr. Sigerson. The Chinese soldiers have arrived and the taker of life has been given into their custody. Before you leave, my son, I want you to do something for me. Anything, Reverend Sir. What is it? The hood figure in the corner is that of the monastery scribe. He keeps our annals. I want you to explain for our records how you knew which one of the three was the taker of life. It was not difficult, sir. The killer had gripped Vatsun's shoulder with the left hand while the right was used to strangle him. Therefore, the Russian Borodin could not be the killer since his left hand was off. Made of wax, then... But the clue of the cigarette pointed directly to the Russian. Therefore, it had obviously been planted there deliberately to incriminate him. Now, there is no trained police force in Tibet. We need no police. There is no crime here, my son. But continue. Why should the cigarette be planted to incriminate the Russian? Unless there was someone capable of making the deduction from a handful of cigarette ash. Therefore, the murderer was the one person who knew my true identity. Miss Eileen Farley, a supposed missionary. No missionary. As it transpired when she confessed, and no American... No. Secret Service agents of America, of German origin, seeking to reach Lhasa before the Russians, and infuriated by Watson's denial of passage. Any Secret Service is better off without such employee. She will pay for her mortal sins. May she redeem herself in her next place on the wheel. My son. Yes, Reverend Sir. You are about to leave me. And I shall never see you again. Though evil and death came to Panchapushpa and to my monastery in the caravan that brought you, I shall miss you, my son. I shall miss you greatly. And I you, Reverend Sir. Would you consider staying here? I can only offer you peace, a shelter from the outworld, and quiet companionship. Ah. But I cannot take them. My work is not done. I must go on. Of course, my son. It was an old man's dream. One last question. What is it, sir? You spoke of your true identity just now. Who are you, my son? Reverend sir, I cannot tell even you the answer to that question. One day, perhaps, but not now. Let us just say that I have wandered through a world of trouble, just as you have remained tranquil in a world of peace. I hope, sir, that we should meet again. I hope so, too. Goodbye, my son. Goodbye, Reverend Sir. Goodbye. That was really an unusual story. You told it so well, I, I felt you were actually a part of it. No, my boy, as I said, the story was told to me by Holmes. I, I've never been to Tibet. Been to India, of course. I never really wanted to go to Tibet. Horrible mountains, terrible weather, lots of bandits on the roads. 
dangerous place. Uh, doctor, you're not afraid of danger, are you? Ten years ago, Mr. Bartell, a question like that had been an insult. Today I realize that all of us, unless we're stupid, have some fear of danger. I would say that I'm definitely not a coward, nor am I a thrill seeker, but uh, I've done with searching for, for something new. Me too, Doctor. I'm through searching for something new also. Now that I've found Petri wine, I'm going to stick to it. Mr. Bartell, no matter what we talk about, when you say it, it always sounds like Petri wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? I can't think of a more delicious wine. And no wonder. The Petri family has been making the fine Petri wine for generations. Ever since the 1800s, they've handed on down from father to son, from father to son, the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, you can rest assured that the Petri family takes pride in doing a good job. They won't put that name Petri on any wine that isn't up to the high Petri standards. Yes, if it's Petri wine, you know it's good wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes adventure do you plan to tell us next week? Well, now, uh, next week, Mr. Bartlett started off in a very light-hearted way and ended on the same note. And yet it involved Sherlock Holmes and myself in serious danger and caused us intense humiliation. I call it the adventure of the pigeon feathers. <laughs> Sounds swell, Doctor. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And before you go, I want to remind the families of our returned veterans that their sons are more than heroes. They not only fought bravely, but in the armed forces they acquired new skills learned or bettered themselves in some trade or furthered their education. Our men have returned with a new maturity and a new wisdom. They'll be more valuable to past or to future employers and more valuable to their country. The greatest assets America has at this moment are her veterans. Remember that. Good night. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Hunt in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Empty House. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, and now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California... Invite you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday night on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is the Mutual Broadcasting The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall, keeper of the establishment where we offer you a full line of spine-tingling items, the shivery best in murder, suspense, terror. And right now, you can sample our latest offering, which has to do with a return from, well, uh, let us say, a return from the beyond. They say that successful people are those who refuse to take no for an answer. They cannot be swayed by reason. They cannot be convinced by the facts. They cannot be moved by logic. They simply will not listen to anyone who says no, not even to the angel of death himself. Barney, I don't want to die. Rest, Barney. rest, darling, rest. I'm so frightened. Don't, don't be, Rachel. The doctor says I have to die. Please, please, darling. I'm so afraid to die. Shh, shh, shh. No, don't be afraid. <laughs> darling, even... Even if you die, I, I can bring you back. 
Barney? What are you saying? I'm saying I'll bring you back from the dead, darling. Believe me. I'll bring you back from the dead. Our mystery drama, Is the Lady Dead?, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes and Joan Loring. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. absolutely no scientific proof, but it does seem to me that, in a general way, a great many people have names that appear to harmonize with their personalities. Do we, therefore, unconsciously strive to maintain the image that our names evoke? I presented this thought merely to introduce you to a gentleman named Barney Kruger. I'm sure Barney Kruger creates an image in your mind. And I'm willing to wager it's a picture of a down-to-earth, practical, two-fisted guy. And you're absolutely right. Barney Kruger is 32 years old and a self-made millionaire. He made his money by sharp, shrewd thinking. By taking nothing for granted. By digging, probing, investigating. Well, I don't give a rap about the report, Carlson. I want to verify those assets. I want to check bank statements. Investigate every officer of that corporation and start with the day he was born. Now, you know how we do things around here. Get on a plane for Chicago, Carlson, and start digging. <sighs> you want to get something done around here, you've got to do it yourself. There's no other way. Uh, Mr. Your... Kruger. Oh, yes, Winters. Your mother's here. My, my mother. Oh. Oh, yes, my mother. Well... I guess, uh, I guess the time has come. Show her in. Yes, sir. Thank you, Winters. Hiya, Mom. Hello. Get your drink? No, thank you. Well, this is a happy surprise. Surprise? Well, I thought you'd be in Europe at least another week, and so when you just called me just before. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I did come back ahead of schedule, didn't I? Barney? Yes, Mom? Well, something seems, uh, different. Different? What do you mean, different? Oh, I don't know. The apartment just seems different. Uh, did you have anything done? There's, there's a definite air of difference about the place. Oh, good or bad? Well, I, I'm not sure, but I, I, I rather like it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I like it. Now, tell me, dear, how was Europe? Oh, you know, Europe. Oh, honestly, Barney, I'm sure you've lost count of the number of times you've been to Europe in the past ten years. Oh, no, 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 I haven't, Mom. I've gone exactly 85 times. You can check my secretary. She has all the records. Well, what's the difference? All you know about Europe covers some airports, hotels, restaurants, some offices, a few mines, a few mills. Mom. You never get to do anything in Europe. I mean, you don't get to do anything... European. Now, look, next time, try something different. Mom, I did do something different this uh-huh. time. Don't tell me. I'll bet you bought a department store instead of a steel factory. Well, not exactly. Now, it doesn't... I got married. Married? Yes, that's right. Oh, well, congratulations, dear. Now, now, where is she? Well, she's right here, Mom. Well, well can I see her? Well, of course you can see her. It's just that I wanted to break the news to you for oh, myself. Oh, Barney, I'm so happy. I, <laughs> I can't believe it. Well, I, I can hardly believe it myself. Well, now, how long have you known her? Uh, let's see. What's today? Uh, Thursday, huh? Uh, well, it's exactly a week. A week? Yes, and what a week, Mother. And who is she? Rachel. Rachel? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, that's a, that's a lovely name. Uh, Rachel who? R- Rachel, uh... Um, I don't know. Uh, you don't know her last name. Well, I do, I do, I did. But I, but I don't seem to remember, Mother. Well, what's the difference? She's Rachel. She's Rachel Kruger now. Well, how did you meet her? Well, it's, it's like a dream, Mom. It's just like a dream. I know, but you had to meet somewhere. Yes, well, I ran her down. 
You what? Well, you know, Mother, in England, they drive on the wrong side of the road. Uh, You mean you drove on the wrong side of the road? Well, I don't have any trouble with it while I'm driving straight ahead, Mother. It's when you come to a turn and you have a tendency to swing over to the right. And so we had a little collision. Barney! Yeah, well, well, no one was hurt or even scratched, Mother. But that was how we met. And so I, um, I took her to a garage to get her car fixed and came to dinner while we were waiting. And, uh, it just happened, Mother. We just fell in love. You don't believe it? Oh, I believe it, Barney. Yes, we we both knew it. And there just didn't seem to be any question about our getting married. I, I would have asked you to fly over, Mother, but time suddenly seemed so precious. We, we didn't have a minute to waste. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how happy we are. Oh, now, don't even try. It's, it's uh, just... Uh... Just what? Well, it's... Just, this is so unlike you. The fact is, you don't even know this girl. Oh, well, I do know her, Mother. But you don't know her parents, her background. You don't know anything about her. I know everything. Well, for instance, where was she going when your two cars collided? Uh, I never asked her. Uh-huh. That's what I mean. Well, I know everything I want to know. I, it's certainly not the way you do business. This isn't business, Mom. This is love. I never thought I'd hear you talk like that. Well, the same rules don't apply in love. All, all you've got to go on is your heart. And if you can't trust that when well, you're in trouble, I guess. Well, Barty, look, I am all for it, and I'm all for Rachel. And when can I finally see her? Right now, Mother. You're having dinner with us. <laughs> I want to know everything about you, Rachel. Oh, it isn't possible to know everything about anyone, even oneself. Are you English? No. Oh, uh, well, where were you raised? It was a very unhappy time. I, I never think about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Are your parents alive? I have none. Oh. Well, what happened? Uh, they were killed. Was it, uh, was it an ac- accident? Uh, no. Oh, please forgive me. I'm not trying to pry. I'm, I'm just curious, and it's a natural curiosity. Of course. Oh, what a perfectly magnificent ring. Oh, I had to buy it in a hurry, Mother. I think it's much too large. Angel, that is a diamond. I wear it because it makes Barney happy. Well, I don't think I have ever seen him so happy in his life. It's so easy to make Barney happy. <laughs> A pity he had to wait so long. Well, my dear, I think you're worth the wait. Now, time I was homeward bound. Oh, well, Mother, must you go? It's so early. Oh, but when you're a guest of a newlywed couple, that's when your welcome wears out. Early. (laughs) Rachel, dear, I'm so happy for you. Thank you. Call me Mother. Mother. Listen, why don't you two girls get together, go shopping, have lunch and things? Oh, don't worry, Barney. We'll arrange for all that. I'll call you tomorrow, Rachel. Goodbye, Mother. Well, I'll see you to the door, Mother. Well, Mom, what do you think? Oh, Barney, Barney. She is just wonderful. Rachel. Yes? Did you sleep? I, uh... What is it, honey? It's nothing. Oh, no, 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 it is something. Oh, Barney. I didn't know people could be so happy. (laughs) There's nothing to it. Just fall in love. Barney, now that I know what love is, I want to live. Rachel, what do you say? I want to live. Of course you can live. I mean, why shouldn't you? You're so strong. You're so sure of yourself. You fear nothing and no one. Oh, darling, don't let anything happen to me. What are you saying? Just hold me. Hold me as if it's the very last time. Darling, what are you saying? Life is so beautiful. I just want to live. Well, you will. You will. Believe me. Yes, my darling. I believe you. Rachel. Hmm. Won't you tell me what you're talking about? I don't know what I'm talking about. I... I'm just frightened. Of what? Of what? When you want something so badly, 
You become scared. But you don't have to be scared of anything. I never really wanted to live until I met you. Well, why? How could anybody not want to live? Oh, there are times when life can be a terrible thing, and that's oh, no, only... No, 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 no. I'm not going to have any more of that kind of talk. Promise. Yes. Oh, Barney. I promise. Barney! What a surprise. Hello, Mother. Uh, would you like something to eat or drink? No, no, I didn't come here for that. Oh, of course not, but every mother has to ask that question. It's part of the franchise. Mom, I'm worried. Why? Well, it has to do with, uh... Rachel. How did you know? I'm worried, too. Oh, why are you worried? It's something in her eyes. What? I don't know. Yes, I see something in her eyes, too, Mother. Something... Something that scares me, and I don't know what it is, either. I think it's a look of fear. Well, what can she be afraid of? We don't know. Actually, we don't know anything about Rachel. We love her, but we know nothing about her. Mom, Rachel is afraid of dying. Well, is she ill? Oh, the best doctors in the country can find nothing wrong with her. But I think I know what it is. What do you say, Barney? You've heard of people who died of grief... Of course. Well, why can't people also die of happiness? Barney. Mom, Rachel is dying. Something's killing her. Barney, don't say that. Mom. I'd better answer that. Hello? Mother. Oh, Rachel, dear. What? How are you? Mother, is Barney there? Uh, Yes. Yes, dear. I'll, I'll put him on. Barney. Yes, thank you. Rachel. Barney, please. Come home quickly. Quickly. Barney. Darling, why didn't you call the doctor? Because... Well, I'll phone him this minute. No, no, please. Just hold me. But, Rachel... Don't leave me. Don't leave me for anything. Rachel, you need to be... No, I have everything I need. Everything I want. Right here. Right now. Oh, darling. I want to live so badly. Well, you will. Don't let me go. Don't let me go there, Barney. To that place. Please. Please, Rachel, don't talk like that. If I... Let go. Bring me back. Oh, Rachel. You're so strong, you can do anything. You can do anything. Rachel. Promise. You'll bring me back. Uh, Rachel. Promise. Well, I, I, I... You're different from other people. Barney, you're wonderful. I know, I know there are things you can do. Oh, Barney, promise. Why? Well, I, I promise. And... I'll help. I'll try as hard as I can to help. And the two of we, two together, we we can do it. We can bring me back. back. Rachel. Rachel. <laughs> Mother is here, sir. Tell her I'll see you later. A uh, Dr. Mallory. Send Dr. Mallory away. He offered to make the arrangements, sir. Arrangements? For the funeral. I'll make the arrangements myself. That's all, Winters. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Winters. Yes, sir. What are we having for dinner? Oh, I, I, I didn't think. I can prepare some sandwiches, sir. Oh, no, no, no. Mrs. Kruger doesn't like sandwiches. Do we have any lamb chops? Yes, sir. Well, I'll have mine rare, as usual, and Mrs. Kruger likes hers medium. Oh, no, sir. Your mother likes hers well done. I'm not talking about my mother. I'm talking about my wife. Your wife? As you know, Winters, there's an exact science to making chops medium. She likes them exactly between rare and well done. But Mrs. Kruger is, uh... Yes, Winters? Mrs. Kruger is what? Uh, nothing, sir. Nothing at all. There may be an exact science to broiling lamb chops, but you must admit there's a fine art 
to being a rich man's butler. And so Winters departs to instruct the cook to prepare a very special dinner. A dinner for two people, one of whom is alive, the other dead. And we'll be back after dessert when I return with Act Two. is always the final answer and death always has the last word but not for Barney Kruger Rachel is dead there is absolutely no question about that but evidently Barney Kruger will not accept it before you dismiss Barney Kruger as a psychotic or a kook remember this is the same Barney Kruger whose reputation for hard-headed practicality is respected throughout the business community. Mrs. Kruger. Yes, Winters. Is my son... I don't know what to say, Mrs. Kruger. He, uh... He ordered dinner for himself and for, uh... For, for whom? Uh, for her. What are you saying, Winters? Mrs. Kruger, I, I'm very much aware of what I'm saying. But surely he knows. Yes, ma'am, he knows. But still, he ordered... I see. Oh, I, I'm not sure of what to do. I was wondering if you had a suggestion. Yes, Winters. Serve the dinner. Barney? Come in, Mother. Sit down. Uh, have you had anything to eat? Oh, yes, yes. Fine. Everything's fine. Well, Winters, uh, Winters told me Do you that... want to look at Rachel, Mother? She's even more beautiful than, than, uh... Yes, Barney. Now, we have to make certain arrangements. You know that, don't you? You know, she came into my life so suddenly, Mother. And so suddenly she left it. Barney... I can't believe that. I won't believe it. Barney... The ring. No, no, I won't believe it. You, you, you really don't intend to bury her with the ring. Bury her? Well, yes, Barney. We have to make arrangements. We no, we we won't do any such thing. We'll bury her ourselves. Barney, no one must ever touch her mother except the people who love her. Will you help me? Well, I'll... just the two of us. We'll see Rachel to her grave. Uh, 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 Barney, now you. Really, you shouldn't bury her with a ring. Why not? Because the ring is worth a... That diamond is worth yes, a... Yes, I know. Rachel said it herself. It's worth a queen's ransom. Well, it may sound rather hard and unfeeling, but what can that ring mean to her now? Oh, everything, Mother. But I do think... It means... It means that I believe she's still my wife. Yes, of course And she... it means I haven't given up Hope? Hope? Of what? Well, as so long as she wears that ring, I could... We, we can... Can what? We can bring her back. Bring her back? Yes, yes, Mother, bring her back. Barney, the age of miracles is past. Oh, no, no, it hasn't. It's still here. Barney... You want to see a miracle? You want to see one? Come Barney... Bar no, 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 Mom, I mean that. Come here. Where, where? Just look. Look in that mirror. Why do you want me to look in the mirror? So you can see a miracle. But, uh, I don't You, think... you are the miracle, Mother. What, are you what, what did it say about you in the Sunday paper, Mom? I, I, I don't remember. Well, I remember. I memorized it. I was so proud of it. Mrs. Elwood Kruger, the acknowledged social leader of the city, stunningly attractive, impeccably groomed, was hostess at the reception for the senator. <laughs> Barney, darling, look, I, I don't... You don't what, Mother? You don't remember... You don't remember how it was when I was a little kid? You don't remember that my father was a hopeless drunk? Look, Barney, and how you washed dishes in an all-night hash joint so you could support the three of us? And when he died in a charity ward? You were thankful because it meant one less mouth to feed? Barney, why I looked you... at you, Ma, every day. You were ready to drop dead from exhaustion, and I said, I'm going to make a great lady out of my mother. And when I was five years old, I started selling papers. Barney, this is not what we're... It is, it is, Mom. It is what we're talking about. Who were you, Ma? What were you? 
You were just a poor girl with no education, no training. Look at what I made possible. I realize, Bernie, I Just know. look in the mirror. Look at you now. Stunning, socially prominent Mrs. Elwood Kruger. You eat lunch with senators. You've had dinner at the White House. Now look in the mirror and tell me what you see. A miracle. Winters. Yes, sir? It's very cold in here. But, Mr. Kruger, the thermostat is way up. Well, Mrs. Kruger is feeling chilled. Mrs. Kruger? Yes, and, uh... Bring her some of that brandy I brought back from Paris. Uh, sir, may may I say something? What? I, I, well, there's no other way to say it than to say it. Sir, Mrs. Kruger isn't here. I'm aware of that, Winters. You buried... Her funeral was this afternoon. Yes. Then... Then you have to admit what? What do I have to admit? You have to admit... You have to admit she's dead. Yes, yes, Winters. She's dead. For now. For now? Yes, for now. Winters, I'd like to ask you something. Yes, sir. I uh, need a man to work for me without asking a lot of questions who believes in what I tell him. A man who's with me. Do you follow this? Yes, sir. Till now, that man has been you, Winters. Yes, sir. So, my question. Is that man still you? Yes, sir. That man is still me. Well, you have to believe with me, Winters. Understand? I, I, I think so, sir. Fine. Bring Mrs. Kruger her brandy. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, will Mrs. Kruger want anything else? I don't think so. Yes, sir. Thanks again. Rachel. Rachel, I want to help you. I'm trying. I'm trying as hard as I can. Rachel. Rachel. I'm very much concerned, Mr. Kruger. Uh, Mr. Kruger? Hmm? Oh. Uh, about what? Carson. Well, the amount of our investment, we're dipping very deeply into reserve capital. Well, that's what reserve capital's for, isn't it? That's why we're getting on a plane for, Ch for Chicago to see, see if we... Uh... Yes, yes, go on. Well, we're going to Chicago shh, to see... If... Shh, shh, don't talk. No. No, I guess I'm hearing things. Well, now I have all the information you need about Henley. Henley? What, what do you mean, Henley? How did you know about Henley? How do I know? A Mr. Kruger. That's why we're going to Chicago to acquire Jason Henley and company. Oh, oh yes, Henley. That, that... Rachel? Rachel? Ra Rachel? Where are you? Oh, Mr. Kruger, who are you looking I'll, for? I'll, I'll, I'll see you later. But but our plane leaves for Chicago. She, she was just a... here. She, now, she can't have gone far. But Mr. Kruger, we have to get on that plane. You get on the plane. You go. But you're the one that has to examine the asset. Well, you do it, Carlson. But you have to make a decision by tonight. You make the decision. You go there and you make it. Mr. Kruger. Mr. Kruger, where are you going? <laughs> Mr. Kruger, what happened? You, you look exhausted. Yeah, yeah. I guess I, I guess I am. What is? I thought I, I heard, heard uh, I, I saw, I saw. I, I ran. What is? I ran. I ran around for hours, trying, trying, just trying. I know why. It, it, it's because, it's because this would have been our anniversary, our first anniversary. Yes, sir. I know that, sir. I took the liberty of opening this bottle of champagne. And, uh, I brought two glasses. Oh, thank you, Wendis. Thank you. Good night, sir. Yes. I thought I... thought I did it, Rachel. I thought I did it today. I thought I brought you back. I thought I heard you. But I'll keep trying. I'll, I'll keep trying. I'll never stop trying, Rachel. Oh, Rachel... Rachel, I can see us so clearly that day, that crazy day I ran into you. 
and you were so frightened at first. You were so scared, it was, it was all I could do to get you to tell me your name. And I, I kept asking, what's your name? What's your name? And you just kept staring at me. And your eyes were so big. And finally, you said... My name is Rachel. Rachel. That's a very pretty name. What's yours? Barney. Barney? I like the sound of that. Mm. I'm sorry about the car. Oh, I don't mind. I never liked this car anyhow. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, Rachel. I'll have it fixed. No, 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 I won't have it fixed. I'll buy you a new one. <laughs> Are you that rich? Oh, I'm fabulously wealthy. But, but don't hold it against me. Uh, do you know you really... You really are a very nice person. How can you tell? I learned how to recognize good people. It was very important for me to know that at one time. Rachel, do you want to hear something crazy? <laughs> Nothing is really crazy when you think about it for a while. No, no, no. This is the wildest thing you'll ever hear. What is it? Here I am, an American... Driving through a place called Henley, just outside of London. I hit a car some girl is driving, and we stop to talk. And ten minutes later, I find out I'm in love with this girl. All I know about her is her name. Her name, Rachel. Now, go ahead. Tell me I'm not crazy. Hmm. Perhaps we're both crazy. All I know about you is your name. Barney. And I love you. Rachel. Rachel, you're here. I'm here. It's, it's you. It's really you. It's not my imagination. Put your arms around me, darling. And, and the ring, your wedding ring. You're wearing the ring. Oh. You, you couldn't be wearing the ring if it weren't really you, Rachel. Oh, Barney, you did it. You brought me back. Yes, yes, yes. You're back. You're back. That's all I have to know. You're back. It all shows what can happen when you're in the habit of saying no. But is she back? Is it possible? You remember the story of Orpheus? He went to the land of the dead to reclaim his lost bride. He almost succeeded, too. However, there was a little detail he forgot about. I won't forget to return shortly with Act Three. It's part of the culture of our country. We raise the kids on slogans like, never say die, don't give up the ship. And when threatened with annihilation by a numerically superior enemy, didn't an American general earn immortality by simply answering, nuts? Barney Kruger took it all seriously. He believed he could attain any goal he set out to reach. He's even brought his wife back from the dead. Barney, I knew you would do it for me. I knew you would do it. Oh, Rachel, I can hardly believe it. Everything in the room, it's exactly the same. Exactly. Yes, yes, I didn't touch anything. Nobody touched anything. Everything is here, you see? Just as I left. Yes, your clothes, all your things. E e even the book you were reading, darling. Oh. Look, look, it's still open to the same page. That's why I could come back, Barney, because everything that's me is here. Oh, you were never gone, Rachel, never. Keep me here, Barney. Keep me here. Yes, I will, I will. I, I just wish I knew how. But you know how. You know. Hey, excuse me, sir. I, uh, I, I thought... I thought I heard you talking Withers. in here. Winter, Winters, look. Is huh? Mrs. Kruger? See, dear, it's Winters. You always liked Winters. Is, isn't that just great, Winters? She's back. Uh, uh-oh. <sighs> yes, sir. <laughs> Barney. Mom. Well, what's the sensational surprise? I hope you're hungry. Oh, of course I am. Am I late for lunch? Oh, you'll remember this lunch as long as you live. Well, uh, I see the table's set for three. 
Who is your guest? Oh, no, no guest, Mom. It's all family. Family? Mom, I have a problem. Oh, are you asking me to help? Yes, yes. Well? Well, I, uh, I didn't realize how complicated a thing like this would be. You see, after all, legally, she is dead and, uh... And what? And there was a death certificate, a, a burial, and, uh... Well, how can I account for the fact... Barney, what are you trying to say? Mom, how, how, how do I, uh... Re reintroduce her in, into the world? Barney, are you all right? Mom, Mom, she's back. Who? Who do you think? Rachel. Barney, I... I... did it, Mom, I did it. I made the miracle. I made it happen. No, Barney. Wait, wait. Just wait. You'll see. You'll see. You'll see with your own eyes. Now, wait. Now, Barney, please. Wait, 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 Mom. Wait. Rachel? Rachel, Mother's here. It's time for lunch. Well, Mother? Mom, come on now. I know it's a shock, but here she is. Here? Who is? Rachel. Rachel? Well, can't you say anything? Barney. You mean you can just stand there and not do anything, Mother? Barney, I, I don't know what Well, a, to... a, a normal person would, would, would put her arms around... Barney. Please, Mother. You, you, you claim you don't see, oh, Rachel? Oh, Barney, my son. Now, just a minute. Win Winters. Winters, come in here. Uh, Barney, let me call. Wait, Mother. Winters. Uh, yes, sir. Winters, how many people are here in this room? How many, uh, how many people, sir? Yes, you heard me. There's you, my mother, myself, and... And? And my wife. Ah. Yes, sir. Yes, Winters. Sir. That'll be all, Winters. Yes, sir. Well... That man worships you, Barney. He'd lay down his life for you. He'd swear on mother, the Bible. What do, you, what do you say now? Huh? I say that Winters is wrong to help you perpetuate this... This fantasy. Oh, is that what it is? Barney, please let me call... A, do a doctor, huh? Naturally. But what else? You say you don't see Rachel. Rachel huh? is... I didn't ask you that. I asked you if you see Rachel. No, Barney, I don't see Rachel. I believe you. Well, then... You don't, you don't see any woman as a part of my life, oh, mother. Oh, Barney. You know, it's a funny thing, Ma, now that I look back on it. You never really wanted me to get married. No, oh, sure, sure, you always said so. And you encouraged me to meet this one or that one or the other one. But that was just a paint on the top, Mom. Somehow or other, you'd always top me off at the last minute. Now, Barney, why would because I... Because you wanted me all for yourself. <gasps> Barney! Papa's been dead 25 years. You never went out with another guy once. Oh, why? Barney, I... Even today, hundreds of men, guys who are really up there, too, they all go for you, Mother. How come you never even look at anybody? Barney, this is not the time. You wanted me all to yourself, and you still want it that way. That's why you don't see Rachel. But she is not Rachel. He... Rachel, say hello to Mother. Hello, Mother. She's not here, huh? Who just spoke? Who's standing right next to me? Barney, what do you want me to say? It isn't as if you were a little boy and we can play little games together. I'm not. I'm not your little boy anymore, Mother. I'm, and I'm on my own. And, and there's another woman in my life. Barney, please. I want you to face reality. Mom, she's not throwing you out. She's not taking your place. She's what... She's what another part of me needs. Now, please, Mom. Just take her in your arms, huh? And tell her she's welcome. She's your daughter. What do you want, Carlson? This is the first time you've been to the office in weeks. Is that so? I've had to make a lot of judgments. Well, that's what you get paid for. But if I'm wrong, we, we, we can go broke. Oh, come on now. Lay everything on the table and I'll straighten it out. Well, the Midwest merger. Well, I, I... The Midwest merger? Well, I'll tell you what I've decided. I've been juggling all the facts. And now that I think about it... Yes? Now that I, now that I think about it... Uh, just a minute. Now, the option expires this afternoon. We really have to move quickly. Yes, just, just a minute, please. Darling. Hello. I miss you, Barney. Yes, I miss you, too. I need you to keep me here. Don't stay away from me, Barney. No, I won't. I need all of your faith, all of your strength. 
All of your will. Darling, you've got it. I need you to hold me, Barney. Hold me. Yes, yes, yes. Hurry back to me, darling. Hurry before I slip away again. No, no, don't. Don't do that. I'll be right there. Hurry, Barney. I'll see you, Carlson. Where are you going? I have an important date. Mr. Kruger, we are going broke. Can't you understand? I need half a million dollars to cover an option this afternoon. We don't have... Well, don't bother me with details. And unless you raise another 500000 by Wednesday morning... All right, we... all right, I'll raise it. But I Is don't there anything see else? you can raise... Just leave it to me. Oh. Please. Now, I'm going home, and I don't want anybody to disturb me. Barney. Hmm. Do you ever get tired of me oh. after the life you led before? Now, what kind of life did I lead before? Well, you went everywhere. Well, we go everywhere, the two of us. Even if we never leave the house, we sit here together and... Oh, uh... Barney, I hope I'm enough for you. No, 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 no. We don't need that kind of talk. Because I'll have to be enough for you. I'll need you with me all the time. <laughs> Tell my son I wish to see him, Winters. I am sorry, ma'am, but he refuses to see anyone. Now, don't you take that tone with me. I'm his mother. I, I said I was sorry, ma'am. Uh, I'll have to ask you to leave. You will have to throw me out. Winters, what's... Oh. That'll be all, Winters. Yes, Barney, I must talk to you. What's there to talk about? Look. Barney, this newspaper. Read it. I don't care about anything. Just read it. The incredible collapse of the Kruger Enterprises. The disappearance of Barney Kruger from the command post is the possible cause You of... see, you're broke. You don't have money to throw around anymore. You know, if you had that ring right now... Now, Mother, I don't want to hear anymore. If you had that ring, you could hold off some creditors, buy some time... Will you let me alone? The world won't let you alone. Now, you won't be able to keep this house... Mother, I don't want to you hear anymore. Don't you say that you don't care. This is a conceit of yours. But it takes money to maintain now, Mother, it. Mother, I think you've said enough. Now, do you want to say hello to Rachel before you leave? Barney, there is no Rachel. You and I saw her placed in her grave. Rachel is dead. No! Rachel's right oh, here. Oh, Barney. Please, let it be over. Whatever it is or was that raged through you like a fever, let it be over. Come back into the world. Come back where you belong. Well, I belong with Rachel. Goodbye, Mother. Oh, you're... You're like your father. He was a man who was intoxicated by liquor and it destroyed him. And you're... You're intoxicated by Rachel. Mother. By a dead Rachel. And she will destroy you, too. I won't hear any more. <laughs> Barney, hold me. I can't be broke. I can't be. Hold me, Barney. You know, I'm crazy. I must be gone crazy. Hold me, Barney. Kiss me. What? Hold you? Hold me. But, Rachel. But what, Barney? Hold me. I need all of you to hold me. Put your arms around but, me. But, Rachel, you're... you're, you're uh... I'm what, Barney? You're dead. What did you say? You're, you're, you're dead. Oh, yes. Now I'm dead. But if you're dead, why, why do I see you so clearly? Because all of your strength hasn't left me yet. It's going, and soon I won't. Rachel. Rachel, are you here? No, Barney, you couldn't keep me here. You weren't strong enough. You don't want me badly enough. Ra Rachel, you, you're becoming dim, Rachel. I'm no longer your wife. Here, your ring. No. Take your ring. No, 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 no. I don't want that. I don't want it. You didn't believe the miracle. Rachel, don't go. I, I Don't go. I believe, Rachel. I do believe. Goodbye, Barney. Goodbye. Ra Rachel? Ra Rachel? Barney. Your mother, she was here. She was here. She's been here Barney, in this room Barney, all the time. Barney, sit down. 
Huh? Now, have Winters get you something. No, she was here, my dear. You it's know, funny. you know she was here. It's time that we face certain facts. Now, you know that Rachel has... <gasps> Arnie! Look! look. What, what's that lying on the floor? Well, it... Mother. Mother. It's the rain. And there it was, gleaming on the floor, a huge diamond ring, the gift of Barney to Rachel, the ring that was buried with her when she died. And you can believe that she returned to the grave and left the ring to release him from their marriage vow. You can believe that. But if you're one of those practical two plus two must equal four people, we have another alternative. I'll be back shortly. Did Rachel come back from the dead and leave the ring? An explanation that might satisfy some of the more literal-minded among us is that realizing how strapped he was becoming financially, Barney may have paid a visit to the grave and removed it himself. After all, it was his ring. It goes to prove that we have a denouement to satisfy every taste. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Joan Loring, Anne Petoniak, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Well, it's our thinking that's wrong. That's what Mildred said. So when she had a pain, she, she changed her thinking. <laughs> Sounds so simple. Yeah, for her it was. Matthew, I want your permission to do an autopsy on your dead wife. An autopsy? Yeah. I want to have her body exhumed and do an autopsy. Well, will they let you do that? With your permission. I think I can get her father's. Yes, but what excuse will you give? Oh, that there's a possibility she was, well, maybe ill, maybe incapacitated before the truck hit her, something like that. Do I have your permission, Matthew? Well, I... Hester, should I say yes? Well, I think you should. But well, look at it this way. It'll be the first autopsy ever performed on a known witch. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... That's what I heard, Tommy. That's what I heard, I tell you. Frankie ain't gonna stop until he stops you. That right, sick? Well, what do you know? So Frank Stacy's bringing that feud out into the open. That's eh? what I heard. What are you gonna do about it, Tommy? Stop fluttering around. Maybe I'll be able to think. No wonder they call you chick. You act more like a chicken than anybody I ever saw. A 40-year-old chicken. <laughs> hey, that's really something. Well, they don't call me chick because I act like a chicken. 
It's because I got a high voice. Because you're yellow, you're chicken hearted. Oh, Shut boss. up. You're not my problem at the moment. What I told you about Frankie Stacy brought you down, huh? Not exactly. And it is making me think. I I kind of got an idea he'd lay off if we'd keep away from his territory, boss. That's what's getting him so sore at you. Well, what he wants doesn't interest me. Maybe if you two guys could get together, you could work something out. You better do it fast on account of Frankie figures on knocking you off. Anyway, that's what I heard. I know that's what you heard. Chick, I think I got something. Yeah, what? Frank Stacy wants to kill me, but I'm going to see to it that he killed somebody else. I, I don't think that would exactly satisfy him. <laughs> he isn't going to have any choice in the matter. Chick, I got it. Huh? Stacy's going to murder somebody in front of witnesses. Witnesses will talk whenever I say the word. Oh, I see what you mean. You'll get Stacy to knock somebody off and then hold that over his head like. Exactly. And he'll do anything I say. Hey, I, I gotta hand it to you, Tommy. That's swell. Hey, you got somebody picked out for Frankie to knock off? Yeah, I think so. Who? Why, you, of course. Good shot, Frankie. <laughs> it was solid, Eddie, solid. And I'm getting hep to all the angles on this billiard table of mine. I'm sharp, huh? Sure, Frankie, sure. You glad you bought the table now? Natch. Only I think I'm going to change the color. I don't like that green business. All pool tables got green uh, whatever that is on them, Frankie. That's the reason I'm going to change the color on mine. I'm going to be different. Keen, that's me. Now back up and watch me make a mass say shot. Quarter says you can't. Put up or shut up. I can't do it for both of us. My money's good. Now shut up while I try to shut. <laughs> easy money, Eddie. Easy money. We're always making easy money, ain't we? Sure, but uh, generally I'm on the collecting end, not the donating. Uh, that reminds me. Huh? Tommy Morrow is still moving in on some of our stores. Well, he won't be much longer. I'm going to take care of him and that stooge. Chick. Today, maybe. And I'll take care of him solid. I got a plan. Oh. Want me to get it, Frankie? Never mind. Yeah, Stacy talking. Frankie, this is Joey. So? So about Tommy Morrow. You better work fast, Frankie. I just heard that he's sending Chick Lewis out gunning for you. Straight tip, Frankie. Yeah, thanks, Joey. I'll remember this. What was it, Frankie? Anything important? Could be. Tommy Morrow is sending that stooge that acts like a chicken, you know, that Chick Lewis, out to knock me off. He's sending Chick? What's he gonna do, peck you to death? That ain't funny, Eddie. Um, I'm sorry, boss. What are you gonna do? Me? I'm gonna call Tommy and make a deal with him later. Right now, I'm gonna try and make a three-cushion shot with this billiard cue. You see why I asked you to come to my office, don't you, Vance? Well, no, Markham. To be perfectly honest, I don't. But a summons from the district attorney is a command appearance for me, so here I am. I want you to realize what'll happen if the reports I have are true. That there's a feud between Tommy Morrow and Frank Stacy, and that it's liable to flame into the open at any minute? That's right. And when that does come out into the open, there's going to be shooting. Only I don't know any way to stop it, or perhaps you might. If I were sure that either Morrow or Stacy would wind up being killed... I wouldn't bother about it. We'd be much better off without them. There is a chance, though, that some innocent people might get in the way when their gang guns start. Yes, I believe that, too. There must be something you can do to prevent a murder, Vance. My talent lies mainly in solving killings, Markham. As I well know. We have one possibility of averting bloodshed in this situation. I understand that Morrow and Stacy hate each other, but that they respect each other, too. That they've arranged some sort of a conference. Find out where the conference is being held, arrest them both, and you have your solution. We have no case against either of them. Not right at the moment, that is. But I'm convinced the conference won't work out. And I'd like to prevent the bloodshed I'm sure will follow. I understand your feelings. Now, let me see. There's Tommy Morrow and his chief stooge, Chick Lewis, on one side. 
That's right, isn't it? Yes, Lewis is a thin, red-headed fellow. Looks more like a chicken than he does a man. On the other side is Frank Stacy and his head hoodlum, a character named Eddie the Lug. Of the Boston of the Lugs, no doubt. Uh, no doubt. <laughs> Markham, I realize your predicament, and I thank you for giving me the overall picture of the situation. So far, I haven't given you any complete picture. It's more like a negative. What do we do about it, Vance? Nothing, I'm afraid, my friend. We'll just have to wait till we see what the negative develops. <laughs> Well, Tommy, here we are. Uh, you see any see sign of Frank Stacy? I, I don't see none. Oh, Chick, I don't see any sign of him either. But he'll be here. This meeting was his idea. You think he was on the level when he asked you to meet him? Could be, and then again, maybe this is a gag. Now, uh, you keep me covered all the time I walk up to meet him, and if anything happens, I'll... There's a car pulled up over there. Yeah, I see it. Two guys in there. That should be Frank Stacy and Eddie the Lug. That's you, Tommy? Yeah, Frankie. I see you brought company. You ain't exactly alone either. I didn't bring Eddie to make trouble. Just to make sure you didn't. How about meet me halfway? Good enough. I'll take your eyes off in a minute, Sig Hammy. Don't worry, Tommy. I'll keep Frankie between his gunman and me, so Eddie won't do any shooting. You just make sure Frankie doesn't make a move if he does. Don't ask questions. Let him have it. Sure. You coming or not, Tommy? Right with you. Keep your hands away from your pockets, Frankie. I'll do the same. Solid, Tommy. Okay, Frankie. This is as far as I go. You come the rest of the way. Check. Glad you decided to meet me, Tommy. I listen to propositions all the time. What's yours? Here you got your stooge chick gunning for me. What I hear is that you're a little sore at me for cutting in on you. You're supposed to be out after me. Maybe the whole thing is a misunderstanding. I wouldn't bet on that. <laughs> Natch. Now look, Tommy. This is a deal. Stay away from my territory and there'll be no trouble. Keep cutting in, and both of us will be sorry. You'll be sorry you did it, and I'll be sorry about what I have to do to you. Latch on? That's no proposition. No? No. Well, this is. We start working together. Put your territory and mine together. Run things together and split the take right down the middle. <laughs> well, part of that sounds all right. It's okay with me to do just what you say, except one thing. We split 60-40, and I get the 60 that ain't exactly fair. So, so me. People say you're tough. I guess people are right. You don't like a 50-50 deal. Somebody must have told you. Okay, Tommy. You had your chance. As far as I'm concerned, we dig each other. The meeting's over. Good enough, only let me tell you something. Tomorrow at this time, you're going to be begging for the chance at a 40% cut. Spend a little time thinking about that, Frankie. You ain't got much more than a little time left. Hey, what's the matter, Frankie? That shot was a pushover and you blew it. You nervous or something? Maybe, Eddie, maybe I am. Give me my gun. Sure, Frankie, sure. Only you're in your own house. Nobody will try to get at you here. You worried about Tommy Morrow? I don't want him to make his move before I'm ready to make mine. Now, let me have that gun. Sure, Frankie. Here it is. I feel better with it in my pocket. Yeah. Now maybe I can shoot little billiards. I'm going to try this one off the rail. Two bits, I make it. No bets. That gives me all the confidence I need. I'm solid now, Eddie. Plenty solid. All I needed all was... All you needed was what, Frankie? Hey, boss. That's Chick Lewis, Tommy Morrow's stooge. That's right. And don't either of you do nothing stupid like reach him. Frankie, I got a message from Tommy for you. He says if I want to prove I'm not yellow, I'm to take my gun down to see you and let it do the talking on account of... Good work, Frankie. You done it. You caught him right in the chest. So that was the gunman Tommy sent down to get me, was it? 
Get rid of Mitty, starting to bleed all over my new billiard table. I don't like the green cloth, but I don't think I like it red either. In detailing my notes on the Sterling murder case, it struck me that the first incoherency was... Lance, you busy? Oh, please come in, Markham. I was just dictating some notes to the machine so Alan could type them up the first thing in the morning. But it can wait. Just a second now till I turn this off. Glad to see you here, Markham. Thanks. Sit down. Your face tells me somebody's been killed. I must remember to make it a little less revealing because that's exactly right, Vance. One of those two gangsters you were concerned about? No. No? No, it's one of the henchmen I told you about. Remember a fellow named Chick Lewis? Yes, he worked for Tommy Morrow. And he acted a little like a chicken, I believe you said. That's the one. We found his body dumped in a lot about an hour ago. He'd been shot. One bullet did it. What's the obvious implication? That he was sent to kill Morrow's rival, Frank Stacy, and Stacy shot first. But that's not what you're thinking. It never is. You refuse to accept the obvious ever. That's one of the reasons I came down to you right away, even before we picked up Stacy. Now, wait a minute, Markham. I never refuse to accept the obvious at any time. The point I think you were trying to make is that some things are obvious to me that aren't to other people. Nothing you've told me makes me believe that Chick Lewis was killed by anybody other than Frank Stacy. Good. That's all I wanted to know. Oh, uh, that might be for me, Vance. I left word where I was going. There's only one way I know to find out. Hello. Hello. This is Marcy Homicide. Is District Attorney Markham there? Just a moment, please. Here you are, Markham. Take the phone on the other side of the desk. I'll continue with my dictating. Good enough, Vance. Sorry I'm such a bother. Hello? To continue with my notes yes, on the Markham. Sterling murder case. What's that? The two sisters were very clever in their idea. What are you talking about? But their mistake was in trying to be cleverer well, in their be. execution of the crime than they were yes, I do. in the plan. Thank you. Lance? Yes? Lance, that call came from Sergeant Marcy in the homicide department. Yes, I know. I imagine it was something about the murder of the man who was called Chick, correct? Yes, he just got the police laboratory report on the bloodstains on Chick Lewis's clothes. And? Lance, it wasn't human blood at all. It was chicken blood. Chick Lewis had chicken blood in his veins. Really? Well, that changes things considerably. It does? How? I said before that I didn't know any reason that it wasn't Frank Stacy who killed Chick Lewis. I've changed my mind. This is just your attorney, Markham. The chicken murder case concerns the killing of Chick Lewis, henchman of gang lord Tommy Morrow. Morrow has been feuding with a rival, Frank Stacy, and it's natural to believe that Lewis was shot down by Stacy. However, when Philo Vance was informed that bloodstains found on Lewis's clothes proved to be chicken blood, he immediately formed a theory as to his murderer. I'm still in Vance's office trying to find out what it is he has... I'm not trying to be mysterious, Markham. Honestly, I'm not. In that case, you're being mysterious without trying. That's all I can say. My theory as to who killed Lewis might be entirely impractical. Yours might be right. I'd rather not go into detail at the moment. It's too possible I might be off on a tangent. You very rarely are. It's a luxury I can't afford too often. Markham, I'll make you a promise about this case. What's that? Leave my theory and me for a few hours, and I'll see to it that you're in on the finale, if I'm right. What about Stacy? You think I ought to pick him up? I don't know why not. That is, if you can find him. I imagine he'll go into hiding. And Markham, if I'm not right about my idea of who killed Lewis, I'm going into hiding too. Well, this thing worked out just the way I planned it. Thanks for your help, kid. It's okay, Mr. Morrow. I remember what you did. It helped me get Stacy over a barrel, and that's what I'm going to keep him to. Oh, and you can cut out that Mr. Morrow stuff, kid. Just call me Tommy. That's okay. Now, I think... Just a minute. Yeah, who is it? This is Stacy, Morrow. Hiya, Frankie. You got my message to call me? That's right. What happened? You decide to get together with me and split the take two ways? Well, I wouldn't exactly say that. 
fact, I was pretty sure you were ready to listen to that 60-40 deal of mine. Now. What do you mean now? Just that. Now. You knocked off a pretty good boy of mine, Chick Lewis, Frankie. Oh, I did, did I? Well, that's news to me. Of course, I heard he was dead. Got it. But, uh... You killed him? You killed him at your apartment? With my little hatchet. Get cute if you want. But I can send you up any time I like for knocking off Chick. You saw me do it, of course. I didn't. I got a little news for you. If I killed the guy, and I'm not admitting anything, you understand, I wouldn't be stupid enough to do it with anybody around. You should have made sure of that, but you didn't. Besides, you trusted the guy who saw you kill Chick. Eddie? That's right. He's working for me now. That's your story. Wait a minute. Eddie, talk to your ex-boss. Sure. Hello. That you, Frankie? That's enough. Put Tommy Morrow back on. Sure. He wants to talk to you again. <laughs> I thought he would. Okay, Frankie, what goes now? 60-40 split for me and you? Or does Eddie go to the cops? Tommy, it looks like you and I are partners. Well, practically partners, anyhow. <laughs> Do you like telling me where we're bound for, Vince? Yes, Markham, I do. I feel very much like telling you. Well, then? But I'm not going to. All I can say is that we're en route to find the murderer of Chick Lewis. You've told me that Frank Stacy can be found in his apartment, generally. That's correct. And that Tommy Morrow, who employed the dead man, operated from a store. I want very much to talk to one of those two men. I think I know where we're going in that case. You don't concede that Stacy killed Lewis, therefore you want to talk to Tommy Morrow. Is that correct? Exactly. And if I'm not mistaken, this is the store from which he operates. And the shades are drawn over the store window, but I think I see some light from the inside. I'm sure you do. And there's a rather strange-looking individual standing in front of the store. Yeah. A bodyguard, probably. Morrow's? It could be. No, Vance, it isn't. I recognize that man. That's Eddie the Luck. And he works for Stacy. Yes. But he's down in front of Tommy Morrow's office. Well, this is really making sense now. It isn't to me. Unless Stacy happens to be down visiting Morrow. I doubt that. Wait here a moment, will you? Do I have any choice in the matter? Mm-mm. Mm, that's what I thought. I'll wait for you. I won't be long, Mark. Going somewhere, Bud? Yes, I think so. I'm going in to see Tommy Morrow. What makes you think so? Look, I don't have any time to delve into my reasoning with you. Step away from that door. <whistles> Apparently, you didn't hear me. Let me try your other ear. My name is Philo Vance. As soon as you step away from that door, I'm going in to see Tommy Morrow because I think he killed Chick Lewis. Come on, move, you. Make me. All right, I will. Will hey, you? No, I don't think so. Oh. Oh, I imagine you're right, Vance. You didn't need any help, did you? Not with that character. Well, as long as you're here, Markham, let's go into this store and we'll see Tommy Morrow together. What about him? Oh, leave him lying there. He's a good advertisement for me. Yeah, I know what you mean. Well, let's go. Uh. Vance, there's nobody here. There's certainly no place for anybody to be hiding. But there's a door leading out the back of this store, and I imagine that Mr. Morrow went out that way when he heard the commotion in the front. Vance, let's wait right here until you tell me something. You believe, apparently, that Morrow killed his own employee, Chick Lewis. You've offered me no reason for your believing that, or any motive for Morrow to kill Chick. You're absolutely correct. Oh, it's about time I was. A few moments ago, you told me that seeing Frank Stacy Stooge, Eddie the Lug, outside this store confirmed your theory. That I did. You don't tell me how or why or when this case will be over. Don't you think it's about time you parted with some information? Yes, I do. I believe in all honesty that this case will be over tonight. I believe that I can turn Chick Lewis's killer over to you. And what's most important, I believe I can prove everything I say. <laughs> A 
sure he said his name was Philo Vance? Sure, I'm sure. And he was looking for you, Tommy. He knew something. I'm sure he knew something. That Vance is an awful hep character, Tommy. How about he asked you, Frankie? Well, I can tell you what I think, can I? We're partners now, ain't we? 60-40, maybe, but partners just the same. I think getting rid of Vance is a good idea. That's why we're here in front of his apartment, ain't it? That's why Eddie has his Tommy gun pointed at the window, ain't it? And I'm awful anxious to get even for that knocking around he gave me, too. Believe me, I am. A couple of shots from this gun will square things. It always does. You know, Tommy? What? You and I stop our fighting, team up together, and the first thing we do to make the partnership start is have a jam session with a Tommy gun and a guy named Philo Vance. Hey, by the way, you were pretty smart. What do you mean I was smart? Buying off Eddie here so he'd be on your side after I killed Chick. <laughs> that wasn't dumb. No, it was sharp, keen, solid. I like having a smart partner. Now, if only Vance would show his face out of that apartment house door, we could go celebrate someplace. Let him show his face. Just let him show his face. <laughs> Get Eddie getting sore. He, he's got to work himself up to shooting a guy. Well, he could make an exception in your case if you keep needling him. That ain't wrong, neither. All right, all right. I'm sorry. Hold it, Frankie. The apartment house door is opening. That's Vance in the doorway. That's Vance, all right. Pose nice and pretty. Just waiting for this. He's fallen. You got him, Eddie. Let's get this car moving. Not so fast. Don't move, you three. My oh. men have this car surrounded. The cops! That's Marshal, the district attorney. Oh, well, Marco, maybe you got us. Yeah. We did a lot of characters a favor knocking off Philo Vance just now. He's smart, yeah. But he could not think a machine gun bullet. If you knew how I felt about Vance, you wouldn't talk that way, Morrow. I have a good mind to take care of you three personally. And forget about the law. That's not necessary, Mark. That's, that's, that's the guy that's we right. killed. You don't think I'd let myself be killed just to prove my theory was correct, do you, Markham? After you take these three individuals down to headquarters, I'll tell you why I wasn't killed. And how that chicken blood proved no red herring in this case. Better start from the beginning, Vance. I have a hunch this is going to be complicated. It isn't at all, Markham. And I think I'd better start at the end. You know now why I called you to be in front of my apartment with some policeman. Yes. You saw something that led you to believe there'd be an attack on your life because you knew too much about the Chick Lewis killing. And there was. And we heard enough while the police and I were hiding in the hedges near the gangster's car to send them all away for a long time. If not forever. Very well, then. We have that much out of the way. I'll take it from there. When I saw the men parked in front of my door, I suspected who they were, so I called you. And then fixed up a dummy to resemble me as much as possible. Then you came down, opened the street door, set the dummy up, and ducked out the back way. I gathered that. That much is true. Now you want to know how the fact that there was chicken blood on Chick Lewis's clothes proved to me that Frank Stacy didn't kill him. Before you go into that, I think I'd better tell you that Frank Stacy has already confessed to killing Lewis. Oh, I have no doubt that he thought he killed the man. What? This is what happened. Tommy Morrow wanted to get something on Stacy, so he framed the murder. He had Chick Lewis show up at Stacy's apartment, a bladder containing chicken blood underneath his coat. He had already bribed Stacy's stooge, Eddie the Lug, to put a blank cartridge in Morrow's gun. I see now, I think. Stacy fired the blank. Chick Lewis fell, and as he was falling, broke the bladder containing the chicken blood. In other words, the whole thing was staged to make Stacy think he killed Lewis. That's right. Uh -huh. So that Morrow could, in the future, dominate Stacy. But if what you say is so, Vance, that Stacy fired a blank, Lewis would still be alive. Yes, and the chances are he still would be alive if he hadn't quarreled with his boss, Morrow, after the supposed murder. This is pure supposition, of course, but I imagine Morrow's confession will show you I'm right. In other words, the supposedly dead Lewis was carted out of Stacy's apartment by Eddie. Lewis then went to report to his boss, but they quarreled, and Morrow killed him. I'm sure that's what happened. It was the only reasonable explanation of why there was chicken blood on Chick Lewis's clothes, Markham. You remember that's what interested me in the beginning. Yes, I do. And I'll be glad to remember that this is the end of the chicken murder case. <laughs> Glass 
this tube was pointing at Matson's body. When the switch went in, there was a whining noise. And then a white light shot out of it. I know you won't believe this. When it hit the body, it, it went all soft. It was just like the bones had gone out of it. It just went all soft and kind of poured off the chair and onto the floor. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in... The Heavy Death. And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's Masters of the Macabre. Our story, written by Robert Newman, is a weird and fantastic nightmare called The Heavy Death. A road just outside the small town of Medford. And running up at his face, white and terror-stricken in the moonlight, is a small, slight man. He pauses every once in a while, his breath whistling in his nostrils, listening, then runs on again. Finally, seeing the two green lights of the state police barracks, he moans with relief and runs in. Oh, thank God there's somebody here. I was afraid. Look, officer, you've got to get me away from here fast. Huh? Yeah, just a minute, Mac. Take it easy. Take it easy. He'll be here any minute coming after me. i got to get away, I tell you. And I'm I... telling you to take it easy. Just wait till I get through talking to Dr. Carden Dr. here. Dr. Carden? Are you Dr. Carden lives in the big white house near the river? Why, well, yes. Well, then you can tell him it's true. Otherwise, he won't believe me. Nobody will. It was you who swiped the big glass thing from, from your laboratory. A Geiger counter? You stole it? Well, he made me do it. Oh, now, whoa. This is getting interesting. That's why Dr. Carden's here. You know anything about his assistant? Young chap named Matson? Yeah. He's dead. He killed him. Matson? Matson dead? Maybe you better start from the beginning. Tell us the whole story. Yeah, but I did it at the right time. He'd be coming after me and... Oh, okay. Like I said, you won't believe it. My name's Sullivan. They call me Shell because I'm a come on with Brian's giant carnival. Weight guessing is my racket, but I turn my hand at almost anything. You know, Shell, game three, card, Marty. Well, we hit town about, about ten days ago for a three-day stand. The first two nights was pretty quiet. The third one was when it happened uh, there was a pretty fair crowd around, and I was warming him up for some weight guessing, with maybe some side bets, when he came up. Okay, folks, okay. Step up, step up. Hurry up. And let Pop D. Sullivan get your weight. A cupid doll, if I'm three pounds off, either way. Now, what do you say, lady? Your weight's not like your age, you know. Ha, <laughs> ha. It always shows. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, sir? Guess your weight? Do you really think you can? Do I think? Ha <laughs> ha! Listen to him, folks. You bet your sweet life, brother. Oh, I have already. The question is, will you bet your sweet life? What? What do you mean? Look, do you want me to guess your weight or not, huh? On the terms I outlined, why, yes. I'll be glad to have you try. Try, try, Sissy. Okay, folks, here we go. Now, let's see. Mm-hmm. A big man, a solid man. Hefty pair of arms on him. I say, uh... One hundred and ninety-five pounds. One hundred and ninety-five. And three pounds off either way, and you get a cupid now. Now, just sit right down here in the scale. There you are. Hey. Hey, what goes on here? You broke my scale. Yes. It only goes up to three hundred and fifty pounds. Three hundred and fifty. What do you got in your pockets? Would you like to look? Nah. No, I don't know how you did it, but more power to you, brother. When I lose, that pay with a smile. Well, here's your QB. Thank you. No, that's not what we bet. What? What do you mean? I think you know what I mean. The carnival closes in about an hour. I'll be waiting. He went walking off slow and heavy. The crowd stood around for a couple of minutes, gaping at the broken scale and talking. Then they all decided it was some kind of a gag and went on and forgot about it. For me, I couldn't forget about it. Somehow I didn't think it was a gag. There was something about him, the way he moved, the way he talked, it scared the pants off me. 
I hung around for a while, getting my stuff together, and then I looked up Rube Thomas. Rube's a big guy. Used to be a wrestler, and he was just closing up his Wheel of Fortune. Hiya, Rube. How are they going? Uh, not bad for one horse town. How's it you? Oh, not too bad. So some wise guy busted my scale. Huh? Busted your scale? Yeah. Um, well, Rube, that's why I come over. He was a queer duck. I just couldn't figure his pitch, but he... He said something about waiting for me when he closed up, so I thought... So, could... so you thought maybe you should have some protection walking down to the station. Yeah. <laughs> That's a hot one. What is? You're on your side bets. Well, don't worry about it. Ain't no one gonna lay a finger on you when you're with Rube Thomas. I helped Rube take down the wheel. But even then, we were about the last to leave the fairgrounds. We went out through the main gate. It was pretty dark, but... I wasn't worried anymore. I'd never yet seen anybody Rube couldn't handle. Then I heard footsteps. Slow and heavy ones. And then... There you are. I've been waiting for you. Yeah? No kidding? Just the guy? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, Bob. What's the pitch? What's your racket? Racket? There's no racket. Your friend and I had a bet. I've come to collect. Yeah? Well, I'll tell you a funny thing about carnivals. When we pull up stakes and get ready to go, all bets are off. I'm afraid this one can't be called off. You see, I need him. You need him? Yes. You bet your life, remember? And you lost. You mean you... Oh, you're nuts. There are people who have thought so, but I'm not. Shall we go? No. No, I ain't got to... Rube! Take it easy, Shell. I told you all bets was off, mister. Now you're going to blow him, I'm going to have to get rough with you. I wouldn't if I were you. No? Well, here's one just for luck. Oh, no, my hand. I warned you. Oh, you. I'll break your bloody neck. I'm sorry. I didn't want to hurt you. You won't believe this. Like, you probably won't believe what happened afterwards. He didn't swing or anything. He just kind of... Dropped his fist on Rube's head. And he smashed in his skull like it hit him with a lead pipe. Good Lord, you, you killed him. Yes. Shall we go? No, no, I... Look at me. Into my eyes. That's right. Now remember this. You're mine. Mine to do it exactly as I wish. And you do exactly what I wish. Do you understand? Yes, yes, yes. Good. Then let's go. Something happened. Happened to me then and there. Something I ain't over yet. It wasn't just that I was scared, more scared than I've ever been in my life. It was something else. When I looked into his eyes, it was like that just plain didn't count. That no one or nothing did. Then I just had to do whatever he wanted, whatever he said. We got in his car and drove to his to your place, Doc, and we stopped in front of it and he pointed at a kind of low building behind it. That is Dr. Carden's laboratory. He has something there I need. A Geiger counter. You're going in and get it for me. You mean swipe it? Yes. It would take too much time to make one of my own, and as I said, I need it. Now, it's a long glass tube, about this size, with filaments inside it. Yeah, but suppose somebody sees me. Suppose somebody comes... Carden's away in Washington with that childish atomic energy condition of theirs. There's only Matts and his assistant, and he must be sleeping. If he should try and stop you, well, you'll have to take care of him, but remember, I want that Geiger counter. Like I said, it was like I was numb. Didn't have a mind of my own. I did it. Found an open window. Went in and got what he wanted. Brought it out to him. He didn't say a word. He just put it in the back of the car, and we drove away. It was about a quarter of twelve when we got to his place big rambling house at the foot of a mountain. It took me around the back to a kind of iron door and... Well, it was... It was like out of Buck Rogers, the 25th century. Big glass tubes, dynamos, wires. He must have noticed me staring because he said... Go ahead, look around. There's equipment here that doesn't exist any place else in the world. Yeah, but what's it all for? And if I told you, you'd be even more frightened than you are now. By the way, what's your name? Sullivan. Sure, Sullivan. I'm Dr. Vance. Dr. Brian Vance. Doctor? Of nuclear physics. Without doubt, the greatest scientist in the world today. 
Do you know anyone else who has been able to convert most of the elements of the human body into the heavy isotopes? Uh, look, I don't know what you mean, but is that... Yes. That is why not only my weight, but the entire atomic mass of my body's... What's that? It sounds like a car. Yes, but Coop. Oh, Matson. You must have heard you in the laboratory. Followed us. Well, I was as quiet as I could be honest. Yeah, there's nothing to be worried or excited about. Hello, Matson. Vance. I should have known it was you. Should have known what was me? A Stolar Geiger. You've done an awful lot of strange things in your career, Vance, but this time you've gone just a little too far. This time I've got you dead to rights. I'm afraid it's just the other way around, Matson. What do you mean? Vance. You don't really think I'd let you or anyone interfere with what I'm doing, do you? You... You killed him, you... Of course. I'll drag him over there out of the way. There's a certain experiment I'm just about ready to try, and his body will come in very handy. Sullivan staring at him in abject horror, Dr. Vance turns away from the body on the floor, lumbers over to one of his instruments, and begins examining it. And far away, in the town's church steeple, the clock strikes twelve for... Murder at midnight. Back to Murder at Midnight and The Heavy Death. It's just a moment later. Sergeant Rowe and Dr. Carden are staring incredulously at Sullivan as he pauses for a moment in his terrifying story. Then the trooper says, We did find Thomas's body out by the fairground, but it was an accident. Hit by a truck or something. You mean this Vance killed Madsen just like that? Shot him without turning a hair. Uh, sure sounds to me like Dr. Carden, what do you think? I don't know, Sergeant. I do know Vance. I knew that he had a laboratory somewhere near here. and Well, it's true that he probably knows as much about nuclear physics as anyone in the world. We tried several times to get him to work with us during the war, but he laughed at us, said that what we were doing was childish. Yes, but, but, but this other business is changing himself, making himself heavy. Yeah, even his voice was heavy-like. Is that possible, Doctor? Theoretically, yes, I suppose it is. After all, Professor Yuri did it with hydrogen, made heavy water, and we've done it with uranium. Yes, but why would he want to do it? Why? There I can only guess. For all his genius, I've always felt Vance was a little mad. It's possible he believes that by changing the atomic weight of his body, he can make it immune to disease. Yeah, that's right. It's true. He said he was going to live forever. Uh, well, go on, Sullivan. What happened after that? <laughs> He made me help him do things around the laboratory. Wire and stuff like that. Seems he got tired pretty easy and his hands was too heavy to do work that was delicate-like. Maybe that's why he needed someone else around. Finally, I couldn't keep my eyes open anymore and I fell asleep on a cot in the corner. I don't know if he ever slept or not. If he did, I never seen him. When I woke up, it was around noon and he had Matson's body propped up in a chair against a... just a kind of a silver screen. So you finally got up, eh, Sullivan? I was just going to wake you. Uh, yes, sir. I... I'm kind of hungry, sir. Oh, yes, food. Well, you're going to help me with a little experiment first, and then we can eat. Yes, sir. Uh, what kind of experiment? Do you... You mean... Why, yes. An experiment on our friend Matson's body. He won't mind. Just a little calcium transmutation. First, we switch on our alpha generator here. Then we make a few frequency adjustments... What? What are you going to do? You'll see. Over there, stand by that master switch on the converter. When I give the word... Yes, sir. They'll let it climb just a little higher. A little higher. Now! Oh! Good Lord! No! No! There's a kind of glass tube pointing at Madsen's body. When I threw the switch, a white light shot out of it and... 
I know you won't believe this. When it hit the body, it went all soft. It was like the bones had gone out of it. It just went all soft and kind of poured off the chair out of the floor. I must have faded or something when I come to. Vance was standing over me, smiling. Anything the matter, Sullivan? Don't you feel well? Uh, yes, sir. I, I'm all right. I was just a... That was the most awful, most terrible thing. Sullivan, if you were a soldier and you saw that happen to the man next to you, would you feel much like fighting after that? What? You, you mean you're going to do that? I'd to... advise you not to ask too many questions. We'll dispose of the rest of the body later, but now let's eat. Like I said, it was just about a week ago. I can't really tell you what happened after that because I was in a daze most of the time. We worked, him showing me what to do, wire and solder and stuff. We ate. Sometimes he let me sleep. Then this morning it happened. I woke up at about ten. He was standing looking at this thing we'd been making. Well, Sullivan, it's finished. Just a few adjustments and we were ready to go. Yes, sir. I'm profoundly grateful to you for your help. I will show you how grateful in a very concrete fashion. You mean you're going to let me go? You're going to let me go? Go? Really, Sullivan, that's a little foolish, isn't it? I don't know. I just thought... Yeah, I I guess it is. Well... Where are you going? uh, Inside to fix some breakfast. No, Sullivan, no food for you. Not today. No food? No. Because tonight you're going to enjoy a tremendous experience. One I experienced myself several months ago. And the process is much simpler when the stomach is empty. Process? You... You mean you... You're going to make me like you? Heavy? Yes, Sullivan. I told you I was grateful to you and... Oh, no, Doc. No, please, will you? For heaven's sake, You're being rather childish. I'm not going to bother detailing what it will mean to you physiologically. The immunities it will give you... I will merely tell you that we'll do it tonight. Getting changed to become like he was. Heavy as lead. Well, it did something to me. It was like I'd been doped, hypnotized. All that time afraid to do anything to make him mad. Now, now I was even more scared to stay. I made out like everything was fine and I waited. I waited and watched. Then about an hour ago, I got my chance. He went into the house to get something. He didn't lock the door. I was out like a shot. Grabbed his car and started down the driveway. As I went past the house, I heard a window open. Sullivan, come back! Come back! You'll regret this! You'll regret it! That's a story. I was so jittery, I went to a ditch just outside of town and had to run the west of the way. I don't care whether you believe me or not, whether you think I'm nuts, what you do to me. I just want one thing. Get me away from here. Get me far away, fast. Because he's going to be coming after me. I know it. Well, I'm not saying what I think. Not yet. What about you, Dr. Carden? I... I wouldn't like to say either. Knowing Vance, I believe he's capable of everything Sullivan told us. And theoretically, everything he described is possible. No, I told you. I don't care whether you believe me or not. Just get me away from here. I can't for an hour or so. I have to call Bridgeton. Have them send down some men. And we can really go into this. In the meantime, I'll... I'll put you in one of the detention cells. You'll be okay there. Are they strong? Really strong? Plenty strong enough to keep you in and anyone else out. Come on. Sergeant! Hey, Sergeant! Back to car! Ain't it about time? Ain't it? Hey, can't you hear me? Sergeant! Dr. Carden! Oh. Oh, gee, Sarge. I was starting to get a little worried. I was... You. Yes, Sullivan. You didn't really think you were going to get away, did you? What are you going to do? You can't do anything. The cell door is locked. And is it? Let's see. There you see. You can't break it down. You can't. It's steel. 
Yes, Sullivan. But steel can be smashed if it has to be. No. I told you you'd regret running away, didn't no, I? No, no. no, no. Look, I'll come back. I'll do anything you want. I'll... I'm afraid it's too late, Sullivan. No. Too late for anything but this. Dr. Carton. Huh? Did you hear it, too? I'm not sure. But it did sound like... This way, quick. Good Lord. Look at that cell door. Oh, and Sullivan. His, his skull smashed like an eggshell. Well, Sergeant, I guess I must be nuts, too. Or, look, Doc. He must have just left here. If we wait for the men from Bridgeton, give him time enough to get back to his place of those blasted gray things of his, there's no telling what he'll do, how many lives he'll cost. But if we leave right now, the two of us, maybe we can get there before him. Cut him off. What do you say? You game? I'm game, Sergeant. Let's go. <laughs> Must be it. Right ahead. The laboratory's probably around and back. Well, Sergeant, the lights are on. Yeah. Maybe he left them on when he came into town and got Sullivan. Or maybe... No. No, listen. He's back. We're too late. What in heaven's name is that? An electrostatic generator or cyclotron. He's... Oh, good Lord. Up the mountain there. Look! Great Scott! Looks like a hole or something. But it's moving. A neutron beam. Disintegrating. Eating its way into the mountain. He must have found some way of harnessing... Dr. Garden! Swinging his way! Must have seen us! Come on, run! No good, Sergeant. Seems to have a range of almost half a mile. But, but eating through solid rock that way. If it hits us... <laughs> You came to see just what Vance was doing, eh, Carden? <laughs> well, take a good look. The last one you'll ever take at anything. Well, you shall be the first to... Uh, did you think that you were going to get away with it, Vance? Uh, who's that? Take a look at the guy. Gentlemen, too much. I've got to cut that down. And what'll happen when you release the load? But I've got to cut it down. Besides, you're, you're just son of a... Yeah, that's because I'm dead that you join me. You can't do it alone. It's too heavy. But I, I too slow. It's time to be high. Good Lord, I... The generator. I've got to cut that down, too. Dr. Garden. Dr. Garden, where are you? Over. Over here, Sergeant. Are you all right? Uh, a little shaken up, but yes, I'm all right. Oh, the laboratory. A whole house. Look. Yes. What happened? Something. Something got out of control. Too much centrifugal force. Or the load released too suddenly, and the whole thing exploded. Now there are things that we'll never know. Except something we knew already. That science can either be man's servant or his master and his doom. And as I stand there, gazing at the smoking ruins that were once Vance's laboratory, through the blessed silence comes the distant clang of the clock in the town's church steeple. For the second time, striking twelve for... Murder! At midnight. <laughs> Remember to be with us again when death hovers like a dark cloud and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight. The 
the part of Shil Sullivan was played by Frank Reddick. With music by Charles Paul, Murder at Midnight was directed by Anton M. Leader. Introducing Lux Radio Theater. Tonight and every Monday night at this time, Lux Radio Theater presents for your entertainment the finest in radio drama. This week we present The Sound of Murder by Donald Westlake. Amy Thornbridge Walker is a little girl. Abraham Levine is a detective. When a little girl tells a middle-aged detective with heart trouble that her mother has murdered her stepfather by making a loud noise at him, what must a middle-aged detective with heart trouble do? Listen in a few moments to The Sound of Murder, adapted and produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Michael McCabe. And now, Act One of tonight's Lux Radio Theatre presentation, The Sound of Murder. Tonight's? Huh? A paper. Oh, yeah, yeah. Take it, Ed. Take it. Well, thanks. So Pope John the Twelfth was the first prelate of the Roman Catholic Church to smoke cigarettes in public. Well, that's just great. The whole world conspires against a man who tries to give up smoking. All around me, day by day, people puff at cigarettes. They don't make any fuss about it. They just smoke cigarettes. If I isolated myself against the smokers of the world, cigarette commercials on radio and television would drive me mad. The most popular sentence in all fiction is, he lit another cigarette. Statesmen, entertainers, all of them, all smoking. Whenever news photographers snap them for posterity. Quiet tonight. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, being a cop is the most exciting thing in the world, Abe. You know that? What? Oh. Come along to Brooklyn's 43rd Precinct, folks. Thrill a minute. Ugh. I'm going to the John. Who knows? I might find a body in there. Yeah. Cockroach. <laughs> <sighs> oh, yes. Sure, that is nice. That is very nice. The governor, cigarette in FDR cigarette holder at a jaunty angle in his mouth. Oh, you're beautiful, governor. The whole world. A grown man who tries to give up smoking is as a comic character. 
a Robert Benchley or a W.C. Fields, bubbling along, plagued by trivia, life an endless gauntlet of minor crises. Mm, they could do a one-reeler on me, a great little comedy, Laurel without Hardy. Hardy died of a heart attack. Abram Levine, 53 years of age, 24 years a cop, eight years into the heart attack range. When I go to bed at night, I keep myself awake listening to the silence that replaces every eighth or ninth beat of my heart. When I climb stairs or do anything strenuous, those missed heartbeats come closer together. Every seventh, then every sixth, then every fifth. One day, my heart will skip two beats in a row. And then, and on that day, Detective Abraham Levine will stop. Because there won't be any third beat. None at all. Not ever. Huh? Huh? Oh, uh... First sign, you know, Abe. First sign? What of? <laughs> Nuts. Talking to yourself. Well, I, I didn't hear you. Come, come in. C come back. Heart? Yeah. Uh, I know a dozen guys with a heart that's kind of suspect. Uh. Yeah. What does is, what is the doc think? Well, I, I, I went to him four months ago. He checked me over. <laughs> Felt like an old auto brought to a mechanic or a boat. You know, a boat its owner wanted to know whether it was worth fixing or not. Or just junk that ought to be replaced. <whistles> like it, it might have been necessary to get a new model. The house next door to mine, a baby cries every night. The new model crying for the old, the obsolete, to get off the road. Well, you've got a little skip in your heart. Lots of people have that, Abe. Yeah, that's what the doctor said. Blood pressure's a bit high, too, but... I paid the doctor his fee, but I'm kind of unconvinced. He said if I really wanted to do something for my heart, I could cut out the smoking. I haven't had a cigarette since. And? I understand for the first time in my life how those junkies we lock up feel. I'm ashamed of myself, becoming so dependent. But I'm going to make it. Yeah. How about uh, turning the fan off? Cool enough. Yeah. Why can't the phone ring? Something. Now I'm trying to smoke a pencil. Come in. What? Someone at the door. Oh. Push! Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, come on in. Uh, sit over here. Uh, you care for a cigarette? Uh, no. Jack, she's, uh... I want to talk to a detective. Are you a detective? Uh, yes, I am. My name is Amy Thornbridge Walker. I live at 717 Prospect Park West, apartment 4A. I want to report a murder, a quite recent murder. A murder? My mother murdered my stepfather. She's a nut. Hear her out and she'll go home. Uh, tell me about it, uh... When, when did it happen? Two weeks ago, Thursday, November the 27th, at 2.30 p.m. Uh, what's your mother's name? Gloria Thornbridge Walker. And my stepfather was Albert Walker. He was an attorney. Uh, was your father's name Thornbridge, is that it? Yes, Jason Thornbridge. He died when I was very small. I think my mother killed him, too, but I'm not absolutely sure. <clears throat> I see. 
But you are absolutely sure that your mother killed Albert Walker? My stepfather, yes. My first father was supposed to have drowned by accident in Lake Champlain, which I consider very unlikely, as he was an excellent swimmer. Uh, how, how long have you thought that your mother killed your, re, uh, your first father? I'd never thought about it at all until she murdered my stepfather. Naturally, I then started thinking about it. <coughs> Did, um, <coughs> he die of drowning too? No, my stepfather wasn't athletic at all. In fact, he was nearly an invalid for the last six months of his life. Then, uh, how... Did your mother kill him? She made a loud noise at him. I can't stay any longer. I stopped here on my way home from school. If, if my mother found out that I knew and that I told the police, she might try and murder me, too. I am not a silly little girl. And I am not telling a lie or making a joke. My mother murdered my stepfather, and I came in here and reported it. That's what I'm supposed to do. You aren't supposed to believe me right away, but you are supposed to investigate and find out whether or not I've told you the truth. My stepfather was a very good man. My mother is a bad woman. Hey, what was that? Who was she? She came in to report a murder. Her mummy killed her daddy by making a great big noise at him. Come again? Well, uh, check it out. Yeah, you do that. Kids come in here, they, they find dead bodies in alleys, and they see flying saucers on rooftops. They report counterfeiters in basement apartments, uh, kidnappers in black trucks. Uh. <laughs> at one time, in a thousand, what a child reports is real and not a product of a young imagination. She did come up here as a joke. A bet, say. Oh, she's a fine little actress. Though, how can I tell? I haven't got any children. It's not easy to uh, communicate with the very young. Her mommy killed her daddy by making a great big noise at him. Yeah. Uh, how many shopping days to Christmas, Jack? <laughs> November 28th, obituary notice on Albert Walker. Cause of death, a heart attack. The mortician was Julius Merriman. The doctor was Henry Sheffield. I've just been talking to Sheffield. Yes, so I got it. You heard then? Well, how could I hear Sheffield's part of it? My ears aren't that big. So? Well, he said it was heart failure, pure and simple. Can't understand why the police should be interested in the case. Neither can I. Sheffield said that Walker had suffered a coronary attack about seven months ago. The second attack was more severe, and he hadn't really recovered from the first. He seemed a bit put out about me calling him. He seemed to think I was implying a number of things. I don't know. He wasn't Mrs. Walker's first husband's doctor. Yeah. Sorry, I... I leaned back too far that time. I... Jack, uh, do you have a cigarette? I, I thought you were giving him up. Uh, not around here. Please, Jack. Noise at him. 
The second attack was more severe, and he hadn't recovered from the first. It was every sixth beat there for a while, after the loud noise of Crawley's backward dive. Did Gloria Thornbridge Walker really kill Albert Walker? Will Abraham Levine really kill Abraham Levine? Huh? Huh? I I, I thought you said something. No, I, I, I didn't say anything. Well, you changed your mind. What? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I... I don't think I'll ever smoke again. If you're coming to me, it must be awful. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's not every night of the year. Not you... every night I talk over problems with my wife, I know. Oh, younger men I know discuss everything with their wives. But me? Well, I'm a product of an older upbringing. I still believe women should be shielded from the more brutal aspects of life. <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> That's your problem. Don't feel lonely, Abe. It happens to all kinds of people. Have some more gravy. Oh, let me tell you. A little girl came in today. She was maybe 13 years old. She was dressed nicely, polite, very intelligent. She wanted to report that her mother had killed her stepfather. A little girl? A thing like that? No, wait, let me tell you. I called the doctor and he said it was a heart attack. The stepfather, Mr. Walker, he'd had one attack already. The second one on top of it killed him. But the little girl blames the mother. Psychological, you think? I don't know. I asked her how her mother had done the killing. and She said her mother had made a loud noise at her father. A joke. These children today, I don't know where they get their ideas. All this on the TV. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Man with a bad heart, bedridden, invalid, sudden shock, a loud noise. Uh, it might do it. Bring on that second attack. What else did the little girl say? That's all. Her stepfather was good and her mother was bad. And she'd stopped off on her way home from school. She only had a minute because she didn't want her mother to know what she was doing. You let her go? You didn't question her? I didn't believe her. You know, the imagination children have. But now? No. I don't know. Now there's two questions in my mind. First, is the little girl right or wrong? Did her mother actually make a loud noise that killed her stepfather or not? And if she did, then question number two, did she do it on purpose or was it an accident? You see, maybe the little girl is right and her mother actually did cause the death, but not intentionally. If so, I, I don't want to make things worse for the mother by dragging it out in the open. Maybe the little girl is wrong altogether. And if so, it would be best to just let the whole thing slide. But maybe she's right. And it was murder. And then, the, you know, the, the child's in danger. Because if I don't do anything, she'll try some other way. And the mother will find out. I don't like that, a little girl like that. Could she defend herself? A woman to kill her husband, or a woman like that could kill a child just as easy. Huh? I don't like that at all, Abe. Yeah, neither do I. question is, what do I do? A child like that. A woman like that. Huh? And then again, maybe not. For right now, you eat. We can think about it.
It's here. I got to thinking about it myself last night. We ought to check it out. I know. I figure I ought to look up the death of the first father. Jason Thornbridge, wasn't it? Good. I was thinking of going to a school, talking to a teacher. She's the kind of child who makes up wild stories all the time. Then, well, that's that. You know what I mean. Yeah, sure. You know what school she's in? Uh, Lathmore Elementary over on 3rd. she tell you that? I didn't hear it if she did. Uh, no, she didn't, but it's the only one it could be. I'm pulling a Sherlock Holmes. She told us she stopped in on our way from school. She was walking home. And there's only three schools in the right direction. So we'd be between them and Prospect Park. But they're close enough for her to walk. There's St. Aloysius, but she wasn't in school uniform. There's PS 118. But with a Prospect Park West address and the clothing she was wearing and her good manners, she doesn't attend a school like that. So that leaves Lathmore. Okay, Sherlock. You go talk to the nice people at Lathmore and I'll dig into the Thornbridge thing. One of us ought to check this out with the lieutenant first. Tell him what we want to do. Fine. Go ahead. Uh, Jack, I, I think maybe you ought to be the one to talk to him. Why me? Why not you? Oh, I think he has more respect for you. What are you talking about? No, I mean it. If I tell him, I think he'd think I was dramatizing or getting emotional or something and he'd say thumbs down. But you're the level-headed type. If you tell him it's serious, he'll believe you. You're nuts. You are the level-headed type, and I am too emotional. <laughs> Flattery will get you everywhere. All right, go to school. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. are, things like that. Yes, uh, about this report she made yesterday, you see. Yes, but what sort of report? Something about this school? Oh, no, no, not at all. Oh, her name? Uh, Amy Walker, Amy Thornbridge Walker. Oh, yes. Amy came to you yesterday. Uh, that's right. Well? You see, I, I want to know what kind of child she is and, um, well, anything else you can tell me about her. Well, I can tell you she's a brilliant and a well-brought-up child. I can tell you that she's the one I picked to be student in charge while I came here to talk to you. That she's always at least a month ahead of the rest of the class in reading the assignments. And that she's the most practical child I've ever met. Her father died two weeks ago, didn't he? Oh, that's right. How did they get along, do you know, uh, Amy and her father? Oh, she worshipped him. He was her stepfather, as a matter of fact. Amy doesn't remember her real father... Mr. Walker was the only father she knew. Having been without one for so long, well, it was important to her. She took his death hard. Oh, she was out of school for a week. 
inconsolable. She spent the time at her grandmother's, I understand. I believe the mother had a doctor in twice to her, uh, to Amy. Yes, her, her mother. Um, how do Amy and her mother get along? Normally, so far as I know. There's never been any sign of discord between them so far as I've seen. But my contact with Amy is limited to school hours, of course. You think there is discord? Oh, no. No, not at all. I didn't mean to imply that. Just that I, I couldn't give you an expert answer to the question. Mm. You're right. Is Amy a very imaginative child, would you say? Well, she's very self-sufficient in play, if that's what you mean. I was thinking about storytelling. Oh, a liar. No. No, Amy isn't the tall talk type. A very practical little girl, really. Very dependable judgment. Yes, as I say. Oh, I beg your pardon, Miss Haskell. Oh, no, not at all, Miss... Uh... I'm sorry. No, as I said, she's she's the one... Amy's the one I left in charge of the class. Hmm. She wouldn't be likely to come to us with a wild story she'd made up by herself. Not at all. If Amy told you about something, it's... Well, it's almost certainly to be the truth. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Could you tell me what this wild story was? I might be able to help. I'd rather not. Not until we're sure, one way or the other. Well, if I can be of any assistance... Oh, thank you. You've already helped. You have all the luck, Abe. You missed the whirlwind. Whirlwind? Uh, Amy's mama was here. Dr. Sheffield called her about you checking up on her husband's death. And just before she came over here, she, she got a call from somebody at Lathmore Elementary saying there was a cop there asking questions about her daughter. She didn't like us casting aspersions on her family. Aspersions? Yeah, that's what she said. You're a little Sir Echo this morning, aren't you? I need a cigarette. What did the lieutenant say? She didn't talk to him. She talked to me. No, when you told him about the little girl's report. Oh. Yeah. Oh, he said it'd take a couple of days on it and then let him know how it looked. Fine. How about Thornbridge? Accidental death. The inquest said so. Uh-huh. No question in anybody's mind. He, he went swimming too soon after lunch, got a stomach cramp and drowned. What's the word on the little girl? Amy? Uh, her teacher says she's reliable, practical, realistic. She tells us something, that's the way it is. That isn't what I wanted to hear, Abe. Didn't overjoy me either. <sighs> no, that isn't what I wanted to hear at all. Uh, what did the mother have to say? I had to spill it, Abe. About what her daughter reported. Well, that's okay. Now we've got no choice. We've got to follow through. What, uh, what was her reaction? She didn't believe it. She had to after she thought about it. Sure. Then she was baffled. She didn't know why Amy should say such a thing. Couldn't understand it. Was she home when her husband died? She says no. Uh, some, somebody had to be with him all the time, but he didn't want a professional nurse. So when Amy came home from school that afternoon, the mother went to the supermarket... Her husband was alive when she left and dead when she got back. Or so she says. She says Amy was the one who found him dead? No, Amy was watching television. When the mother came home, she found him and called the doctor. Now, what about noises? She didn't hear any and can't understand what Amy means. All right. We've got one timetable discrepancy. Amy said her mother was at home and made a loud noise. The mother says she was out to the supermarket. After a lifetime of smoking, my hand just... <clears throat> That's tough. So? Yeah. What, um... What did you think of Mrs. Walker, Jack? She's tough. She was mad and she's used to having things her own way. Can't see her playing nursemaid. But she sure seemed baffled about why the kid should make such an accusation. I'll have to talk to Amy again. Once we've got both stories, we can see which one breaks down. Hmm. Yeah. Mm, I, I wonder... Oh, I, I'm sorry, Abe. Look, I'll... I'll... Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It's... It's, uh... it's a bit 
been a lifetime for me, too. I, I can't. Sure, sure. Can't change a habit for me, Jack. Just sort of found myself watching you light that cigarette. <laughs> yes, I must see Amy again. I wonder if she'll try and shut the kid's mouth. Well, let's not think about that now. We've still got all day. You're going to phone the Walker's place? No, I'm going to call the school. I'll talk with Amy there. I'll ask that we're left alone. Ah. I really am sorry, but you see, girl, we um, had no choice. Your mother had to know. I, I think it'll be all right. She wouldn't dare try and hurt me now with you investigating. It'd be too obvious. My mother is very subtle, Mr. Levine. You have quite a vocabulary. I'm a very heavy reader. I want to talk to you about the day when your father died. Your mother said she went out to the store, and when she came back, he was dead. Now, what do you say? Nonsense. I was the one who went out to the store. The minute I came home from school, she sent me out to the supermarket. But I came back too quick for her. Why? Well, just as I was coming down the hall from the elevator, I heard a great clang sound from our apartment. Then it came again as I was opening the door. I went through the living room, and I saw my mother coming out of my stepfather's room. She was smiling, but when she saw me, she suddenly looked terribly upset and told me something awful had happened. And she ran to the telephone to call Dr. Sheffield. She acted terribly agitated and carried on just as though she meant it, just as though she really meant it. And she fooled Dr. Sheffield completely. Why did you wait so long before coming to us? I didn't know what to do. I didn't think anybody would believe me. I was afraid if, if Mother knew what I knew and what I was going to do, she, she might try and do something to me. But Monday in civics, Miss Haskell was talking about the duties of different parts of government, firemen and, and policemen and everybody, and she said the duty of the police was to investigate crimes and see the guilty were punished. So yesterday I, I came and told you because, well, it didn't matter if you didn't believe me. You'd have to do your duty and investigate anyway. All right. Well, we're doing that. But we need more than just your word. You understand that, don't you? We need proof of some kind. Yes. What store did you go to that day? A supermarket, the big one on 7th Avenue. Do you know any of the clerks there? Would they recognize you? I don't think so. It's a great big supermarket. I don't think they know any of their customers at all. Did you see anyone on your trip to the store or back that would remember that it was you who went to the store and not your mother? That it was that particular day? I... No. No? I don't think so. I don't know any of the people in the neighborhood. Most of the people I know are my parents' friends or kids from school, and they live all over, not just around here. <clears throat> uh, well, we'll see what we can do. This clang you told me about, do you have any idea what your mother used to make the noise? No, I don't. I'm sorry. It sounded like a gong or something. I don't know what it could possibly have been. A tablespoon against the bottom of a pot? Oh. Something like that? Oh, no, much louder than that. And she didn't have anything in her hands when she came into the bedroom? Uh, out of the bedroom? No. Nothing. Well, we'll see what we can do. You can go back to class now. Thank you. Thank you for helping me. It's my duty, as you pointed out. You'd do it anyway, Mr. Levine. You're a very good man. Like my stepfather. <clears throat> Yeah. More ways than one, maybe. Well, you go back to class. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, there's one thing I can't do for you. Now, uh, look. Um, <laughs> hope Mrs. Haskell doesn't mind me stealing a piece of paper from her pad. Now, look. This is the number of the precinct, and this is my home number there. Now, if you think there's any danger of any kind, any trouble at all, you can call me. At the precinct until 4 o'clock, and then at home after that. Oh, thank you. You are a very good man. A very, very good man.
Hey, switch off that lousy fan, Jack. It's like Antarctic in here. You have a fan on to keep cool, and I wear a coat to keep warm. We were born for different worlds. So? Nothing. Same here. Not a thing. Sheffield says, in his opinion, that Amy's making the whole thing up. That her stepfather's death was a great shock, and all this is some kind of delayed reaction to it. Certainly he won't admit any possibility that Mrs. Walker murdered her husband. Neither can he see any possible motive for such an act. Well, the only contradiction between both stories, Amy's and her mother's, is the bit about who went to the store the day Mr. Walker died. Find proof that either Amy or her mother's lying, and we'll have the full answer. Yes, but who saw them? One or both of them? Nobody. Who could possibly remember? I've asked until I'm sick of asking. Well, no one remembers. No one saw. No one knows anyone. It's a city of strangers we live in, Jack. Oh, it's been two weeks. Their building has a doorman, but he can't remember that far back. He sees the same tenants go in and out every day. And he wouldn't be able to tell you for sure who went in or out yesterday, much less two weeks ago, he says. She's home from school now. I wonder what they're saying to each other. If we could listen in, we'd know a whole lot more than we do now. No. Whether she's guilty or innocent, they're both saying the same exact thing. The death's two weeks old. Oh, you're right, Jack. If Mrs. Walker did commit murder, she's used to the idea now that she's gotten away with it. She'll deny everything Amy says and try to... Convince the girl she's talking out of the back of her neck. Uh, the same things and the same words as if she were innocent. What if she kills the kid? She won't. If Amy were to disappear or to have an accident or be killed by an intruder, we'd know the truth at once. No, oh, she can't take the chance. With her husband, all she had to do was to fool a doctor who was inclined to believe her in the first place. Besides, the death was a strong possibility anyway. This time, she'd be killing a healthy 12-year-old. She'd be trying to fool a couple of cops who wouldn't believe her at all. Ah, she's probably safer now than before she came to us. Who knows what the mother might have been planning up until now. All right, that's fine so far. But what do we do now? Tomorrow I want to take a look at the Walker apartment. But why not right now? No, let's give her a night to get rattled. Any evidence she hasn't removed in two weeks, she's unlikely to think of now. Oh, all right, I, I don't expect to find anything. I want to look at the place because I can't think of anything else to do. Sure. All we have is the unsupported word of a 12-year-old child. Yeah, the body can't tell us anything because there wasn't a murder weapon. Walker died of natural causes, proving they were induced... Won't be the easiest thing in the world. If only someone had seen the kid at the grocery store. That's the only chink in the wall, Abe. The only place we can get a grip. We can try again tomorrow, but I doubt we'll get anywhere. Tomorrow, maybe lightning will strike.
Samuel. Oh, cab, please. Yes, uh, 312 Crossfield. Uh, Ridgeway, yeah. Huh? Yeah, urgent. Five minutes? Fine. Waste your time. If it didn't work at first when I wasn't ready for it, then it won't work at all. Your mother is dead. You killed her too. <clears throat> your father and mother both. And when you called my home to tell me she'd killed herself, and my wife told you I had already left, you knew then that I knew. And you had to kill me too. I told you that my heart was weak like your father's. So you'd kill me, and it'd simply be another heart failure, brought on by the sight of your mother's corpse. Do you want to know how I knew? Monday in civics, Miss Haskell told you about the duties of the police. But Miss Haskell also told me you were always at least a month ahead in your studies. 
two weeks before your stepfather died, you read that assignment in your school book. And then and there, you decided how to kill them both. The only thing I don't understand is why. You'll never understand, Mr. Levine. No. No, it's you who doesn't understand. To snuff out a life like that, it means nothing to you. You frightened, shocked him into dying. It was bad enough when it was only her. Don't do this, don't do that. When she had to marry him, and there were two of them watching me all the time, saying, no, no, no. That's all they ever said. The only time I ever had some peace was, was when I was at my grandmother's. Is that why? That this useless, half-begun thing could kill and kill. Do you know what's going to happen to you? They won't execute you because you're too young. They'll judge you insane and they'll lock you away. And there'll be guards and matrons there to say, don't do this and don't do that. A million, million times more than you can imagine. And they'll keep you locked away in a little room forever and ever. And they'll let you do nothing you want to do. Nothing. There's nothing you can do to me now. And I won't drink the poison you fed your mother. And your bag of tricks won't work. Not now. You see, I know, Amy. I know. Without even seeing your mother's body, I know. And there'll be a suicide confession forged somewhere, won't there? I know, Amy, I know. I'm going to phone the precinct now, and they'll come and get you. And you'll be locked away in that tiny room forever and ever and ever. You see, I was right, wasn't I, Amy? I know everything. There's your poor mother's body there on the bed. She looks sad, but not to you, I suppose. And there's the suicide note. See, I know everything, Amy. Everything. Stay away from me! Stay away from me! Why are you standing out there on the windowsill, Amy? Won't you catch a cold? Huh? They'll lock you away, Amy, in a tiny, tiny room. No, they won't. No! Yes. I know what I've done. I made it end that way. She never understood death. So it was possible for her to throw herself into it. The parents began the child, and the child ends the parents. Another baby, crying, wailing, saying, make way, make way. We will. We will. But in our own time. Don't rush us.
In tonight's presentation of Donald Westlake's The Sound of Murder, you heard Tony Jay as Abraham Levine, Sean Hewitt as Jack Crawley, and Linda Stewart as Amy Thornbridge Walker. Others in the cast were Sheila Holliday and Beryl Gordon. The Sound of Murder was adapted and produced for Lux Radio Theatre by Michael McCabe. Signal gasoline, the gasoline that does go farther. The Signal Oil Company presents The Whistler. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Murder on Paper. I am the Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Well, to begin with, I'm not telling this story. No, Fred Wallace is telling it. Fred Wallace is a writer of detective stories for pulp magazines. And this is the best story he's ever told. Yes. Go on, Fred. Continue your dictation. <laughs> you were a writer, a police reporter, and you never held a job very long. Just why was that, Fred? I was a victim of the ponies. I couldn't stay away from the racetracks. I was hitting the 40-year mark, and I was down at Hialeah Park in Florida when I met a gorgeous blonde from California named Lita Martin. Her friend, Vera Durant. This Vera was a widow who was tossing money around and having the time of her life. She wasn't too pretty, not as pretty as Lita, but her husband had left her a half a million dollars. That made up for it. What more could I ask? Uh, am I taking too much time? All the time you want, Wallace. Well, by the time the Hialeah meet was over, Vera and I were married and on our way to her place in Los Angeles. Santa Anita was closed, but Hollywood Park was about to open, and I'd figured on running a stable and a string of ponies. I didn't mention the subject until we'd pulled out of San Bernardino. What's the matter with the idea, Vera? I thought you were crazy about horse racing. I had a lot of fun at High Leo, Fred. I enjoyed watching the horses run. You want some money, didn't you? Little, but I didn't go for that reason. My friend Lita insisted I spend the season in Florida just... Just to get my mind off things. Well, you certainly seem to have a good time. Now that I think of it, it seems silly. It's gambling, and I don't approve of gambling. What? Well, that's certainly news to me. The way you threw down hundred-dollar bills, I thought you were an old-timer at it. It was my first time at such a place. Oh, Fred, darling, there's no reason why we can't go to the races once or twice. Once or twice? I know you've been able to get by on your gambling, but you're 40 years old. It's time you settle down and accomplish something in a bona fide business. Business? What do I know about business? But I know horses, and with a good string, I can clean up. Fred, darling, there's no need for you to clean up. All you need to do is learn the business my husband left me, and to be able to take care of that. Oh, a chemical plant. Are you kidding, Vera? I'll speak to Mr. Adamson tomorrow as to the right job to start you on. And you'll find it most exciting when you get into it. Okay, honey, I'll try. Well, Fred, you weren't exactly conscious of it at the time, but that was when you got the idea for all this. You could pick horses, but you couldn't pick women. Once Vera got home, she was entirely changed, wasn't she, Fred? It was all business and hung on to nickels like they were $20 bills. What a change. But I went to work in the chemical plant at $75 a week and tried my best to like it. I was bored stiff. And finally, I located a bookie and started playing the horses again. 
One day I got a bit too deep and I borrowed some dough from a guy. When I stalled him a little too long, he threatened me. He was a well-known gangster and I got frightened. I went home during lunch hour to see if I could wangle some extra dough from Vera. But Vera, honey, a thousand dollars isn't going to break you. You act like you didn't know where your next meal was coming from. You have a salary of $75 a week, friend. And a car, and all your living expenses are free. Any sensible person can certainly get along on that. Sensible or not, I need a thousand bucks now, and I gotta have it. Why? All right. I borrowed that much from a guy to place a little bet, but I picked the wrong guy. He turned out to be a gangster. He's put me on the spot. Oh, don't be so corny on the spot. You won't let me have the money? That's childish nonsense. I'm not kidding. This guy's serious. But do you care? No. You got more money than you can ever use, and what good will it do you? None. You're a cheap little penny pincher. You better go, Fred. Back to the plan. What good is your money? No good. You don't enjoy life and you never will. Please. What good is a lot of money if you can't use it? You might as well have a bunch of rocks in the bank. You're a stingy, selfish, self-centered tightwad, Vera. Do you hear me? Stingy, selfish, and miserable. I gave her the works. But when she pranced out of the room and slammed the door, I knew she meant it. And I knew, too, that I'd overplayed my hand. Then I got to thinking about what I'd said. That her money was no good to her and that she didn't enjoy life. All kinds of dough and she didn't enjoy life. That's what I was thinking that day on the train. If she didn't enjoy life, why should she go on living? With the prologue of tonight's story, Murder on Paper, the Signal Oil Company brings you another of the strange tales by the Whistler. But before we go on with the story, let's consider carbon, that word you hear so often in connection with automobile motors. Well, just what is carbon and what does it do? Well, coal is carbon, so is soot. Some motor oils form the hard kind of carbon in the cylinder head, gradually building up a thick, hard crust that causes knock, loss of motor efficiency, lower gasoline mileage. It can even cause costly repair bills. That's why the solvent refining of Signal Four Star Motor Oil is doubly important to you at this time when you want your motor to last out the duration and you want all the miles you can get from ration gasoline. You see, because of solvent refining, which is the latest most costly process known to oil engineers, Signal four-star motor oil actually forms less carbon. And it's soft, soot-like carbon that tends to blow out with the exhaust gases. Thus, by keeping your motor cleaner, more efficient, solvent-refined Signal four-star motor oil does two important things. One, aids longer motor life, and two, helps your gasoline go farther. So for your motor's next refill, ask your neighborhood Signal gasoline dealer for your best buy today. Signal four-star motor oil. And now, back to the Whistler. That's when the whole thing crystallized, wasn't it, Fred? It was as clear as a bell. As a writer, you'd plotted a hundred murders where the killer was always caught. This time, you'd shuffle them all together and plot one where the killer would never even be suspected. You didn't have the plot yet, did you? But I knew I was going to kill my wife, Vera. I grabbed my hat and left the house, got into Vera's convertible coupe and started driving. I headed out sunset toward the beach. I don't know why, except maybe I didn't want to go back to the plant. And Vera had a beach house at Malibu. I pulled up in front of it, got out, walked down the side of the house toward the beach, sort of aimlessly. Started to flop down on the sand. I didn't see Vera's friend, Lita, stretched out on the beach next door. Fred! Fred, hey! What? Oh, hi, Lita. What are you doing down here at this time of day? I don't know, just monkeying around. Oh, yeah? Well, come on over here and sit down, Fred. I won't bite you. Yeah? Okay. I knew I shouldn't have done it, but I sat down close to her. Too close. And when a guy gets that close to a gal like Lita Martin, 
Well, it's like sticking your nose over a can of ether. <laughs> Are you afraid of me, Fred? <laughs> <laughs> afraid? Not in the least. Why? Oh, I don't know. Something's wrong with you. <laughs> a domestic problem, Fred? No, a business problem. Business? Oh, you're worried as much about the business as you are about the North Pole. I'm going to the races this afternoon. Want to come along? No, I haven't time for that sort of thing. Besides, Vera doesn't approve of it. I've got a lot of work to do at the plant, and she'll expect me to make a report to her this evening. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear that you're making such an effort to learn the chemical business. But it's certainly a mystery to me. What is? How you ever took up with a girl like Vera in the first place. Vera and I are very happy. You really love Vera? And not just her money? What a thing to say. Of course I love her. What's wrong with Vera? Nothing's wrong with her. She's one of my best friends. But you and Vera are as much alike as, as night and day. At least you were. You get a kick out of everything, Fred. Vera is such a tightwad that she never enjoys anything, except making money. She's never really enjoyed life. How could she? What? Well, she has everything to make life livable, but she'll never enjoy a minute of it. Yeah. Uh, when are you going back to town? What? Oh, I'm going back now. Oh, good. You can take me in. I'll tell the maid I'll go in with you. I'll change in just three minutes. Uh, you don't mind taking me in, do you, Fred? Why, no. It's a pleasure, Lita. Glad to. <laughs> And it was on that ride back from the beach that you got the idea, wasn't it, Fred? A few blocks from the beach, you realized the convertible was pulling hard to the left. You stopped on an incline and found the valve and the right front tire was leaking. You jacked the wheel up to change, but you didn't pull the emergency brake on hard enough. The car slipped off the jack and started to roll, but a call to Lita and she grabbed the emergency, eh, Fred? That gave me the idea, how to get rid of Vera. She planned to go up to her mountain place that evening because the first snow had fallen, a perfect setup. But I needed a witness for what I was going to do, so I worked it so that Vera invited Lita. About an hour before we left, I put the leaky tire back on the wheel, then loosened the bolt on the emergency brake to where it would just barely hold when pulled all the way back. I dropped a couple of sleeping tablets in Vera's tea just before we left. Vera sat in front with me and Lita in the rear with the luggage. After we passed the Crestline turnoff, I picked a spot on a downgrade. I pulled off to the side, facing a five or six hundred foot drop. I stopped, eased the handbrake back all the way. It held just barely. What's the matter, Fred? I put that tire back on the wheel. I thought I'd fixed it, but it's almost flat again. I can feel it. I'll have to change again. Oh, well, can I help you? Oh, thanks, Lita, but I can handle it. Hmm, I guess beer is sound asleep. Uh, hand me the jack and that wrench under your feet. Okay. I left them out because I didn't trust my job on that tire. Thanks, Lita. I'll have it changed in a jiffy. I jacked up the right front wheel till it just barely cleared the ground, removed the hubcap, applied the lug wrench, and I was all set to throw the car in motion. I wanted to get Lita out of the car on the opposite side because she was to be my witness if I needed one. Uh, Lita, bring me that flashlight beside you. Guess I'll need your help after all dark out here. Yes, Fred. As Lita slammed the door, I gave a terrific pull on the lug wrench. The car rolled off the jack and went into motion. I yelled just for effect, but it was only a few feet to the edge. The car shot over, hit a ledge about 20 feet below, and then crashed on down to the bottom. I stood there looking down, acting as though I was paralyzed. Then I turned around with a horrified look on my face and let out a terrific groan. But... But Lita wasn't there. She disappeared. I was frantic. I screamed into the dark. Lita! But no answer. My witness had disappeared. You were terrified, Fred. You stood there trembling in the dark, screaming for Lita as though she were a mile away. Then it came to you. You grabbed the flashlight and shot it around and down on the ledge below. And there was Lita, on the rocks of the ledge and blood on her face. 
I knew then how she'd got there. She jumped on the left running board to grab the emergency brake and gone over with the car. That's what I hadn't counted on. Lita wasn't supposed to have touched the brake. Only this afternoon she'd pulled it on. Now when it didn't work, she'd know for sure that it had been tampered with. She could tell them that the accident was no accident. I picked up a rock. Started down to the ledge to give her a good bash on the head. But a car pulled up, Fred. Vera, your wife, was dead. But they rushed Lita to San Bernardino. You never left Lita's side for three days because your witness was now a good prospect for state's witness when she came to. But I thanked my lucky stars when she regained consciousness. She knew me, but she couldn't seem to remember just what had happened. I was awful sweet to her. I told her my own private version of the accident. Fred, what what happened? Don't you remember, Lita? No. All I can recall is a, a terrible crash. Nothing more. The tire went flat, and I stopped to change it. I jacked the wheel up and started to remove the lug nuts, and it slipped off the jack and rolled over the cliff. Well, where was I? Vera was asleep in the front seat, and you were sitting in the back seat. You must have been thrown clear when the car hit the ledge. Or maybe when you saw the car rolling, you tried to jump out. Perhaps that's what saved you. Poor Vera. She didn't have a chance, did she? No. What do you mean? Well, didn't you say she was asleep? Did I say that? Well, yes. That's right, she was. Well, at least she didn't suffer. She probably never knew what happened. Lita, you... You can't remember a thing about what happened? No, I... I can't seem to remember just what it was all about. It's it's all very hazy. But did the doctor tell you? Tell me what? Well, he said my loss of memory was only temporary. At least he hoped so, and maybe in time, he didn't say how long, but that in time everything will clear up. In a way, I hope that won't happen. Why? I'd rather not know any more about it than I do. For your own sake, I hope... I mean, I hope you never remember about it. It was too gruesome. Lita? Yes, Fred? Look, it was all my fault, darling. It was pure negligence on my part. I should have put a rock under one of the wheels. There's nothing that can be done about... about poor Vera now. But you're going to be all right. And I want you to know that I'll do all in my power to make up for it. It's my duty. It's the least I can do. What are you getting at, Fred? It'll be my duty from now on to take care of you, Lita. Vera would want it that way, I'm sure. Fred, I don't understand. Later on, we can be married, and I'll always stay right by your side. After all, you and I always thought a great deal of each other, didn't we? Are you trying to say that I'm paralyzed or something? No, darling, not that. But haven't you looked in a mirror? I say Lita, as soon as you're out of here, I'll spend every dollar Vera left me. I'll have the best plastic surgeons in the country, and you'll be just as beautiful as ever. Fred, I... <laughs> you are listening to The Whistler, brought to you by your friend, the Signal Oil Company. Marketers of the famous Signal Gasoline, your best buy today. Remember to let every go signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. left to you, wasn't it, Fred? But you dumped it all on the market, including the plant and all the real estate, turned it into cash, married Lita, had her face fixed up, and bought another beautiful place up at Big Bear Lake, and took Lita up there. You had no servants because you wanted her all to yourself, didn't you, Fred? I watched her like a hawk because I wanted to be around if she should regain a memory. But after a while, she got to acting kind of strange. She began to ask funny questions. About what happened that night, I mean. The cloud was beginning to clear up is what I figured. It was getting on my nerves. And I knew for sure that if it cleared up and she remembered about grabbing for that break, the whole thing would come out. She'd know that I'd killed Vera. 
Then one afternoon... Fred, I just had another one of those terrible dreams. Nightmares. Nightmares? Since when he'd been having nightmares in the afternoon. I've had several of them. It's terrifying, Fred. I... I can't understand why I always dream the same thing. I seem to be driving a car at fast speed. There's a high wall in front of me. I grab the handbrake and pull and pull, but the car won't stop. And just as I'm about to crash, I wake up in a cold sweat. Are you dreaming? Or is it just your imagination? Why do you say that? If you've got something on your mind, why don't you say it? I don't know what you mean, Fred. I didn't mean to upset you. I'm not upset. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you, dear. There was a man here to see you this afternoon. Said he'd drop by later. Yeah, what man? He said his name was Jenkins. He owns the garage in the village. Jenkins? What about him? Well, it was something about your brakes. I think he said your brakes were loose. He said he'd come by later. Brakes? I don't know what he's talking about. I've never had my car in his garage. The only connection I had with him was when he hauled that wrecked convertible up the... What's the matter, Fred? There's nothing. Maybe I'd better run down to the village and see Jenkins. Why? How do I know until I get there? Yes, Fred, you don't like the looks of this. Rush down to the garage at the village and see Jenkins... See what he's told Lita. See what he's found out. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Wallace. Well, I got a little bill here for $18 that I can't overlook. Then I had uh, had something I wanted to tell you uh, about the Chrysler convertible, the one that went over the cliff. What about it? Well, you know I hauled it up the hill and took it to my shop. I've looked it over, and uh, yeah, it can be fixed up. I told you I didn't want it fixed up. Junk it. Junk it? Well, then you'll have to sign this pink slip over to me. I'll sign it. Give it here. But I want it junked. Well, yes, sir, but I can only get a hundred for it as junk. All right, junk it, and you keep what you get for your trouble. I don't want anything. There you are. Huh. But what I wanted to tell you was... Yes. Uh, I know why it rolled over the cliff. Why? The emergency brake wouldn't hold. I know that. And that's something I can't understand. Handle pulls all the way back to the last notch, and the brake lining barely touches the brake drum. I can't understand that. I can. The brake lining was worn. It was loose. The brake was loose, but the lining wasn't worn. What? Well, it couldn't have been. I relined all the brakes for your dead wife last summer, and I cinched up the emergency to where it had worked when pulled only halfway back. Well, that's what this $18 bill's for. Well, then the bolt on the brake must have worked loose. No, no, no. I checked on that. The nut was screwed clear to the end of the bolt, but it... Still had a cotter key in it. I've never, never made a mistake like that in my life. Well, then how would it get loose? I don't know. I don't know. Unless somebody loosened it on purpose. Maybe somebody had it in for you. It's the only thing I could think of. As I was telling your wife on the phone, what? I... I said as I was telling your wife. You talk to my wife about this? Well, yes, yes. Didn't she tell you I called? How much did you tell her? Well, I tried to explain about the... You had no of... right to talk to my wife about such things. But I just thought you ought to know... Yes, of course. I just meant that you shouldn't have bothered my wife about it. She's been very nervous since the accident. I try not to mention it to her. Oh, oh. well, I'm, I'm sorry. It's all right, only we're both trying to forget the whole thing. Sure, sure, Mr. Wallace. So just send me a bill and I'll mail a check and just forget about this. Sure, sure, I'll, I'll get the bill for you in just a minute. Never mind, I have to hurry. I have to get home right away. <laughs> Well, Fred, Jenkins stumbled onto the evidence, didn't he? He doesn't seem to suspect anything, but he talked to Lita. Lita, whose memory is returning. Now she knows what happened. All the way back, my mind was going a mile a minute. Lita knew, and I had to make my plans quickly, plans to get rid of her. I drove in the back directly into the garage. I guess that's why I didn't see the car parked in front. When I rushed into the house, Lita was standing in the hall waiting for me. Oh, darling, I was hoping you'd get back. So you knew all the time. I, I don't know what you're talking about, but whatever it is, it'll keep. Right now, come in the living room. There's but somebody... it won't keep. The game's up, Lita. Jenkins told you, didn't he? Didn't he? Well, 
Well, he said something about the brakes on the convertible, but That's I... not all. He told you why they didn't work, why the car went over the cliff, didn't he? Fred, Fred, listen, the sheriff's office... Oh, so you got the sheriff's office in on it, too. Well, what were you waiting for? Why didn't you turn me in long ago? You knew about the brake. You probably even knew about me putting the leaking tire back on and jerking the car off the jack. My only mistake was in not letting you go over the cliff with Vera. Now, it looks like I'll have to do that all over again. Fred! As if you didn't know. Now I'll have to take care of you. I don't think so, Wallace. I think I'll have to take care of you. What? Fred, I tried to tell you. The sheriff sent a deputy out to see me and... Oh, no, you did Stand trap me, you dirty... Fight, Mrs. Wallace. I've heard all I need You to. won't catch me. Fred, don't! Stop, Fred! The Whistler will bring you the rest of the strange story in just a moment. Meantime, Signal Oil Company wants to pass along this important war production board warning about the shortage of auto batteries. Due to increased military requirements, WPB announces 40% fewer new batteries will be produced for civilian cars during January, February, March. You know what that means. More and more cars that need new batteries will have to make the old one do. So play safe. Keep your present battery working for you as long as you can by seeing that it gets the regular attention it needs. That means stopping at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer every two weeks for his complete battery checkup. He'll add distilled water to restore the safe level and remove destructive corrosion from the terminals. If your battery seems run down, his hydrometer test shows whether it needs recharging. And your signal dealer is equipped to give you a quick, thorough recharge job. All this is part of your signal complete go farther service. Every car needs it more than ever today. See that your car gets it by stopping at least every two weeks at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the Whistler. And what happened then, Fred, after you ran out the door? I saw the deputy's car, but I didn't see the other guy, the driver, until I ran past and there was a gun in my face. I took a wild poke at him, but he just slapped me on the side of the head with the gun barrel. When I woke up, I was sitting here. Yes, Fred. Sitting in the sheriff's office. And now you're speaking into a microphone. Making a record of your confession. <laughs> you may have been excellent at plotting murder on paper. But when a man's emotions become involved with the real thing, it isn't so good. You see, you were perfectly safe. You'd committed the perfect crime. Neither Lita nor anybody else suspected a thing till you yourself divulged it. And the sheriff's deputy has just told you that all he came by your place for was to return Vera's purse, which a couple of Boy Scouts had found in the brush where the accident had occurred. Yes, it was just nerves, Fred. Nerves. That's all. Well... Guess that'll be my last murder plot for a long while. Yes, Fred. I can assure you that the gentleman at San Quentin will see to that. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale, the curious story of murder is legal. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Oil and fine quality auto accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, story by J. Donald Wilson, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking and inviting you to listen next Monday night at 9 when... The Signal Oil Company presents... The Whistler. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
the Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Since the Equitable Life Assurance Society was founded 90 years ago, this country has changed in many ways. But in one respect, it is still the same. In those early days, people always spoke of America as the land of opportunity. Well, it still is the land of opportunity just as much as ever. In just a few minutes in tonight's middle commercial, the Equitable Society will have a special message for listeners who agree with this philosophy. We will describe a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up, offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, Murder on the Midway. The traveling carnival, once an institution, is fast disappearing from the American scene. Their gradual disappearance is a great pity, if only because it means that many a small-town child will grow up without ever having seen the fearless daredevil who did his dive from the high platform into a shallow tank of water. Nor shall he ever see the fabulous fat lady, the bearded lady, or the pretty young girl who was advertised as being able to shoot better than Annie Oakley. The majority of those shows which still manage to tour the country and bring joy to children of all ages are composed of old-timers who are the last link America has with the show business of yesterday. As such, they are deserving of our complete respect, for they have brought laughter and excitement wherever they went. Unfortunately for them... That respect is often withheld because a few, a very few of the groups of traveling performers still among us, are not more than transient groups of rogues, drunks, and common thieves. Tonight's case is the story of what went on at one of the latter type shows, both out front and backstage. <laughs> Tonight's file opens at a traveling carnival which has just arrived in a small New England town. It is mid-afternoon, and Eddie Scott, a pitchman with the show, is walking down the midway. Eddie! Eddie, my boy! What? Oh, hello, J.C. Uh, may I have the pleasure of a few words with you? Yeah, sure. Eddie... I want to tell you about a magnificent plan I have. Uh, look... Uh, Eddie... I like you, son. Like you. And I'm going to show my friendship in a concrete fashion. Yeah, that's fine. Hey, don't, yeah. don't go, my boy. Don't go. I'm going to move you to the head of the midway. Yeah, well... I'll I... build you a stand that'll be the envy of every yeah, other performer with the J.C. Crawford Sunflower Carnival. All right, but I... You'll send thousands of watches a day. Yeah, yeah, I know, J.C., but in the meantime, i got to go set up the stand I got uh, now. Wait, wait, Eddie, wait. I, uh... I don't want to impose, son, but uh, I promised Lily Bell I'd bring her some horoscopes. Uh, go buy her tent, will you, and, and give her those rather ungainly crates, huh? Well, look, I... Uh, I thank but... you, my boy. Yeah, thank but... You. But look, Jack... When you leave her tent, you'll be half for your analyzer. And because this hey, is Walla. a special matinee... Hey, Walla. Have... Huh? Oh, hello, Eddie. Hi. Some horoscopes for Lily Bell. She inside? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Drew. Yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, we have brought this uh, great attraction at tremendous expense to you. And 
Come back. Lily Bell. Yeah. Eddie Scott. Come on in. Hi, Eddie. What's playing? Uh, J.C., give me these horoscopes, please. Yeah. Throw them by the trunk, will you? Yeah, sure. How late do we work? How do I know? Oh, didn't J.C. tell you? Uh, he's a lotus. Didn't even know his own name. You know something? He still don't lose that con. He got me to carry these things all the way over here. Hey, Lily Pearl. What's this? What? There's jewelry in a trunk. Leave it alone. Looks like the McCoy. Well, it ain't. It's costume junk for the act. Well, oh. I never saw costume stuff like this. Well, I bet you Blow, could sell it for the... Huh? Put that stuff down and get out. Meanwhile... At a nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Taylor is just leaving the office of the agent in charge when he sees Agent Clinton Forrest in the hall. Hello, Clint. Oh, hi, Jim. You saved me a trip. I'm just going by to your desk. Yeah, why? Well, as of a couple of minutes ago, we were assigned to the same case. What is it? A jewel theft took place sometime last night or early this morning aboard a train that left Boston at midnight. The Indian Head Limited. Any description on the thief? No, no one saw him. Not even the person who was robbed? No, the victim was an old lady traveling alone. When the porter tried to wake her this morning, she didn't respond. A doctor, who had the next compartment was called, he said the old lady had been chloroformed. Well. When she was brought around, she said that she forgot to lock her compartment door, and that's the last thing she remembers. Hmm. Any value on what was stolen? $23,000. Oh, we have got one lead. What's that, Jim? Well, the local police at a town called Harrisonville boarded the train as soon as the robbery was discovered. They found a small clump of dirt in the compartment. From its size and shape, it apparently had stuck to the arch of a man's shoe. Mm -hmm. The lab just reported that they've analyzed it, and it contains bits of sawdust, confetti, and popcorn. Sounds like a circus. Well, I checked with the railroad. And for part of the night, they were hauling four cars belonging to the J.C. Crawford Sunflower Carnival. I see. Oh, where is that carnival now? It's at Union City for a five-day stand. The local police there have started preliminary investigation. Well, Jim, the chief at Union City is a graduate of the FBI Academy. Yeah, I know that. Uh, Clint, how about you getting a list of the stolen jewelry from the police up at Harrisonville? Then you can send out a stolen property flyer. Okay. Uh, where are you going? Well, the SAC is sending me to Union City to investigate that carnival. Lily Bell? What is it, Walter? I, uh, I gotta talk to you. Look, we got trouble. Huh? Yeah, there was a cop around talking to old man Crawford about the jewelry. How come? Oh, I don't know. How do you know somebody from the carnival took it? Honey, you're the mind reader. Oh, very funny. What do we do now? Just keep the stuff in your trunk and make sure nobody sees it. It's too late. Huh? Somebody has seen it. Who? Eddie Scott. Well, how did he see it? Well, he brought in a crate of horoscopes. Told him to throw them next to my trunk. The next thing I know, he's got the stuff in his dukes. Oh, fine. Yeah. Asked me if it was real. I told him no and kicked him out. Mm. That ain't good. He'll hear about the cop and get smart. Should we bury the stuff? No, no. We just can't leave it in the trunk. Order! Order, where are you? It's J.C. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, back here, J.C. Hey, you got a crowd, my boy. You're neglecting your spiel. I'll be right out, sir. What do we do? No. Try to think of something. I'll see you later. Pardon me. Huh? Are you J.C. Crawford? Oh, oh, yes, sir. J.C. Crawford in person and at your service. Thank you. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. The FBI? That's right, sir. Here are my credentials. Oh. Yeah. That's a good picture of you. Well, Mr. Crawford, could uh, we go someplace where we can talk? Why, uh, well, surely, surely, uh... Hey, let's go have a drink. Well, I'd rather go where it's a little quieter, if you don't mind. Well, uh... Oh, uh... Oh, this tent here. It's my office. That's fine. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Thanks. 
That's Crawford, Chief Thompson of the local police, told me that he's already spoken to you about the jewel theft on the train last night. Yeah. That is correct, sir. Have you any idea how many people you have traveling with this carnival? Oh, I have indeed, sir. Answer is 55. 55 great performers in my show. I'd like to uh, question all of them as soon as possible. Uh, yeah, can't be done. Oh, why not, Mr. Crawford? Oh, busy, busy, busy. They're entertaining the grand citizens of this community. Well, what time does the show close? 11 o'clock. Can you arrange for me to question them after that? Why, uh, well, certainly, certainly. Be happy to. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Uh, what time is it now? Uh, it's a few minutes past nine. Well, uh, we got two hours till the show closes. Um, uh, I'll tell you what we ought to do. What's that, sir? Let's you and me go out and have a few friendly libations, huh? No, thanks, Mr. Crawford. Yeah, but you If you don't mind, I'd like to take a look around the lot. Oh. Oh, well, uh, we're all right. Uh, here. Here, take some passes. Thanks. And, uh, <clears throat> if you have need of my services before 11, you may find me at the end of the midway. Can't miss the place. It has a large sign outside featuring the most beautiful words in the English language. We serve whiskey. And now a question from L.J., whose birthday is July 25th. L.J., you were born under the sign of Leo, and therefore, this is a favorable time for you. There is an old Turkish proverb, a man does not seek his luck, luck seeks its man. So you can see that even in ancient days, the Turks realized how important the position of the stars was to every one of us. And now for the next question. This one is from E.S., born on March the 22nd, which is the sign of Aries the Ram. He asks... I'm, I'm sorry, E.S. Your question cannot be answered. That's all for this show, folks. Oh... Lily Bell. Lily Bell. Come in, Walter. Hey, what happened? Why did you cut the show? Eddie Scott was out front. He sent me a note. It said, do I get cut in or do I tell what's in your trunk? Oh. Well, we got to do something quick. The FBI's looking for the jewelry now. How do you know? Old man Crawford told me there was a G-man around to see him. When? About an hour ago. He's going to put the vacuum on all of us after the last show. You think he'll dip into everybody's trunk? Well, he could. Lily Bell. Teddy. What do I do? Talk to him. Talk to him. I'll, uh, I'll step back here. Okay. Come on in. Hi, Lily Bell. Hi. I'm uh, sorry I broke up your act that way. What do you want? Like I told you in the note. I'd like to be cut in. How much? Well, I don't want to be fair about it. Yeah. What would you think of, oh, say, 50%? You want half? That's right. You expect to just walk in and cut yourself down the middle? Uh Uh-huh. That ain't what you're getting. It ain't? No. Your cut's already been figured. Oh. Oh. What is it? This. Huh? Honey, that's the best fortune you've told in weeks. We will reopen tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message to a very special kind of person. To the man or woman who can truthfully say to himself, I'm on the way up. Can you speak those words and really mean them? Are you the kind of man whose neighbors will say, Look at the Barton's new car. Well, Ed's new job must be working out all right. If you're that type of person, if you're absolutely confident that your earning power is going to increase in the next few years, if you have plenty of honest-to-goodness faith in your own future, then here's a suggestion. 
Investigate the Equitable Society's special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. A life insurance plan that offers you these three distinct advantages. First, immediate protection. The moment you sign the contract, you enjoy the peace of mind that comes from knowing that your wife and children have the protection they need. Second, the equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. In other words, your life insurance keeps in step with your income. Third advantage, the equitable plan is flexible at all times. It can expand or contract as you see fit and offers you many desirable options which your Equitable Society representative will be glad to explain to you. So why not get in touch with him immediately, phone him as soon as possible, and ask for full details on the Equitable Plan for People on the Way Up, or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Murder on the Midway. If you are like the ordinary person, you pick up your newspaper, notice a story about some local holdup or jewel theft, And you skip over it because you regard it as too insignificant to take up your time. It is, in your eyes, just another petty theft. But it is not petty, even though the amount stolen in any one robbery may be so small as to be negligible. Crime today is big business, and nothing illustrates that better than statistics gathered from a recent survey made by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. In one recent six-month period the value of property stolen in the United States amounted to well over $57 million. In order to garner that loot, 336,000 crimes were committed. Those are sobering facts. But even more noteworthy is the accompanying fact that in many of those crimes, the thief was aided in no small measure by the victim. Carelessness such as the failure of the robbery victim in tonight's case to lock a compartment door when she went to sleep. Carelessness like that is an ally of the criminal, an ally without which his operations would be considerably lessened. Your FBI hopes that you will try to avoid such carelessness. By doing that, you will be hurting the chances for success of our common enemy, the criminal. Tonight's file continues later that night at the FBI field office. Hello? Hello, Clint. Jim Taylor. Oh, hiya, Jim. I think we may have something on that jewel theft. Good. I've just finished questioning the employees at the carnival. One of the pitchmen didn't show up and couldn't be found. When was he last seen? Earlier tonight. After the questioning was over, I went to his living quarters. It's a leaky tent here on the fairgrounds. Uh, Find anything? Yes, the small jewel box that was stolen from the old lady on the train was in his trunk. Anything in the box? No, it was empty. What's this employee's name, Jim? Edward Scott. Now, I had a full description wired into the office by the local police here. Good. An alarm's already gone out from this point. Oh, Clint. Yeah? Will you ask the Bureau to have some flyers printed up? Right. Uh, when do you think you'll be back? Oh, I'm getting a train out of here in uh, an hour. I'll see you in the office first thing in the morning. <laughs> I've been looking all over for you. Oh, what's the matter? Eddie's body is gone. Is that all? Look, put those darts down and talk to me. I want Lily to... Bell. I took him. Huh? I took him. You see, I heard the FBI guy talking to Crawford. He thinks Eddie did the job. Because he didn't show up? Well, that was one thing. Then he found the jewel box I stuck in Eddie's trunk. Oh. Well, what'd you do with Eddie? Dumped him. Where? <laughs> He's safe. 
Pretty good, huh? Walter, let's quit this show, huh? <laughs> Not yet. Not till things cool off. Hey, look. What? I got a bullseye. Left-handed. <laughs> Morning, Clint. Morning, Jim. Anything in yet on the Yeti Scott alarm? Not a thing. No. I teletyped Scott's name and description to Washington. We ought to have something from them later in the day. Mm-hmm. Well, Scott had no regular home, Clint. Mm-hmm. According to everything I could find out at the carnival, he used to get his mail care of Billboard magazine, and they'd forward it on to him. Mm-hmm. We've notified them to call the New York office as soon as they hear from Scott with his new address. Oh, pardon me, Clint. Sure. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is Chief Jones at Union City. Yes, Chief. I've got some news on Eddie Scott. He's just been found dead. He what? He was brought in a little while ago. Chief, we'll be down there as soon as we can. Oh, Clint. Hmm? Chief Jones said we could use his office. Oh, fine. Oh, uh, you find anything out at the fairgrounds? No, not a thing. I spoke to Crawford, but <laughs> it's such a hangover, he wasn't very coherent. Mm-hmm. Oh, I learned how Scott was found. Uh, where did they find him? On a houseboat at the lake, a couple of miles up the road. Some kids were playing on the deck of the boat. They accidentally started a fire. Mm-hmm. Instead of running away, they called the fire department, and firemen found the body propped up in a closet. Was the murder committed on the boat? Well, it looks like Scott's murderer took his body up there to hide it. How was he killed, Jim? Well, he was struck on the back of the head with a dull-edged weapon. Oh, possibly a hammer. Are, uh, are those Scott's effects on the table, Jim? Yeah, that's it. Have you examined them? Yes, I've just been through them. Find anything useful? Well, this might be something. This pad? Yes, there's some indented writing on the top sheet here. What does it say? Well, I'll... Hold it, Hold it at the right angle and I'll read it for you. Ah, I got it. Um, E.S., March 22nd. Yeah. Uh, do I get cut in, or do I tell what's in your trunk? Hmm. Well, that ES probably stands for Eddie Scott. Yes, I'm sure it does. But what about the March 22nd and the rest of it? Well, I've been trying to figure that part out, Clint. Now, uh, Scott had... Hey, wait a minute. Uh, I think this might be a lead. I remember the other night while I was at the carnival, there was a fortune. works. Jim, if, if you're right, and she's the one Eddie Scott wrote that other note to, she's got to show some reaction when she gets the same note after he's dead. Yeah. Now, what made you think of her? I saw her work when I was here last night. You see that wicker basket up there on the stage? Mm-hmm. Well, that's where she throws the slips of paper with the questions on them after she gives her answers. And now, this is it, Clint. Born yep. on March the 22nd, which is the sign of Aries, the ram. In answer to your question, E.S. Uh, Look at her, Clint. Let's yeah. see, and gentlemen, that concludes this show. Good night. She's leaving, Jim. Oh. She's got a little tent right out in back of this one, Clint. Go get her. Mm-hmm. I'm going to grab that wicker basket up on the stage. Okay, uh, come in, through. Let us through, please. Harness. See you later, Clint. Yeah. Excuse me, please. Excuse me. Coming through. Thank you. Excuse me. Say, uh, can you tell me how to get to the Great Lily Bell's tent? Sure, it's right back there. Oh, thanks. Hello. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. What do you want here? I'd like to ask you some questions. Go ahead. Just how well do you know Eddie Scott? I just knew him to say hello to. What do you mean, knew him? Has anything happened to him? 
I don't know. I don't know anything about him. Hardly knew him. I think maybe we better do the rest of this questioning down at police headquarters. Oh, no, you don't. Huh? Keep your hands over your head. See if he's got a gun on him, Lily Bell. Okay. No. No, no, he hasn't. Keep your hands in the air anyway. Get the stuff, Lily Bell. Let's get out of here. What about this guy? Get the stuff out of the trunk. I'll take care of him. Okay. Drop that gun, huh? I said drop it. Oh, no. <laughs> oh! All right, get up. Come on, get up. And leave that gun right where it is. Yeah, yeah. Did you find the note that Eddie Scott wrote yesterday, Jim? Yes, it was in the wicker basket up on the stage. Good. All right, Clint, let's throw the cuffs on both of them and get out of here. Although charged with violation of the National Stolen Property Act, Walter Marshall and Lily Bell Adams were turned over to local authorities and convicted for the murder of Edward Scott. Walter Marshall was executed, and Lily Bell Adams received life imprisonment. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI was not solved because of any sudden inspiration or any lucky hunch. Few cases are solved that way. The arrest of the criminals portrayed in this file was brought about the same way almost every other arrest comes to pass as a result of calm, deliberate, painstaking investigation, plus, and this is a very big plus, the close and valuable cooperation of local police. Your FBI is proud of the fact that more than 97% of all persons arrested by special agents in the past year were later convicted after a fair trial in a court of law. That is a superlative record, and your FBI wishes to take this opportunity to acknowledge publicly that it would have been impossible to obtain such a margin of convictions if it had not been for the invaluable aid rendered to special agents in every part of the nation. Only through this kind of teamwork between law enforcement agencies can any real progress be made in the war against crime. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Old-timers in the life insurance profession have a saying that may interest you. They say... You can judge a man by the life insurance he buys. In other words, veteran insurance men have noticed that their customers who make small-scale insurance plans seldom get very far. On the other hand, the type of man who thinks big who invests in a forward-looking program like the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up, is the man who usually does get to the top. So why not line yourself up with the successful men of tomorrow? Ask your Equitable Society representative to give you full facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a story that reveals a ghoulish attempt to evade the law. Its subject, bank theft. Its title, The Traveling Corpse. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Traveling Corpse, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 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 Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you love, honor, or murder. 
a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear and starring Kathy and Elliot Lewis. Hello, Alice. Yeah, this is Helen. Look, kid, I'm not going to be able to go to the dance after all. Well, Harry works the late shift with that taxi of his, so I've got to stay home and look at the four walls again. Oh, I'm so fed up, sometimes I feel like leaving this house and Harry and the whole works. Believe me, the only reason I haven't is because I need the money to do it. Seven years of wedded bliss. Only thing to show for it is this stinking place. If I ever get my hands on a thousand bucks, I'd get out of here so fast that it'd make it... I said if I had a thousand bucks, I'd kiss off Harry so fast that it'd make it... Hold it a minute, Alice. Somebody came in. Hold it. Is that you, Harry? Yeah, it's me. Came home early. Well, if you expect to find dinner at this hour, you're going to be disappointed. It's Harry, Alice. Honey? What was I saying? Oh, yeah. The same old thing. Honey, cut the conversation. Something's happened. What? I said cut the conversation. Here, give me that phone. Well, the phone... Alice, Helen will call you later. Goodbye. Big man. Baby, you know what I got here? $12,000. Yes, in a moment, Kathy and Elliot Lewis... And a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Wilcox, where will you spend your summer vacation? On the open road, Hap, my hapless pedestrian, enjoying the remarkable performance of my Autolite Stay Full battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Ah, what sweet Stay Fullman. Correction, Wilcox, you mean sweet fulfillment. Ah, you walked into a trap, Hap, my lad. The Autolite Stay Full battery brings sweet Stay Fullman. Because it has three times as much liquid reserve as batteries without stay-full features. That's why it needs water only three times a year in normal car use. A man who puns like that won't live long, Wilcox. Ah, but half the Autolite stay-full battery lives an incredibly long life. According to tests based on SAE life cycle standards, for example, this famous battery gave 70% longer average life than batteries without stay-full features. I shouldn't have started all this. Oh, and speaking of starting, my friend, the Autolite stay-full battery has plenty of starting stamina and dependability. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite battery dealer tomorrow and ask for an Autolite stay-full battery for your car. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with love, honor, or murder, and the performances of Kathy and Elliot Lewis, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in... Suspense. That's what I said, baby. $12,000. Are you out of your mind, Harry? Helen, I found this wallet in my cab just a few minutes ago. Wallet? Here, look inside. Open it up. Harry. Hundred dollar bill. And fifties and twenties and tens. More than twelve thousand dollars. Twelve thousand dollars. <laughs> now is it all right to come home early? Why, gee, I I don't know what to say. Nah, take it easy, baby. Don't get too excited. I gotta give it back. Give it back? Well, yeah. Look at the name inside the wallet. Well, Belongs you... to a regular customer of mine, Sidney Walker, the news commentator. I take him around town every afternoon. He calls up for me personally. $12,000. Yeah. But as far as we're concerned, it's not worth 12 cents, huh? If I don't turn it into the company before Walker calls about it, they can throw me in a pen for five years. Then why did you bring it home? Oh, I don't know. I guess I shouldn't have at that. It's just that I never saw so much money before. I wasn't so far away. And I, I just had to bring it home and show it to you. You had to bring it home and wave it under my nose. That's like you. Oh, no, Helen. That's just like you, Harry. No, give me the money, Helen. Walker's going to remember leaving the money in my cab. He'll call up the company. Wait a second. How long ago did you find the money? Twenty minutes ago. I came straight home. Well, what's the hurry? What? Well, as long as you're home, why don't you wash up? I'll fix you some supper. I'll make you a good supper. Well, I don't know. I ought to get back. Go on, honey. Go on. Wash up. Go ahead. Give us a chance for a little while to kind of pretend the money belongs to us. Ah, this coffee really hits the spot. Why didn't you eat, honey? Hmm? Oh, I was thinking. About the 12,000 bucks? Well, someday we'll have it too, baby. We've got it right now, Harry. Well, 
Well, yeah, for about five more minutes. Well, I guess I'd better report in now. It's been almost an hour. Walker will be calling the company pretty soon. I want the money to be in the safe when he does. Uh, you give me the wallet, Helen? How do you know Walker will call the company? Oh, we've been through all of that. He'll call because he'll remember the ride with me. We went over a bumpy stretch. Easy for his wallet to pop out then. He'll probably remember that. He could have lost it in so many other places. He may not even think of the cab ride. And if he doesn't, won't you feel like a fool? Well, it's better than cooling my heels in some jail. I know what I'd do if I were you. What? I'd take the chance that Walker wouldn't remember that he wouldn't call. I'd keep the money. Oh, Helen, stop that. That's what I'd do, but not you. You've always been afraid to take a chance. You'll always be content to be nothing. I'm sorry I ever came here with the money. Now, give it back to me. I'm turning it into the company. You love me, Harry. Well, that's got nothing to do with no, it. No, it has everything to do with it. If you leave this house with the money, when you come back, I'll be gone. Now you're talking like a sad. I mean it. Come on, give me the wallet. Here it is, Harry. When you come back, I'll be gone. Yeah, I'll bet you will. Well, I gotta be gone. I'll see you later, honey. I'll be home later. Doesn't matter when you come home. You won't find me here. Ah, uh, you stop talking like that. So long, Helen. It's really goodbye, Harry. I mean it. You. You. From the first day we were married, you've been twisting me around your little finger. Only because you know how much I love you, how much I need you. I guess you'll never stop doing that, will you, Helen? Well... What do you want me to do? Nothing. Nothing. Leave everything to me. Fearless Cab Company. Uh, this is Mr. Sidney Walker's personal secretary calling. Don't tell me that cab Mr. Walker ordered hasn't got there yet. I sent it out hours ago. Oh, oh, no, it got here all right. It's not that. I, uh, we're trying to locate Mr. Walker, and I just wondered if by any chance you might have heard from him. What? Well, no, if he got his cab all right, why should he have called us? Oh, of course you're right. Well, thank you very much. Well? He hasn't reported anything yet. That don't make sense. Twelve thousand bucks is a lot of money, even for Walker. Give me the phone book. Who are you going to call now? Mr. Walker, of course. We've got to find out why he hasn't reported losing his wallet. What? Oh, look, why don't you let me bring the money back? Maybe, maybe he'll give me a good reward. He might even You're give me not a... going to do anything. Let me see now, where we are. Here it is. You're going to get us in trouble, Helen. I know what I'm doing. Hello? H Hello? I'd like to speak to Mr. Walker, please. Well, he's not in right now. This is Mr. Walker's housekeeper. Could I take a message? Uh, no, no, this is a personal matter. Where could I be certain of reaching him? Nowhere until 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock? Yes, that's when he does his nightly broadcast, you know. Oh, yes, of course. And, and uh, uh, what time does he reach the station? Five minutes of 10. Uh-huh. You're quite sure he'll be there then? Oh, my heavens. You could stake your life on it. That's been a schedule for a good many years. Oh, who's this talking? Are you a friend of Mr. Walker? Oh, yes, yes. My husband and I have known Sidney for a long time. Well, as long as you're a friend, I can tell you. Mr. Walker has a busy evening ahead of him. Oh? He lost his wallet an hour or so ago. It contained a lot of money, enough for a payment on a house he's wanted. That's too bad. I do hope he finds it. Oh, he'll find the wallet all right. He's out looking for it right now. Do you have any idea where he might have lost it? Oh, yes, he certainly has, and he's mighty disappointed it hasn't been returned. He knows who found the wallet? Well, not exactly. The way he told it to me, he knows who should have found it. But that is, he didn't tell me the rascal's name. I see. He's too kind and easygoing, that's what he is. Uh, he's always been that way. I'd have called the police right away. 
Why hasn't he? Oh, he doesn't want to cause any embarrassment or hard feelings, you know. So first he's going to look everywhere else he's been this evening. Hmm. And if it still doesn't turn up? Well, he says that this fellow he suspects hasn't come by the apartment to return the money by the time he gets home. Then he'll report it all right. And, <laughs> oh, but my gracious, here I am gabbing away a mile a minute. I'm sure all this doesn't interest you. Oh, it does. Of course it does. Now, if we want to reach Sydney before he gets home, you say he will arrive at the radio station just before 10. At 5 minutes to 10, on the dot. Well, then we'll contact him there. Thank you. Harry. Yes? That was his housekeeper. By what she said, he knows he left the wallet in your cab. See, I told you. Yeah, but he hasn't reported it yet. Mr. Walker is a very fair man. Oh. Well, I'll have time to bring it down to the company. Harry, then. how many times do I have to tell you we're not going to bring it down to the company? Now, come on. We've got to decide what we can do between now and midnight to keep Walker from reporting his loss. There's nothing we can do. You just said he knows he left the money in my cab. That's right. Well, then what is there to decide? I'm smiling about it. Was I smiling? Thinking of something. Of what? You know, there is really only one way in all the world to keep Walker from telling about that wallet. What are you talking about? The only way to keep Walker from telling would be to kill him. But now, now, look. We've got to decide what we're going to do, so let's stop the jokes. Do I look like I'm joking? No. No, you don't. There's that gun in the dresser drawer. Never been used. They can never trace anything to you. Oh, Helen, what are you talking about? You've got to kill him. It's simple arithmetic. But how can I? He's... He's never done me any harm. If he lives, he'll call the police and tell him you've stolen his money. Well, that's why i got to return the money. If you do that, you'll lose your wife. No, no but Helen, look... Listen to me. Look how simple at five minutes to ten, you can be absolutely certain that he'll be entering the broadcasting studio. If you were waiting outside for him, there are so many quiet places you could take him with a gun. Yeah, but Helen, listen to me. Even even if, if I wanted to kill him, I, I couldn't. I have no nerve. Oh, yes, you have. What? You see, Harry, there are some men who can kill a hundred times. Doesn't bother their appetite. They still get a good night's sleep. Yeah, but not, not... No, I know, no, not you. Not you, Harry. But every man, even a weakling like you, can kill once. He's got to kill to get rid of the thing that'll destroy him. Oh, Helen, please, I can't. You can. Harry, you can do it for me. Oh, why don't you let me just bring the money back? It'd be so much better that way. Harry. What time is it? What? What time is it? Uh, it's ten after nine. You couldn't bring the money back now even if I let you. But why? What time should you have reported in with your cab? Well, half past eight. What the... Oh. So that's it. See what I mean? If Walker reports his loss now, you're in trouble no matter what you do. They'll know you were thinking of keeping the money. In their eyes, that's almost as bad as really keeping it. Yeah, but I... You I, know I... the rules of that company. You're supposed to inspect your cab after every fare. If they don't arrest you, they'll fire you. They'll blackball you. You'll never get another job. That's why you kept me here. Made supper for me. Stalled around. You figured that one out, too, didn't you, Helen? Yes, I figured that one out, too. Walker will get to the station at 5 to 10. You've got 45 minutes. Start out and act as if you're on a regular run. That'll be your alibi later. Just stop at all the usual places and talk to the boys and act as if it were just another night. What, what about my schedule? I'm supposed to be in at 8.30. You can always tell them that business was so good you couldn't come in. Shall I get the gun, Harry? Yes. <laughs> Autolite is bringing you Kathy and Elliot Lewis in Love, Honor, or Murder. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Wilcox, if you drive across the Arizona desert, 
Take special note of the barrel cactus. What? Why, Hap? Why, Hap? It's a desert phenomenon. Holds water like a well. Well, well. That reminds me of the Autolite Stay Full battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. I was afraid it would. Ah, no need for fear, lad, because the Autolite Stay Full battery has plenty of starting stamina and dependability. You see, this super battery has a fiberglass retaining mat protecting every positive plate. That keeps the power-producing material in place and means extra long life. The little cactus lives a mighty long life, too. Now, pardon me, Hap, but SAE Life Cycle Standard Tests show that the Autolite Stay-Full battery gives 70% longer average life than batteries without Stay-Full features. Oh, there's no use talking. You're so right, Hap. The thing to do is see your friendly Autolite battery dealer tomorrow. Ask for an Autolite Stay-Full battery, the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember... You're always right with Autolite. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our stars, Kathy and Elliot Lewis, in Love, Honor, or Murder, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Harry, is it you? Uh, beg pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was my husband. What do you want? Oh, you must be Mrs. Blake, Harry's wife, huh? Yeah, what do you want? Say, uh, have I talked to you on the phone before? Why? Your voice sounds kind of familiar. You may have. Who is this? This is Dave Harris over at Peerless Cab Company. Peerless Cab Company? Yeah. Say, uh, have you seen Harry in the last couple hours? I know, he's out working. Well, he should have been through with his shift at 8.30. It's 25 to 10 already. That's not like Harry. 25 to 10... Is there something wrong? Well, I don't know. One of Harry's regular customers, Sidney Walker, called up a few minutes ago from a restaurant on the way to that broadcast of his. Yeah? He thinks he left a wallet in Harry's cab. I said he thinks he left... I heard the... you. Well, there was $12,000 in a wallet, Mrs. Blake. Walker says he looked everywhere else that he might have lost it and it hadn't turned up. He just wants me to contact Harry as soon as possible and tell him to look in the back of his cab. Yeah, well, if Harry should call, I'll tell him to get in touch with you right away. I should... What did you say before? Huh? Walker called and told all this before he started for the station. Uh, what, what are you talking about, Mrs. Blake? Nothing. Nothing. Walker called before he reached the station. Harry will be waiting at the station to kill him. But now Walker's already told him that maybe Harry took the wallet. Everything will point to Harry. They'll arrest him ten minutes after he's killed Walker. Harry will tell him everything. He's weak. He'll try to blame me. He'll tell him I made him do it. I gotta call him back. I gotta stop him before he kills Walker. Twenty-five to ten. Twenty minutes to reach him. I got to reach him. <laughs> Twenty minutes to reach Harry. Twenty minutes to call him back. I told Harry to make all the regular stops so everybody remember him. Oh, let me think. <laughs> He'll stop for gas at the taxi garage. Yeah, yeah, I reached him there before. A number's written down someplace. And there's that little book. I'm shaking so I can't. Here. Here it is. Mutual 6552. Max speaking. This, this is Mrs. Blake calling. Harry Blake's wife? Yeah, Miss Blake. Has Harry been there yet? T to get his gas, I mean. No, he hasn't been here all night. Say, what's he been up to? What do you mean? Well, I just got a call from the main office to hold him here when he does show up. Look, Mac, Harry always told me you were his friend. Well, sure. Well, he's in uh... trouble, terrible trouble. I haven't got the time to explain, but if I don't reach him right away, I don't know what'll happen. Well, uh... I don't know what I can do, Miss Blake. Well, you you can tell me the names and the telephone numbers of some of the places that cabbies like Harry stop off at well, he, while, while they're on their runs. Uh, well, sometimes the boys stop at Gus's Coffee Shop on 6th Avenue for coffee. What's their number? Uh, wait a minute. It's, uh, it's uh, State uh, 8570. Yeah, State 8570. All right, all right. Where else? Oh, maybe if he had a few minutes to spare, he'd go into Frank's tavern on Washington Boulevard. I don't know the phone number there. I'll look it up. I'll look it up. Where else? Uh, 
course, he might go up to Union headquarters to chew the rank with the boys. Union headquarters? Yeah, where else? Well, look, there's lots of places he might stop off at. You gotta reach him by 10 o'clock, huh? Well, that doesn't leave you much time. No, it doesn't leave me much time. <laughs> I'm trying to locate Harry Blake. Has he been there tonight? He hasn't. Well, if he does show up, will you tell him to call his wife? Tell him it's very important. You're sure Harry isn't in? Could you just kind of look around again? It, it, all right, if you're sure. But, but listen, if he does drop in, tell him to call home right away. Harry Blake. Yeah, the cab driver. He was in your place just a few minutes ago. Can you call him back? Please, it's terribly important. I know you're awful busy and everything. Hello? 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 What am I going to do? What am I going to do? i got to stop him. How? Fifteen minutes to ten. Ten minutes. Only ten minutes. i got to think. i got to think. Radio station's on 6th and Main. That's... Two miles away. Maybe I could get to Harry before Walker reaches there. I've got to try. I've got to try. I've got to stop him. Driver. Huh? When I got in your cab, you told me you could get me to the radio station in ten minutes. Oh, I didn't give you no guarantees, lady. I'm doing the best I can. But I- I've got to get there before five or ten. You told me you could make... It don't do no good to holler in my ear, lady. There must be... Some way to make better time. Can't you take side streets or something? Again, you're stuck. It's the traffic, lady. But you told me. I know what I told you, but I didn't figure on so much traffic. <laughs> Please hurry. Yeah, yeah. I'll pay you anything if you get me there. Oh, dang. Always in a hurry. Oh. Now what's wrong? I told you, lady, the traffic is lousing us up. What time is it now? Oh, about ten minutes to ten. Don't tell me about. I want the exact time. Exact time, uh, seven minutes to ten. Seven minutes to ten? How much farther is it to the station? Well, I can tell you this. We're not going to make it in two minutes. And there's no need to make it at all. Take me home. Just a minute or two before ten. He'll be coming home soon. Wanting to hide under the bed, whimpering like a dog. They'll trace the killing to him fast enough. They'll come here. They'll take us both away. And the money, too. Money? The money, too. Wait a minute. Why should they come here? Why should they get the money? Why do I have to take the blame for what he did? I didn't commit the murder. That money, I could get away. They wouldn't look for me too hard. Yeah. Yeah, why should I take the blame for what Harry did? Department, Sergeant Graham speaking. I want to report a murder. What's that? You're too late to stop the murder, but you can still catch the killer. Wait a second. Now, just who is this killer? His name is Harry Blake. Drives a taxi cab. Taxi number is 365. You should find him somewhere... Around the radio station. Six ten. Uh, just who did he kill? He... He killed... Harry? Evening, Helen. Go on, finish your conversation. How did you get back here so soon? Good cabbie can make time when he has to. You killed him? It's just after ten o'clock. Turn on the radio and find out. Oh, you're talking on the phone. 
I'll turn the radio on for you. Harry, the police will come here and look for you. They'll catch you, Harry. Did anybody see you do it? Did they try to... Yeah. analysis of foreign affairs, Mr. Sidney Walker. <sighs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Sidney Walker. Tonight, I'm going to bring you a report on a recent interview I had with one of the oh, most prominent oh, industrialists in America. I want to hear. I tell you his name. <laughs> You didn't give it that long. I should have known. I should have known. I actually thought you went through with it. You didn't have the nerve. No. I didn't kill him. But I did have the nerve. What? Yeah. You gave me the nerve. That pep talk before I left, it was very true, you know. What are you talking about? You remember? Even a weakling like me can kill once if he's got a kill to get rid of the one thing that'll destroy him. Those were your very words. Then why didn't you kill Walker? Because I got to thinking about what you said and how right you were. And the more I thought about it, the more I realize. Realize what? That I was headed in the wrong direction. What do you mean by that? Put that gun away, Harry. In order to rid myself of the one thing in the world that can destroy me, I had to come back here to you. Helen... <laughs> Hello. This says the police department, isn't it? I heard her speaking to you as I was opening the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, it's the police department. What's going on there? What were those shots? Wasn't my wife reporting a murder? Yeah, she was. She gave us all the information, except she didn't tell us who was going to be killed. Oh. Well, you see, officer, until this very moment, she really didn't know. <laughs> Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's stars, Kathy and Elliot Lewis. Well, Harlow, I hope you and your Autolite Stay Full Battery have a wonderful vacation together. Thanks, Hap, and the same to you. See you August 31st, when Suspense will return to the CBS Airways, same time, same stations. Until then, we'll say so long for Autolite, makers of more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in more than 28 plants coast to coast. Now, if you're planning a vacation motor trip, be sure to have your car carefully checked at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. And if your Autolite-equipped car needs replacement parts, ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts. Because they're engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. Best wishes for a happy, carefree summer. And remember, friends, you're always right with Autolite. Remember, Thursday, August 31st, Suspense returns to the air with the first of a series of stories that is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear, directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense was composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lynn Murray tonight. Love, Honor, or Murder is an original play written for radio by Larry Marcus. Kathy and Elliot Lewis can be heard in their new Columbia record albums, Happy Anniversary and Happy Holiday. Don't forget, Suspense returns to the air Thursday, August 31st. You can buy Autolite Stayful batteries, Autolite standard or resistor spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite... Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal Gasoline. 
Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal. Yes, you do go farther with signal. Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, murder is legal. I am The Whistler, and I know many things I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who've stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. This is the strip, playland of Hollywood. Here are the most elegant gaming houses and nightclubs in the Western Hemisphere. Here are the sumptuous apartments of the great and near great the idols of a million adolescent girls. In the apartment of David Faraday, hero of costume epics and courtroom scandals. Mr. Faraday, wake up, Mr. Faraday. It's time for you to go to Mr. Costas' party. Come on now, Mr. Faraday. It's just me, Jenny O. There aren't no reporters here. I hope we're not bored. Boss, I'm coming in. I know you're tired, boss, but you just got to get up. Trial's all over. Boss, are you all right? That's blood there. Oh, Lord, help me. Mr. Faraday, you've been shot. You're dead. Yes. In the elegant apartment of David Faraday on the Sunset Strip, the body of the screen's swashbuckling hero grows colder. Only two blocks down the street and the guests are arriving at a party given in his honor. A party given by the most important man in Hollywood. A man who's never been in front of a camera. Oh, Clifford, darling, am I late? Oh, Pussy was an angel of patience. I spoiled the last three takes in my hurry to get here, didn't I, Pussy? I'm so anxious to see David, and he won't answer his phone. He hasn't talked to anyone since the trial, even me, his fiancée, and I've been calling him all afternoon. Clifford, what do you do? Hide your winning client so that the jury can't change its mind. I've been frantic, haven't I, Poochie? If you don't mind, Miss Lorraine, my name is Poochowitz. Poochowitz, not Poochie. Oh. What would my wife think? Poochie, dear, your wife hasn't had a thought since she married you. <laughs> since before, maybe, huh? <laughs> I wouldn't worry about David, Madeline. He was very tired and probably went home to sleep. The trial was very wearing. However, I think that he'll be here. It was very close, wasn't it? I mean, the girl's story was quite sound. But, of course, we all knew that David would get off. With you for a lawyer, how could he miss? After all, you wouldn't want to spoil a perfect record of acquittal. Well, that's really up to the jury. But it was a difficult case. So much publicity complicates any defense. Hello, Madeline. Oh, Charlotte. Oh, darling, you look ravishing. That is, for a girl whose fiancé almost went to prison. Why, if it had been Tommy, I wouldn't have slept a wink. Oh, Mr. Carstair, you know Miss Mannering of Colossal. No, I haven't had the pleasure. Oh, you're the famous lawyer, Clifford Carstair. Oh, I've heard so much about you. No one you have ever defended has ever been convicted. Oh, of course, Madeline, how silly of me. Naturally, you didn't worry with Mr. Carstair defending David. Well, you flatter me. The evidence freed him, not I. Tell me, Mr. Carstair, is it merely evidence that frees all your clients? Naturally. However, the most important factor is careful preparation. Every contingency must be taken care of ahead of time. Of course. In a sense, the, the verdict is in before the case ever comes to court. <laughs> then it must be confusing if the criminal messed up the crime to start with. I mean, before you could take a hand in arranging the evidence. Well, naturally, Miss Mannering, I try to avoid uh, taking cases that are, that are too confused. Oh. However, no case is perfect legally. That is because no defendant ever considers the legal angle before the circumstances arise. The perfect crime will never be committed until a lawyer can handle the chain of evidence from the beginning of a crime. 
even before its commission. <laughs> but, of course, that is impossible. Unless he were to commit a crime himself. <laughs> that would hardly be ethical, Miss Mannering. Besides, he'd be unable to defend himself, and thus the whole theory breaks down. Uh, but before we embark upon our life of crime, Miss Mannering, uh, you'll find the bar in the library at the end of the hall. Oh, I... uh, my honor, Miss Mannering. Oh, what a delightful European bow, Mr. Put your way. <laughs> Wait, Madeline. Yes, Clifford? You don't seem very happy. I, I thought this was to be our night. Our night to celebrate David's acquittal? <laughs> don't be absurd, darling. Oh, what could I do, Maddie? My professional reputation was at stake. Our love, too, darling. Don't forget our love. That was at stake. It was me or your reputation. In Kansas City, I think you would have chosen differently. Kansas City was ten years ago, Maddie. Isn't it enough that I still love you without having to give up everything that I've gained to prove it? Oh, Cliff, you were my only hope. If David had been convicted today, I would have been free, and we could have been married. For the first time since my divorce from Jack, I was going to be happy with you. But this way... Oh, you won your case, but I've lost mine. No, I've lost too, Madeline. What? I've loved you for a long time, even in Kansas City. Even when you left me to marry Jack. Need we talk about that now? Yes. Jack was the handsomer, the younger, the more promising... So you married him, even loving me. And still, I loved you. Your love has strange ways of showing itself then and now. You set yourself out to break my husband. You had him disbarred, ruined his career. Was that love? Well, I knew you'd leave him after he was no longer a shiny new prize. I didn't leave, Jack. He left me. After the automobile accident, the night you had him disbarred, he said he didn't want me to be saddled with a cripple. So he just disappeared. I couldn't come back to you then. That would have been crawling, and I won't crawl for any man. But you'd crawl to David to save your career, to keep your beautiful face in front of the public. Well, that's something else. Something you could have saved me from if you'd loved me, instead of having David acquitted today. You'll be quite safe now, Maddie. You see, David is dead. You mean you... Something like that. Yes. <laughs> With the prologue of Murder is Legal, the Signal Oil Company brings you another of the strange tales of the Whistler. Now, before we return to our story, I'd like to ask you a question. Are you planning on repainting your car before the day arrives when you can replace it with a new one? If you're like most motorists, your answer is, not if you can make the present finish last out the duration. Well, right there is where your Signal gasoline dealer can be of real service to you. He now features the famous Venus One Application Auto Polish. In one easy operation, Venus removes dingy road film to bring out the true color of your car and then leaves the renewed finish sparkling under a protective glaze of Carnauba and Ozocerite, the hardest and most waterproof waxes known to science. Made by the Whiz Company, nationally famous for finer quality automotive products, Venus Polish is just one of your signal dealer's complete line of Whiz items to make your car look and run better longer. Next time you're at your neighborhood Signal gasoline dealers, look over his Whiz product. You'll find motor rhythm, metal polish, car wax, radiator cleaner, upholstery cleaner, and many other upkeep items. Like all your Signal dealer services, Whiz products have proven their ability to help your car last longer and go farther. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Madeline Lorraine, the glamorous picture star, has just heard the startling news that David Faraday, her fiancé, is dead. What makes it more startling is the fact that Clifford Carstair, the famous lawyer, has practically admitted to her that he murdered David, his client. <laughs> it's so funny. Did you understand me? Yes, Clifford, darling. David has been murdered. Well, I thought you'd be pleased, but... Oh, I... I am, darling. I am. <laughs> Just that it's so funny, so so horribly funny. You wouldn't risk losing a case, but you'd risk this, this crime. Oh, you're a born comedian, Cliff. 
Poochie should hire you. Stop it, Madeline. <laughs> Why? Don't people laugh when they're happy? My career's safe. So's yours. Our love is safe. Why, it's wonderful. But what about the police? You and me are... Are we safe, too? Mm. Yes. Yes, I think so. The police will discover that Jack, your former husband, committed the murder. Jack? But I don't understand. Is he here? How did you... How could he... Oh, one at a time, sweet. Yes, yes, he's here in Los Angeles. I saw him last week. I had occasion to cut through Pershing Square on my way to see a client. He was... He was sitting with his wooden leg propped on a bench feeding the pigeons. He's changed, Madeline. I hardly recognized him. He didn't see me, but I made inquiries. I can find him when I need him. But I still don't understand. If you killed David, Shh. I... Well, you did, though. So why should the police... Very simple. Elementary matter of preparation. Oh. Faraday was shot with a gun registered to your husband. Uh, you've had it for years, but uh, no one will know that. Also, there are the marks of a peg leg on the balcony. The room was broken into. He had uh, plenty of motive and... Besides, I think I can persuade him to confess. Uh, that is, if I make it sufficiently profitable. No, Cliff. No, we can't do it. Between us, we wrecked Jack's life. We can't make him pay for our crimes, too. Don't be silly. He won't be convicted. None of my clients ever is. Your glamorous friend was quite right. I've wanted to arrange my own crime, set the evidence beforehand, and I have. This is perfect, Madeline. It'll be a clear case of self-defense. With me as his attorney, Jack is a cinch for acquittal. It's precious, Cliff. Darling, you're a genius. You arrange everything the way you want it, don't you? It's wonderful. And so funny. So terribly funny. <laughs> yes. You've planned a perfect crime, haven't you, Mr. Carstairs? Madeline thinks it's very funny. Funny and clever, Mr. Carstairs. Yes, Madeline Lorraine's husband, her first husband, that is, is a cinch for acquittal. That is, if he cooperates. And he will. Won't he, Mr. Carstairs? You know he will. Hello, Jack. Down. Glad to see you again. I'll bet. You were pretty sure of me, weren't you, Carstair? Pretty sure I'd come when you sent for me. You came, I see. Ah, the great Carstair wins again. Someday you'll overstep yourself like I did. I'm waiting. Why be so bitter, Jack? I've always liked you personally. You know that. Sure, you only broke my career. Had me disbarred for one little slip. And I get drunk and lose a leg in Madeline. That's all there was in my life, my career in Madeline. I'd be dead now, but for two things. Watching her rise in the world and waiting for you. Well, that was a long time ago, Jack. Why don't you forget it? I did what I had to do. There was no rancor in it. It was nothing personal. Won't you believe that? Maybe. How is Madeline? I guess she's going to marry that Hollywood heel. Too bad, Carstair. Looks like you lose out again. I've got to hand it to you, though. You protected him. I hadn't thought you had so many scruples, Carster. He was my client. I had to protect him. Uh, I have another client now, though, and uh, I need your help. Well, well. I never thought I'd hear the great Carstair yelling for help. You should have thought of that before you had me disbarred. Sorry, chum. Well, I told Madeline you wouldn't be any good to us. But she insisted that I contact you. Why didn't you say so in the first place? Well, I didn't consider it was necessary. You know I see Madeline. I know you still love her. The story, please. You uh, do, don't you, Jack? The story, fast and good. Well, uh, Madeline, like all figures in the public eye, had some things in her past that the fans might not have approved of. It was essential that she keep them a secret. So? Well, David Faraday knew of these things and uh, was using them to blackmail her into marrying him. Late this afternoon, she met him at his apartment. The colored boy was out. No one saw her. They quarreled. Uh, she had that uh, old gun of yours in her bag. She shot him, Jack. The poor fool. Poor little fool. Is there any chance for a car, Stair? If it comes to open court, not one in a million. I'd do what I could, naturally, but there's not one chance in a million of getting off with less than life. How can you keep it from coming to court? By acting fast. They haven't found the body yet. 
When they do, the newspapers will be howling for a conviction. It's election year, and the D.A. will take a fast confession and not ask too many embarrassing questions. That's where you come in. Wait a minute. I'm not burning for anyone else's murders, wooden leg and all. I'm not asking you to burn for it, Jack. You see, I know this D.A. He won't even fight a self-defense plea if it uh, looks good at all. Uh, with Maddie, there's too much supplemental evidence. They'd have to make it second degree. With you, it's a cinch. I'm Faraday's lawyer. My dictaphones will show his reactions to your being in town. How he wanted to send for you. How he, how he was afraid of you. Clear cut. Self-defense. Oh, and Madeline would never chance. But I'd stake my reputation, even my life, on getting you off scot-free. What makes you think they'll believe this confession? Even if he did have a motive for getting me there. In the first place, that gun was registered to you. In the second, I have checked over the scene. He had a paper knife in his hand. I arranged the room to look as if a fight had occurred. Also, there are marks of a peg leg in the soft ground outside his balcony. In other words, if I don't cooperate... The police will probably pick you up anyway, precisely. And if I do? I am empowered to offer you the sum of $10,000. Fifteen. I won't haggle. Sorry, Carstairs, I can't see it. It's a fine deal. I go to the chair for Madeline's murder, and you pay $15,000 over to my widow. Maybe you'll even throw in a crypt at the cemetery, but it's not enough. Uh, let me restate my position, Jack. Perhaps I didn't make it clear. On the one hand... You confess the circumstances of Faraday's death, and I'll guarantee to get you off. On the other, I tip off the district attorney, and 90 to 1, they indict you anyway. Without my support, I don't think you'd have much chance of acquittal, especially when the blackmail attempts that you made on Faraday come out. I never tried to blackmail Faraday, and you know it. No, as his lawyer, I'd be in a position to know these details, don't you think? Did I ever tell you I hated your guts? Frequently, in Kansas City. I didn't say it loud enough. Well, Carstairs, you've got me over a barrel. There's not much I can do. Good. But I want it in writing. Don't you think that's uh, too risky? And besides, it wouldn't be worth the paper it's written on. Maybe, but that way I know you won't double-cross me. I'd trust Maddie if she were in it alone. With you, I want a contract, you might say. Something to hold over your head. Very well. We'll make it out right now. Okay, you phrase it, but put in the money and that you guarantee my acquittal. Hmm, we don't trust one another or even like one another. But in this, you have my word. Well, oh, Carstairs, we're partners now. We've a contract for crime. Shall we drink to our new venture? And to how much I hate your guts! <laughs> Yes, a good legal partnership. Practically a corporation, if you add it. Madeline. And three such brilliant people, too. They're sure to make a go of it, wouldn't you say? What? Who was there? Quiet, it's me, Jack. Jack? Oh, darling. I, I mean, it is four in the morning and I have to be on the set at six. Can't you wait, Jack? I heard what you said the first time. Let me in the French door. Jack. You haven't come near me for ten years. Tonight I thought maybe you needed me. I do, Jack. I have for a long time. I sent for you often. You never came. I wanted you to have your chance, as I didn't have mine. You've got everything now. You're a big star. You've a fine home, jewels. What more could you want? Well... Safety. I'll give you that, darling. Was what Carstairs told me true? Yes. Poor kid. But nothing's going to happen. I just wanted to tell you that. This is one case Carstairs won't dare lose. I know. But that's not what I want. What do you want, Maddie? Do I have to tell you, Jack? After all this time, do I have to say it? Yes. I guess I... I don't belong in Hollywood, Jack. I'm a fake. I go around being Madeline Lorraine, hard, indiscreet, sophisticated, just as Hollywood as I can be. But underneath, I'm just Mrs. John Tennant from Kansas City. Do you mean that, Madeline? Don't you know when you're being proposed to? And don't say this is so sudden. 
Not, not now. Oh, darling. <laughs> I tried so hard to be tough. I thought I was. Until tonight. And when this happened, I couldn't put on the act any longer. What about Carstairs? Oh, he wants to marry me when this is over. And you? Not anymore. You know what I want. All right, Madeline. If that's what you want, truly. <laughs> Tell no one anything. We'll go through with this. When it's over, I'll have $15,000. We'll go away someplace. Brazil's a good spot. We'll start over. 10000 should see us through. I thought you said 15000 I need the rest. I have a debt to pay. A 10-year-old debt. <laughs> Yes, you'll go through with it, Jack. The papers next morning have the story. David Faraday, swashbuckling movie star, was killed in a drunken brawl. His confessed slayer is John Ternant, ex-husband of actress Madeline Lorraine. Ternant allegedly came to the star's apartment at the request of Faraday's lawyer to sign an affidavit regarding his divorce with Miss Lorraine, which took place in Kansas City eight years ago. An argument ensued, and Faraday, according to Ternant, seemed intoxicated, attacking with a paper knife. In the struggle that followed, the actor was killed. The renowned Clifford Carstairs is representing Ternant. Gentlemen of the jury, the defense rests. Firm in the knowledge that no American would convict a man for defending his life from a foul murder. You were wonderful, Cliff. Thanks, Maddie. Let's walk down the hall a minute. It's a good policy for me to leave the room now. And besides, I want to talk to you. All right, Cliff. Well, Cliff. Uh, what? Well, you wanted to walk and talk, you said. Well, yes, I, uh, I, uh, well, I want the date for our wedding set, Maddie. Oh, don't rush me so, Cliff. Rush you? Why, it's been two months since David's death. You just keep putting me off. Do you think that's fair, Maddie? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't given it very much thought. Well, you still love me, don't you? That hasn't changed, has it? Well, everything changes, Cliff. There's nothing certain, except, of course, a car stare verdict. You always win, Cliff. You always win, except this time. Well, I told you the verdict was a cinch. No, I didn't mean the trial. I meant me. You lose me. Oh, Maddie, you can't do this to me. I don't see that I'm doing anything to you. I'm just doing something for me. Not for Puchowitz, nor our public, nor David, nor you. Just me. I'm going back to Jack, Cliff. After the farce in there is over, we're going to go away and start all over again. Oh, Madeline, you... You owe me more than this. Do I? I'm sorry, Cliff. I... I only killed a man for your sake. That was your idea, Cliff, not mine. And then that night... When you told me about it, and about how you were going to use Jack to protect us, well, it was suddenly so horribly funny that I laughed. Remember? In that instant, faced with a murder, I realized what I really wanted. And it wasn't you at all, Cliff. It wasn't Hollywood or my name in lights, either. It was Jack. And going back to being simple, being just his wife. And it was so tragically funny. It doesn't amuse me, Maddie. What if I were to expose your connection with Faraday in the killing? Remember the contract you signed with Jack, dear. You can't touch him without putting yourself in the chair. As for me, well, I don't want my public anymore. They can think what they please about me. I'm a different woman, Cliff, than the one who came to your party that night. And if I've been foolish, I'll atone for it. And that's my answer, Cliff, and it won't change. I'm sorry. The great Carstairs has lost this verdict. But that's not all of this strange story. The Whistler will be back to tell you what really happened. Meantime, I want to answer a question which, judging by the number of inquiries, must be puzzling a lot of drivers today. It's this. Since certain gasoline ingredients have gone to war, aren't all of today's gasoline the same... No, indeed. 
If you've tried many brands in your car, you've already noticed a difference in performance, and I'll tell you why. Each oil company has its own refining method for its own brand of gasoline. Well, as thousands of Western drivers who keep a close record of their gasoline mileage know, the Signal refining method has for years been famous for its extra mileage. Signal is frank in telling you that with certain ingredients reserved for fighting planes, Signal can't promise all the brilliant performance you enjoyed with pre-war Signal gasoline and which you'll again find in further improved Signal post-war gasoline. But the name Signal still stands for the finest quality gasoline that can be made. And Signal still places the emphasis on mileage. That's why with gasoline rations, Signal Go Farther Gasoline is more than ever your best buy today. If you haven't tried Signal Go Farther Gasoline in your car, there never was a better reason or better time for getting acquainted with your neighborhood Signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, of course, Jack was acquitted. You won again, Carstair. Everything turned out just as you said it would. Except, of course, Madeline. You killed a man for nothing, but it was a perfect crime. The evidence was arranged as only a lawyer could do it. But then Jack was a lawyer, too, once. You know what a good lawyer with, shall we say, $5,000 can do, don't you, Mr. Carstair? thousand here and there to the proper people that tip off to the police. You've done it often enough yourself. A frame-up, they call it, don't they? Hello, Carstair. Remember me, Reynolds, district attorney's office? I want to ask you a few questions. Oh, well, sit down. Thank you. Always glad to help you, boys. Good. Then answer this one. Why did you kill David Faraday? What? The colored man says you came in that afternoon. Says you paid him to say he was out. Says he was scared to talk before. Why, that's ridiculous. He wasn't anywhere around. Then you admit you were there. I admit nothing. How about the gunsmith downtown? He says you paid him $1,000 to file that identification number on a gun. You haven't got a chance, Costair. I've been framed. It's an open and shut case. Funny, we'd never have thought of it. We got the tip from that guy you forced to confess to the crime. He skipped to Brazil. Afraid uh, we'd make him stand trial for perjury. We wouldn't, though. In our business, we know how easy it is for a smart lawyer like you to frame a guy and force him into a confession. I've been framed, I tell you. It was his gun. Tell that to the judge. Maybe he'll believe you. No, Carstair. Even you can't talk your way out of this one. Yes, Carstair. Framed. But in this case, frame for a murder you did commit. Monday at 9 o'clock, the Whistler will bring you another strange tale, the curious story of the Bells of Aberdobe. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, story by Robert Libet, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking. Remember to let every traffic signal remind you you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.